Chapter six point five of the nine eleven Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The nine eleven Commission Report. Chapter six point five. The new administration's approach. The Bush administration in its first month faced many problems other than terrorism. They included the collapse of the Middle East peace process and, in April, a crisis over a U.S. so-called spy plane brought down in Chinese territory. The new administration also focused heavily on Russia, a new nuclear strategy that allowed missile defenses, Europe, Mexico and the Persian Gulf. In the spring, reporting on terrorism surged dramatically. In Chapter 8, we will explore this reporting and the ways agencies responded. These increasingly alarming reports, briefed to the President and top officials, became part of the context in which the new administration weighed its options for policy on Al-Qaeda. Except for a few reports that the CSG considered and apparently judged to be unreliable, none of these pointed specifically to possible Al-Qaeda action inside the United States, although the CSG continued to be concerned about the domestic threat the mosaic of threat intelligence came from the counter-terrorist centre, which collected only abroad. Its reports were not supplemented by reports from the FBI. Clark had expressed concern about an al-Qaeda presence in the United States, and he worried about an attack on the White House by, quote, Hezbollah, Hamas, al-Qaeda, and other terrorist organizations, end quote. In May, President Bush announced that Vice President Cheney would himself lead an effort looking at preparations for managing a possible attack by weapons of mass destruction and at more general problems of national preparedness. The next few months were mainly spent organizing the effort and bringing an admiral from the Sixth Fleet back to Washington to manage it. The Vice President's task force was just getting underway when the 9-11 attack occurred. On May 29th, at Tenet's request, Rice and Tenet converted their usual weekly meeting into a broader discussion on Al-Qaeda. Participants included Clark, CTC Chief Kofa Black, and Richard, a group chief with authority over the Bin Laden unit. Rice asked about, quote, taking the offensive, end quote, and whether any approach could be made to influence Bin Laden or the Taliban. Clark and Black replied that the CIA's ongoing disruption activities were taking the offensive, and that bin Laden could not be deterred. A wide-ranging discussion then ensued about breaking the back of bin Laden's organization. Tenet emphasized the ambitious plans for covert action that the CIA had developed in December 2000. In discussing the draft authorities for this program in March, CIA officials had pointed out that the spending level envisioned for these plans was larger than the CIA's entire current budget for counterterrorism covert action. It would be a multi-year program, requiring such levels of spending for about five years. The CIA official, Richard, told us that Rice got it. He said she agreed with his conclusions about what needed to be done, although he complained to us that the policy process did not follow through quickly enough. Clark and Black were asked to develop a range of options for attacking bin Laden's organization from the least to most ambitious. Rice and Hatley asked Clark and his staff to draw up the new presidential directive. On June 7, Hatley circulated the first draft, describing it as an admittedly ambitious program for confronting al-Qaeda. The draft NSPD's goal was to, quote, eliminate the al-Qaeda network of terrorist groups as a threat to the United States and to friendly governments, end quote. It called for a multi-year effort involving diplomacy, covert action, economic measures, law enforcement, public diplomacy, and, if necessary, military efforts. The State Department was to work with other governments to end all al-Qaeda sanctuaries and also to work with the Treasury Department to disrupt terrorist financing. The CIA was to develop an expanded covert action program, including significant additional funding and aid to anti-Taliban groups. The draft also tasked OMB with ensuring that sufficient funds to support this program were found in U.S. budgets from fiscal years 2002 to 2006. Rice viewed this draft directive as the embodiment of a comprehensive new strategy employing all instruments of national power to eliminate the al-Qaeda threat. 
Clark, however, regarded the new draft as essentially similar to the proposal he had developed in December 2000 and put forward to the new administration in January 2001. In May or June, Clark asked to be moved from his counterterrorism portfolio to a new set of responsibilities for cyber security. He told us that he was frustrated with his role and with an administration that he considered not, quote, serious about al-Qaeda, end quote. If Clark was frustrated, he never expressed it to her, Rice told us. Diplomacy in Blind Alleys Afghanistan The new administration had already begun exploring possible diplomatic options, retracing many of the paths travelled by its predecessors. U.S. envoys again pressed the Taliban to turn bin Laden, quote, over to a country where he could face justice, end quote and repeated, yet again, the warning that the Taliban would be held responsible for any al-Qaeda attacks on the U.S. interests. The Taliban's representatives repeated their old arguments. Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage told us that while U.S. diplomats were becoming more active on Afghanistan through the spring and summer of 2001, quote, it would be wrong for anyone to characterize this as a dramatic shift from the previous administration, end quote. Footnote. In early July 2001, shortly before retiring, Ambassador Milam met one last time with Taliban Deputy Foreign Minister Jalil in Islamabad. Milam tried to dispel any confusion about where bin Laden fit into U.S.-Taliban relations. The Saudi terrorist was the issue, and he had to be expelled. The State Department's South Asia Bureau called for a less confrontational stance toward the Taliban. It opposed a policy to overthrow the Taliban and was cautious about aiding the Northern Alliance. End footnote. In deputies' meetings at the end of June, Tenet was asked to assess the prospects for Taliban cooperation with the United States on Al-Qaeda. The NSC staff was tasked to flesh out options for dealing with the Taliban. Revisiting these issues tried the patience of some of the officials who felt they had already been down these roads and who found the NSC's procedures slow. Quote, we weren't going fast enough, Armitage told us. Clark kept arguing that moves against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda should not have to wait months for a larger review of U.S. policy in South Asia. For the government, Hadley said to us, we moved it along as fast as we could move it along. As all hope in moving the Taliban faded, debate revived about giving covert assistance to the regime's opponents. Clark and the CIA's Kofa Black renewed the push to aid the Northern Alliance. Clark suggested starting with modest aid, just enough to keep the Northern Alliance in the fight and tie down al-Qaeda terrorists without aiming to overflow the Taliban. Rice, Hatley and the NSC staff member for Afghanistan, Zalmay Galilzad, told us they opposed giving aid to the Northern Alliance alone. They argued that the program needed to have a big part for Pashtun opponents of the Taliban. They also thought the program should be conducted on a larger scale than had been suggested. Clark concurred with the idea of a larger program, but he warned that delay risked the Northern Alliance final defeat at the hands of the Taliban. During the spring, the CIA, at the NSC's request, had developed draft legal authorities, a presidential finding, to undertake a large-scale program of covert assistance to the Taliban's foes. The draft authorities expressly stated that the goal of the assistance was not to overthrow the Taliban. But even this program would be very costly. This was the context for earlier conversations, when in March Tenet stressed the need to consider the impact of such a large program on the political situation in the region, and in May Tenet talked to Rice about the need for a multi-year financial commitment. By July, the deputies were moving toward agreement that some last effort should be made to convince the Taliban to shift position, and then, if that failed, the administration would move on the significantly enlarged covert action program. As the draft presidential directive was circulated in July, the State Department sent the deputies a lengthy historical review of U.S. efforts to engage the Taliban about bin Laden from 1996 on. These talks have been fruitless, the State Department concluded. Arguments in the summer brought to the surface the more fundamental issue of whether the U.S. covert action program should seek to overthrow the regime, intervening decisively in the civil war in order to change Afghanistan's government. 
by the end of a deputies' meeting on September 10, officials formally agreed on a three-phase strategy. First, an envoy would give the Taliban a last chance. If this failed, continuing diplomatic pressure would be combined with a planned covert action program encouraging anti-Taliban Afghans of all major ethnic groups to stalemate the Taliban in the civil war and attack al-Qaeda bases, while the United States developed an international coalition to undermine the regime. In Phase 3, if the Taliban's policy still did not change, the deputies agreed that the United States would try covert action to topple the Taliban's leadership from within. The deputies agreed to revise the al-Qaeda presidential directive, then being finalized for presidential approval, in order to add this strategy to it. Armitage explained to us that after months of continuing the previous administration's policy, he and Powell were bringing the State Department to a policy of overthrowing the Taliban. From his point of view, once the United States made the commitment to arm the Northern Alliance, even covertly, it was taking action to initiate regime change, and it should give those opponents the strength to achieve complete victory. Pakistan The Bush administration immediately encountered the dilemmas that arose from the varied objectives the United States was trying to accomplish in its relationship with Pakistan. In February 2001, President Bush wrote General Musharraf on a number of matters. He emphasized that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were, quote, a direct threat to the United States and its interests that must be addressed, end quote. He urged Musharraf to use his influence with the Taliban on bin Laden and al-Qaeda. Powell and Armitage reviewed the possibility of acquiring more carrots to dangle in front of Pakistan. Given the generally negative view of Pakistan on Capitol Hill, the idea of lifting sanctions may have seemed far-fetched, but perhaps no more so than the idea of persuading Musharraf to antagonize the Islamists in his own government and nation. On June 18, Rice met with the visiting Pakistani foreign minister, Abdul Sattar. She, quote, really let him have it, end quote, about al-Qaeda, she told us. Other evidence corroborates her account. But, as she was upbraiding Sattar, Rice recalled thinking that the Pakistani diplomat seemed to have heard it all before. Sattar urged senior U.S. policymakers to engage the Taliban, arguing that such a course would take time but would produce results. In late June, the deputies agreed to review U.S. objectives. Clark urged Hatley to split off all other issues in U.S.-Pakistani relations and just focus on demanding that Pakistan move vigorously against terrorism, to push the Pakistanis to do before an al-Qaeda attack what Washington would demand that they do after. He had made similar requests in the Clinton administration. He had no more success with Rice than he had with Berger. On August 4, President Bush wrote President Musharraf to request his support in dealing with terrorism and to urge Pakistan to engage actively against al-Qaeda. The new administration was again registering its concerns, just as its predecessor had, but it was still searching for new incentives to open up diplomatic possibilities. For its part, Pakistan had done little. Assistant Secretary of State Christina Rocca described the administration's plan to break this logjam as a move from half-engagement to enhanced engagement. The administration was not ready to confront Islamabad and threaten to rupture relations. Deputy Secretary Armitage told us that before 9-11, the envisioned new approach to Pakistan had not yet been attempted. Saudi Arabia The Bush administration did not develop new diplomatic initiatives on al-Qaeda with the Saudi government before 9-11. Vice President Cheney called Crown Prince Abdullah on July 5, 2001 to seek Saudi help in preventing threatened attacks on American facilities in the kingdom. Secretary of State Powell met with the Crown Prince twice before 9-11. They discussed topics like Iraq, not al-Qaeda. U.S.-Saudi relations in the summer of 2001 were marked by sometimes heated disagreements about ongoing Israeli-Palestinian violence, not about bin Laden. Military plans The confirmation of the Pentagon's new leadership was a lengthy process. Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz was confirmed in March 2001 and Under-Secretary of Defense for Policy. Douglas Fight in July. 
though the new officials were briefed about terrorism and some of the earlier planning, including that for Operation Infinite Resolve, they were focused, as Secretary Rumsfeld told us, on creating a 21st century military. At the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Shelton did not recall much interest by the new administration in military options against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. He could not recall any specific guidance on the topic from the Secretary. Brian Sheridan, the outgoing Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, SOLIC, the key counterterrorism policy office in the Pentagon, never briefed Rumsfeld. He departed on January 20th. He had not been replaced by 9-11. Rumsfeld noted to us his own interest in terrorism, which came up often in his regular meetings with Tenet. He thought that the Defense Department, before 9-11, was not organized adequately or prepared to deal with new threats like terrorism. But his time was consumed with getting new officials in place and working on the foundation documents of a new defense policy, the Quadrennial Defense Review, the Defense Planning Guidance, and the existing Contingency Plans. He did not recall any particular counter-terrorism issue that engaged his attention before 9-11, other than the development of the Predator unmanned aircraft system. The commander of Central Command, General Franks, told us that he did not regard the existing plans as serious. To him, a real military plan to address Al-Qaeda would need to go all the way, following through the details of a full campaign, including the political-military issues of where operations would be based, and securing the rights to fly over neighboring countries. The draft presidential directive circulated in June 2001 began its discussion of the military by reiterating the Defense Department's lead role in protecting its forces abroad. The draft included a section directing Secretary Rumsfeld to develop contingency plans to attack both al-Qaeda and Taliban targets in Afghanistan. The new section did not specifically order planning for the use of ground troops or clarify how this guidance differed from the existing infinite resolve plans. Footnote. The annex said that Pentagon planning was also to include options to eliminate weapons of mass destruction that the Al-Qaeda network might acquire or make. End footnote. Hadley told us that by circulating this section, a draft annex B to the directive the White House was putting the Pentagon on notice that it would need to produce new military plans to address this problem. The military didn't particularly want this mission, Rice told us. With this directive still awaiting President Bush's signature, Secretary Rumsfeld did not order his subordinates to begin preparing any new military plans against either al-Qaeda or the Taliban before 9-11. President Bush told us that before 9-11 he had not seen good options for special military operations against bin Laden. Suitable bases in neighboring countries were not available, and, even if the U.S. forces were sent in, it was not clear where they would go to find bin Laden. President Bush told us that before 9-11 there was an appetite in the government for killing bin Laden, not for war. Looking back in 2004, he equated the presidential directive with a readiness to invade Afghanistan. The problem, he said, would have been how to do that if there had not been another attack on America. To many people, he said, it would have seemed like an ultimate act of unilateralism. But he said that he was prepared to take that on. Domestic Change and Continuity During the transition, Bush had chosen John Ashcroft, a former senator from Missouri, as his attorney general. On his arrival at the Justice Department, Ashcroft told us, he faced a number of problems spotlighting the need for reform at the FBI. In February, Clark briefed Attorney General Ashcroft on his directorate's issues. He reported that at the time the Attorney General acknowledged a steep learning curve and asked about the progress of the coal investigation. Neither Ashcroft nor his predecessors received the President's daily brief. His office did receive the daily intelligence report for senior officials that, during the spring and summer of 2001, was carrying much of the same threat information. The FBI was struggling to build up its institutional capabilities to do more against terrorism, relying on a strategy called Max Cap 5 that had been unveiled in the summer of 2000. The FBI's Assistant Director for Counterterrorism, Dale Watson, told us that he felt the new Justice Department leadership was not supportive of the strategy. 
Watson had the sense that the Justice Department wanted the FBI to get back to the investigative basics, guns, drugs, and civil rights. But the new administration did seek an 8% increase in overall FBI funding in its initial budget proposal for fiscal year 2002, including the largest proposed percentage increase in the FBI's counterterrorism program since fiscal year 1997. The additional funds included the FBI's support of the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah, a one-time increase, enhanced security at FBI facilities, and improvements to the FBI's WMD incident response capability. In May, the Justice Department began shaping plans for building a budget for fiscal year 2003, the process that would usually culminate in an administration proposal at the beginning of 2002. On May 9, the Attorney General testified at the Congressional hearing concerning federal efforts to combat terrorism. He said that, One of the nation's most fundamental responsibilities is to protect its citizens from terrorist attacks. The budget guidance issued the next day, however, highlighted gun crimes, narcotics trafficking, and civil rights as priorities. Watson told us that he almost fell out of his chair when he saw this memo, because it did not mention counterterrorism. Longtime FBI Director Louis Free left in June 2001 after announcing the indictment in the Cobar Towers case that he had worked so long to obtain. Thomas Picard was the acting director during the summer. Free's successor, Robert Mueller, took office just before 9-11. The Justice Department prepared a draft fiscal year 2003 budget that maintained but did not increase the funding level for counterterrorism in its pending fiscal year 2002 proposal. Picard appealed for more counterterrorism enhancements, an appeal the Attorney General denied on September 10. Footnote. Picard told us that he approached Ashcroft and asked him to reconsider DOJ's denial of the FBI's original counterterrorism budget request in light of the continuing threat. It was not uncommon for FBI budget requests to be reduced by the Attorney General or by OMB before being submitted to Congress. This had occurred during the previous administration. End footnote. Ashcroft had also inherited an ongoing debate on whether and how to modify the 1995 procedures governing intelligence sharing between the FBI and the Justice Department's criminal division. But in August 2001, Ashcroft's deputy, Larry Thompson, issued a memorandum reaffirming the 1995 procedures with the clarification that evidence of any federal felony was to be immediately reported by the FBI to the criminal division. The 1995 procedures remained in effect until after 9-11. Footnote. In Chapter 3, we discuss how this problem arose. By 2001, it had become worse. During 2000, the FBI had erred in preparing some of its applications for FISA surveillance, misstating how much information had been shared with criminal prosecutors and the nature of the walls between the intelligence and law enforcement functions within the FBI. In March 2001, Judge Royce Lamberth, chief judge of the FISA court, chastised the FBI sending a letter to Ashcroft announcing he was banning an offending supervisory agent from appearing before the court. Judge Lambert also met personally with Ashcroft and his acting deputy, Robert Mueller, to complain about the performance of the FBI and the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, OIPR. In July 2001, the General Accounting Office criticized the way the 1995 procedures were being applied and criticized OIPR and FBI for not complying with the information-sharing requirements of the 1995 procedures. This was the third report in as many years by a government agency indicating that the procedures were not working as planned. In October 2000, December 2000, and March 2001, proposals for reform to the 1995 procedures were put forth by senior DOJ officials. None resulted in reform. One impediment was that the respective DOJ components could not agree on all the proposed reforms. A second impediment was a concern that such reforms would require a challenge to the FISA Court's position on the matter. This was considered risky because the FISA Court of Review had never convened and one of the judges had previously voiced skepticism regarding the constitutionality of the FISA statute. Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson did ask the Court to accept the modifications described in the text 
which were distributed as part of his August 2001 memorandum reaffirming the 1995 procedures. End footnote. Covert Action and the Predator In March 2001, Rice asked the CIA to prepare a new series of authorities for covert action in Afghanistan. Rice's recollection was that the idea had come from Clark and the NSC Senior Director for Intelligence, Mary McCarthy, and had been linked to the proposal for aid to the Northern Alliance and the Uzbeks. Rice described the draft document as providing for Consolidation Plus, superseding the various Clinton administration documents. In fact, the CIA drafted two documents. One was a finding that did concern aid to opponents of the Taliban regime, the other was a draft memorandum of notification which included more open-ended language authorizing possible lethal action in a variety of situations. Tenet delivered both to Hatley on March 28. The CIA's notes for Tenet advised him that, quote, in response to the NSC request for drafts that will help the policymakers review their options, each of the documents has been crafted to provide the agency with the broadest possible discretion permissible under the law. End quote. At the meeting, Tenet argued for deciding on a policy before deciding on the legal authorities to implement it. Hadley accepted this argument, and the draft MON was put on hold. Footnote. This tasking may have occurred before Reich's March 15, 2001 meeting with Tenet. Attorney General John Ashcroft told us he told Rice on March 7, 2001, that his lawyers had determined that the existing legal authorities for covert action against bin Laden were unclear and insufficient, and that he suggested new, explicit kill authorities be developed. As the policy review moved forward, the planned covert action program for Afghanistan was included in the draft presidential directive as part of an Annex A on intelligence activities to eliminate the al-Qaeda threat. The main debate during the summer of 2001 concentrated on the one new mechanism for a lethal attack on bin Laden, an armed version of the Predator drone. In the first months of the new administration, questions concerning the Predator became more and more a central focus of dispute. Clark favored resuming Predator flights over Afghanistan as soon as weather permitted, hoping that they still might provide the elusive, actionable intelligence to target bin Laden with cruise missiles. Learning that the Air Force was thinking of equipping Predators with warheads, Clark became even more enthusiastic about redeployment. The CTC chief Kofa Black argued against deploying the Predator for reconnaissance purposes. He recalled that the Taliban had spotted a Predator in the fall of 2000 and scrambled their MiG fighters. Black wanted to wait until the armed version was ready. Quote, I do not believe the possible recon value outweighs the risk of possible program termination when the stakes are raised by the Taliban parading a charred predator in front of CNN, he wrote. Military officers in the Joint Staff shared his concern. Footnote. The mission commander for the predator flights, Air Force Major Mark A. Kuta, had registered his opposition to redeploying the aircraft back in December 2000. Quote, Given the cost-benefit ratio from these continued missions, it seems senseless. End quote. End footnote. There is some dispute as to whether or not the Deputies Committee endorsed resuming reconnaissance flights at its April 30, 2001 meeting. In any event, Rice and Hatley ultimately went along with the CIA in the Pentagon, holding off on reconnaissance flights until the armed predator was ready. Footnote. See NSC Memo, Summary of Conclusions of Deputies Committee Meeting, April 30, 2001. This document noted the consensus in favor of reconnaissance missions commencing in July, but DDCI McLaughlin told us that he and Black believed that no such decision had been made at the meeting. Hadley told us he believed that a decision had been made at the meeting to fly such missions. End footnote. The CIA's senior management saw problems with the armed predator as well, problems that Clark and even Black and Allen were inclined to minimize. One, which also applied to reconnaissance flights, was money. A predator cost about three million U.S. dollars. If the CIA flew predators for its own reconnaissance or covert action purposes, it might be able to borrow them from the Air Force, but it was not clear that the Air Force would bear the cost if a vehicle went down. Deputy Secretary of Defense Wolfowitz 
took the position that the CIA should have to pay for it. The CIA disagreed. Footnote. Allen described the quibbling over financing the Predator program as ridiculous. End footnote. Second, Tennant in particular questioned whether he, as Director of Central Intelligence, should operate an armed Predator. This was new ground, he told us. Tennant ticked off key questions. What is the chain of command? Who takes the shot? Are America's leaders comfortable with the CIA doing this, going outside of normal military command and control? Charlie Allen told us that when these questions were discussed at the CIA, he and the agency's executive director, A.B. Buzzy Krongard, had said that either one of them would be happy to pull the trigger. But Tennant was appalled, telling them that they had no authority to do it, nor did he. Third, the Hellfire warhead carried by the Predator needed work. It had been built to hit tanks, not people. It needed to be designed to explode in a different way, and even then had to be targeted with extreme precision. In the configuration planned by the Air Force through mid-2001, the Predator's missile would not be able to hit a moving vehicle. White House officials had seen the Predator video of the men in white. On July 11, Hadley tried to hurry along preparation of the armed system. He directed McLaughlin, Wolfowitz and Joint Chiefs Vice Chairman Richard Myers to deploy predators capable of being armed no later than September 1st. He also directed that they have cost-sharing arrangements in place by August 1st. Rice told us that this attempt by Hadley to dictate a solution had failed and that she eventually had to intervene herself. On August 1st, the Deputies Committee met again to discuss the armed predator. They concluded that it was legal for the CIA to kill bin Laden or one of his deputies with a predator. Such strikes would be acts of self-defense that would not violate the ban on assassinations in Executive Order 12333. The big issues, who would pay for what, who would authorize strikes, and who would pull the trigger, were left for the principals to settle. The Defense Department representatives did not take positions on these issues. The CIA's McLaughlin had also been reticent. When Hadley circulated a memorandum attempting to prod the deputies to reach agreement, McLaughlin sent it back with a handwritten comment on the cost-sharing. Quote, We question whether it is advisable to make such an investment before the decision is taken on flying an armed predator. End quote. For Clark, this came close to being a final straw. He angrily asked Rice to call Tenet. Either Al-Qaeda is a threat worth acting against, or it is not, Clark wrote. CIA leadership has to decide which it is, and seize these bipolar mood swings. These debates, though, had little impact in advancing or delaying efforts to make the Predator ready for combat. Those were in the hands of military officers and engineers. General John Jumper had commanded U.S. Air Forces in Europe and seen Predators used for reconnaissance in the Balkans. He started the program to develop an armed version and, after returning in 2000 to head the Air Combat Command, took direct charge of it. There were numerous technical problems, especially with the Hellfire missiles. The Air Force tests conducted during the spring were inadequate, so missile testing needed to continue and modifications needed to be made during the summer. Even then, Jumper told us, problems with the equipment persisted. Nevertheless, the Air Force was moving at an extraordinary pace. In the modern era since the 1980s, Jumper said to us, I would be shocked if you found anything that went faster than this. September 2001 The Principal's Committee had its first meeting on Al-Qaeda on September 4. On the day of the meeting, Clark sent Rice an impassioned personal note. He criticized U.S. counterterrorism efforts past and present. The real question before the principals, he wrote, was, Are we serious about dealing with the Al-Qaeda threat? Is Al-Qaeda a big deal? Decision-makers should imagine themselves on a future day when the CSG has not succeeded in stopping Al-Qaeda attacks and hundreds of Americans lay dead in several countries, including the U.S., Clark wrote. What would those decision-makers wish that they had done earlier? That future day could happen at any time. Clark then turned to the coal. The fact that the USS coal was attacked during the last administration does not absolve us of responding for the attack, he wrote. 
many in al-qaeda and the taliban may have drawn the wrong lesson from the coal that they can kill americans without there being a u.s response without there being a price one might have thought that with a two hundred and fifty million dollar hole in a destroyer and seventeen dead sailors the pentagon might have wanted to respond instead they have often talked about the fact that there is nothing worth hitting in afghanistan and said the cruise missiles cost more than the jungle gyms and mud huts at terrorist camps clark could not understand why we continue to allow the existence of large-scale al-qaeda bases where we know people are being trained to kill americans turning to the cia clark warned that its bureaucracy which was masterful at passive aggressive behavior would resist funding the new national security presidential directive leaving it a hollow shell of words without deeds the cia would insist its other priorities were more important invoking president bush's own language clark wrote you are left with a modest effort to swat flies to try to prevent specific al-qaeda attacks by using intelligence to detect them and friendly governments police and intelligence officers to stop them you are left waiting for the big attack with lots of casualties after which some major u s retaliation will be in order rice told us she took clark's memo as a warning not to get dragged down by bureaucratic inertia while his arguments have force we also take clark's jeremiah as something more after nine years on the nsc staff and more than three years as the president's national coordinator he had often failed to persuade these agencies to adopt his views or to persuade his superiors to set an agenda of the sort he wanted or that the whole government could support meanwhile another counter-terrorism veteran kofa black was preparing his boss for the principals meeting he advised tenet that the draft presidential directive envisioned an ambitious covert action program but that the authorities for it had not yet been approved and the funding still had not been found if the cia was reluctant to use the predator black did not mention it he wanted a timely decision from the principals adding that the window for missions within two thousand and one was a short one the principals would have to decide whether rice tenet rumsfeld or someone else would give the order to fire at the september fourth meeting the principals approved the draft presidential directive with little discussion rice told us that she had at some point told president bush that she and his other advisers thought it would take three years or so for their al-qaeda strategy to work they then discussed the armed predator hadley portrayed the predator as a useful tool although perhaps not for immediate use rice who had been advised by her staff that the armed predator was not ready for deployment commented about the potential for using the armed predator in the spring of two thousand and two the state department supported the armed predator although secretary powell was not convinced that bin laden was as easy to target as had been suggested treasury secretary paul o'neill was skittish cautioning about the implications of trying to kill an individual the defense department favored strong action deputy secretary wolfowitz questioned the united states ability to deliver bin laden and bring him to justice he favored going after bin laden as part of a larger air strike similar to what had been done in the 1986 U.S. strike against Libya. General Myers emphasized the predator's value for surveillance, perhaps enabling broader air strikes that would go beyond bin Laden to attack al-Qaeda's training infrastructure. The principals also discussed which agency, CIA or defense, should have the authority to fire a missile from the armed predator. At the end, Rice summarized the meeting's conclusions. The armed predator capability was needed but not ready. The predator would be available for the military to consider along with its other options. The CIA should consider flying reconnaissance-only missions. The principals, including the previously reluctant tenet, thought that such reconnaissance flights were a good idea, combined with other efforts to get actionable intelligence. Tenet deferred an answer on the additional reconnaissance flights, conferred with his staff after the meeting and then directed the cia to press ahead with them a few days later a final version of the draft presidential directive was circulated incorporating two minor changes made by the principals on september ninth dramatic news arrived from afghanistan the leader of the northern alliance ahmed shah massoud 
had granted an interview in his bungalow near the Tajikistan border with two men whom the Northern Alliance leader had been told were Arab journalists. The supposed reporter and cameraman, actually Al-Qaeda assassins, then set off a bomb, riddling Massoud's chest with shrapnel. He died minutes later. On September 10th, Hadley gathered the deputies to finalize their three-phase, multi-year plan to pressure and perhaps ultimately topple the Taliban leadership. That same day, Hadley instructed DCI Tenet to have the CIA prepare new draft legal authorities for the broad covert action program envisioned by the draft presidential directive. Hadley also directed Tenet to prepare a separate section authorizing a broad range of other covert activities, including authority to capture or to use lethal force against al-Qaeda command and control elements. This section would supersede the Clinton-era documents. Hadley wanted the authorities to be flexible and broad enough to cover any additional UBL-related covert actions contemplated. Funding still needed to be located. The military component remained unclear. Pakistan remained uncooperative. The domestic policy institutions were largely uninvolved. But the pieces were coming together for an integrated policy dealing with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban and Pakistan. End of chapter 6.5《ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッタリ・ハッ In Chapter 5, we described the Southeast Asia travels of Nawaf al Hazmi, Khalid al Madiar, and others in January 2000 on the first part of the plane's operation. In that chapter, we also described how Madiar was spotted in Kuala Lumpur early in January 2000, along with associates who were not identified, and then was lost to sight when the group passed through Bangkok. On January 15th, Hazmi and Mirar arrived in Los Angeles. They spent about two weeks there before moving on to San Diego. Two weeks in Los Angeles. Why Hazmi and Mirar came to California, we do not know for certain. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, KSM, the organizer of the plane's operation, explains that California was a convenient point of entry from Asia and had the added benefit of being far away from the intended target area. Hazmi and Mirar were ill prepared for a mission in the United States. Their only qualifications for this plot were their devotion to Osama bin Laden, their veteran service, and their ability to get valid U.S. visas. Neither had spent any substantial time in the West, and neither spoke much, if any, English. It would therefore be plausible that they or KSM would have tried to identify, in advance, a friendly contact for them in the United States. In detention, KSM denies that Al Qaeda had any agents in Southern California. We do not credit this denial. We believe it is unlikely that Hazmi and Mirar, neither of whom, in contrast to the Hamburg group, had any prior exposure to life in the West, would have come to the United States without arranging to receive assistance from one or more individuals informed in advance of their arrival. KSM says that though he told others involved in the conspiracy to stay away from mosques, And to avoid establishing personal contacts, he made an exception in this case and instructed Hazmi and Mirar to pose as newly arrived Saudi students and seek assistance at local mosques. He counted on their breaking off any such relationships once they moved to the East Coast. Our inability to ascertain the activities of Hazmi and Mirar during their first two weeks in the United States may reflect Al Qaeda tradecraft designed to protect the identity of anyone who may have assisted them during that period. Hazmi and Mirar were directed to enroll in English language classes upon arriving in Southern California so that they could begin pilot training as soon as possible. KSM claims to have steered the two to San Diego on the basis of his own research, which supposedly included thumbing through a San Diego phone book acquired at a Karachi flea market. Contradicting himself, 
He also says that, as instructed, they attempted to enroll in three language schools in Los Angeles. After the pair cleared immigration and customs at Los Angeles International Airport, we do not know where they went. They appear to have obtained assistance from the Muslim community, specifically the community surrounding the King Fahd Mosque in Culver City, one of the most prominent mosques in Southern California. It is fairly certain that Hazmi and Madar spent time at the King Fahd Mosque and made some acquaintances there. One witness interviewed by the FBI after the September 11th attacks has said he first met the hijackers at the mosque in early 2000. Furthermore, one of the people who would befriend them, a man named Madar Abdullah, recalled a trip with Hazmi and Madar to Los Angeles in June, when, on their arrival, the three went to the King Fahd Mosque. There, Hazmi and Midar greeted various individuals whom they appeared to have met previously, including a man named Kalam. In Abdullah's telling, when Kalam visited the Al-Qaeda operatives at their motel that evening, Abdullah was asked to leave the room so that Hazmi, Midar, and Kalam could meet in private. The identity of Kalam and his purpose in meeting with Hazmi and Midar remain unknown. To understand what Hazmi and Midar did in their first weeks in the United States, Evidently staying in Los Angeles, we have investigated whether anyone associated with the King Fahd Mosque assisted them. This subject has received substantial attention in the media. Some have speculated that Fahad al-Thumari, an imam at the mosque and an accredited diplomat at the Saudi Arabian consulate from 1996 until 2003, may have played a role in helping the hijackers establish themselves on their arrival in Los Angeles. This speculation is based, at least in part, on Thamari's reported leadership of an extremist faction at the mosque. A well-known figure at the King Fahd Mosque and within the Los Angeles Muslim community, Thamari was reputed to be an Islamic fundamentalist and a strict adherent to orthodox Wahhabi doctrine. Some Muslims concerned about his preaching have said he injected non-Islamic themes into his guidance-slash-prayers at the King Fahd Mosque and had followers supportive of the events of September 11, 2001. Thamari appears to have associated with a particularly radical faction within the community of local worshippers, and had a network of contacts in other cities in the United States. After 9-11, Thamari's conduct was a subject of internal debate among some Saudi officials. He apparently lost his position at the King Fahd Mosque, possibly because of his immoderate reputation. On May 6, 2003, Thamari attempted to re-enter the United States from Saudi Arabia, but was refused entry, based on a determination by the State Department that he might be connected with terrorist activity. When interviewed by both the FBI and the Commission staff, Thamari has denied preaching anti-Western sermons, much less promoting violent jihad. More to the point, he claimed not to recognize either Hazmi or Madar. Both denials are somewhat suspect. He likewise denied knowing Omar al-Bayoumi, a man from San Diego we will discuss shortly, even though witnesses and telephone records established that the two men had contact with each other. Similarly, Thamari's claim not to know Modar Abdullah is belied by Abdullah's contrary assertion. On the other hand, Thamari undoubtedly met with and provided religious counseling to countless individuals during his tenure at the King Fahd Mosque, so he might not remember two transients like Hazmi and Madar several years later. The circumstantial evidence makes Thumari a logical person to consider as a possible contact for Hazmi and Madyar. Yet, after exploring the available leads, we have not found evidence that Thumari provided assistance to the two operatives. We do not pick up their trail until February 1st, 2000, when they encountered Omar al-Bayoumi and Kaysen bin Don at a halal food restaurant on Venice Boulevard in Culver City, a few blocks away from the King Fahd Mosque. Bayoumi and Bindan have both told us that they had driven up from San Diego earlier that day so that Bayoumi could address a visa issue and collect some papers from the Saudi consulate. Bayoumi heard Hazmi and Midar speaking in what he recognized to be Gulf Arabic and struck up a conversation. Since Bindan knew only a little Arabic, he had to rely heavily on Bayoumi to translate for him. Midar and Hazmi said they were students from Saudi Arabia who had just arrived in the United States to study English. They said they were living in an apartment near the restaurant, but did not specify the address. They did not like Los Angeles and were having a hard time, especially because they did not know anyone. Bayoumi told them how pleasant San Diego was and offered to help them settle there. 
The two pairs then left the restaurant and went their separate ways. Bayoumi and Ben Don have been interviewed many times about the February 1st, 2000 lunch. For the most part, their respective accounts corroborate each other. However, Bayoumi has said that he and Ben Don attempted to visit the King Fahd Mosque after lunch but could not find it. Ben Don, on the other hand, recalls visiting the mosque twice that day for prayers, both before and after the meal. Ben Don's recollection is spotty and inconsistent. Bayoumi's version can be challenged as well, since the mosque is close to the restaurant and Bayoumi had visited it and the surrounding area on multiple occasions, including twice within six weeks of February 1st. We do not know whether the lunch encounter occurred by chance or design. We know about it because Bayoumi told law enforcement that it happened. Bayoumi, then 42 years old, was in the United States as a business student, supported by a private contractor for the Saudi Civil Aviation Authority, where Bayoumi had worked for over 20 years. The object of considerable media speculation following 9-11, he lives now in Saudi Arabia, well aware of his notoriety. Both we and the FBI have interviewed him and investigated evidence about him. Bayoumi is a devout Muslim, obliging and gregarious. He spent much of his spare time involved in religious study and helping run a mosque in El Cajon, about 15 miles from San Diego. It is certainly possible that he has dissembled about some aspects of his story, perhaps to counter suspicion. On the other hand, we have seen no credible evidence that he believed in violent extremism or knowingly aided extremist groups. Our investigators who have dealt directly with him and studied his background find him to be an unlikely candidate for clandestine involvement with Islamist extremists. The Move to San Diego By February 4th, Hazmi and Madar had come to San Diego from Los Angeles, possibly driven by Modar Abdullah. Abdullah, a Yemeni University student in his early twenties, is fluent in both Arabic and English, and was perfectly suited to assist the hijackers in pursuing their mission. After 9-11, Abdullah was interviewed many times by the FBI. He admitted knowing of Hazmi and Madar's extremist leanings and Madar's involvement with the Islamic Army of Aden, a group with ties to al-Qaeda, back in Yemen. Abdullah clearly was sympathetic to those extremist views. During a post-9-11 search of his possessions, the FBI found a notebook, belonging to someone else, with references to planes falling from the sky, mass killing, and hijacking. Further, when detained as a material witness following the 9-11 attacks, Abdullah expressed hatred for the U.S. government and stated that the U.S. brought this on themselves. When interviewed by the FBI after 9-11, Abdullah denied having advanced knowledge of attacks. In May 2004, however, we learned of reports about Abdullah bragging to fellow inmates at a California prison in September through October 2003 that he had known Hazmi and Madar were planning a terrorist attack. The stories attributed to Abdullah are not entirely consistent with each other. Specifically, according to one inmate, Abdullah claimed an unnamed individual had notified him that Hazmi and Madar would be arriving in Los Angeles with plans to carry out an attack. Abdullah allegedly told the same inmate that he had driven the two Al-Qaeda operatives from Los Angeles to San Diego, but did not say when this occurred. We have been unable to corroborate this account. Another inmate has recalled Abdullah claiming he first heard about the hijackers' terrorist plans after they arrived in San Diego, when they told him they planned to fly an airplane into a building and invited him to join them on the plane. According to this inmate, Abdullah also claimed to have found out about the 9-11 attacks three weeks in advance, a claim that appears to dovetail with evidence that Abdullah may have received a phone call from Hazmi around that time that he stopped making calls from his telephone after August 25, 2001, and that, according to his friends, he started acting strangely. Although boasts among prison inmates often tend to be unreliable, this evidence is obviously important. To date, neither we nor the FBI have been able to verify Abdullah's alleged jailhouse statements, despite investigative efforts. We thus do not know when or how Hazmi and Midar first came to San Diego, we do know that on February 4th, they went to the Islamic Center of San Diego to find Omar al-Bayoumi and take him up on his offer of help. Bayoumi obliged by not only locating an apartment, but also helping them to fill out the lease application, co-signing the lease, and, when the real estate agent refused to take cash for a deposit, helping them open a bank account, which they did with a $9,900 deposit. 
He then provided a certified check from his own account, for which the Al-Qaeda operatives reimbursed him on the spot for the deposit. Neither then nor later did Bayoumi give money to either Hazmi or Midar, who had received money from KSM. Hazmi and Midar moved in with no furniture and practically no possessions. Soon after the move, Bayoumi used their apartment for a party attended by some twenty male members of the Muslim community. At Bayoumi's request, Ben Don videotaped the gathering with Bayoumi's video camera. Hazmi and Midar did not mingle with the other guests, and reportedly spent most of the party by themselves off camera in a back room. Hazmi and Midar immediately started looking for a different place to stay. Based on their comment to Bayoumi about the first apartment being expensive, one might infer that they wanted to save money. They may also have been reconsidering the wisdom of living so close to the video camera wielding by Yumi, who Hazmi seemed to think was some sort of Saudi spy. Just over a week after moving in, Hazmi and Midar filed a 30-day notice of intention to vacate. Bayoumi apparently loaned them his cell phone to help them check out possibilities for new accommodations. Their initial effort to move turned out poorly. An acquaintance arranged with his landlord to have Midar take over his apartment. Midar put down a $650 deposit and signed a lease for the apartment effective March 1st. Several weeks later, Midar sought a refund of his deposit, claiming he no longer intended to move in because the apartment was too messy. When the landlord refused to refund the deposit, Midar became belligerent. The landlord remembers him ranting and raving as if he were psychotic. Hazmi and Midar finally found a room to rent in the home of an individual they had met at a mosque in San Diego. According to the homeowner, the future hijackers moved in on May 10, 2000. Midar moved out after only about a month. On June 9th, he left San Diego to return to Yemen. Hazmi, on the other hand, stayed at this house for the rest of his time in California until mid-December. He would then leave for Arizona with a newly arrived 9-11 hijacker pilot, Hani Hanjour. While in San Diego, Hazmi and Midar played the part of recently arrived foreign students. They continued to reach out to members of the Muslim community for help. At least initially, they found well-meaning new acquaintances at the Islamic Center of San Diego, which was only a stone's throw from the apartment where they first lived. For example, when they purchased a used car with cash, they bought it from a man who lived across the street from the Islamic Center and who let them use his address in registering the vehicle an accommodation to help a fellow Muslim brother. Similarly, in April, when their cash supply may have been dwindling, Hazmi persuaded the administrator of the Islamic Center to let him use the administrator's bank account to receive a $5,000 wire transfer from someone in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. This was KSM's nephew, Ali Abdul Aziz Ali. Hazmi and Midar visited other mosques as well, mixing comfortably as devout worshippers. During the operative's critical first weeks in San Diego, Modar Abdullah helped them. Translating between English and Arabic, he assisted them in obtaining California driver's licenses and with applying to language and flight schools. Abdullah also introduced them to his circle of friends. He shared an apartment with some of those friends near the Rabat Mosque in La Mesa, a few miles from the hijacker's residence. Abdullah has emerged as a key associate of Hazmi and Madar in San Diego. Detained after 9-11, first as a material witness, then on immigration charges, he was deported to Yemen on May 21, 2004, after the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of California declined to prosecute him on charges arising out of his alleged jailhouse admissions concerning the 9-11 operatives. The Department of Justice declined to delay his removal pending further investigation of this new information. Other friends of Abdullah also translated for Hazmi and Madar and helped them adjust to life in San Diego. Some held extremist beliefs or were well acquainted with known extremists. For example, immediately after 9-11, Osama Awadala, a Yemeni whose telephone number was found in Hazmi's Toyota at Washington Dulles International Airport, was found to possess photos, videos, and articles relating to bin Laden. Awadala also had lived in a house where copies of bin Laden's fatwas and other similar materials were distributed to the residents. Omar Bakar Bashat, a Saudi, also met Hazmi and Madar at the Rabat Mosque. 
he admitting helping Hasme to learn English and taking over the operative's first apartment in San Diego after they moved out. Bacar Bashat apparently had downloaded stridently anti-American web pages to his computer's hard drive. Another potentially significant San Diego contact for Hasmi and Madar was Anwar Alaki, an imam at the Rabat Mosque. Born in New Mexico and thus a U.S. citizen, Alaki grew up in Yemen and studied in the United States on a Yemeni government scholarship. We do not know how or when Hasmi and Madar first met Alaki. The operatives may even have met or at least talked to him the same day they first moved to San Diego. Hasmi and Madar reportedly respected Alaki as a religious figure and developed a close relationship with him. When interviewed after 9-11, Alaki said he did not recognize Hasmi's name, but did identify his picture. Although Alaki admitted meeting with Hasmi several times, he claimed not to remember any specifics of what they discussed. He described Hasmi as a soft-spoken Saudi student who used to appear at the mosque with a companion, but who did not have a large circle of friends. Alaki left San Diego in mid-2000, and by early 2001 had relocated to Virginia. As we will discuss later, Hasmi eventually showed up at Alaki's mosque in Virginia, an appearance that may not have been coincidental. We have been unable to learn enough about Alaki's relationship with Hasmi and Madar to reach a conclusion. In sum, although the evidence is thin as to specific motivations, our overall impression is that soon after arriving in California, Hasmi and Madar sought out and found a group of young and ideologically like-minded Muslims with roots in Yemen and Saudi Arabia, individuals mainly associated with Madar Abdullah and the Rabat Mosque. The Al-Qaeda operatives lived openly in San Diego under their true names, listing Hasmi in the telephone directory. They managed to avoid attracting much attention. Flight training fails. Midar bails out. Hasmi and Midar came to the United States to learn English, take flying lessons, and become pilots as quickly as possible. They turned out, however, to have no aptitude for English. Even with help and tutoring from Madar Abdullah and other bilingual friends, Hasmi and Midar's efforts to learn proved futile. This lack of language skills, in turn, became an insurmountable barrier to learning how to fly. A pilot they consulted at one school, the Sorby Flying Club in San Diego, spoke Arabic. He explained to them that their flight instruction would begin with small planes. Hasmi and Madar emphasized their interest in learning to fly jets, Boeing aircraft in particular, and asked where they might enroll to train on jets right away. Convinced that the two were either joking or dreaming, the pilot responded that no such school existed. Other instructors who worked with Hasmi and Madar remember them as poor students who focused on learning to control the aircraft in flight, but took no interest in takeoffs or landings. By the end of May 2000, Hasmi and Madar had given up on learning how to fly. Madar's mind seems to have been with his family back in Yemen, as evidenced by calls he made from the apartment telephone. When news of the birth of his first child arrived, he could stand life in California no longer. In late May and early June of 2000, he closed his bank account, transferred the car registration to Hasmi, and arranged his return to Yemen. According to KSM, Madar was bored in San Diego and foresaw no problem in coming back to the United States since he had not overstayed his visa. Hasmi and Modar Abdullah accompanied him to Los Angeles on June 9th. After visiting the King Fahd Mosque one last time with his friends, Madar left the country the following day. KSM kept in fairly close touch with his operatives, using a variety of methods. When bin Laden called KSM back from Pakistan to Afghanistan in the spring of 2000, KSM asked Khalad, whom we introduced in Chapter 5, to maintain email contact with Hasmi in the United States. Madar's decision to strand Hasmi in San Diego enraged KSM, who had not authorized the departure and feared it would compromise the plan. KSM attempted to drop Madar from the plane's operation, and would have done so, he says, had he not been overruled by bin Laden. Following Madar's departure, Hasmi grew lonely and worried that he would have trouble managing by himself. He prayed with his housemate each morning at 5 a.m. and attended services at the Islamic Center. He borrowed his housemate's computer for Internet access, following news coverage of fighting in Chechnya and Bosnia. With his housemate's help, Hasmi also used the Internet to search for a wife. 
after obtaining KSM's approval to marry. This search did not succeed. Although he developed a close relationship with his housemate, Hasby preferred not to use the house telephone, continuing the practice he and Madar had adopted of going outside to make phone calls. After Madar left, other students moved into the house. One of these, Yazid al-Salmi, stands out. In July 2000, Salmi purchased $4,000 in traveler's checks at a bank in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. On September 5th, Hasmi deposited $1,900 of the traveler's checks into his bank account after withdrawing the same amount in cash. It is possible that Hasmi was simply cashing the traveler's checks for a friend. We do not know. Salmi claims not to remember the transaction. After 9-11, Salmi reportedly confided to Modar Abdullah that he had previously known terrorist pilot Hani Hanjour. After living in the same house with Hasmi for about a month, Salmi moved to the La Mesa apartment shared by Abdullah and others. By the fall of 2000, Hasmi no longer even pretended to study English or take flying lessons. Aware that his co-conspirators in Afghanistan and Pakistan would be sending him a new colleague shortly, he bided his time and worked for a few weeks at a gas station in La Mesa, where some of his friends, including Abdullah, were employed. On one occasion, Hasmi told a fellow employee that he was planning to find a better job, and let slip a prediction that he would become famous. On December 8, 2000, Hani Hanjour arrived in San Diego, having traveled from Dubai via Paris and Cincinnati. Hasmi likely picked up Hanjour at the airport. We do not know where Hanjour stayed. A few days later, both men left San Diego. Before departing, they visited the gas station in La Mesa, where Hasmi reportedly introduced Hanjour as a long-time friend from Saudi Arabia. Hasmi told his housemate that he and his friend, Hani, were headed for San Jose to take flying lessons, and told his friends that he would stay in touch. Hasmi promised to return to San Diego soon, and he and Hanjur drove off. Hasmi did not sever all contact with his friends in San Diego. According to Abdullah, after Hasmi left San Diego in December 2000, he telephoned Abdullah twice. In December 2000 or January 2001, Hasmi said he was in San Francisco and would be attending flight school there. About two weeks later, he said he was attending flight school in Arizona. Some evidence, which we will discuss later, indicates that Hasmi contacted Abdullah again in August 2001. In addition, during the month following Hasmi's departure from San Diego, he emailed his housemate three times, including a January 2001 email that Hasmi signed, Samur an apparent attempt to conceal his identity that struck the housemaid as strange at the time. Hasby also telephoned his housemate that he and his friend had decided to take flight lessons in Arizona and that Midar was now back in Yemen. That was their last contact. When the housemate emailed Hasmi in February and March of 2001 to find out how he was faring, Hasmi did not reply. The housemate who rented the room to Hasmi and Madar during 2000 is an apparently law-abiding citizen with long-standing, friendly contacts among local police and FBI personnel. He did not see anything unusual enough in the behavior of Hasmi or Madar to prompt him to report to his law enforcement contacts, nor did those contacts ask him for information about his tenants slash housemates. End of Chapter 7.1 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 7.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 7.2. The 9-11 Pilots in the United States. The Hamburg pilots arrive in the United States. In the early summer of 2000, the Hamburg group arrived in the United States to begin flight training. Marwan al Shahi came on May 29th, arriving in Newark on a flight from Brussels. He went to New York City and waited there for Mohammed Atta to join him. On June 2nd, Atta traveled to the Czech Republic by bus from Germany and then flew from Prague to Newark the next day. 
According to Ramsey ben Alshib, Atta did not meet with anyone in Prague. He simply believed it would contribute to operational security to fly out of Prague rather than Hamburg, the departure point for much of his previous international travel. Atta and Shahi had not settled on where they would obtain their flight training. In contrast, Zayad Jara had already arranged to attend the Florida Flight Training Center, FFTC, in Venice, Florida. Jara arrived in Newark on June 27th and then flew to Venice. He immediately began the private pilot program at FFTC, intending to get a multi-engine license. Jara moved in with some of the flight instructors affiliated with his school and bought a car. While Jara quickly settled into training in Florida, Atta and Shahi kept searching for a flight school. After visiting the Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma, where Zacharias Musawi would enroll several months later, and where another Al-Qaeda operative, Ihab Ali, had taken lessons in the mid-1990s, Atta started flight instruction at Huffman Aviation in Venice, Florida, and both Atta and Shahi subsequently enrolled in the Accelerated Pilot Program at that school. By the end of July, both of them took solo flights, and by mid-August, they passed the private pilot airman test. They trained through the summer at Huffman, while Girard continued his training at FFTC. The Hamburg operatives paid for their flight training primarily with funds wired from Dubai by KSM's nephew, Ali Abdul Aziz Ali. Between June 29th and September 17, 2000, Ali sent Shahi and Atta a total of $114,500 in five transfers, ranging from $5,000 to $70,000. Ali relied on the unremarkable nature of his transactions, which were essentially invisible amid the billions of dollars flowing daily across the globe. Ali was not required to provide identification in sending this money, and the aliases he used were not questioned. In mid-September, Atta and Shahi applied to change their immigration status from tourist to student, stating their intention to study at Huffman until September 1, 2001. In late September, they decided to enroll at Jones Aviation in Sarasota, Florida, about 20 miles north of Venice. According to the instructor at Jones, the two were aggressive, rude, and sometimes even fought with him to take over the controls during their training flights. In early October, they took the Stage 1 exam for instruments rating at Jones Aviation and failed. Very upset, they said they were in a hurry because jobs awaited them at home. Ada and Shahi then returned to Huffman. In the meantime, Jara obtained a single-engine private pilot certificate in early August. Having reached that milestone, he departed on the first of five foreign trips he would take after first entering the United States. In October, he flew back to Germany to visit his girlfriend, Eisel Singwin. The two traveled to Paris before Girard returned to Florida on October 29th. His relationship with her remained close throughout his time in the United States. In addition to his trips, Girard made hundreds of phone calls to her and communicated frequently by email. Girard was supposed to be joined at FFTC by Ramzi ben Alshib, who even sent the school a deposit. But Ben El Sheeb could not obtain a U.S. visa. His first applications in May and June 2000 were denied because he lacked established ties in Germany, ensuring his return from a trip to the United States. In September, he went home to Yemen to apply for a visa from there, but was denied on grounds that he also lacked sufficient ties to Yemen. In October, he tried one last time in Berlin, applying for a student visa to attend Aviation Language School, but the prior denials were noted, and this application was denied as well as incomplete. Unable to participate directly in the operation, Ben Al Sheeb instead took on the role of coordinating between KSM and the operatives in the United States. Apart from sending a total of about $10,000 in wire transfers to Atta and Shahi during the summer of 2000, one of Ben Al Sheeb's first tasks in his new role as plot coordinator was to assist another possible pilot. Zacharias Musawi. In the fall of 2000, KSM had sent Musawi to Malaysia for flight training, but Musawi did not find a school he liked. He worked instead on other terrorist schemes, such as buying four tons of ammonium nitrate for bombs to be planted on cargo planes flying to the United States. When KSM found out, 
he recalled Musawi back to Pakistan and directed him to go to the United States for flight training. In early October, Musawi went to London. When Ben al Sheib visited London in December, he stayed at the same 16-room dormitory where Musawi was still residing. From London, Musawi sent inquiries to the Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma. Confronting training or travel problems with Hazmi, Madar, Ben al Sheib, and Musawi, Al Qaeda was looking for another possible pilot candidate. A new recruit with just the right background conveniently presented himself in Afghanistan. The fourth pilot, Hani Hanjour. Hani Hanjour from Taif, Saudi Arabia, first came to the United States in 1991 to study at the Center for English as a Second Language at the University of Arizona. He seems to have been a rigorously observant Muslim. According to his older brother, Hani Hanjour went to Afghanistan for the first time in the late 1980s as a teenager to participate in the Jihad and, because the Soviets had already withdrawn, worked for a relief agency there. In 1996, Hanjour returned to the United States to pursue flight training after being rejected by a Saudi flight school. He checked out flight schools in Florida, California, and Arizona, and he briefly started at a couple of them before returning to Saudi Arabia. In 1997, he returned to Florida, and then along with two friends, went back to Arizona and began his flight training there in earnest. After about three months, Hanjour was able to obtain his private pilot's license. Several more months of training yielded him a commercial pilot certificate, issued by the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, in April 1999. He then returned to Saudi Arabia. Hanjour reportedly applied to the Civil Aviation School in Jeddah after returning home, but was rejected. He stayed home for a while and then told his family he was going to the United Arab Emirates to work for an airline. Where Hanjour actually traveled during this time period is unknown. It is possible he went to the training camps in Afghanistan. The fact that Hanjour spent so much time in Arizona may be significant. A number of important al-Qaeda figures attended the University of Arizona in Tucson or lived in Tucson in the 1980s and early 1990s. Some of Hanjour's known Arizona associates from the time of his flight training in the late 1990s have also raised suspicion. FBI investigators have speculated that al-Qaeda may have directed other extremist Muslims in the Phoenix area to enroll in aviation training. It is clear that when Hanjour lived in Arizona in the 1990s, he associated with several individuals holding extremist beliefs who have been the subject of counterterrorism investigations. Some of them trained with Hanjour to be pilots. Others had apparent connections to al-Qaeda, including training in Afghanistan. By the spring of 2000, Hanjour was back in Afghanistan. According to KSM, Hanjour was sent to him in Karachi for inclusion in the plot after Hanjour was identified in al-Qaeda's al farouk camp as a trained pilot on the basis of background information he had provided. Hanjour had been at a camp in Afghanistan for a few weeks when bin Laden or Atef apparently realized that he was a trained pilot. He was told to report to KSM, who then trained Hanjour for a few days in the use of code words. On June 20th, Hanjour returned home to Saudi Arabia. He obtained a U.S. student visa on September 25th and told his family he was returning to his job in the UAE. Hanjour did go to the UAE, but to meet facilitator Ali Abdul Aziz Ali. Ali opened a bank account in Dubai for Hanjour and providing the initial funds for his trip. On December 8th, Hanjour traveled to San Diego. His supposed destination was in English as a second language program in Oakland, California, which he had scheduled before leaving Saudi Arabia, but never attended. Instead, as mentioned earlier, he joined Nawaf al-Hazmi in San Diego. Hazmi and Hanjour left San Diego almost immediately and drove to Arizona. Settling in Mesa, Hanjour began refresher training at his old school, Arizona Aviation. He wanted to train on multi-engine planes, but had difficulties because his English was not good enough. The instructor advised him to discontinue, but Hanjour said he could not go home without completing the training. In early 2001, he started training on a Boeing 737 simulator at Pan Am International Flight Academy in Mesa. An instructor there found his work well below standard and discouraged him from continuing. 
Again, Hanjour persevered. He completed the initial training by the end of March 2001. At that point, Hanjour and Hazmi vacated their apartment and started driving east, anticipating the arrival of the muscle hijackers, the operatives who would storm the cockpits and control the passengers. By as early as April 4th, Hanjour and Hazmi had arrived in Falls Church, Virginia. The three pilots in Florida continued with their training. Atta and Shahi finished up at Huffman and earned their instrument certificates from the FAA in November. In mid-December 2000, they passed their commercial pilot tests and received their licenses. They then began training to fly large jets on a flight simulator. At about the same time, Girard began simulator training, also in Florida, but at a different center. By the end of 2000, less than six months after their arrival, the three pilots on the East Coast were simulating flights on large jets. Travels in Early 2001 Girard, Atta, and Shahi, having progressed in their training, all took foreign trips during the holiday period of 2000 to 2001. Girard flew through Germany to get home to Beirut. A few weeks later, he returned to Florida via Germany with Eisel Singwin. She stayed with him in Florida for ten days, even accompanying him to a flight training session. We do not know whether Atta or Al-Qaeda leaders knew about Jarrah's trips and Singwin's visit. The other operatives had broken off regular contact with their families. At the end of January 2001, Jarrah again flew to Beirut to visit his sick father. After staying there for several weeks, Jarrah visited Singwin in Germany for a few days before returning to the United States at the end of February. While Jarrah took his personal trips, Atta traveled to Germany in early January 2001 for a progress meeting with Ramzi Ben al Sheib. Ben al Sheib says Atta told him to report to the Al Qaeda leadership in Afghanistan that the three Hamburg pilots had completed their flight training and were awaiting orders. Atta also disclosed that a fourth pilot, Hanjur, had joined Hazmi. Upon returning to Florida, Atta wired Ben al Sheib travel money. Ben al Sheib proceeded to Afghanistan made his report, and spent the next several months there and in Pakistan. When Atta returned to Florida, Shahi left for Morocco, traveling to Casablanca in mid-January. Shahi's family, concerned about not having heard from him, reported him missing to the UAE government. The UAE embassy, in turn, contacted the Hamburg police, and a UAE representative tried to find him in Germany, visiting Moss and Shahi's last address in Hamburg. After learning that his family was looking for him, Shahi telephoned them on January 20th and said he was still living and studying in Hamburg. The UAE government then told the Hamburg police they could call off the search. Atta and Shahi both encountered some difficulty re-entering the United States on January 10th and January 18th, respectively. Because neither presented a student visa, both of them had to persuade INS inspectors that they should be admitted so that they could continue their flight training. Neither operative had any problem clearing customs. Atta's alleged trip to Prague Mohammed Atta is known to have been in Prague on two occasions. In December 1994, when he stayed one night at a transit hotel, and in June 2000, when he was en route to the United States. On the latter occasion, he arrived by bus from Germany on June 2nd, and departed for Newark the following day. The allegation that Atta met with an Iraqi intelligence officer in Prague in April 2001 originates from the reporting of a single source of the Czech intelligence service. Shortly after 9-11, the source reported having seen Atta meet with Ahmed Khalil Ibrahim Samir Alani, an Iraqi diplomat, at the Iraqi embassy in Prague on April 9, 2001, at 11 a.m. This information was passed to CIA headquarters. The U.S. legal attaché, Legat, in Prague, the representative of the FBI, met with the Czech services source. After the meeting, the assessment of Legat and the Czech officers present was that they were 70% sure the source was sincere and believed his own story of the meeting. Subsequently, the Czech intelligence service publicly stated that there was a 70% probability that the meeting between Atta and Ani had taken place. The Czech interior minister also made several statements to the press about his belief that the meeting had occurred and the story was widely reported. 
The FBI has gathered evidence indicating that Otto was in Virginia Beach on April 4th, as evidenced by a bank surveillance camera photo, and in Coral Springs, Florida on April 11th, where he and Shahi leased an apartment. On April 6th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, Atta's cellular telephone was used numerous times to call various lodging establishments in Florida from cell sites within Florida. We cannot confirm that he placed those calls, but there are no U.S. records indicating that Atta departed the country during this period. Czech officials have reviewed their flight and border records as well for any indication that Atta was in the Czech Republic in April 2001, including records of anyone crossing the border who even looked Arab. They have also reviewed pictures from the area near the Iraqi embassy and have not discovered photos of anyone who looked like Atta. No evidence has been found that Atta was in the Czech Republic in April 2001. According to the Czech government, Ani, the Iraqi officer alleged to have met with Atta, was about 70 miles away from Prague on April 8th through 9th and did not return until the afternoon of the 9th, while the source was firm that the sighting occurred at 11 a.m. When questioned about the reported April 2001 meeting, Ani, now in custody, has denied ever meeting or having any contact with Atta. Ani says that shortly after 9-11, he became concerned that press stories about the alleged meeting might hurt his career. Hoping to clear his name, Ani asked his superiors to approach the Czech government about refuting the allegation. He also denies knowing of any other Iraqi official having contact with Atta. These findings cannot absolutely rule out the possibility that Atta was in Prague on April 9, 2001. He could have used an alias to travel and a passport under that alias, but this would be an exception to his practice of using his true name while traveling, as he did in January and would in July when he took his next overseas trip. The FBI and CIA have uncovered no evidence that Atta held any fraudulent passports. KSM and Ben al Shib both denied that an Atta Ani meeting occurred. There was no reason for such a meeting, especially considering the risk it would pose to the operation. By April 2001, all four pilots had completed most of their training, and the muscle hijackers were about to begin entering the United States. The available evidence does not support the original Czech report of an Atta Ani meeting. After returning to Florida from their trips, Atta and Shahi visited Georgia, staying briefly in Norcross and Decatur, and renting a single-engine plane to fly with an instructor in Lawrenceville. By February 19th, Atta and Shahi were in Virginia. They rented a mailbox in Virginia Beach, cashed a check, and then promptly returned to Georgia, staying in Stone Mountain. We have found no explanation for these travels. In mid-March, Gerard was in Georgia as well, staying in Decatur. There is no evidence that the three pilots met, although Gerard and Atta apparently spoke on the phone. At the end of the month, Gerard left the United States again and visited Singlin in Germany for two weeks. In early April, Atta and Shahi returned to Virginia Beach and closed the mailbox they had opened in February. By the time Atta and Shahi returned to Virginia Beach from their travels in Georgia, Hazmi and Anjur had also arrived in Virginia, in Falls Church. They made their way to a large mosque there, the Dar al-Hijra Mosque, sometime in early April. As we mentioned earlier, one of the imams at this mosque was the same Anwar Alaki with whom Hazmi had spent time at the Rabat Mosque in San Diego. Alaki had moved to Virginia in January 2001. He remembers Hazmi from San Diego, but is denied having any contact with Hazmi or Hanjur in Virginia. At the Dar al-Hijra Mosque, Hazmi and Hanjur met a Jordanian named Ayad al-Rababa. Rababa says he had gone to the mosque to speak to the Imam, Alaki, about finding work. At the conclusion of services, which normally had 400 to 500 attendees, Rababa says he happened to meet Hazmi and Hanjur. They were looking for an apartment. Rababa referred them to a friend who had one to rent. Hazmi and Hanjur moved into the apartment, which was in Alexandria. Some FBI investigators doubt Rababa's story. Some agents suspect that Alaki may have tasked Rababa to help Hazmi and Hanjur. We share that suspicion, given the remarkable coincidence of Alaki's prior relationship with Hazmi. As noted above, the Commission was unable to locate an interview Alaki. Rababa has been deported to Jordan, 
having been convicted after 9-11 in a fraudulent driver's license scheme. Rababa, who had lived in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, told investigators that he had recommended Patterson, New Jersey, as a place with an Arabic-speaking community where Hasby and Hanjour might want to settle. They asked for his help in getting them an apartment in Patterson. Rababa tried without success. He says he then suggested that Hasby and Hanjour travel with him to Connecticut, where they could look for a place to live. On May 8th, Rababa went to Hasmi and Hanjur's apartment to pick them up for the trip to Connecticut. There he says he found them with new roommates, Ahmad El Gamadi and Majed Moked. These two men had been sent to America to serve as muscle hijackers and had arrived at Dulles Airport on May 2nd. Rababa drove Hanjur to Fairfield, Connecticut, followed by Hasmi, who had Moked and Gamadi in his car. After a short stay in Connecticut, where they apparently called area flight schools and real estate agents, Rababa drove the four to Patterson to have dinner and show them around. He says that they returned with him to Fairfield that night and that he never saw them again. Within a few weeks, Hanjour, Hasmi, and several other operatives moved to Patterson and rented a one-room apartment. When their landlord later paid a visit, he found six men living there. Nawaf al-Hasmi, now joined by his younger brother, Salim, Hanjour, Moked, probably Ahmad al Gamadi, and Abdul Aziz al Omari, Hazmi's old friend Khalid al Midar would soon join them. Atta and Shahi had already returned to Florida. On April 11th, they moved into an apartment in Coral Springs. Atta stayed in Florida awaiting the arrival of the first muscle hijackers. Shahi, on the other hand, bought a ticket to Cairo and flew there from Miami on April 18th. We do not know much more about Shahi's reason for traveling to Egypt in April than we know about his January trip to Morocco. Shahi did meet with Atta's father, who stated in a post-9-11 interview that Shahi just wanted to pick up Atta's international driver's license and some money. This story is not credible. Atta already had the license with him and presented it during a traffic stop on April 26, while Shahi was still abroad. Shahi spent about two weeks in Egypt, obviously more time than would have been needed just to meet with Atta's father. Shahi could have traveled elsewhere during this time, but no records indicating additional travel have been discovered. Shahi returned to Miami on May 2nd. That day, Atta and Jarrah were together, about 30 miles to the north, visiting a Department of Motor Vehicles office in Lauderdale Lakes, Florida, to get Florida driver's licenses. Back in Virginia, Hasmi and Hanjur were about to leave for Connecticut and New Jersey. As the summer approached, the lead operatives were settled in Florida and New Jersey, waiting for the rest of their contingent to join them. End of chapter 7.2 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 7.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 7.3 Assembling the Teams During the summer and early autumn of 2000, Bin Laden and senior al-Qaeda leaders in Afghanistan started selecting the muscle hijackers, the operatives who would storm the cockpits and control the passengers. Despite the phrase widely used to describe them, the so-called muscle hijackers were not at all physically imposing. Most were between 5 feet 5 inches and 5 feet 7 inches in height. Recruitment and Selection for 9-11 Twelve of the thirteen muscle hijackers excluding Nawaf al-Hazmi and Medar, came from Saudi Arabia. Satam al-Sakami, Wail al-Shari, Walid al-Shari, Abdul Aziz al-Omari, Ahmed al-Gamadi, Hamza al-Gamadi, Mahand al-Shari, Majed Moked, Salam al-Hazmi, Saeed al-Gamadi, Ahmad al-Haznawi, and Ahmad al-Nami, the remaining recruit, Fayez Bani Hamad, came from the UAE. He appears to have played a unique role among the muscle hijackers because of his work with one of the plot's financial facilitators, 
Mustafa el Hasawi. Saudi authorities interviewed the relatives of these men and have briefed us on what they found. The Muslim hijackers came from a variety of educational and societal backgrounds. All were between 20 and 28 years old. Most were unemployed with no more than a high school education and were unmarried. Four of them, Ahmed al Ghamadi, Saeed al Ghamadi, Hamza al Ghamadi, and Ahmad al Haznawi, came from a cluster of three towns in the Al Baha region, an isolated and underdeveloped area of Saudi Arabia, and shared the same tribal affiliation. None had a university degree. Their travel patterns and information from family members suggest that the four may have been in contact with each other as early as the fall of 1999. Five more, Wael al Shari, Walid al Shari, Abdul Aziz al Omari, Mahand al Shari, and Ahmed al Nami, came from Asir province a poor region in southwestern Saudi Arabia that borders Yemen. This weekly policed area is sometimes called the Wild Frontier. Wael and Walid al-Sheri were brothers. All five in this group had begun university studies. Omari had graduated with honors from high school, had attained a degree from the Imam Muhammad ibn Saad Islamic University, was married, and had a daughter. The three remaining Muslim hijackers from Saudi Arabia were Satam al Sakami, Majed Moked, and Salim al Hazmi. Sakami came from Riyadh. Moked hailed from a small town called Anakil, west of Medina. Sakami had very little education, and Moked had dropped out of university. Neither Sakami nor Moked appears to have had ties to the other or to any of the other operatives before getting involved with extremists, probably by 1999. Salim al-Hazmi, a younger brother of Nawaf, was born in Mecca. Salim's family recalled him as a quarrelsome teenager. His brother Nawaf probably recommended him for recruitment into al-Qaeda. One al-Qaeda member who knew them says that Nawaf pleaded with bin Laden to allow Salim to participate in the 9-11 operation. Detainees have offered varying reasons for the use of so many Saudi operatives. Ben al Sheib argues that Al Qaeda wanted to send a message to the government of Saudi Arabia about its relationship with the United States. Several other Al Qaeda figures, however, have stated that ethnicity generally was not a factor in the selection of operatives unless it was important for security or operational reasons. KSM, for instance, denies that Saudis were chosen for the 9 11 plot to drive a wedge between the United States and Saudi Arabia and stresses practical reasons for considering ethnic background when selecting operatives. He says that so many were Saudi because Saudis comprise the largest portion of the pool of recruits in the Al-Qaeda training camps. KSM estimates that in any given camp, 70% of the Mujahideen were Saudi, 20% were Yemeni, and 10% were from elsewhere. Although Saudi and Yemeni trainees were most often willing to volunteer for suicide operations, prior to 9-11 it was easier for Saudi operatives to get into the United States. Most of the Saudi muscle hijackers developed their ties to extremists two or three years before the attacks. Their families often did not consider these young men religious zealots. Some were perceived as devout, others as lacking in faith. For instance, although Ahmad al Ghamadi, Hamza al Ghamadi, and Saeed al Ghamadi attended prayer services regularly, and Omari often served as an imam at his mosque in Saudi Arabia, Sakami and Salim al Hazmi appeared unconcerned with religion and, contrary to Islamic law, were known to drink alcohol. Like many other Al Qaeda operatives, the Saudis who eventually became the Muslim hijackers were targeted for recruitment outside Afghanistan, probably in Saudi Arabia itself. Al Qaeda recruiters, certain clerics, and, in a few cases, family members probably all played a role in spotting potential candidates. Several of the muscle hijackers seem to have been recruited through contacts at local universities and mosques. According to the head of one of the training camps in Afghanistan, some were chosen by unnamed Saudi sheikhs who had contacts with al-Qaeda. Omari, for example, is believed to have been a student of a radical Saudi cleric named Suleiman Alawan. His mosque, which is located in al Qasim province, is known among more moderate clerics as a terrorist factory. The province is at the very heart of the strict Wahhabi movement in Saudi Arabia. Saeed al Ghamadi and Mahand al Sheri also spent time in Al Qasim, both breaking with their families. 
According to his father, Mahand al-Sheri's frequent visits to this area resulted in his failing exams at his university in Riyadh. Saeed al Gamadi transferred to a university in al qasim but he soon stopped talking to his family and dropped out of school without informing them. The majority of these Saudi recruits began to break with their families in late 1999 and early 2000. According to relatives, some recruits began to make arrangements for extended absences. Others exhibited marked changes in behavior before disappearing. Salem al-Hazmi's father recounted that Salem, who had had problems with alcohol and petty theft, stopped drinking and started attending mosque regularly three months before he disappeared. Several family members remembered that their relatives had expressed a desire to participate in jihad, particularly in Chechnya. None had mentioned going to Afghanistan. These statements might be true or cover stories. The four recruits from the al Ghamadi tribe, for example, all told their families that they were going to Chechnya. Only two, Ahmed al Ghamadi and Saeed al Ghamadi, had documentation suggesting travel to a Russian republic. Some aspiring Saudi mujahideen, attending to go to Chechnya, encountered difficulties along the way and diverted to Afghanistan. In 1999, Ibn al-Khattab, the primary commander of Arab nationals in Chechnya, reportedly had started turning away most foreign mujahideen because of their inexperience and inability to adjust to the local conditions. KSM states that several of the 9-11 muscle hijackers faced problems traveling to Chechnya and so went to Afghanistan, where they were drawn into al-Qaeda. Khalad has offered a more detailed story of how such diversions occurred. According to him, a number of Saudi mujahideen who tried to go to Chechnya in 1999 to fight the Russians were stopped at the Turkish-Georgian border. Upon arriving in Turkey, they received phone calls at guest houses in places such as Istanbul and Ankara, informing them that the route to Chechnya via Georgia had been closed. These Saudis then decided to travel to Afghanistan, where they could train and wait to make another attempt to enter Chechnya during the summer of 2000. While training at al-Qaeda camps, a dozen of them heard bin Laden's speeches, volunteered to become suicide operatives, and eventually were selected as muscle hijackers for the plane's operation. Khalad says he met a number of them at the Kandahar airport, where they were helping to provide extra security. He encouraged bin Laden to use them. Khalad claims to have been closest with Saeed al Ghamadi, whom he convinced to become a martyr, and whom he asked to recruit a friend, Ahmed al Ghamadi, to the same cause. Although Khalad claims not to recall everyone from this group who was later chosen for the 9-11 operation, he says they also included Sukami, Walid and Wail al-Sheri, Omari, Nami, Hamza al Ghamadi, Salim al-Hazmi, and Moked. According to KSM, operatives volunteered for suicide operations and for the most part were not pressured to martyr themselves. Upon arriving in Afghanistan, a recruit would fill out an application with standard questions such as, What brought you to Afghanistan? How did you travel here? How did you hear about us? What attracted you to the cause? What is your educational background? Where have you worked before? Applications were valuable for determining the potential of new arrivals, for filtering out potential spies from among them, and for identifying recruits with special skills. For instance, as pointed out earlier, Hani Hanjour noted his pilot training. Prospective operatives also were asked whether they were prepared to serve as suicide operatives. Those who answered in the affirmative were interviewed by senior al-Qaeda lieutenant Mohammed Atef. KSM claims that the most important quality for any al-Qaeda operative was willingness to martyr himself. Khalad agrees and claims that this criterion had preeminence in selecting the planes operation participants. The second most important criterion was demonstrable patience, Kalad says, because the planning for such attacks could take years. Kalad claims it did not matter whether the hijackers had fought in jihad previously, since he believes that U.S. authorities were not looking for such operatives before 9-11. But KSM asserts that young mujahideen with clean records were chosen to avoid raising alerts during travel. The al-Qaeda training camp head mentioned above adds that operatives with no prior involvement in activities likely to be known to international security agencies were purposefully selected for the 9-11 attacks. Most of the muscle hijackers first underwent basic training similar to that given other al-Qaeda recruits. This included training in firearms, heavy weapons, explosives, and topography. 
Recruits learned discipline and military life. They were subjected to artificial stresses to measure their psychological fitness and commitment to jihad. At least seven of the Saudi muscle hijackers took this basic training regime at the Al Farouk camp near Kandahar. This particular camp appears to have been the preferred location for vetting and training the potential muscle hijackers because of its proximity to bin Laden and senior al-Qaeda leadership. Two others, Sukami and Moked, trained at Kaldan, another large basic training facility located near Kabul, where Medar had trained in the mid-1990s. By the time operatives for the plane's operation were picked in mid-2000, some of them had been training in Afghanistan for months, others were just arriving for the first time, and still others may have been returning after prior visits to the camps. According to KSM, bin Laden would travel to the camps to deliver lectures and meet the trainees personally. If bin Laden believed a trainee held promise for a special operation, that trainee would be invited to the Al-Qaeda leader's compound at Tarnak Farms for further meetings. KSM claims that bin Laden could assess new trainees very quickly, in about ten minutes, and that many of the 9-11 hijackers were selected in this manner. Bin Laden, assisted by a TEF, personally chose all the future muscle hijackers for the plane's operation, primarily between the summer of 2000 and April 2001. Upon choosing a trainee, bin Laden would ask him to swear loyalty for a suicide operation. After the selection and oath swearing, the operative would be sent to KSM for training and the filming of a martyrdom video, a function KSM supervised as head of al-Qaeda's media committee. KSM sent the muscle hijacker recruits on to Saudi Arabia to obtain U.S. visas. He gave them money, about $2,000 each, and instructed them to return to Afghanistan for more training after obtaining the visas. At this early stage, the operatives were not told details about the operation. The majority of the Saudi muscle hijackers obtained U.S. visas in Jeddah or Riyadh between September and November of 2000. KSM told potential hijackers to acquire new, clean passports in their home countries before applying for a U.S. visa. This was to avoid raising suspicion about previous travel to countries where al-Qaeda operated. Fourteen of the nineteen hijackers, including nine Saudi muscle hijackers, obtained new passports. Some of these passports were then likely doctored by the al-Qaeda passport division in Kandahar, which would add or erase entry and exit stamps to create false trails in the passports. In addition to the operatives who eventually participated in the 9-11 attacks as muscle hijackers, bin Laden apparently selected at least nine other Saudis who, for various reasons, did not end up taking part in the operation. Mohammed Mani Ahmad al Qatani, Khalid Saeed Ahmad al-Zarani, Ali Abd al-Rahman al-Fakasi al-Gamadi, Saeed al baluki Kataiba al Naji, Zuhair al Tubadi, Saeed Abdullah Saeed al Gamadi, Saad al Rashid, and Mushabib al Hamlan. A tenth individual, a Tunisian with Canadian citizenship named Abdurraf Jadeh, may have been a candidate to participate in 9 11, or he may have been a candidate for a later attack. These candidate hijackers either backed out had trouble obtaining needed travel documents, or were removed from the operation by the al-Qaeda leadership. Khalad believes KSM wanted between four and six operatives per plane. KSM states that al-Qaeda had originally planned to use 25 or 26 hijackers, but ended up with only the 19. Final Training and Deployment to the United States Having acquired U.S. visas in Saudi Arabia, the muscle hijackers returned to Afghanistan for special training in late 2000 to early 2001. The training reportedly was conducted at the al matar complex by Abu Tarab al-Jordani, one of only a handful of al-Qaeda operatives who, according to KSM, was aware of the full details of the planned planes operation. Abu Tarab taught the operatives how to conduct hijackings, disarm air marshals, and handle explosives. He also trained them in bodybuilding and provided them with a few basic English words and phrases. According to KSM, Abu Tarab even had the trainees butcher a sheep and a camel with a knife to prepare to use knives during the hijackings. The recruits learned to focus on storming the cockpit at the earliest opportunity when the doors first opened, and to worry about seizing control over the rest of the plane later. The operatives were taught about other kinds of attack as well, such as truck bombing, 
so that they would not be able to disclose the exact nature of their operation if they were caught. According to KSM, the muscle did not learn the full details, including the plan to hijack planes and fly them into buildings, before reaching the United States. After training in Afghanistan, the operatives went to a safe house maintained by KSM in Karachi and stayed there temporarily before being deployed to the United States via the UAE. The safe house was run by al-Qaeda operative Abd al-Rahim Ghulum Rabani, also known as Abu Ramah, a close associate of KSM, who assisted him for three years by finding apartments and lending logistical support to operatives KSM would send. According to an al-Qaeda facilitator, operatives were brought to the safe house by a trusted Pakistani al-Qaeda courier named Abdullah Sindhi, who also worked for KSM. The future hijackers usually arrived in groups of two or three, staying at the safe house for as long as two weeks. The facilitator has identified each operative whom he assisted at KSM's direction in the spring of 2001. Before the operatives left Pakistan, each of them received $10,000 from KSM for future expenses. From Pakistan, the operatives transited through the UAE en route to the United States. In the Emirates, they were assisted primarily by al-Qaeda operatives Ali Abdul Aziz Ali and Mustafa El Hasawi. Ali apparently assisted nine future hijackers between April and June 2001 as they came through Dubai. He helped them with plane tickets, traveler's checks, and hotel reservations. He also taught them about everyday aspects of life in the West, such as purchasing clothes and ordering food. Dubai, a modern city with easy access to a major airport, travel agencies, hotels, and Western commercial establishments, was an ideal transit point. Ali reportedly assumed the operatives he was helping were involved in a big operation in the United States. He did not know the details. When he asked KSM to send him an assistant, KSM dispatched Hasawi, who had worked on al-Qaeda's media committee in Kandahar. Hasawi helped send the last four operatives, other than Midar, to the United States from the UAE. Hasawi would consult with Atta about the hijackers' travel schedule to the United States, and later check with Atta to confirm that each had arrived. Hasawi told the muscle hijackers that they would be met by Atta at the airport. Hasawi also facilitated some of the operation's financing. The muscle hijackers began arriving in the United States in late April 2001. In most cases, they traveled in pairs on tourist visas and entered the United States in Orlando or Miami, Florida, Washington, D.C., or New York. Those arriving in Florida were assisted by Atta and Shalhi, while Hazmi and Hanjour took care of the rest. By the end of June, 14 of the 15 muscle hijackers had crossed the Atlantic. The muscle hijackers supplied an infusion of funds which they carried as a mixture of cash and traveler's checks purchased in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Seven muscle hijackers are known to have purchased a total of nearly $50,000 in traveler's checks that were used in the United States. Moreover, substantial deposits into operatives U.S. bank accounts immediately followed the entry of other muscle hijackers indicating that those newcomers brought money with them as well. In addition, muscle hijacker Bani Hamad came to the United States after opening bank accounts in the UAE into which were deposited the equivalent of approximately $30,000 on June 25, 2001. After his June 27 arrival in the United States, Bani Hamad made visa and ATM withdrawals from his UAE accounts. The hijackers made extensive use of banks in the United States, choosing both branches of major international banks and smaller regional banks. All of the hijackers opened accounts in their own name and used passports and other identification documents that appeared valid on their face. Contrary to numerous published reports, there is no evidence the hijackers ever used false social security numbers to open any bank accounts. While the hijackers were not experts on the use of the U.S. financial system, Nothing they did would have led the banks to suspect criminal behavior, let alone a terrorist plot to commit mass murder. The last muscle hijacker to arrive was Khalid al Madar. As mentioned earlier, he had abandoned Hazmi in San Diego in June 2000 and returned to his family in Yemen. Madar reportedly stayed in Yemen for about a month before Khalid persuaded him to return to Afghanistan. Madar complained about life in the United States. He met with KSM, who remained annoyed at his decision to go AWOL. But KSM's desire to drop him from the operation 
yielded to bin Laden's insistence to keep him. By late 2000, Midar was in Mecca, staying with a cousin until February 2001, when he went home to visit his family, before returning to Afghanistan. In June 2001, Midar returned once more to Mecca to stay with his cousin for another month. Madar said that bin Laden was planning five attacks on the United States. Before leaving, Madar asked his cousin to watch over his home and family because of a job he had to do. On July 4, 2001, Madar left Saudi Arabia to return to the United States, arriving at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Madar gave his attendant address as the Marriott Hotel, New York City, but instead spent one night at another New York hotel. He then joined the group of hijackers in Patterson, reuniting with Nawaf al-Hazmi after more than a year. With two months remaining, all 19 hijackers were in the United States and ready to take the final steps toward carrying out the attacks. Assistance from Hezbollah and Iran to Al-Qaeda As we mentioned in Chapter 2, while in Sudan, senior managers in Al-Qaeda maintained contacts with Iran and the Iranian-supported worldwide terrorist organization Hezbollah which is based mainly in southern Lebanon and Beirut. Al-Qaeda members received advice and training from Hezbollah. Intelligence indicates the persistence of contacts between Iranian security officials and senior Al-Qaeda figures after bin Laden's return to Afghanistan. Khalad has said that Iran made a concerted effort to strengthen relations with Al-Qaeda after the October 2000 attack on the USS Cole, but was rebuffed because bin Laden did not want to alienate his supporters in Saudi Arabia. Khalad and other detainees have described the willingness of Iranian officials to facilitate the travel of al-Qaeda members through Iran on their way to and from Afghanistan. For example, Iranian border inspectors would be told not to place telltale stamps in the passports of these travelers. Such arrangements were particularly beneficial to Saudi members of al-Qaeda. Our knowledge of the international travels of the al-Qaeda operatives selected for the 9-11 operation remains fragmentary but we now have evidence suggesting that 8 to 10 of the 14 Saudi muscle operatives traveled into or out of Iran between October 2000 and February 2001. In October 2000, a senior operative of Hezbollah visited Saudi Arabia to coordinate activities there. He also planned to assist individuals in Saudi Arabia in traveling to Iran during November. A top Hezbollah commander and Saudi Hezbollah contacts were involved. Also in October 2000, two future muscle hijackers, Mahand al-Shari and Hamza al-Ghamadi, flew from Iran to Kuwait. In November, Ahmad al-Ghamadi apparently flew to Beirut, traveling, perhaps by coincidence, on the same flight as a senior Hezbollah operative. Also in November, Salim al-Hazmi apparently flew from Saudi Arabia to Beirut. In mid-November, we believe, three of the future muscle hijackers, Wael al-Shari, Walid al-Shari, and Ahmed al-Nami, all of whom had obtained their U.S. visas in late October, traveled in a group from Saudi Arabia to Beirut and then onward to Iran. An associate of a senior Hezbollah operative was on the same flight that took the future hijackers to Iran. Hezbollah officials in Beirut and Iran were expecting the arrival of a group during the same time period. The travel of this group was important enough to merit the attention of senior figures in Hezbollah. Later in November, two future muscle hijackers, Satam al-Sakami and Majed Moked, flew into Iran from Bahrain. In February 2001, Khalid al-Madar may have taken a flight from Syria to Iran and then traveled further within Iran to a point near the Afghan border. KSM and Ben al-Shib have confirmed that several of the 9-11 hijackers at least eight, according to Ben al-Shib, transited Iran on their way to or from Afghanistan, taking advantage of the Iranian practice of not stamping Saudi passports. They deny any other reason for the hijackers' travel to Iran. They also deny any relationship between the hijackers and Hezbollah. In sum, there is strong evidence that Iran facilitated the transit of al-Qaeda members into and out of Afghanistan before 9-11, and that some of these were future 9-11 hijackers. There also is circumstantial evidence that senior Hezbollah operatives were closely tracking the travel of some of these future muscle hijackers into Iran in November 2000. However, we cannot rule out the possibility of a remarkable coincidence. 
that is, that Hezbollah was actually focusing on some other group of individuals traveling from Saudi Arabia during this same time frame, rather than the future hijackers. We have found no evidence that Iran or Hezbollah was aware of the planning for what later became the 9-11 attack. At the time of their travel through Iran, the al-Qaeda operatives themselves were probably not aware of the specific details of their future operation. After 9-11, Iran and Hezbollah wished to conceal any past evidence of cooperation with Sunni terrorists associated with al-Qaeda. A senior Hezbollah official disclaimed any Hezbollah involvement in 9-11. We believe this topic requires further investigation by the U.S. government. End of Chapter 7.3 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 7.4 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 7.4 Final Strategies and Tactics Final Preparations in the United States During the early summer of 2001, Atta, assisted by Shahi, was busy coordinating the arrival of most of the muscle hijackers in southern Florida, picking them up at the airport, finding them places to stay, and helping them settle in the United States. The majority settled in Florida. Some opened bank accounts, acquired mailboxes, and rented cars. Several also joined local gyms, presumably to stay fit for the operation. Upon first arriving, most stayed in hotels and motels, but by mid-June they settled in shared apartments relatively close to one another and Atta. Though these muscle hijackers did not travel much after arriving in the United States, two of them, Walid al-Sheri and Satam al-Sakami, took unusual trips. On May 19th, Sheri and Sakami flew from Fort Lauderdale to Freeport, the Bahamas, where they had reservations at the Bahamas Princess Resort. The two were turned away by Bahamian officials on arrival, however, because they lacked visas. They returned to Florida that same day. They likely took this trip to renew Sakami's immigration status, as Sakami's legal stay in the United States ended May 21st. On July 30th, Sheri traveled alone from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. He flew to San Francisco the next day, where he stayed one night before returning via Las Vegas. While this travel may have been a casing flight, Cherie traveled in first class on the same type of aircraft he would help hijack on September 11th, a Boeing 767, and the trip included a layover in Las Vegas. Cherie was neither a pilot nor a plot leader, as were the other hijackers who took surveillance flights. The three Hamburg pilots, Atta, Shahi, and Girard, took the first of their cross-country surveillance flights early in the summer. Shahi flew from New York to Las Vegas via San Francisco in late May. Jara flew from Baltimore to Las Vegas via Los Angeles in early June. Atta flew from Boston to Las Vegas via San Francisco at the end of June. Each traveled in first class on United Airlines. For the east-west transcontinental leg, each operative flew on the same type of aircraft he would pilot on September 11th. Atta and Shahi, a Boeing 767, Jara, a Boeing 757. Hanjur and Hazmi, as noted below, took similar cross-country surveillance flights in August. Jara and Hanjur also received additional training and practice flights in the early summer. A few days before departing on his cross-country test flight, Jara flew from Fort Lauderdale to Philadelphia, where he trained at Hortman Aviation and asked to fly the Hudson Corridor a low-altitude hallway along the Hudson River that passes New York landmarks like the World Trade Center. Heavy traffic in the area can make the corridor a dangerous route for an inexperienced pilot. Because Hortman deemed Jara unfit to fly solo, he could fly this route only with an instructor. Hanjur, too, requested to fly the Hudson Corridor about this same time at Air Fleet Training Systems in Teterboro, New Jersey, where he started receiving ground instruction soon after settling in the area with Hazmi. Hanjur flew the Hudson Corridor, but his instructor declined a second request because of what he considered Hanjur's poor piloting skills. 
Shortly thereafter, Hanjour switched to Caldwell Flight Academy in Fairfield, New Jersey, where he rented small aircraft on several occasions during June and July. In one such instance on July 20th, Hanjour, likely accompanied by Hazmi, rented a plane from Caldwell and took a practice flight from Fairfield to Gaithersburg, Maryland, a route that would have allowed them to fly near Washington, D.C. Other evidence suggests that Han Jour may even have returned to Arizona for flight simulator training earlier in June. There is no indication that Atta or Shahi received any additional flight training in June. Both were likely too busy organizing the newly arrived muscle hijackers and taking their cross-country surveillance flights. Atta, moreover, needed to coordinate with his second-in-command, Nawaf al-Hazmi. Although Atta and Hazmi appear to have been in Virginia at about the same time in early April, they probably did not meet then. Analysis of late April communications associated with KSM indicates that they had wanted to get together in April, but could not coordinate the meeting. Atta and Hazmi probably first met in the United States only when Hazmi traveled round trip from Newark to Miami between June 19th and June 25th. After he returned to New Jersey, Hazmi's behavior began to closely parallel that of the other hijackers. He and Hanjour, for instance, soon established new bank accounts, acquired a mailbox, rented cars, and started visiting a gym. So did the four other hijackers who evidently were staying with them in New Jersey. Several also obtained new photo identification, first in New Jersey and then at the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles, where Hazmi and Hanjour had obtained such documents months earlier, likely with help from their Jordanian friend, Rababa. Atta probably met again with Hazmi in early July. Returning from his initial cross-country surveillance flight, Atta flew into New York. Rather than return immediately to Florida, he checked into a New Jersey hotel. He picked up tickets to travel to Spain at a travel agency in Patterson on July 4th before departing for Fort Lauderdale. Now that the muscle hijackers had arrived, he was ready to meet with Ramsey ben al Sheib for the last time. The Meeting in Spain After meeting with Atta in Berlin in January 2001, ben al Sheib had spent much of the spring of 2001 in Afghanistan and Pakistan, helping move the muscle hijackers as they passed through Karachi. During the Berlin meeting, the two had agreed to meet later in the year in Kuala Lumpur to discuss the operation in person again. In late May, Ben al Shib reported directly to bin Laden at an al-Qaeda facility known as Compound 6 near Kandahar. Bin Laden told Ben al Shib to instruct Atta and the others to focus on their security and that of the operation, and to advise Atta to proceed as planned with the targets discussed before Atta left Afghanistan in early 2000, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, the White House, and the Capitol. According to Ben al Shib, Bin Laden said he preferred the White House over the Capitol, asking Ben al Shib to confirm that Atta understood this preference. Ben al Shib says Bin Laden had given the same message to Walid al Sheri for conveyance to Atta earlier that spring. Ben al Shib also received permission to meet Atta in Malaysia. Atef provided money for the trip, which KSM would help Ben al Shib arrange in Karachi. In early June, Ben al Sheib traveled by taxi from Kandahar to Quetta, Pakistan, where al-Qaeda courier Abu Rama took him to KSM. According to Ben al Sheib, KSM provided a plane ticket to Malaysia and a fraudulent Saudi passport to use for the trip. KSM told him to ask Atta to select a date for the attacks. Ben al Sheib was to return to Germany and then inform KSM of the date. KSM also gave Ben al Sheib the email address of Zarkarius Musawi for future contact. Ben al Sheib then left for Kuala Lumpur. Ben al Sheib contacted Atta upon arriving in Malaysia and found a change in plan. Atta could not travel because he was too busy helping the new arrivals settle in the United States. After remaining in Malaysia for approximately three weeks, Ben al Sheib went to Bangkok for a few days before returning to Germany. He and Atta agreed to meet later at a location to be determined. In early July, Atta called Ben al Sheib to suggest meeting in Madrid, for reasons Ben al Sheib claims not to know. He says he preferred Berlin, but that he and Atta knew too many people in Germany and feared being spotted together. Unable to buy a ticket to Madrid at the height of the tourist season, Ben al Sheib booked a seat on a flight to Rias near Barcelona the next day. 
Atta was already en route to Madrid, so Ben al Shib phoned Shahi in the United States to inform him of the change in itinerary. Atta arrived in Madrid on July 8th. He spent the night in a hotel and made three calls from his room, most likely to coordinate with Ben al-Shib. The next day, Atta rented a car and drove to Rias to pick up Ben al-Shib. The two then drove to the nearby town of Cambrils. Hotel records show Atta renting rooms in the same area until July 19th, when he returned his rental car in Madrid and flew back to Fort Lauderdale. On July 16th, Ben al-Shib returned to Hamburg using a ticket Atta had purchased for him earlier that day. According to Ben al-Shib, they did not meet with anyone else while in Spain. Ben al-Shib says he told Atta that bin Laden wanted the attacks carried out as soon as possible. Bin Laden, Ben al-Shib conveyed, was worried about having so many operatives in the United States. Atta replied that he could not yet provide a date because he was too busy organizing the arriving hijackers and still needed to coordinate the timing of the flights so that the crashes would occur simultaneously. Atta said he required about five to six weeks before he could provide an attack date. Ben al-Shib advised Atta that bin Laden had directed that the other operatives not be informed of the date until the last minute. Atta was to provide bin al-Shib with advance notice of at least a week or two so that bin al-Shib could travel to Afghanistan and report the date personally to bin Laden. As to targets, Atta understood bin Laden's interest in striking the White House. Atta said he thought this target too difficult, but had tasked Hazmi and Hanjur to evaluate its feasibility and was awaiting their answer. Atta said that those two operatives had rented small aircraft and flown reconnaissance flights near the Pentagon. Atta explained that Hanjur was assigned to attack the Pentagon, Jarrah the capital, and that both Atta and Shahi would hit the World Trade Center. If any pilot could not reach his intended target, he was to crash the plane. If Atta could not strike the World Trade Center, he planned to crash his aircraft directly into the streets of New York. Atta told Ben al-Shib that each pilot had volunteered for his assigned target, and that the assignments were subject to change. During the Spain meeting, Atta also mentioned that he had considered targeting a nuclear facility he had seen during familiarization flights near New York a target they referred to as electrical engineering. According to Ben al-Shib, the other pilots did not like the idea. They thought a nuclear target would be difficult because the airspace around it was restricted, making reconnaissance flights impossible, and increasing the likelihood that any plane would be shot down before impact. Moreover, unlike the approved targets, this alternative had not been discussed with senior al-Qaeda leaders and therefore did not have the requisite blessing nor would a nuclear facility have particular symbolic value. Atta did not ask Ben al-Shib to pass this idea on to bin Laden, Atef, or KSM, and Ben al-Shib says he did not mention it to them until after September 11th. Ben al-Shib claims that during their time in Spain, he and Atta also discussed how the hijackings would be executed. Atta said he, Shahi, and Jarrah had encountered no problems carrying box cutters on cross-country surveillance flights. The best time to storm the cockpit would be about 10 to 15 minutes after takeoff, when the cockpit doors typically were open for the first time. Atta did not believe they would need any other weapons. He had no firm contingency plan in case the cockpit door was locked. While he mentioned general ideas such as using a hostage or claiming to have a bomb, he was confident the cockpit doors would be opened and did not consider breaking them down a viable idea. Atta told Ben al-Shib he wanted to select planes departing on long flights because they would be full of fuel, and that he wanted to hijack Boeing aircraft because he believed them easier to fly than Airbus aircraft, which he understood had an autopilot feature that did not allow them to be crashed into the ground. Finally, Atta confirmed that the muscle hijackers had arrived in the United States without incident. They would be divided into teams according to their English-speaking ability. That way they could assist each other before the operation, and each team would be able to command the passengers in English. According to Ben al-Shib, Atta complained that some of the hijackers wanted to contact their families to say goodbye, something he had forbidden. Atta, moreover, was nervous about his future communications with Ben al-Shib, whom he instructed to obtain new telephones upon returning to Germany. Before Ben al-Shib left Spain, he gave Atta eight necklaces and eight bracelets that Atta had asked him to buy when he was recently in Bangkok, believing that if the hijackers were clean-shaven and well-dressed, others would think them wealthy Saudis and give them less notice. 
As directed, upon returning from Spain, Ben al Shib obtained two new phones, one to communicate with Atta, and another to communicate with KSM and others, such as Zacharias Musawi. Ben al Shib soon contacted KSM, and, using code words, reported the results of his meeting with Atta. This important exchange occurred in mid-July. The conversation covered various topics. For example, Gerard was to send Ben al Shib certain personal materials from the hijackers, including copies of their passports, which Ben al Shib in turn would pass along to KSM, probably for subsequent use in al Qaeda propaganda. The most significant part of the mid July conversation concerned Gerard's troubled relationship with Atta. KSM and Ben al Shib both acknowledged that Gerard chafed under Atta's authority over him. Ben al Shib believes the disagreement arose in part from Gerard's family visits. Moreover, Gerard had been on his own for most of his time in the United States because Ben al Shib's visa difficulty had prevented the two of them from training together. Gerard thus felt excluded from the decision making. Ben al Shib had to act as a broker between Gerard and Atta. Concerned that Gerard might withdraw from the operation at this late stage, KSM emphasized the importance of Atta and Gerard's resolving their differences. Ben al Shib claims that such concern was unwarranted, and in their mid July discussion reassured KSM that Atta and Gerard would reconcile and be ready to move forward in about a month after Gerard visited his family. Noting his concern and the potential for delay, KSM at one point instructed Ben al Shib to send the skirts to Sally, a coded instruction to Ben al Shib to send funds to Zacharias Musawi. While Ben al Shib admits KSM did direct him to send Musawi money during the mid July conversation, he denies knowing exactly why he received this instruction, though he thought the money was being provided within the framework of the 9 11 operation. KSM may have instructed Ben al Shib to send money to Musawi in order to help prepare Musawi as a potential substitute pilot for Jarrah. On July 20, 2001, Eisel Singwin, Jarrah's girlfriend, purchased a one-way ticket for Jarrah from Miami to Dusseldorf. On Jarrah's previous four trips from the United States to see Singwin and his family in Lebanon, he had always traveled with a round-trip ticket. When Jarrah departed Miami on July 25th, Atta appears to have driven him to the airport, another unique circumstance. Ben al Shib picked up Gerard at the airport in Dusseldorf on July 25th. Gerard went to see Singwin as soon as possible, so he and Ben al Shib arranged to meet a few days later. When they did, they had an emotional conversation during which Ben al Shib encouraged Gerard to see the plan through. While Gerard was in Germany, Ben al Shib and Musawi were in contact to arrange for the transfer of funds. Ben al Shib received two wire transfers from Hasawi in the UAE totaling $15,000, and within days relayed almost all of this money to Musawi in two installments. Musawi had been taking flight lessons at the Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma since February, but stopped in late May. Although at that point he had only about 50 hours of flight time and no solo flights to his credit, Musawi began making inquiries about flight materials and simulator training for Boeing 747s. On July 10th, he put down a $1,500 deposit for flight simulator training at Pan Am International Flight Academy in Egan, Minnesota, and by the end of the month, he had received a simulator schedule to train from August 13th through August 20th. Musawi also purchased two knives and inquired of two manufacturers of GPS equipment whether their products could be converted for aeronautical use activities that closely resembled those of the 9-11 hijackers during their final preparations for the attacks. On August 10th, shortly after getting the money from Ben al Shib, Musawi left Oklahoma with a friend and drove to Minnesota. Three days later, Musawi paid the $6,800 balance owed for his flight simulator training at Pan Am in cash and began his training. His conduct, however, raised the suspicions of his flight instructor. It was unusual for a student with so little training to be learning to fly large jets without any intention of obtaining a pilot's license or other goal. On August 16th, once the instructor reported his suspicion to the authorities, Musawi was arrested by the INS on immigration charges. KSM denies ever considering Musawi for the planes operation. Instead, he claims that Musawi was slated to participate in a second wave of attacks. KSM also states that Musawi had no contact with Atta, 
and we are unaware of evidence contradicting this assertion. Yet KSM has also stated that by the summer of 2001, he was too busy with the planes operation to continue planning for any second wave attacks. Moreover, he admits that only three potential pilots were ever recruited for the alleged second wave, Musawi plus two others, who by midsummer of 2001 had backed out of the plot. We therefore believe that the effort to push Musawi forward in August 2001 lends credence to the suspicion that he was being primed as a possible pilot in the immediate planes operation. Ben al Sheeb says he assumed Musawi was to take his place as another pilot in the 9-11 operation. Recounting a post-9-11 discussion with KSM in Kandahar, Ben al Sheeb claims KSM mentioned Musawi as being part of the 9-11 operation. Although KSM never referred to Musawi by name, Ben al Sheeb understood he was speaking of the operative to whom Ben al Sheeb had wired money. Ben al Sheeb says KSM did not approve of Musawi, but believes KSM did not remove him from the operation only because Musawi had been selected and assigned by Bin Laden himself. KSM did not hear about Musawi's arrest until after September 11th. According to Ben al-Sheib, had Bin Laden and KSM learned prior to 9-11 that Musawi had been detained, they might have canceled the operation. When Ben al-Sheib discussed Musawi's arrest with KSM after September 11th, KSM congratulated himself on not having Musawi contact the other operatives, which would have compromised the operation. Musawi had been in contact with Ben al-Sheib, of course, but this was not discovered until after 9-11. As it turned out, Musawi was not needed to replace Jarrah. By the time Musawi was arrested in mid-August, Jarrah had returned to the United States from his final trip to Germany, his disagreement with Atta apparently resolved. The operatives began their final preparations for the attacks. Readying the Attacks a week after he returned from meeting Ben al Sheib in Spain, Atta traveled to Newark, probably to coordinate with Hazmi and give him additional funds. Atta spent a few days in the area before returning to Florida on July 30th. The month of August was busy, as revealed by a set of contemporaneous Atta Ben al Sheib communications that were recovered after September 11th. On August 3rd, for example, Atta and Ben al Sheib discussed several matters such as the best way for the operatives to purchase plane tickets and the assignment of muscle hijackers to individual teams. Atta and Ben al Sheib also revisited the question of whether to target the White House. They discussed targets in coded language, pretending to be students discussing various fields of study. Architecture referred to the World Trade Center, arts the Pentagon, law the Capitol, and politics the White House. Ben al Sheib reminded Atta that Bin Laden wanted to target the White House. Atta again cautioned that this would be difficult. When Ben al Sheib persisted, Atta agreed to include the White House, but suggested they keep the Capitol as an alternate target in case the White House proved too difficult. Atta also suggested that the attacks would not happen until after the first week in September, when Congress reconvened. Atta and Ben al Sheib also discussed the friend who was coming as a tourist a cryptic reference to candidate hijacker Mohammed al Qatani, mentioned above, whom Hassawi was sending the next day as the last one to complete the group. On August 4th, Atta drove to the Orlando airport to meet Qatani. Upon arrival, however, Qatani was denied entry by immigration officials because he had a one-way ticket and little money, could not speak English, and could not adequately explain what he intended to do in the United States. He was sent back to Dubai, Hassawi contacted KSM, who told him to help Katani return to Pakistan. On August 7th, Atta flew from Fort Lauderdale to Newark, probably to coordinate with Hazmi. Two days later, Ahmed al Ghamadi and Abdul Aziz al Omari, who had been living in New Jersey with Hazmi and Hanjour, flew to Miami, probably signifying that the four hijacking teams had finally been assigned. While Atta was in New Jersey, he, Hazmi, and Hanjur all purchased tickets for another set of surveillance flights. Like Shahi, Jara, Atta, and Walid al Sheri before them, Hazmi and Hanjur each flew in first class on the same type of aircraft they would hijack on 9 11, a Boeing 757, and on transcontinental flights that connected to Las Vegas. This time, however, Atta himself also flew directly to Las Vegas, where all three stayed on August 13th to 14th. 
Beyond Las Vegas' reputation for welcoming tourists, we have seen no credible evidence explaining why, on this occasion and others, the operatives flew to or met in Las Vegas. Through August, the hijackers kept busy with their gym training, and the pilots took frequent practice flights on small rented aircraft. The operatives also began to make purchases suggesting that the planning was coming to an end. In mid-August, for example, they bought small knives that may actually have been used in the attacks. On August 22nd, moreover, Girard attempted to purchase four GPS units from a pilot shop in Miami. He was able to buy only one unit, which he picked up a few days later when he also purchased three aeronautical charts. Perhaps most significant, however, was the purchase of plane tickets for September 11th. On August 23rd, Atta again flew to Newark, probably to meet with Hazmi and select flights. All 19 tickets were booked and purchased between August 25th and September 5th. It therefore appears that the attack date was selected by the third week of August. This timing is confirmed by Ben al-Sheib, who claims Atta called him with the date in mid-August. According to Ben al-Sheib, Atta used a riddle to convey the date in code, a message of two branches, a slash, and a lollipop. To non-Americans, 11-9 would be interpreted as September 11th. Ben al-Sheib says he called Atta back to confirm the date before passing it to KSM. KSM apparently received the date from Ben al-Sheib and a message sent through Ben al-Sheib's old Hamburg associate, Zachariah Esabar. Both Ben al-Sheib and KSM claim that Esabar was not privy to the meaning of the message and had no foreknowledge of the attacks. According to Ben al-Sheib, shortly after the date was chosen, he advised Esabar and another Hamburg associate, Saeed Bahaji, that if they wanted to go to Afghanistan, now was the time because it would soon become more difficult. Essabar made reservations on August 22nd and departed Hamburg for Karachi on August 30th. Bahaji purchased his tickets on August 20th and departed Hamburg for Karachi on September 3rd. Ben al Sheib also made arrangements to leave for Pakistan during early September before the attacks, as did Ali and Hassawi, the plot facilitators in the UAE. During these final days, Ben al-Sheib and Atta kept in contact by phone, email, and instant messaging. Although Atta had forbidden the hijackers to contact their families, he apparently placed one last call to his own father on September 9th. Atta also asked Ben al-Sheib to contact the family of one hijacker, pass along goodbyes from others, and give regards to KSM. Jarrah alone appears to have left a written farewell a sentimental letter to Eisel Sanguin. Hazmi, however, may not have been so discreet. He may have telephoned his former San Diego companion, Modar Abdullah, in late August. Several bits of evidence indicate that others in Abdullah's circle may have received word that something big would soon happen. As noted earlier, Abdullah's behavior reportedly changed noticeably. Prior to September 11th, both he and Yazid al-Salmi suddenly became intent on proceeding with their planned marriages. One witness quotes Salmi as commenting after the 9-11 attacks, I knew they were going to do something, that is why I got married. Moreover, as of August 2001, Iyad Krywish and other employees at the Texaco station where Hazmi had worked suddenly were anticipating attention from law enforcement authorities in the near future. Finally, according to an uncorroborated witness account, early on the morning of September 10th, Abdullah, Osama Awadala, Omar Bakar Bashat, and others behaved suspiciously at the gas station. According to the witness, after the group met, Awadala said, It is finally going to happen, as the others celebrated by giving each other high fives. Dissent Within the Al-Qaeda Leadership while tactical preparations for the attack were nearing completion, the entire operation was being questioned at the top, as al-Qaeda and the Taliban argued over strategy for 2001. Our focus has naturally been on the specifics of the plane's operation, but from the perspective of bin Laden and Atef, this operation was only one, admittedly key element of their unfolding plans for the year. Living in Afghanistan, interacting constantly with the Taliban, the al-Qaeda leaders would never lose sight of the situation in that country. Bin Laden's consistent priority was to launch a major attack directly against the United States. He wanted the plane's operation to proceed as soon as possible. 
Midar reportedly told his cousin during the summer of 2001 that bin Laden was reputed to have remarked, I will make it happen even if I do it by myself. According to KSM, bin Laden had been urging him to advance the date of the attacks. In 2000, for instance, KSM remembers bin Laden pushing him to launch the attacks amid the controversy after then-Israeli opposition party leader Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. KSM claims bin Laden told him it would be enough for the hijackers simply to down planes rather than crash them into specific targets. KSM says he resisted the pressure. KSM claims to have faced similar pressure twice more in 2001. According to him, bin Laden wanted the operation carried out on May 12, 2001, seven months to the day after the coal bombing. KSM adds that the 9-11 attacks had originally been envisioned for May 2001. The second time he was urged to launch the attacks early was in June or July 2001, supposedly after bin Laden learned from the media that Sharon would be visiting the White House. On both occasions, KSM resisted, asserting that the hijacking teams were not ready. Bin Laden pressed particularly strongly for the latter date in two letters, stressing the need to attack early. The second letter reportedly was delivered by Bin Laden's son-in-law, Aus al-Madani. Other evidence corroborates KSM's account. For instance, Midar told his cousin that the attacks were to happen in May, but were postponed twice, first to July, then to September. Moreover, one candidate hijacker remembers a general warning being issued in the Al-Qaeda camps in July or early August, just like the warnings issued two weeks before the coal bombing and ten days before the eventual 9-11 attacks. During the midsummer alert, Al-Qaeda members dispersed with their families, security was increased, and bin Laden disappeared for about 30 days until the alert was cancelled. While the details of the operation were strictly compartmented, by the time of the alert, word had begun to spread that an attack against the United States was coming. KSM notes that it was generally well known by the summer of 2001 that he was planning some kind of operation against the United States. Many were even aware that he had been preparing operatives to go to the United States, leading some to conclude that al-Qaeda was planning a near-term attack on U.S. soil. Moreover, bin Laden had made several remarks that summer hinting at an upcoming attack and generating rumors throughout the worldwide jihadist community. Bin Laden routinely told important visitors to expect significant attacks against U.S. interests soon, and, during a speech at the al Farouk camp, exhorted trainees to pray for the success of an attack involving 20 martyrs. Others have confirmed hearing indications of an impending attack and have verified that such news, albeit without specific details, had spread across al-Qaeda. Although bin Laden's top priority apparently was to attack the United States, others had a different view. The Taliban leaders put their main emphasis on the year's military offensive against the Northern Alliance, an offensive that ordinarily would begin in the late spring or summer. They certainly hoped that this year's offensive would finally finish off their old enemies, driving them from Afghanistan. From the Taliban's perspective, an attack against the United States might be counterproductive, it might draw the Americans into the war against them, just when final victory seemed within their grasp. There is evidence that Mullah Omar initially opposed a major al-Qaeda operation directly against the United States in 2001. Furthermore, by July, with word spreading of a coming attack, a schism emerged among the senior leadership of al-Qaeda. Several senior members reportedly agreed with Mullah Omar. Those who reportedly sided with bin Laden included Atef, Suleiman Abu Ghaith, and KSM. But those said to have opposed him were weighty figures in the organization, including Abu Hafs the Mauritanian, Sheikh Saeed al-Masri, and Saif al-Adil. One senior al-Qaeda operative claims to recall bin Laden arguing that attacks against the United States needed to be carried out immediately to support insurgency in the Israeli-occupied territories and protest the presence of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Beyond these rhetorical appeals, bin Laden also reportedly thought an attack against the United States would benefit al-Qaeda by attracting more suicide operatives, eliciting greater donations, and increasing the number of sympathizers willing to provide logistical assistance. Mullah Omar is reported to have opposed this course of action for ideological reasons rather than out of fear of U.S. retaliation. 
He is said to have preferred for al-Qaeda to attack Jews, not necessarily the United States. KSM contends that Omar faced pressure from the Pakistani government to keep al-Qaeda from engaging in operations outside Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda's chief financial manager, Sheikh Saeed, argued that al-Qaeda should defer to the Taliban's wishes. Another source says that Sheikh Saeed opposed the operation, both out of deference to Omar and because he feared the U.S. response to an attack. Abu Hafs, the Mauritanian, reportedly even wrote bin Laden a message basing opposition to the attacks on the Koran. According to KSM, in late August, when the operation was fully planned, bin Laden formally notified the al-Qaeda Shura Council that a major attack against the United States would take place in the coming weeks. When some council members objected, bin Laden countered that Mullah Omar lacked authority to prevent al-Qaeda from conducting jihad outside Afghanistan. Though most of the Shura Council reportedly disagreed, bin Laden persisted. The attacks went forward. The story of dissension within al-Qaeda regarding the 9-11 attacks is probably incomplete. The information on which the account is based comes from sources who were not privy to the full scope of al-Qaeda and Taliban planning. Bin Laden and Atef, however, probably would have known, at least, that the general Taliban offensive against the Northern Alliance would rely on al-Qaeda military support. Another significant al-Qaeda operation was making progress during the summer, a plot to assassinate the Northern Alliance leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud. The operatives, disguised as journalists, were in Massoud's camp and prepared to kill him sometime in August. Their appointment to see him was delayed. But on September 9th, the Massoud assassination took place. The delayed Taliban offensive against the Northern Alliance was apparently coordinated to begin as soon as he was killed and it got underway on September 10th. As they deliberated earlier in the year, bin Laden and Atef would likely have remembered that Mullah Omar was dependent on them for the Massoud assassination and for vital support in the Taliban military operations. KSM remembers Atef telling him that al-Qaeda had an agreement with the Taliban to eliminate Massoud, after which the Taliban would begin an offensive to take over Afghanistan. Atef hoped Massoud's death would also appease the Taliban when the 9-11 attacks happened. There are also some scant indications that Omar may have been reconciled to the 9-11 attacks by the time they occurred. Moving to Departure Positions In the days just before 9-11, the hijackers returned leftover funds to al-Qaeda and assembled in their departure cities. They sent the excess funds by wire transfer to Hasawi in the UAE, about $26,000 altogether. The hijackers targeting American Airlines Flight 77 to depart from Dulles migrated from New Jersey to Laurel, Maryland, about 20 miles from Washington, D.C. They stayed in a motel during the first week in September and spent time working out at a gym. On the final night before the attacks, they lodged at a hotel in Herndon, Virginia, close to the airport. Further north, the hijackers targeting United Airlines Flight 93 to depart from Newark gathered in that city from their base in Florida on September 7th. Just after midnight on September 8th through 9th, Gerard received a speeding ticket in Maryland as he headed north on I-95. He joined the rest of his team at their hotel. Atta was still busy coordinating the teams. On September 7th, he flew from Fort Lauderdale to Baltimore presumably to meet with the Flight 77 team in Laurel. On September 9th, he flew from Baltimore to Boston. By then, Shahi had arrived there, and Atta was seen with him at his hotel. The next day, Atta picked up Omari at another hotel, and the two drove to Portland, Maine, for reasons that remain unknown. In the early morning hours of September 11th, they boarded a commuter flight to Boston to connect to American Airlines Flight 11. The two spent their last night pursuing ordinary activities, making ATM withdrawals, eating pizza, and shopping at a convenience store. Their three fellow hijackers for Flight 11 stayed together in a hotel in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Shahi and his team targeting United Airlines Flight 175 from Logan Airport spent their last hours at two Boston hotels. The plan that started with a proposal by KSM in 1996 had evolved to overcome numerous obstacles. Now 19 men waited in nondescript hotel rooms to board four flights the next morning. End of chapter 7.4 Recording by Leanne Howlett
Chapter 8.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 8.1 The system was blinking red. 8.1 The Summer of Threat As 2001 began, counterterrorism officials were receiving frequent but fragmentary reports about threats. Indeed, there appeared to be possible threats almost everywhere the United States had interests, including at home. To understand how the escalation in threat reporting was handled in the summer of 2001, it is useful to understand how threat information in general is collected and conveyed. Information is collected through several methods, including signals intelligence and interviews of human sources, and gathered into intelligence reports. Depending on the source and nature of the reporting, these reports may be highly classified, and therefore tightly held, or less sensitive and widely disseminated to state and local law enforcement agencies. Threat reporting must be disseminated either through individual reports or through threat advisories. Such advisories, intended to alert their recipients, may address a specific threat or be a general warning. Because the amount of reporting is so voluminous, only a select fraction can be chosen for briefing the President and senior officials. During 2001, Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet was briefed regularly regarding threats and other operational information relating to Osama bin Laden. He, in turn, met daily with President Bush, who was briefed by the CIA through what is known as the President's Daily Brief, PDB. Each PDB consists of a series of six to eight relatively short articles or briefs covering a broad array of topics. CIA staff decides which subjects are the most important on any given day. There were more than 40 intelligence articles in the PDBs from January 20th to September 10th, 2001, that related to bin Laden. The PDB is considered highly sensitive and is distributed to only a handful of high-level officials. The Senior Executive Intelligence Brief, SEIB, distributed to a broader group of officials, has a similar format and generally covers the same subjects as the PDB. It usually contains less information so as to protect sources and methods. Like their predecessors, the Attorney General, the FBI Director, and Richard Clark, the National Security Council, NSC, Counterterrorism Coordinator, all received the SEIB, not the PDB. Clark and his staff had extensive access to terrorism reporting, but they did not have access to internal, non-disseminated information at the National Security Agency, NSA, CIA or FBI. The drumbeat begins. In the spring of 2001, the level of reporting on terrorist threats and planned attacks increased dramatically to its highest level since the Millennium Alert. At the end of March, the intelligence community disseminated a terrorist threat advisory, indicating a heightened threat of Sunni extremist terrorist attacks against U.S. facilities, personnel, and other interests. On March 23rd, in connection with discussions about possibly reopening Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, Clark warned National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice that domestic or foreign terrorists might use a truck bomb, their weapon of choice, on Pennsylvania Avenue. That would result, he said, in the destruction of the West Wing and parts of the residence. He also told her that he thought there were terrorist cells within the United States, including Al-Qaeda. The next week, Rice was briefed on the activities of Abu Zubaydah and on CIA efforts to locate him. As pointed out in Chapter 6, Abu Zubaydah had been a major figure in the Millennium Plots. Over the next few weeks, the CIA repeatedly issued warnings, including calls from DCI Tenet to Clark, that Abu Zubaydah was planning an operation in the near future. One report cited a source indicating that Abu Zubaydah was planning an attack in a country that CIA analysts thought might be Israel or perhaps Saudi Arabia or India. Clark relayed these reports to Rice. In response to these threats, the FBI sent a message to all its field offices on April 13th, summarizing reporting to date. It asked the offices to task all resources, including human sources and electronic databases, for any information pertaining to 
current operational activities relating to Sunni extremism. It did not suggest that there was a domestic threat. The Interagency Counterterrorism Security Group, CSG, that Clark chaired, discussed the Abu Zubaydah reports on April 19th. The next day, a briefing to top officials reported, Bin Laden planning multiple operations. When the deputies discussed al-Qaeda policy on April 30th, they began with a briefing on the threat. In May 2001, the drumbeat of reporting grew louder with reports to top officials that Bin Laden public profile may presage attack and Bin Laden Network's plans advancing. In early May, a walk-in to the FBI claimed there was a plan to launch attacks on London, Boston, and New York. Attorney General John Ashcroft was briefed by the CIA on May 15th regarding al-Qaeda generally and the current threat reporting specifically. The next day brought a report that a phone call to a U.S. embassy had warned that bin Laden supporters were planning an attack in the United States using high explosives. On May 17th, based on the previous day's report, the first item on the CSG's agenda was UBL Operation Planned in U.S., the anonymous caller's tip could not be corroborated. Late May brought reports of a possible hostage plot against Americans abroad to force the release of prisoners, including Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind Sheikh who was serving a life sentence for his role in the 1993 plot to blow up sites in New York City. The reporting noted that operatives might opt to hijack an aircraft or storm a U.S. embassy. This report led to a Federal Aviation Administration FAA information circular to airlines noting the potential for an airline hijacking to free terrorists incarcerated in the United States. Other reporting mentioned that Abu Zubaydah was planning an attack, possibly against Israel, and expected to carry out several more if things went well. On May 24th alone, counterterrorism officials grappled with reports alleging plots in Yemen and Italy as well as a report about a cell in Canada that an anonymous caller had claimed might be planning an attack against the United States. Reports similar to many of these were made available to President Bush in morning intelligence briefings with DCI Tenet, usually attended by Vice President Dick Cheney and National Security Advisor Rice. While these briefings discussed general threats to attack America and American interests, the specific threats mentioned in these briefings were all overseas. On May 29th, Clark suggested that Rice ask DCI Tenet what more the United States could do to stop Abu Zubaydah from launching a series of major terrorist attacks, probably on Israeli targets, but possibly on U.S. facilities. Clark wrote to Rice and her deputy, Stephen Hadley. When these attacks occur, as they likely will, we will wonder what more we could have done to stop them. In May, CIA Counterterrorist Center, CTC, Chief Kofer Black, told Rice that the current threat level was a 7 on a scale of 1 to 10, as compared to an 8 during the millennium. High Probability of Near-Term Spectacular Attacks Threat reports surged in June and July, reaching an even higher peak of urgency. The summer threats seemed to be focused on Saudi Arabia, Israel, Bahrain, Kuwait, Yemen, and possibly Rome, but the danger could be anywhere, including a possible attack on the G8 summit in Genoa. A June 12 CIA report, passing along biographical background information on several terrorists, mentioned, in commenting on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, that he was recruiting people to travel to the United States to meet with colleagues already there so that they might conduct terrorist attacks on bin Laden's behalf. On June 22, the CIA notified all its station chiefs about intelligence suggesting a possible al-Qaeda suicide attack on a U.S. target over the next few days. DCI Tenet asked that all U.S. ambassadors be briefed. That same day, the State Department notified all embassies of the terrorist threat and updated its worldwide public warning. In June, the State Department initiated the Visa Express program in Saudi Arabia as a security measure in order to keep long lines of foreigners away from vulnerable embassy spaces. The program permitted visa applications to be made through travel agencies instead of directly at the embassy or consulate. A terrorist threat advisory distributed in late June indicated a high probability of near-term spectacular terrorist attacks 
resulting in numerous casualties. Other report titles warned, Bin Laden attacks may be imminent, and Bin Laden and associates making near-term threats. The latter reported multiple attacks planned over the coming days, including a severe blow against U.S. and Israeli interests during the next two weeks. On June 21st, near the height of the threat reporting, U.S. Central Command raised the force protection condition level for U.S. troops in six countries to the highest possible level, Delta. The U.S. Fifth Fleet moved out of its port in Bahrain, and a U.S. Marine Corps exercise in Jordan was halted. U.S. embassies in the Persian Gulf conducted an emergency security review, and the embassy in Yemen was closed. The CSG had foreign emergency response teams, known as FESs, ready to move on four hours' notice and kept up the terrorism alert posture on a rolling 24-hour basis. On June 25th, Clark warned Rice and Hadley that six separate intelligence reports showed al-Qaeda personnel warning of a pending attack. An Arabic television station reported bin Laden's pleasure with al-Qaeda leaders who were saying that the next weeks will witness important surprises and that U.S. and Israeli interests will be targeted. Al-Qaeda also released a new recruitment and fundraising tape. Clark wrote that this was all too sophisticated to be merely a psychological operation to keep the United States on edge, and the CIA agreed. The intelligence reporting consistently described the upcoming attacks as occurring on a calamitous level, indicating that they would cause the world to be in turmoil, and that they would consist of possible multiple, but not necessarily simultaneous, attacks. On June 28th, Clark wrote Rice that the pattern of al-Qaeda activity, indicating attack planning over the past six weeks, had reached a crescendo. A series of new reports continued to convince me and analysts at State, CIA, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and NSA that a major terrorist attack or series of attacks is likely in July, he noted. One al-Qaeda intelligence report warned that something very, 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 very big was about to happen, and most of bin Laden's network was reportedly anticipating the attack. In late June, the CIA ordered all its station chiefs to share information on al-Qaeda with their host governments, and to push for immediate disruptions of cells. The headline of a June 30th briefing to top officials was stark, Bin Laden planning high-profile attacks. The report stated that Bin Laden operatives expected near-term attacks to have dramatic consequences of catastrophic proportions. That same day, Saudi Arabia declared its highest level of terror alert. Despite evidence of delays possibly caused by heightened U.S. security, the planning for attacks was continuing. On July 2nd, the FBI Counterterrorism Division sent a message to federal agencies and state and local law enforcement agencies summarizing information regarding threats from bin Laden. It warned that there was an increased volume of threat reporting, indicating a potential for attacks against U.S. targets abroad from groups aligned with or sympathetic to Osama bin Laden. Despite the general warnings, the message further stated, The FBI has no information indicating a credible threat of terrorist attack in the United States. However, it went on to emphasize that the possibility of attack in the United States could not be discounted. It also noted that the July 4th holiday might heighten the threats. The report asked recipients to exercise extreme vigilance and report suspicious activities to the FBI. It did not suggest specific actions that they should take to prevent attacks. Disruption operations against al-Qaeda-affiliated cells were launched involving 20 countries. Several terrorist operatives were detained by foreign governments, possibly disrupting operations in the Gulf and Italy, and perhaps averting attacks against two or three U.S. embassies. Clark and others told us of a particular concern about possible attacks on the 4th of July. After it passed uneventfully, the CSG decided to maintain the alert. To enlist more international help, Vice President Cheney contacted Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah on July 5th. Hadley apparently called European counterparts, while Clark worked with senior officials in the Gulf. In late July, because of threats, Italy closed the airspace over Genoa and mounted anti-aircraft batteries at the Genoa airport during the G8 summit, which President Bush attended. 
At home, the CSG arranged for the CIA to brief intelligence and security officials from several domestic agencies. On July 5th, representatives from the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, the FAA, the Coast Guard, the Secret Service, Customs, the CIA, and the FBI met with Clark to discuss the current threat. Attendees report that they were told not to disseminate the threat information they received at the meeting. They interpreted this direction to mean that although they could brief their superiors, they could not send out advisories to the field. An NSC official recalls a somewhat different emphasis, saying that attendees were asked to take the information back to their home agencies and do what you can with it, subject to classification and distribution restrictions. A representative from the INS asked for a summary of the information that she could share with field offices. She never received one. That same day, the CIA briefed Attorney General Ashcroft on the Al-Qaeda threat, warning that a significant terrorist attack was imminent. Ashcroft was told that preparations for multiple attacks were in late stages or already complete, and that little additional warning could be expected. The briefing addressed only threats outside the United States. The next day, the CIA representative told the CSG that Al-Qaeda members believed the upcoming attack would be spectacular, qualitatively different from anything they had done to date. Apparently, as a result of the July 5th meeting with Clark, the Interagency Committee on Federal Building Security was tasked to examine security measures. This committee met on July 9th, when 37 officials from 27 agencies and organizations were briefed on the current threat level in the United States. They were told that not only the threat reports from abroad, but also the recent convictions in the East Africa bombings trial, the conviction of Ahmed Rassam, and the just-returned Kobar Towers indictments, reinforced the need to exercise extreme vigilance. Attendees were expected to determine whether their respective agencies needed enhanced security measures. On July 18, 2001, the State Department provided a warning to the public regarding possible terrorist attacks in the Arabian Peninsula. Acting FBI Director Thomas Picard told us he had one of his periodic conference calls with all special agents in charge on July 19. He said one of the items he mentioned was the need, in light of increased threat reporting, to have evidence response teams ready to move at a moment's notice in case of an attack. He did not task field offices to try to determine whether any plots were being considered within the United States or to take any action to disrupt any such plots. In mid-July, reporting started to indicate that bin Laden's plans had been delayed, maybe for as long as two months, but not abandoned. On July 23rd, the lead item for CSG discussion was still the Al-Qaeda threat, and it included mention of suspected terrorist travel to the United States. On July 31st, an FAA circular appeared alerting the aviation community to reports of possible near-term terrorist operations, particularly on the Arabian Peninsula and or Israel. It stated that the FAA had no credible evidence of specific plans to attack U.S. civil aviation, though it noted that some of the currently active terrorist groups were known to plan and train for hijackings and were able to build and conceal sophisticated explosive devices in luggage and consumer products. Tennant told us that in his world, the system was blinking red. By late July, Tennant said, it could not get any worse. Not everyone was convinced. Some asked whether all these threats might just be deception. On June 30th, the SEIB contained an article titled, Bin Laden Threats Are Real. Yet Hadley told Tennant in July that Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz questioned the reporting. Perhaps Bin Laden was trying to study U.S. reactions. Tennant replied that he had already addressed the Defense Department's questions on this point. The reporting was convincing. To give a sense of his anxiety at the time, one senior official in the Counterterrorist Center told us that he and a colleague were considering resigning in order to go public with their concerns. The Calm Before the Storm On July 27th, Clark informed Rice and Hadley that the spike in intelligence about a near-term Al-Qaeda attack had stopped. He urged keeping readiness high during the August vacation period, warning that another report suggested an attack had just been postponed for a few months, but will still happen. 
On August 1st, the FBI issued an advisory that in light of the increased volume of threat reporting and the upcoming anniversary of the East Africa Embassy bombings, increased attention should be paid to security planning. It noted that although most of the reporting indicated a potential for attacks on U.S. interests abroad, the possibility of an attack in the United States could not be discounted. On August 3rd, the intelligence community issued an advisory concluding that the threat of impending al-Qaeda attacks would likely continue indefinitely. Citing threats in the Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, Israel, and Europe, the advisory suggested that al-Qaeda was lying in wait and searching for gaps in security before moving forward with the planned attacks. During the spring and summer of 2001, President Bush had on several occasions asked his briefers whether any of the threats pointed to the United States. Reflecting on these questions, the CIA decided to write a briefing article summarizing its understanding of this danger. Two CIA analysts involved in preparing this briefing article believed it represented an opportunity to communicate their view that the threat of a bin Laden attack in the United States remained both current and serious. The result was an article in the August 6 Presidential Daily Brief titled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S. It was the 36th PDB item briefed so far that year that related to bin Laden or al-Qaeda, and the first devoted to the possibility of an attack in the United States. The following is the text of an item from the Presidential Daily Brief received by President George W. Bush on August 6, 2001. Redacted material is indicated by brackets. Bin Laden determined to strike in U.S. Clandestine foreign government and media reports indicate Bin Laden since 1997 has wanted to conduct terrorist attacks in the U.S. Bin Laden implied in U.S. television interviews in 1997 and 1998 that his followers would follow the example of World Trade Center bomber Ramzi Youssef and bring the fighting to America. After U.S. missile strikes on his base in Afghanistan in 1998, Bin Laden told followers he wanted to retaliate in Washington according to a redacted material service. An Egyptian Islamic Jihad, EIJ, operative, told an redacted material service at the same time that Bin Laden was planning to exploit the operative's access to the U.S. to mount a terrorist strike. The millennium plotting in Canada in 1999 may have been part of Bin Laden's first serious attempt to implement a terrorist strike in the U.S. Convicted plotter Ahmed Rassam has told the FBI that he conceived the idea to attack Los Angeles International Airport himself, but that Bin Laden Lieutenant Abu Zubaydah encouraged him and helped facilitate the operation. Rassam also said that in 1998 Abu Zubaydah was planning his own U.S. attack. Rassam says Bin Laden was aware of the Los Angeles operation. Although Bin Laden has not succeeded, his attacks against the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998 demonstrate that he prepares operations years in advance and is not deterred by setbacks. Bin Laden associates surveilled our embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam as early as 1993, and some members of the Nairobi cell planning the bombings were arrested and deported in 1997. Al-Qaeda members, including some who are U.S. citizens, have resided in or traveled to the U.S. for years, and the group apparently maintains a support structure that could aid attacks. Two al-Qaeda members found guilty in the conspiracy to bomb our embassies in East Africa were U.S. citizens, and a senior EIJ member lived in California in the mid-1990s. A clandestine source said in 1998 that a bin Laden cell in New York was recruiting Muslim American youth for attacks. We have not been able to corroborate some of the more sensational threat reporting, such as that from a redacted material service in 1998 saying that bin Laden wanted to hijack a U.S. aircraft to gain the release of blind Sheikh Omar Abd al-Rahman and other U.S.-held extremists. Nevertheless, FBI information since that time indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks including recent surveillance of federal buildings in New York. The FBI is conducting approximately 70 full-field investigations throughout the U.S. that it considers bin Laden-related. 
CIA and the FBI are investigating a call to our embassy in the UAE in May, saying that a group of bin Laden supporters was in the U.S. planning attacks with explosives. The President told us the August 6th report was historical in nature. President Bush said the article told him that al-Qaeda was dangerous, which he said he had known since he had become President. The President said bin Laden had long been talking about his desire to attack America. He recalled some operational data on the FBI and remembered thinking it was heartening that 70 investigations were underway. As best he could recollect, Rice had mentioned that the Yemeni's surveillance of a federal building in New York had been looked into in May and June, but there was no actionable intelligence. He did not recall discussing the August 6th report with the Attorney General or whether Rice had done so. He said that if his advisers had told them there was a cell in the United States, they would have moved to take care of it. That never happened. Although the following days SEIB repeated the title of this PDB, it did not contain the reference to hijackings, the alert in New York, the alleged casing of buildings in New York, the threat phoned in to the embassy, or the fact that the FBI had approximately 70 ongoing bin Laden-related investigations. No CSG or other NSC meeting was held to discuss the possible threat of a strike in the United States as a result of this report. Late in the month, a Foreign Service reported that Abu Zubaydah was considering mounting terrorist attacks in the United States after postponing possible operations in Europe. No targets, timing, or method of attack were provided. We have found no indication of any further discussion before September 11th among the President and his top advisors of the possibility of a threat of an al-Qaeda attack in the United States. DCI Tenet visited President Bush in Crawford, Texas on August 17th and participated in PDB briefings of the President between August 31st, after the President had returned to Washington, and September 10th. But Tenet does not recall any discussions with the President of the domestic threat during this period. Most of the intelligence community recognized in the summer of 2001 that the number and severity of threat reports were unprecedented. Many officials told us that they knew something terrible was planned, and they were desperate to stop it. Despite their large number, the threats received contained few specifics regarding time, place, method, or target. Most suggested that attacks were planned against targets overseas. Others indicated threats against unspecified U.S. interests. We cannot say for certain whether these reports, as dramatic as they were, related to the 9-11 attacks. Government Response to the Threats National Security Advisor Rice told us that the CSG was the nerve center for running the crisis, although other senior officials were involved over the course of the summer. In addition to his daily meetings with President Bush, and weekly meetings to go over other issues with Rice, Tennant was speaking regularly with Secretary of State Colin Powell and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. The foreign policy principals routinely talked on the telephone every day on a variety of topics. Hadley told us that before 9-11, he and Rice did not feel they had the job of coordinating domestic agencies. They felt that Clark and the CSG, part of the NSC, were the NSC's bridge between foreign and domestic threats. There was a clear disparity in the levels of response to foreign versus domestic threats. Numerous actions were taken overseas to disrupt possible attacks, enlisting foreign partners to upset terrorist plans, closing embassies, moving military assets out of the way of possible harm. Far less was done domestically, in part, surely, because to the extent that specifics did exist, they pertained to threats overseas. As noted earlier, a threat against the embassy in Yemen quickly resulted in its closing. Possible domestic threats were more vague. When reports did not specify where the attacks were to take place, officials presumed that they would again be overseas, though they did not rule out a target in the United States. Each of the FBI threat advisories made this point. Clark mentioned to National Security Advisor Rice at least twice that al-Qaeda sleeper cells were likely in the United States. In January 2001, Clark forwarded a strategy paper to Rice, warning that al-Qaeda had a presence in the United States. He noted that two key al-Qaeda members in the Jordanian cell involved in the Millennium Plot were naturalized U.S. citizens, and that one jihadist suspected in the East Africa bombings had 
informed the FBI that an extensive network of al-Qaeda sleeper agents currently exists in the U.S. He added that Rassam's abortive December 1999 attack revealed al-Qaeda supporters in the United States. His analysis, however, was based not on new threat reporting, but on past experience. The September 11th attacks fell into the void between the foreign and domestic threats. The foreign intelligence agencies were watching overseas, alert to foreign threats to U.S. interests there. The domestic agencies were waiting for evidence of a domestic threat from sleeper cells within the United States. No one was looking for a foreign threat to domestic targets. The threat that was coming was not from sleeper cells. It was foreign, but from foreigners who had infiltrated into the United States. A second cause of this disparity in response is that domestic agencies did not know what to do, and no one gave them direction. Cressy told us that the CSG did not tell the agencies how to respond to the threats. He noted that the agencies that were operating overseas did not need direction on how to respond. They had experience with such threats and had a playbook. In contrast, the domestic agencies did not have a game plan. Neither the NSC, including the CSG, nor anyone else instructed them to create one. This lack of direction was evident in the July 5th meeting with representatives from the domestic agencies. The briefing focused on overseas threats. The domestic agencies were not questioned about how they planned to address the threat and were not told what was expected of them. Indeed, as noted earlier, they were specifically told they could not issue advisories based on the briefing. The domestic agency's limited response indicates that they did not perceive a call to action. Clark reflected a different perspective in an email to Rice on September 15, 2001. He summarized the steps taken by the CSG to alert domestic agencies to the possibility of an attack in the United States. Clark concluded that domestic agencies, including the FAA, knew that the CSG believed a major al-Qaeda attack was coming and could be in the United States. Although the FAA had authority to issue security directives mandating new security procedures, none of the few that were released during the summer of 2001 increased security at checkpoints or on board aircraft. The information circulars mostly urged air carriers to exercise prudence and be alert. Prior to 9-11, the FAA did present a CD-ROM to air carriers and airport authorities describing the increased threat to civil aviation. The presentation mentioned the possibility of suicide hijackings, but said that, fortunately, we have no indication that any group is currently thinking in that direction. The FAA conducted 27 special security briefings for specific air carriers between May 1, 2001 and September 11, 2001. Two of these briefings discussed the hijacking threat overseas. None discussed the possibility of suicide hijackings or the use of aircraft as weapons. No new security measures were instituted. Rice told us she understood that the FBI had tasked its 56 U.S. field offices to increase surveillance of suspected terrorists and to reach out to informants who might have information about terrorist plots. An NSC staff document at the time describes such a tasking as having occurred in late June, but does not indicate whether it was generated by the NSC or the FBI. Other than the previously described April 13th communication sent to all FBI field offices, however, the FBI could not find any record of having received such a directive. The April 13th document asking field offices to gather information on Sunni extremism did not mention any possible threat within the United States and did not order surveillance of suspected operatives. The NSC did not specify what the FBI's directives should contain, and did not review what had been issued earlier. Acting FBI Director Picard told us that in addition to his July 19th conference call, he mentioned the heightened terrorist threat in individual calls with the special agents in charge of field offices during their annual performance review discussions. In speaking with agents around the country, we found little evidence that any such concerns had reached FBI personnel beyond the New York field office. The head of counterterrorism at the FBI, Dale Watson, said he had many discussions about possible attacks with Kofor Black at the CIA. They had expected an attack on July 4th. Watson said he felt deeply that something was going to happen. But he told us the threat information was nebulous. He wished he had known more. 
He wished he had had five hundred analysts looking at Osama bin Laden threat information instead of two. Attorney General Ashcroft was briefed by the CIA in May and by Picard in early July about the danger. Picard said he met with Ashcroft once a week in late June through July and twice in August. There was a dispute regarding Ashcroft's interest in Picard's briefings about the terrorist threat situation. Picard told us that after two such briefings, Ashcroft told him that he did not want to hear about the threats any more. Ashcroft denies Picard's charge. Picard says he continued to present terrorism information during further briefings that summer, but nothing further on the chatter the U.S. government was receiving. The Attorney General told us he asked Picard whether there was intelligence about attacks in the United States, and that Picard said no. Picard said he replied that he could not assure Ashcroft that there would be no attacks in the United States, although the reports of threats were related to overseas targets. Ashcroft said he therefore assumed the FBI was doing what it needed to do. He acknowledged that in retrospect this was a dangerous assumption. He did not ask the FBI what it was doing in response to the threats, and did not task it to take any specific action. He also did not direct the INS, then still part of the Department of Justice, to take any specific action. In sum, the domestic agencies never mobilized in response to the threat. They did not have direction and did not have a plan to institute. The borders were not hardened. Transportation systems were not fortified. Electronic surveillance was not targeted against a domestic threat. State and local law enforcement were not marshaled to augment the FBI's efforts. The public was not warned. The terrorists exploited deep institutional failings within our government. The question is whether extra vigilance might have turned up an opportunity to disrupt the plot. As seen in Chapter 7, Al-Qaeda's operatives made mistakes. At least two such mistakes created opportunities during 2001, especially in late August. End of Chapter 8.1 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 8.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 8.2. Late Leads. Midyar, Musawi, and KSM. In Chapter 6, we discussed how intelligence agencies successfully detected some of the early travel in the planes operation, picking up the movements of Khalid el Madar and identifying him, and seeing his travel converge with someone they perhaps could have identified but did not, Nawaf al Hazmi, as well as with less easily identifiable people such as Khalad and Abu Barah. These observations occurred in December 1999 and January 2000. The trail had been lost in January 2000 without a clear realization that it had been lost and without much effort to pick it up again. Nor had the CIA placed Madar on the State Department's watch list for suspected terrorists so that either an embassy or a port of entry might take note if Madar showed up again. On four occasions in 2001, the CIA, the FBI, or both, had apparent opportunities to refocus on the significance of Hazmi and Madar and reinvigorate the search for them. After reviewing those episodes, we will turn to the handling of the Musawi case and some late leads regarding Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. January 2001. Identification of Khalid. Almost one year after the original trail had been lost in Bangkok, the FBI and the CIA were working on the investigation of the coal bombing. They learned of the link between a captured conspirator and a person called Khalad. They also learned that Khalad was a senior security official for bin Laden, who had helped direct the bombing. We introduced Khalad in Chapter 5, and returned to his role in the coal bombing in Chapter 6. One of the members of the FBI's investigative team in Yemen realized that he had heard of Khalad before from a joint FBI-CIA source four months earlier. 
the FBI agent obtained from a foreign government a photo of the person believed to have directed the coal bombing. It was shown to the source, and he confirmed that the man in that photograph was the same collade he had described. In December 2000, on the basis of some links associated with Khalid al-Madar, the CIA's bin Laden unit speculated that Khalid and Khalid al-Madar might be one and the same. The CIA asked that a Kuala Lumpur surveillance photo of Madar be shown to the joint source who had identified Khalid. In early January 2001, two photographs from the Kuala Lumpur meeting were shown to the source. One was a known photograph of Madar, the other a photograph of a then unknown subject. The source did not recognize Madar, but he indicated he was 90% certain that the other individual was Khalid. This meant that Kalad and Midar were two different people. It also meant that there was a link between Kalad and Midar, making Midar seem even more suspicious. Yet we found no effort by the CIA to renew the long-abandoned search for Midar or his travel companions. In addition, we found that the CIA did not notify the FBI of this identification. DCI Tenet and Kofer Black testified before Congress's joint inquiry into 9-11 that the FBI had access to this identification from the beginning, but drawing on an extensive record, including documents that were not available to the CIA personnel who drafted that testimony, we conclude this was not the case. The FBI's primary coal investigators had no knowledge that Kalad had been in Kuala Lumpur with Madar and others until after the September 11 attacks. Because the FBI had not been informed in January 2000 about Madar's possession of a U.S. visa, it had not then started looking for him in the United States. Because it did not know of the links between Kalad and Madar, it did not start looking for him in January 2001. This incident is an example of how day-to-day -day gaps in information sharing can emerge even when there is mutual goodwill. The information was from a joint FBI-CIA source who spoke essentially no English, and whose languages were not understood by the FBI agent on the scene overseas. Issues of travel and security necessarily kept short the amount of time spent with the source. As a result, the CIA officer usually did not translate either questions or answers for his FBI colleague and friend. For interviews without simultaneous translation, the FBI agent on the scene received copies of the reports that the CIA disseminated to other agencies regarding the interviews, but he was not given access to the CIA's internal operational reports, which contained more detail. It was there, in reporting to which FBI investigators did not have access, that information regarding the January 2001 identification of Kalad appeared. The CIA officer does not recall this particular identification, and thus cannot say why it was not shared with his FBI colleague. He might not have understood the possible significance of the new identification. In June 2000, Madar left California and returned to Yemen. It is possible that if, in January 2001, the CIA had resumed its search for him, placed him on the State Department's tip-off watch list, or provided the FBI with the information, he might have been found either before or at the time he applied for a new visa in June 2001, or when he returned to the United States on July 4th. Spring 2001, Looking Again at Kuala Lumpur By mid-May 2001, as the threat reports were surging, a CIA official detailed to the International Terrorism Operations Section at the FBI wondered where the attacks might occur. We will call him John. Recalling the episode about the Kuala Lumpur travel of Madar and his associates, John searched the CIA's databases for information regarding the travel. On May 15th, he and an official at the CIA re-examined many of the old cables from early 2000, including the information that Madar had a U.S. visa and that Hazmi had come to Los Angeles on January 15th, 2000. The CIA official who reviewed the cables took no action regarding them. John, however, began a lengthy exchange with a CIA analyst, whom we will call Dave, to figure out what these cables meant. John was aware of how dangerous Kalad was, at one point calling him a major league killer. He concluded that something bad was definitely up. Despite the U.S. links evident in this traffic, 
John made no effort to determine whether any of these individuals was in the United States. He did not raise that possibility with his FBI counterpart. He was focused on Malaysia. John described the CIA as an agency that tended to play a zone defense. He was worrying solely about Southeast Asia, not the United States. In contrast, he told us, the FBI tends to play man-to-man. -man. Desk officers at the CIA's bin Laden unit did not have cases in the same sense as an FBI agent who works in an investigation from beginning to end. Thus, when the trail went cold after the Kuala Lumpur meeting in January 2000, the desk officer moved on to different things. By the time the March 2000 cable arrived with information that one of the travelers had flown to Los Angeles, the case officer was no longer responsible for follow-up. While several individuals at the bin Laden unit opened the cable when it arrived in March 2000, no action was taken. The CIA's zone defense concentrated on where, not who. Had its information been shared with the FBI, a combination of the CIA's zone defense and the FBI's man-to-man -man approach might have been productive. June 2001, the meeting in New York. John's review of the Kuala Lumpur meeting did set off some more sharing of information, getting the attention of an FBI analyst whom we will call Jane. Jane was assigned to the FBI's coal investigation. She knew that another terrorist involved in that operation, Fahd al Kuso, had traveled to Bangkok in January 2000 to give money to Kalad. Jane and the CIA analyst, Dave, had been working together on coal-related issues. Chasing Cousseau's trail, Dave suggested showing some photographs to FBI agents in New York who were working on the coal case and had interviewed Cousseau. John gave three Kuala Lumpur surveillance pictures to Jane to show to the New York agents. She was told that one of the individuals in the photographs was someone named Khalid al-Madar. She did not know why the photographs had been taken or why the Kuala Lumpur travel might be significant, and she was not told that someone had identified Khalid in the photographs. When Jane did some research in a database for intelligence reports, IntelLink, she found the original NSA reports on the planning for the meeting. Because the CIA had not disseminated reports on its tracking of Madar, Jane did not pull up any information about Madar's U.S. visa or about travel to the United States by Hazmi or Madar. Jane, Dave, and an FBI analyst who was on detail to the CIA's bin Laden unit went to New York on June 11th to meet with the agents about the Cole case. Jane brought the surveillance pictures. At some point in the meeting, she showed the photographs to the agents and asked whether they recognized Cuso in any of them. The agents asked questions about the photographs. Why were they taken? Why were these people being followed? Where are the rest of the photographs? The only information Jane had about the meeting, other than the photographs, were the NSA reports that she had found on IntelLink. These reports, however, contained caveats that their contents could not be shared with criminal investigators without the permission of the Justice Department's Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, OIPR. Therefore, Jane concluded that she could not pass on information from those reports to the agents. This decision was potentially significant because the signals intelligence she did not share linked Madara to a suspected terrorist facility in the Middle East. The agents would have established a link to the suspected facility from their work on the embassy bombings case. This link would have made them very interested in learning more about Madar. The sad irony is that the agents who found the source were being kept from obtaining the fruits of their own work. Dave, the CIA analyst, knew more about the Kuala Lumpur meeting. He knew that Madar possessed a U.S. visa, that his visa application indicated that he intended to travel to New York, that Hazmi had traveled to Los Angeles, and that a source had put Madar in the company of Kalad. No one at the meeting asked him what he knew. He did not volunteer anything. He told investigators that as a CIA analyst, he was not authorized to answer FBI questions regarding CIA information. Jane said she assumed that if Dave knew the answers to questions, he would have volunteered them. The New York agents left the meeting without obtaining information that might have started them looking for Madar. Madar had been a weak link in Al-Qaeda's operational planning. He had left the United States in June 2000, a mistake KSM realized could endanger the entire plan, for to continue with the operation, 
Madar would have to travel to the United States again. And unlike other operatives, Madar was not clean. He had jihadist connections. It was just such connections that had brought him to the attention of U.S. officials. Nevertheless, in this case, KSM's fears were not realized. Madar received a new U.S. visa two days after the CIA-FBI meeting in New York. He flew to New York City on July 4th. No one was looking for him. August 2001. The search for Madar and Hazmi begins and fails. During the summer of 2001, John, following a good instinct, but not as part of any formal assignment, asked Mary, an FBI analyst detailed to the CIA's bin Laden unit, to review all the Kuala Lumpur materials one more time. She had been at the New York meeting with Jane and Dave, but had not looked into the issues yet herself. John asked her to do the research in her free time. Mary began her work on July 24th. That day she found the cable reporting that Madar had a visa to the United States. A week later she found the cable reporting that Madar's visa application, what was later discovered to be his first application, listed New York as his destination. On August 21st, she located the March 2000 cable that noted with interest that Hazmi had flown to Los Angeles in January 2000. She immediately grasped the significance of this information. Mary and Jane promptly met with an INS representative at FBI headquarters. On August 22nd, the INS told them that Madar had entered the United States on January 15, 2000, and again on July 4, 2001. Jane and Mary also learned that there was no record that Hazmi had left the country since January 2000, and they assumed he had left with Madar in June 2000. They decided that if Madar was in the United States, he should be found. They divided up the work. Mary asked the bin Laden unit to draft a cable, requesting that Madar and Hazmi be put on the tip-off watch list. Both Hazmi and Madar were added to this watch list on August 24th. Jane took responsibility for the search effort inside the United States. As the information indicated that Madar had last arrived in New York, she began drafting what is known as a lead for the FBI's New York field office. A lead relays information from one part of the FBI to another and requests that a particular action be taken. She called an agent in New York to give him a heads up on the matter but her draft lead was not sent until August 28th. Her email told the New York agent that she wanted him to get started as soon as possible, but she labeled the lead as routine, a designation that informs the receiving office that it has 30 days to respond. The agent who received the lead forwarded it to his squad supervisor. That same day, the supervisor forwarded the lead to an intelligence agent to open an intelligence case an agent who thus was behind the wall, keeping FBI intelligence information from being shared with criminal prosecutors. He also sent it to the cold case agents and an agent who had spent significant time in Malaysia searching for another Khalid, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The suggested goal of the investigation was to locate Madar, determine his contacts and reasons for being in the United States, and possibly conduct an interview. Before sending the lead, Jane had discussed it with John, the CIA official on detail to the FBI. She had also checked with the acting head of the FBI's bin Laden unit. The discussion seems to have been limited to whether the search should be classified as an intelligence investigation or as a criminal one. It appears that no one informed higher levels of management in either the FBI or CIA about the case. There is no evidence that the lead or the search for these terrorist suspects was substantively discussed at any level above deputy chief of a section within the counterterrorism division at FBI headquarters. One of the cold case agents read the lead with interest and contacted Jane to obtain more information. Jane argued, however, that because the agent was designated a criminal FBI agent, not an intelligence FBI agent, the wall kept him from participating in any search for Madar. In fact, she felt he had to destroy his copy of the lead because it contained NSA information from reports that included caveats, ordering that the information not be shared without OIPR's permission. The agent asked Jane to get an opinion from the FBI's National Security Law Unit, NSLU, on whether he could open a criminal case on Madar. Jane sent an email to the Cole case agent explaining that according to the NSLU, the case could be opened only as an intelligence matter, and that if Madar was found, 
Only designated intelligence agents could conduct or even be present at any interview. She appears to have misunderstood the complex rules that could apply to this situation. The FBI agent angrily responded, Whatever has happened to this, some day someone will die, and wall or not, the public will not understand why we were not more effective and throwing every resource we had at certain problems. Let's hope the National Security Law Unit will stand behind their decisions then, especially since the biggest threat to us now, UBL, is getting the most protection. Jane replied that she was not making up the rules. She claimed that they were in the relevant manual and ordered by the FISA court and every office of the FBI is required to follow them, including FBI New York. It is now clear that everyone involved was confused about the rules governing the sharing and use of information gathered in intelligence channels. Because Madar was being sought for his possible connection to or knowledge of the coal bombing, he could be investigated or tracked under the existing coal criminal case. No new criminal case was needed for the criminal agent to begin searching for Madar. And as NSA had approved the passage of its information to the criminal agent, he could have conducted a search using all available information. As a result of this confusion, the criminal agents who were knowledgeable about Al-Qaeda and experienced with criminal investigative techniques, including finding suspects and possible criminal charges, were thus excluded from the search. The search was assigned to one FBI agent, and it was his very first counterterrorism lead. Because the lead was routine, he was given 30 days to open an intelligence case and make some unspecified efforts to locate Madar. He started the process a few days later. He checked local New York databases for criminal record and driver's license information and checked the hotel listed on Madar's U.S. entry form. Finally, on September 11th, the agent sent a lead to Los Angeles because Madar had initially arrived in Los Angeles in January 2000. We believe that if more resources had been applied and a significantly different approach taken, Madar and Hazmi might have been found. They had used their true names in the United States. Still, the investigators would have needed luck as well as skill to find them prior to September 11th, even if such searches had begun as early as August 23rd, when the lead was first drafted. Many FBI witnesses have suggested that even if Madar had been found, there was nothing the agents could have done except follow him onto the planes. We believe this is incorrect. Both Hazmi and Madar could have been held for immigration violations or as material witnesses in the coal bombing case. Investigation or interrogation of them, and investigation of their travel and financial activities, could have yielded evidence of connections to other participants in the 9-11 plot. The simple fact of their detention could have derailed the plan. In any case, the opportunity did not arise. Phoenix Memo The Phoenix Memo was investigated thoroughly by the Joint Inquiry and the Department of Justice Inspector General. We will recap it briefly here. In July 2001, an FBI agent in the Phoenix field office sent a memo to FBI headquarters and to two agents on international terrorism squads in the New York field office, advising of the possibility of a coordinated effort by Osama bin Laden to send students to the United States to attend civil aviation schools. The agent based his theory on the inordinate number of individuals of investigative interest attending such schools in Arizona. The agent made four recommendations to FBI headquarters. To compile a list of civil aviation schools, establish liaison with those schools, discuss his theories about bin Laden with the intelligence community, and seek authority to obtain visa information on persons applying to flight schools. His recommendations were not acted on. His memo was forwarded to one field office. Managers of the Osama bin Laden unit and the Radical Fundamentalist unit at FBI headquarters were addressees, but they did not even see the memo until after September 11th. No managers at headquarters saw the memo before September 11th, and the New York field office took no action. As its author told investigators, the Phoenix memo was not an alert about suicide pilots. His worry was more about a Pan Am Flight 103 scenario in which explosives were placed on an aircraft. The memo's references to aviation training were broad, including aeronautical engineering. If the memo had been distributed in a timely fashion, and its recommendations acted on promptly, we do not believe it would have uncovered the plot. It might well, however, have sensitized the FBI, 
so that it might have taken the Musawi matter more seriously the next month. Zacharias Musawi On August 15, 2001, the Minneapolis FBI field office initiated an intelligence investigation on Zacharias Musawi. As mentioned in Chapter 7, he had entered the United States in February 2001 and had begun flight lessons at Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma. He resumed his training at the Pan Am International Flight Academy in Egan, Minnesota, starting on August 13th. He had none of the usual qualifications for flight training on Pan Am's Boeing 747 flight simulators. He said he did not intend to become a commercial pilot, but wanted the training as an ego-boosting thing. Musawi stood out because, with little knowledge of flying, he wanted to learn how to take off and land a Boeing 747. The agent in Minneapolis quickly learned that Musawi possessed jihadist beliefs. Moreover, Musawi had $32,000 in a bank account, but did not provide a plausible explanation for this sum of money. He had traveled to Pakistan, but became agitated when asked if he had traveled to nearby countries while in Pakistan. Pakistan was the customary route to the training camps in Afghanistan. He planned to receive martial arts training and intended to purchase a global positioning receiver. The agent also noted that Masawi became extremely agitated whenever he was questioned regarding his religious beliefs. The agent concluded that Musawi was an Islamic extremist preparing for some future act in furtherance of radical fundamentalist goals. He also believed Musawi's plan was related to his flight training. Musawi can be seen as an al-Qaeda mistake and a missed opportunity. An apparently unreliable operative, he had fallen into the hands of the FBI. As discussed in Chapter 7, Musawi had been in contact with and received money from Ramzi bin al -Sheib. If Musawi had been connected to al-Qaeda, questions should instantly have arisen about a possible al-Qaeda plot that involved piloting airliners, a possibility that had never been seriously analyzed by the intelligence community. The FBI agent who handled the case in conjunction with the INS representative on the Minneapolis Joint Terrorism Task Force suspected that Musawi might be planning to hijack a plane. Minneapolis and FBI headquarters debated whether Musawi should be arrested immediately or surveilled to obtain additional information. Because it was not clear whether Musawi could be imprisoned, the FBI case agent decided the most important thing was to prevent Musawi from obtaining any further training that he could use to carry out a potential attack. As a French national who had overstayed his visa, Musawi could be detained immediately. The INS arrested Musawi on the immigration violation. A deportation order was signed on August 17, 2001. The agents in Minnesota were concerned that the U.S. Attorney's Office in Minneapolis would find insufficient probable cause of a crime to obtain a criminal warrant to search Musawi's laptop computer. Agents at FBI headquarters believed there was insufficient probable cause. Minneapolis, therefore, sought a special warrant under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to conduct the search. We introduced FISA in Chapter 3. To do so, however, the FBI needed to demonstrate probable cause that Musawi was an agent of a foreign power, a demonstration that was not required to obtain a criminal warrant, but was a statutory requirement for a FISA warrant. The case agent did not have sufficient information to connect Musawi to a foreign power, so he reached out for help in the United States and overseas. The FBI agent's August 18th message requested assistance from the FBI legal attaché in Paris. Musawi had lived in London, so the Minneapolis agent sought assistance from the legal attaché there as well. By August 24th, the Minneapolis agent had also contacted an FBI detailee and a CIA desk officer at the counter-terrorist center about the case. The FBI legal attaché's office in Paris first contacted the French government on August 16th or 17th, shortly after speaking to the Minneapolis case agent on the telephone. On August 22nd and 27th, the French provided information that made a connection between Musawi and a rebel leader in Chechnya, Ibn al khattab This set off a spirited debate between the Minneapolis field office, FBI headquarters, and the CIA as to whether the Chechen rebels and Khattab were sufficiently associated with the terrorist organization to constitute a foreign power for purposes of the FISA statute. FBI headquarters did not believe this was good enough, and its National Security Law Unit declined to submit a FISA application. 
After receiving the written request for assistance, the legal attaché in London had promptly forwarded it to his counterparts in the British government, hand-delivering the request on August 21st. On August 24th, the CIA also sent a cable to London and Paris regarding subjects involved in suspicious 747 flight training that described Musawi as a possible suicide hijacker. On August 28th, the CIA sent a request for information to a different service of the British government. This communication warned that Musawi might be expelled to Britain by the end of August. The FBI office in London raised the matter briefly with British officials as an aside after a meeting about a more urgent matter on September 3rd and sent the British service a written update on September 5th. The case was not handled by the British as a priority amid a large number of other terrorist-related inquiries. On September 4th, the FBI sent a teletype to the CIA, the FAA, the Customs Service, the State Department, the INS, and the Secret Service summarizing the known facts regarding Musawi. It did not report the case agent's personal assessment that Musawi planned to hijack an airplane. It did contain the FAA's comments that it was not unusual for Middle Easterners to attend flight training schools in the United States. Although the Minneapolis agents wanted to tell the FAA from the beginning about Musawi, FBI headquarters instructed Minneapolis that it could not share the more complete report the case agent had prepared for the FAA. The Minneapolis supervisor sent the case agent in person to the local FAA office to fill in what he thought were gaps in the FBI headquarters teletype. No FAA actions seemed to have been taken in response. There was substantial disagreement between Minneapolis agents and FBI headquarters as to what Misawi was planning to do. In one conversation between a Minneapolis supervisor and a headquarters agent, the latter complained that Minneapolis's visa request was couched in a manner intended to get people spun up. The supervisor replied that was precisely his intent. He said he was trying to keep someone from taking a plane and crashing into the World Trade Center. The headquarters agent replied that this was not going to happen, and that they did not know if Masawi was a terrorist. There is no evidence that either FBI Acting Director Picard or Assistant Director for Counterterrorism Dale Watson was briefed on the Masawi case prior to 9-11. Michael Rollins, the FBI Assistant Director heading the Bureau's International Terrorism Operations Section, ITOS, recalled being told about Masawi in two passing hallway conversations but only in the context that he might be receiving telephone calls from Minneapolis, complaining about how headquarters was handling the matter. He never received such a call. Although the acting special agent in charge of Minneapolis called the ITOS supervisors to discuss the Masawi case on August 27th, he declined to go up the chain of command at FBI headquarters and call Rollins. On August 23rd, DCI Tenet was briefed about the Masawi case in a briefing titled, Islamic extremist learns to fly. Tennant was also told that Musawi wanted to learn to fly a 747, paid for his training in cash, was interested to learn the doors do not open in flight, and wanted to fly a simulated flight from London to New York. He was told that the FBI had arrested Musawi because of a visa overstay, and that the CIA was working the case with the FBI. Tennant told us that no connection to al-Qaeda was apparent to him at the time. Seeing it as an FBI case, he did not discuss the matter with anyone at the White House or the FBI. No connection was made between Musawi's presence in the United States and the threat reporting during the summer of 2001. On September 11th, after the attacks, the FBI office in London renewed their appeal for information about Musawi. In response to U.S. requests, the British government supplied some basic biographical information about Musawi. The British government informed us that it also immediately tasked intelligence collection facilities for information about Massawi. On September 13th, the British government received new, sensitive intelligence that Musawi had attended an al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. It passed this intelligence to the United States on the same day. Had this information been available in late August 2001, the Massawi case would almost certainly have received intense high-level attention. The FBI also learned after 9-11 that the Millennium terrorist Rassam, who by 2001 was cooperating with investigators, recognized Musawi as someone who had been in the Afghan camps. As mentioned above, before 9-11, the FBI agents in Minneapolis had failed to persuade supervisors at headquarters 
that there was enough evidence to seek a FISA warrant to search Massawi's computer hard drive and belongings. Either the British information or the Rassam identification would have broken the logjam. A maximum U.S. effort to investigate Musawi conceivably could have unearthed his connections to Ben al-Shib. Those connections might have brought investigators to the core of the 9-11 plot. The Ben al-Shib connection was recognized shortly after 9-11, though it was not an easy trail to find. Discovering it would have required quick and very substantial cooperation from the German government, which might well have been difficult to obtain. However, publicity about Musawi's arrest and a possible hijacking threat might have derailed the plot. With time, the search for Madar and Hazmi and the investigation of Musawi might also have led to a breakthrough that would have disrupted the plot. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed Another late opportunity was presented by a confluence of information regarding Khalid Sheikh Mohammed received by the intelligence community in the summer of 2001. The possible links between KSM, Musawi, and an individual only later identified as Ramzi bin al-Shib would remain undiscovered, however. Although we readily equate KSM with al-Qaeda today, this was not the case before 9-11. KSM, who had been indicted in January 1996 for his role in the Manila Air Plot, was seen primarily as another freelance terrorist associated with Ramzi Youssef. Because the links between KSM and bin Laden or al-Qaeda were not recognized at the time, responsibility for KSM remained in the small Islamic extremist branch of the counter-terrorist center, not in the bin Laden unit. Moreover, because KSM had already been indicted, he became targeted for arrest. In 1997, the counter-terrorist center added a renditions branch to help find wanted fugitives. Responsibility for KSM was transferred to this branch, which gave the CIA a man-to-man -man focus, but it was not an analytical unit. When subsequent information came, more critical for analysis than for tracking, no unit had the job of following up on what the information might mean. For example, in September 2000, a source had reported that an individual named Khalid al-Sheikh al-Balushi was a key lieutenant in al-Qaeda. Al-Balushi means from Baluchistan, and KSM is from Baluchistan. Recognizing the possible significance of this information, the bin Laden unit sought more information. When no information was forthcoming, the bin Laden unit dropped the matter. When additional pieces of the puzzle arrived in the spring and summer of 2001, they were not put together. The first piece of the puzzle concerned some intriguing information associated with a person known as Mukhtar, that the CIA had begun analyzing in April 2001. The CIA did not know who Mukhtar was at the time, only that he associated with al-Qaeda lieutenant Abu Zubaydah, and that, based on the nature of the information, he was evidently involved in planning possible terrorist activities. The second piece of the puzzle was some alarming information regarding KSM. On June 12, 2001, a CIA report said that Khaled, was actively recruiting people to travel outside Afghanistan, including to the United States, where colleagues were reportedly already in the country to meet them, to carry out terrorist-related activities for bin Laden. CIA headquarters presumed from the details of the reporting that this person was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. In July, the same source was shown a series of photographs and identified a photograph of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as the Khaled he had previously discussed. The final piece of the puzzle arrived at the CIA's bin Laden unit on August 28th, in a cable reporting that KSM's nickname was Mukhtar. No one made the connection to the reports about Mukhtar that had been circulated in the spring. This connection might also have underscored concern about the June reporting that KSM was recruiting terrorists to travel, including to the United States. Only after 9-11 would it be discovered that Mukhtar slash KSM had communicated with a phone that was used by bin al-Shib, and that bin al-Shib had used the same phone to communicate with Musawi, as discussed in Chapter 7. As in the Musawi situation already described, the links to bin al-Shib might not have been an easy trail to find, and would have required substantial cooperation from the German government. But time was short and running out. Time runs out. As Tennant told us, the system was blinking red during the summer of 2001. Officials were alerted across the world. Many were doing everything they possibly could to respond to the threats. 
yet no one working on these late leads in the summer of 2001 connected the case in his or her inbox to the threat reports agitating senior officials and being briefed to the president. Thus, these individual cases did not become national priorities. As the CIA supervisor John told us, no one looked at the bigger picture. No analytic work foresaw the lightning that could connect the thundercloud to the ground. We see little evidence that the progress of the plot was disturbed by any government action. The U.S. government was unable to capitalize on mistakes made by al-Qaeda. Time ran out. End of chapter 8.2 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 9.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Siebold. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 9. Heroism and Horror. 9.1. Preparedness as of September 11th. Emergency response is a product of preparedness. On the morning of September 11, 2001, the last best hope for the community of people working in or visiting the World Trade Center rested not with national policymakers, but with private firms and local public servants, especially the first responders, fire, police, emergency medical service, and building safety professionals. Building Preparedness The World Trade Center the World Trade Center complex was built for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Construction began in 1966 and tenants began to occupy its space in 1970. The Twin Towers came to occupy a unique and symbolic place in the culture of New York City and America. The World Trade Center actually consisted of seven buildings, including one hotel spread across 16 acres of land. The buildings were connected by an underground mall, the Concourse. The Twin Towers, one World Trade Center, or the North Tower, and two World Trade Center, or the South Tower, were the signature structures, containing 10.4 million square feet of office space. Both towers had 110 stories, were about 1,350 feet high, and were square. Each wall measured 208 feet in length. On any given workday, up to 50,000 office workers occupied the towers, and 40,000 people passed through the complex. Each tower contained three central stairwells, which ran essentially from top to bottom, and 99 elevators. Generally, elevators originating in the lobby ran to sky lobbies on higher floors, where additional elevators carried passengers to the tops of the buildings. Stairwells A and C ran from the 110th floor to the raised mezzanine level of the lobby. Stairwell B ran from the 107th floor to level B6, six floors below ground, and was accessible from the West Street lobby level, which was one floor below the mezzanine. All three stairwells ran essentially straight up and down, except for two deviations in stairwells A and C, where the staircase jutted out toward the perimeter of the building. On the upper and lower boundaries of these deviations were transfer hallways contained within the stairwell proper. Each hallway contained smoke doors to prevent smoke from rising from lower to upper portions of the building, they were kept closed, but not locked. Doors leading from tenant space into the stairwells were never kept locked. Re-entry from the stairwells was generally possible on at least every fourth floor. Doors leading to the roof were locked. There was no rooftop evacuation plan. The roofs of both the North Tower and the South Tower were sloped and cluttered surfaces with radiation hazards, making them impractical for helicopter landings and as staging areas for civilians. Although the South Tower roof had a helipad, it did not meet 1994 Federal Aviation Administration guidelines. The 1993 terrorist bombing of the World Trade Center and the Port Authority's response. Unlike most of America, New York City, and specifically the World Trade Center, had been the target of terrorist attacks before 9-11. At 12.18 p.m. on February 26, 1993, a 1,500-pound bomb stashed in a rental van was detonated on a parking garage ramp beneath the Twin Towers. The explosion killed six people, injured about a thousand more, 
and exposed vulnerabilities in the World Trade Centers and the city's emergency preparedness. The towers lost power and communications capability. Generators had to be shut down to ensure safety, and elevators stopped. The public address system and emergency lighting systems failed. The unlit stairwells filled with smoke and were so dark as to be impassable. Rescue efforts by the Fire Department of New York were hampered by the inability of its radios to function in buildings as large as the Twin Towers. The 911 emergency call system was overwhelmed. The general evacuation of the tower's occupants via the stairwells took more than four hours. Several small groups of people who were physically unable to descend the stairs were evacuated from the roof of the South Tower by New York Police Department helicopters. At least one person was lifted from the North Tower roof by the NYPD in a dangerous helicopter repel operation 15 hours after the bombing. General knowledge that these air rescues had occurred appears to have left a number of civilians who worked in the Twin Towers with the false impression that helicopter rescues were part of the World Trade Center evacuation plan and that rescue from the roof was a viable, if not favored, option for those who worked on the upper floors. Although they were considered after 1993, helicopter evacuations, in fact, were not incorporated into the World Trade Center Fire Safety Plan. To address the problems encountered during the response to the 1993 bombing, the Port Authority spent an initial $100 million to make physical, structural, and technological improvements to the World Trade Center, as well as to enhance its fire safety plan and reorganize and bolster its fire safety and security staffs. Substantial enhancements were made to power sources and exits. Fluorescent lights and markings were added in and near stairwells. The Port Authority also installed a sophisticated computerized fire alarm system with redundant electronics and control panels, and state-of-the-art fire command stations were placed in the lobby of each tower. To manage fire emergency preparedness and operations, the Port Authority created the dedicated position of Fire Safety Director. The director supervised a team of deputy fire safety directors, one of whom was on duty at the fire command station in the lobby of each tower at all times. He or she would be responsible for communicating with building occupants during an emergency. The Port Authority also sought to prepare civilians better for future emergencies. Deputy fire safety directors conducted fire drills at least twice a year with advance notice to tenants. Fire safety teams were selected from among civilian employees on each floor and consisted of a fire warden, deputy fire warden, and searchers. The standard procedure for fire drills was for fire wardens to lead co-workers in their respective areas to the center of the floor, where they would use the emergency intercom phone to obtain specific information on how to proceed. Some civilians have told us that their evacuation on September 11th was greatly aided by changes and training implemented by the Port Authority in response to the 1993 bombing. But during these drills, civilians were not directed into the stairwells or provided with information about their configuration and about the existence of transfer hallways and smoke doors. Neither full nor partial evacuation drills were held. Moreover, participation in drills that were held varied greatly from tenant to tenant. In general, civilians were never told not to evacuate up. The standard fire drill announcement advised participants that in the event of an actual emergency, they would be directed to descend to at least three floors below the fire. Most civilians recall simply being taught to await the instructions that would be provided at the time of an emergency. Civilians were not informed that rooftop evacuations were not part of the evacuation plan or that doors to the roof were kept locked. The Port Authority acknowledges that it had no protocol for rescuing people trapped above a fire in the towers. Six weeks before the September 11th attacks, Control of the World Trade Center was transferred by net lease to a private developer, Silverstein Properties. Select Port Authority employees were designated to assist with the transition. Others remained on site, but were no longer part of the official chain of command. However, on September 11th, most Port Authority World Trade Department employees, including those not on the designated transition team, reported to their regular stations to provide assistance throughout the morning. Although Silverstein Properties was in charge of the World Trade Center on September 11th, the World Trade Center Fire Safety Plan remained essentially the same. Preparedness of First Responders On 9-11, the principal first responders were from the Fire Department of New York, the New York Police Department, the Port Authority Police Department, 
and the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. Port Authority Police Department On September 11, 2001, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey Police Department consisted of 1,331 officers, many of whom were trained in fire suppression methods as well as in law enforcement. The PAPD was led by a superintendent. There was a separate PAPD command for each of the Port Authority's nine facilities, including the World Trade Center. Most Port Authority police commands used ultra-high-frequency radios. Although all the radios were capable of using more than one channel, most PAPD officers used one local channel. The local channels were low wattage and worked only in the immediate vicinity of that command. The PAPD also had an agency-wide channel, but not all commands could access it. As of September 11th, the Port Authority lacked any standard operating procedures to govern how officers from multiple commands would respond to and then be staged and utilized at a major incident at the World Trade Center. In particular, there were no standard operating procedures covering how different commands should communicate via radio during such an incident. The New York Police Department The 40,000 officer NYPD was headed by a police commissioner whose duties were not primarily operational, but who retained operational authority. Much of the NYPD's operational activities were run by the chief of department. In the event of a major emergency, a leading role would be played by the Special Operations Division. This division included the Aviation Unit, which provided helicopters for surveys and rescues, and the Emergency Service Unit, or ESU, which carried out specialized rescue missions. The NYPD had specific and detailed standard operating procedures for the dispatch of officers to an incident, depending on the incident's magnitude. The NYPD precincts were divided into 35 different radio zones, with a central radio dispatcher assigned to each. In addition, there were several radio channels for citywide operations. Officers had portable radios with 20 or more available channels, so that the user could respond outside his or her precinct. ESU teams also had these channels, but at an operation would use a separate point-to-point -point channel which was not monitored by a dispatcher. The NYPD also supervised the city's 911 emergency call system. Its approximately 1,200 operators, radio dispatchers, and supervisors were civilian employees of the NYPD. They were trained in the rudiments of emergency response. When a 911 call concerned a fire, it was transferred to FDNY dispatch. The Fire Department of New York The 11,000-member FDNY was headed by a fire commissioner who, unlike the police commissioner, lacked operational authority. Operations were headed by the chief of department, the sole five-star chief. The FDNY was organized in nine separate geographic divisions. Each division was further divided into between four to seven battalions. Each battalion contained typically between three and four engine companies and two to four ladder companies. In total, the FDNY had 205 engine companies and 133 ladder companies. On-duty ladder companies consisted of a captain or lieutenant and five firefighters. On-duty engine companies consisted of a captain or lieutenant and normally four firefighters. Ladder companies' primary function was to conduct rescues. Engine companies focused on extinguishing fires. The FDNY's Specialized Operations Command, or SOC, contained a limited number of units that were of particular importance in responding to a terrorist attack or other major incident. The department's five rescue companies and seven squad companies performed specialized and highly risky rescue operations. The logistics of fire operations were directed by Fire Dispatch Operations Division, which had a center in each of the five boroughs. All 911 calls concerning fire emergencies were transferred to FDNY dispatch. As of September 11th, FDNY companies and chiefs responding to a fire used analog point-to-point -point radios that had six normal operating channels. Typically, the companies would operate on the same tactical channel, which chiefs on the scene would monitor and use to communicate with the firefighters. Chiefs at a fire operation also would use a separate command channel. Because these point-to-point -point radios had weak signal strength, communications on them could be heard only by other FDNY personnel in the immediate vicinity. In addition, the FDNY had a dispatch frequency for each of the five boroughs. 
These were not point-to-point -point channels and could be monitored from around the city. The FDNY's radios performed poorly during the 1993 World Trade Center bombing for two reasons. First, the radio signals often did not succeed in penetrating the numerous steel and concrete floors that separated companies attempting to communicate, and second, so many different companies were attempting to use the same point-to-point -point channel that communications became unintelligible. The Port Authority installed, at its own expense, a repeater system in 1994 to greatly enhance FDNY radio communications in the difficult high-rise environment of the Twin Towers. The Port Authority recommended leaving the repeater system on at all times. The FDNY requested, however, that the repeater be turned on only when it was actually needed because the channel could cause interference with other FDNY operations in Lower Manhattan. The repeater system was installed at the Port Authority Police Desk in 5 World Trade Center to be activated by members of the Port Authority Police when the FDNY units responding to the World Trade Center complex so requested. However, in the spring of 2000, the FDNY asked that an activation console for the repeater system be placed instead in the lobby fire safety desk of each of the towers, making FDNY personnel entirely responsible for its activation. The Port Authority complied. Between 1998 and 2000, fewer people died from fires in New York City than in any three-year period since accurate measurements began in 1946. Firefighter deaths, a total of 22 during the 1990s, compared favorably with the most tranquil periods in the department's history. Office of Emergency Management and Interagency Preparedness In 1996, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani created the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management, which had three basic functions. First, OEM's Watch Command was to monitor the city's key communications channels, including radio frequencies of FDNY dispatch and the NYPD, and other data. A second purpose of the OEM was to improve New York City's response to major incidents, including terrorist attacks, by planning and conducting exercises and drills that would involve multiple city agencies, particularly the NYPD and FDNY. Third, the OEM would play a crucial role in managing the city's overall response to an incident. After OEM's Emergency Operations Center was activated, designated liaisons from relevant agencies, as well as the mayor and his or her senior staff, would respond there. In addition, an OEM field responder would be sent to the scene to ensure that the response was coordinated. The OEM's headquarters was located at 7 World Trade Center. Some questioned locating it both so close to a previous terrorist target and on the 23rd floor of a building, difficult to access should elevators become inoperable. There was no backup site. In July 2001, Mayor Giuliani updated a directive titled Direction and Control of Emergencies in the City of New York. Its purpose was to eliminate potential conflict among responding agencies, which may have areas of overlapping expertise and responsibility. The directive sought to accomplish this objective by designating, for different types of emergencies, an appropriate agency as incident commander. This incident commander would be responsible for the management of the city's response to the emergency, while the OEM was designated the on-scene interagency coordinator. Nevertheless, the FDNY and NYPD each considered itself operationally autonomous. As of September 11th, they were not prepared to comprehensively coordinate their efforts in responding to a major incident. The OEM had not overcome this problem. End of chapter 9.1 Recording by Bob Siebold Chapter 9.2 Part 1 of the 9-11 Commission Report this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Chapter 9.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. September 11th, 2001. As we turn to the events of September 11th, we are mindful of the unfair perspective afforded by hindsight. Nevertheless, 
we will try to describe what happened in the following 102 minutes. The 17 minutes from the crash of the hijacked American Airlines Flight 11 into the First World Trade Center, the North Tower, at 846 until the South Tower was hit, the 56 minutes from the crash of the hijacked United Airlines Flight 175 into the Second World Trade Center, the South Tower, at 9.03 until the collapse of the South Tower, the 29 minutes from the collapse of the South Tower at 9.59 until the collapse of the North Tower at 10.28. From 8.46 until 9.03 a.m. At 8.46 and 40 seconds, the hijacked American Airlines Flight 11 flew into the upper portion of the North Tower, cutting through floors 93 through 99. Evidence suggests that all three of the building's stairwells became impassable from the 92nd floor up. Hundreds of civilians were killed instantly by the impact. Hundreds more remained alive but trapped. Civilians, fire safety personnel, and 911 calls. North Tower. A jet fuel fireball erupted upon impact and shot down at least one bank of elevators. The fireball exploded onto numerous lower floors, including the 77th and the 22nd. The West Street lobby level and the B4 level, four stories below ground. The burning jet fuel immediately created thick black smoke that enveloped the upper floors and roof of the North Tower. The roof of the South Tower was also engulfed in smoke because of the prevailing light winds from the Northwest. Within minutes, New York City's 911 system was flooded with eyewitness accounts of the event. Most callers correctly identified the target of the attack. Some identified the plane as a commercial airliner. The first response came from private firms and individuals, the people and companies in the building. Everything that would happen to them during the next few minutes would turn on their circumstances and their preparedness, assisted by building personnel on site. Hundreds of civilians trapped on or above the 92nd floor gathered in large and small groups, primarily between the 103rd and the 106th floors. A large group was reported on the 92nd floor, technically below the impact, but unable to descend. Civilians were also trapped in elevators. Other civilians below the impact zone, mostly on floors in the 70s and 80s, but also on at least the 47th and 22nd floors, were either trapped or waiting for assistance. It is unclear when the first full building evacuation order was attempted over the public address system. The deputy fire safety director in the lobby, while immediately aware that a major incident had occurred, did not know for approximately 10 minutes that a commercial jet had directly hit the building. Following protocol, he initially gave announcements to those floors that had generated computerized alarms, advising those tenants to descend to points of safety, at least two floors below the smoke or fire, and to wait there for further instructions. The deputy fire safety director has told us that he began instructing a full evacuation within about 10 minutes of the explosion, but the first FDNY chiefs to arrive in the lobby were advised by the Port Authority fire safety director, who had reported to the lobby, although he was no longer the designated fire safety director, that the full building evacuation announcement had been made within one minute of the building being hit. Because of damage to building systems caused by the impact of the plane, public address announcements were not heard in many locations. For the same reason, many civilians may have been unable to use the emergency intercom phones, as they had been advised to do in fire drills. Many called 911. The 911 system was not equipped to handle the enormous volume of calls it received. Some callers were unable to connect with 911 operators, receiving an all-circuits-busy message. Standard operating procedure was for calls relating to fire emergencies to be transferred from 911 operators to the FDNY dispatch operators in the appropriate borough, in this case, Manhattan. Transfers were often plagued by delays, 
and were in some cases unsuccessful. Many calls were also prematurely disconnected. The 911 operators and FDNY dispatchers had no information about either the location or the magnitude of the impact zone and were therefore unable to provide information as fundamental as whether callers were above or below the fire. Because the operators were not informed of NYPD Aviation's determination of the impossibility of rooftop rescues from the Twin Towers on that day, they could not knowledgeably answer when callers asked whether to go up or down. In most instances, therefore, the operators and the FDNY dispatchers relied on standard operating procedures for high-rise fires, that civilians should stay low, remain where they are, and wait for emergency personnel to reach them. This advice was given to callers from the North Tower for locations both above and below the impact zone. Fire chiefs told us that the evacuation of tens of thousands of people from skyscrapers can create many new problems, especially for individuals who are disabled or in poor health. Many of the injuries after the 1993 bombing occurred during evacuation. Although the guidance to stay in place may seem understandable in cases of conventional high-rise fires, FDNY chiefs in the North Tower lobby determined at once that all building occupants should attempt to evacuate immediately. By 8.57, FDNY chiefs had instructed the PAPD and building personnel to evacuate the South Tower as well because of the magnitude of the damage caused by the first plane's impact. These critical decisions were not conveyed to 9-11 operators or to FDNY dispatchers. Departing from protocol, a number of operators told callers that they could break windows, and several operators adv advised callers to evacuate if they could. Civilians who called the Port Authority Police Desk, located at World Trade Center 5, were advised to leave if they could. Most civilians who were not obstructed from proceeding began evacuating without waiting for instructions over the intercom system. Some remained to wait for help, as advised by 9-11 operators. Others simply continued to work or delayed to collect personal items, but in many cases were urged to leave by others. Some Port Authority civilian employees remained on various upper floors to help civilians who were trapped and to assist in the evacuation. While evacuating, some civilians had trouble reaching the exits because of the damage caused by the impact. Some were confused by deviations in the increasingly crowded stairwells and impeded by doors that appeared to be locked but actually were jammed by debris or shifting that resulted from the impact of the plane. Despite these obstacles, the evacuation was relatively calm and orderly. Within 10 minutes of impact, smoke was beginning to rise to the upper floors in debilitating volumes and isolated fires were reported, although there were some pockets of refuge. Faced with insufferable heat, smoke, and fire, and with no prospect for relief, some jumped or fell from the building. South Tower Many civilians in the South Tower were initially unaware of what had happened in the other tower. Some believed an incident had occurred in their building. Others were aware that a major explosion had occurred on the upper floors of the North Tower. Many people decided to leave, and some were advised to do so by fire wardens. In addition, Morgan Stanley, which occupied more than 20 floors of the South Tower, evacuated its employees by the decision of company security officials. Consistent with protocol, at 8.49, the deputy fire safety director in the South Tower told his counterpart in the North Tower that he would wait to hear from, quote, the boss from the fire department or somebody, end quote, before ordering an evacuation. At about this time, an announcement over the public address system in the South Tower stated that the incident had occurred in the other building and advised tenants generally, that their building was safe and that they should remain on or return to their offices or floors. A statement from the Deputy Fire Safety Director informing tenants that the incident had occurred in the other building was consistent with protocol. 
the expanded advice did not correspond to any existing written protocol and did not reflect any instruction known to have been given to the deputy fire safety director that day we do not know the reason for the announcement as both the deputy fire safety director believed to have made it and the director of fire safety for the world trade center complex perished in the south towers collapse clearly however the prospect of another plane hitting the second building was beyond the contemplation of anyone giving advice according to one of the first fire chiefs to arrive such a scenario was unimaginable quote, beyond our consciousness end quote. as a result of the announcement many civilians remained on their floors others reversed their evacuation and went back up similar advice was given in person by security officials in both the ground floor lobby where a group of twenty that had descended by the elevators was personally instructed to go back upstairs and in the upper sky lobby where many waited for express elevators to take them down security officials who gave this advice were not part of the fire safety staff several south tower occupants called the port authority police desk and world trade center five some were advised to stand by for further instructions. Others were strongly advised to leave. It is not known whether the order by the FDNY to evacuate the South Tower was received by the Deputy Fire Safety Director making announcements there. However, at approximately 9.02, less than a minute before the building was hit, an instruction over the South Tower's public address system advised civilians generally that they could begin an orderly evacuation if conditions warranted like the earlier advice to remain in place it did not correspond to any pre-written emergency instruction fdny initial response mobilization the fdny response began within five seconds of the crash by nine o'clock many senior fdny leaders including seven of the eleven most highly ranked chiefs in the department as well as the commissioner and many of his deputies and assistants had begun responding from headquarters in brooklyn while en route over the brooklyn bridge the chief of department and the chief of operations had a clear view of the situation on the upper floors of the north tower they determined that because of the fire's magnitude and location near the top of the building their mission would be primarily one of rescue they called for a fifth alarm which would bring additional engine and ladder companies as well as for two more elite rescue units the chief of department arrived about nine o'clock general fdny incident command was transferred to his location on the west side highway in all twenty two of the thirty two senior chiefs and commissioners arrived at the world trade center before ten o'clock as of nine o'clock the units that were dispatched, including senior chiefs responding to headquarters, included approximately 235 firefighters. These units consisted of 21 engine companies, nine ladder companies, four of the department's elite rescue teams, the department's single hazmat team, two of the city's elite squad companies, and support staff. In addition, at 8.53, nine brooklyn units were staged on the brooklyn side of the brooklyn battery tunnel to await possible dispatch orders operations a battalion chief and two ladder and two engine companies arrived at the north tower at approximately 852 as they entered the lobby they encountered badly burned civilians who had been caught in the path of the fireball Floor to ceiling windows in the northwest corner of the west street level of the lobby had been blown out. Some large marble tiles had been dislodged from the walls. One entire elevator bank was destroyed by the fireball. Lights were functioning, however, and the air was clear of smoke. As the highest ranking officer on the scene, the battalion chief initially was the FDNY incident commander. Minutes later, the on-duty division chief for Lower Manhattan arrived and took over. Both chiefs immediately began speaking with the former fire safety director and other building personnel to learn whether building systems were working. They were advised that all 99 elevators in the North Tower appeared to be out, and there were no assurances that sprinklers or standpipes were working on upper floors. 
Chiefs also spoke with Port Authority police personnel and an OEM representative. After conferring with the chiefs in the lobby, one engine and one ladder company began climbing stairwell C at about 8.57, with the goal of approaching the impact zone as scouting units and reporting back to the chiefs in the lobby. The radio channel they used was Tactical 1. Following FDNY high-rise fire protocols, other units did not begin climbing immediately, as the chiefs worked to formulate a plan before sending them up. Units began mobilizing in the lobby, lining up and awaiting their marching orders. Also, by approximately 8.57, FDNY chiefs had asked both building personnel and a Port Authority police officer to evacuate the South Tower because, in their judgment, the impact of the plane into the North Tower made the entire complex unsafe, not because of concerns about a second plane. The FDNY chiefs in the increasingly crowded North Tower lobby were confronting critical choices with little or no information. They had ordered units up the stairs to report back on conditions, but did not know what the impact floors were. They did not know if any stairwells into the impact zone were clear, and they did not know whether water for firefighting would be available on the upper floors. They also did not know what the fire and impact zone looked like from the outside. They did know that the explosion had been large enough to send down a fireball that blew out elevators and windows in the lobby, and that conditions were so dire that some civilians on upper floors were jumping or falling from the building. They also knew from building personnel that some civilians were trapped in elevators and on specific floors. According to Division Chief for Lower Manhattan Peter Hayden, quote, we had a very strong sense we would lose firefighters and that we were in deep trouble, but we had estimates of 25,000 to 50,000 civilians and we had to try to rescue them." End quote. The chiefs concluded that this would be a rescue operation, not a firefighting operation. One of the chiefs present explained, quote, We realized that, because of the impact of the plane, that there was some structural damage to the building, and most likely that the fire suppression systems within the building were probably damaged and possibly inoperable. We knew that at the height of the day, there were as many as 50,000 people in this building. We had a large volume of fire on the upper floors. Each floor was approximately an acre in size. Several floors of fire would have been beyond the fire extinguishing capability of the forces we had on hand. So, we determined very early on that this was going to be strictly a rescue mission. We were going to vacate the building, get everybody out, and then we were going to get out." End quote. The specifics of the mission were harder to determine, as they had almost no information about the situation 80 or more stories above them. They also received advice from senior FDNY chiefs that while the building might eventually suffer a partial collapse on upper floors, such structural failure was not imminent. No one anticipated the possibility of a total collapse. Emergency Medical Services EMS, personnel were directed to one of four triage areas being set up around the perimeter of the World Trade Center. Some entered the lobby to respond to specific casualty reports. In addition, many ambulance paramedics from private hospitals were rushing to the World Trade Center complex. NYPD Initial Response Numerous NYPD officers saw the plane strike the North Tower and immediately reported it to NYPD communications dispatchers. At 8.58, while en route, the NYPD Chief of Department raised the NYPD's mobilization to level four, thereby sending to the World Trade Center approximately 22 lieutenants, 100 sergeants, and 800 police officers from all over the city. The chief of department arrived at Church and Vesey at nine o'clock. At 9.01, the NYPD patrol mobilization point was moved to West and Vesey in order to handle the greater number of patrol officers dispatched in the higher level mobilization. These officers would be stationed around the perimeter of the complex to direct the evacuation of civilians. 
Many were diverted on the way to the scene by intervening emergencies related to the attack. At 8.50, the aviation unit of the NYPD dispatched two helicopters to the World Trade Center to report on conditions and assess the feasibility of a rooftop landing or of special rescue operations. En route, the two helicopters communicated with air traffic controllers at the area's three major airports and informed them of the commercial airplane crash at the World Trade Center. The air traffic controllers had been unaware of the incident. At 8.56, an NYPD ESU team asked to be picked up at the Wall Street heliport to initiate rooftop rescues. At 8.58, however, after assessing the North Tower roof, a helicopter pilot advised the ESU team that they could not land on the roof because, quote, it is too engulfed in flames and heavy smoke condition, end quote. By 9 o'clock, a third NYPD helicopter was responding to the World Trade Center complex. NYPD helicopters and ESU officers remained on the scene throughout the morning, prepared to commence rescue operations on the roof if conditions improved. Both FDNY and NYPD protocols called for FDNY personnel to be placed in NYPD helicopters in the event of an attempted rooftop rescue at a high-rise fire. No FDNY personnel were placed in NYPD helicopters on September 11th. The 9-11 operators and FDNY dispatchers were not advised that rooftop rescues were not being undertaken. They thus were not able to communicate this fact to callers, some of whom spoke of attempting to climb to the roof. Two on-duty NYPD officers were on the 20th floor of the North Tower at 846. They climbed to the 29th floor, urging civilians to evacuate, but did not locate a group of civilians trapped on the 22nd floor. Just before 9 o'clock, an ESU team began to walk from Church and Vesey to the North Tower lobby with the goal of climbing toward and setting up a triage center on the upper floors for the severely injured. A second ESU team would follow them to assist in removing those individuals. Numerous officers responded in order to help injured civilians and to urge those who could walk to vacate the area immediately. Putting themselves in danger of falling debris, several officers entered the plaza and successfully rescued at least one injured, non-ambulatory citizen and attempted to rescue others. Also, by about 9 o'clock, transit officers began shutting down subway stations in the vicinity of the World Trade Center and evacuating civilians from those stations. Around the city, the NYPD cleared major thoroughfares for emergency vehicles to access the World Trade Center. The NYPD and PAPD coordinated the closing of bridges and tunnels into Manhattan. PAPD Initial Response the Port Authority's on-site commanding police officer was standing in the concourse when a fireball erupted out of elevator shafts and exploded onto the mall concourse, causing him to dive for cover. The on-duty sergeant initially instructed the officers in the World Trade Center Command to meet at the police desk in World Trade Center 5. Soon thereafter, he instructed officers arriving from outside commands to meet him at the fire safety desk in the North Tower lobby. A few of these officers from outside commands were given World Trade Center command radios. One Port Authority police officer at the World Trade Center immediately began climbing stairwell C in the North Tower. Other officers began performing rescue and evacuation operations on the ground floors and in the PATH, Port Authority Trans-Hudson, stationed below the World Trade Center complex. Within minutes of impact, Port Authority police officers from the PATH, Bridges, Tunnels, and Airport Commands began responding to the World Trade Center. The PAPD lacked written standard operating procedures for personnel responding from outside commands to the World Trade Center during a major incident. In addition, Officers from some PAPD commands lacked in interoperable radio frequencies. 
As a result, there was no comprehensive coordination of PAPD's overall response. At 9 o'clock, the PAPD commanding officer of the World Trade Center ordered an evacuation of all civilians in the World Trade Center complex because of the magnitude of the calamity in the North Tower. This order was given over World Trade Center Police Radio, Channel W, which could not be heard by the Deputy Fire Safety Director in the South Tower. Also at 9 o'clock, the PAPD Superintendent and Chief of Department arrived separately and made their way to the North Tower. OEM Initial Response By 8.48, Officials in OEM headquarters on the 23rd floor of World Trade Center 7, just to the north of the North Tower, began to activate the Emergency Operations Center by calling such agencies as the FDNY, NYPD, Department of Health, and the Greater Hospital Association, and instructing them to send their designated representatives to the OEM. In addition, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA was called and asked to send at least five federal urban search and rescue teams. Such teams are located throughout the United States. At approximately 8.50, a senior representative from the OEM arrived in the lobby of the North Tower and began to act as the OEM field responder to the incident. He soon was joined by several other OEM officials, including the OEM director. Summary in the 17-minute period between 18.46 and 9.03 a.m. on September 11th, New York City and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey had mobilized the largest rescue operation in the city's history. Well over a thousand first responders had been deployed, an evacuation begun, and the critical decision that the fire could not be fought had been made. Then the second plane hit. From 9.03 until 9.59 a.m. At 9.03 and 11 seconds, the hijacked United Airlines Flight 175 hit the Second World Trade Center, the South Tower, from the south, crashing through the 77th to the 85th floors. What had been the largest and most complicated rescue operation in city history instantly doubled in magnitude. The plane banked as it hit the building, leaving portions of the building undamaged on impact floors. As a consequence, and in contrast to the situation in the North Tower, one of the stairwells, A, initially remained passable from at least the 91st floor down and likely from top to bottom. Civilians, fire safety personnel, and 911 calls. South Tower. At the lower end of the impact, the 78th floor sky lobby, hundreds had been waiting to evacuate when the plane hit. Many had attempted but failed to squeeze into packed express elevators. Upon impact, many were killed or severely injured. Others were relatively unharmed. We know of at least one civilian who seized the initiative and shouted that anyone who could walk should walk to the stairs and anyone who could help should help others in need of assistance. As a result, at least two small groups of civilians descended from that floor. Others remained on the floor to help the injured and move victims who were unable to walk to the stairwell to aid their rescue. Still others remained alive in the impact zone above the 78th floor. Damage was extensive and conditions were highly precarious. The only survivor known to have escaped from the heart of the impact zone described the 81st floor where the wing of the plane had sliced through his office as a demolition site in which everything was broken up and the smell of jet fuel was so strong that it was almost impossible to breathe. This person escaped by means of an unlikely rescue, aided by a civilian fire warden descending from a higher floor who, critically, had been provided with a flashlight. At least four people were able to descend stairwell A from the 81st floor or above. One left the 84th floor immediately after the building was hit. Even at that point, the stairway was dark, smoky, and difficult to navigate. Glow strips on the stairs and handrails were a significant help. 
Several flights down, however, the evacuee became confused when he reached a smoke door that caused him to believe the stairway had ended. He was able to exit that stairwell and switch to another. Many civilians in and above the impact zone ascended the stairs. One small group reversed its descent down the stairwell A after being advised by another civilian that they were approaching a floor in flames. The only known survivor has told us that their intention was to exit the stairwell in search of clearer air. At the 91st floor, joined by others from intervening floors, they perceived themselves to be trapped in the stairwell and began descending again. By this time, the stairwell was pretty black. Intensifying smoke caused many to pass out, and the fire had ignited in the 82nd floor transfer hallway. Others ascended to attempt to reach the roof, but were thwarted by locked doors. At approximately 9.30, a lock release order, which would unlock all areas in the complex controlled by the building's computerized security system, including doors leading to the roofs, was transmitted to the Security Command Center, located on the 22nd floor of the North Tower. Damage to the software controlling the system resulting from the impact of the plane prevented this order from being executed. Others attempting to descend were frustrated by jammed or locked doors and stairwells, or confused by the structure of the stairwell deviations. By the lower 70s, however, stairwells A and B were well lit and conditions were generally normal. Some civilians remained on affected floors, and at least one ascended from a lower point into the impact zone to help evacuate colleagues or assist the injured. Within 15 minutes after the impact, debilitating smoke had reached at least one location on the 100th floor, and severe smoke conditions were reported throughout the floors in the 90s and 100s over the course of the following half hour. By 9.30, a number of civilians who had failed to reach the roof remained on the 105th floor, likely unable to descend because of intensifying smoke in the stairwell. There were reports of tremendous smoke on that floor, but at least one area remained less affected until shortly before the building collapsed. There were several areas between the impact zone and the uppermost floors where conditions were better. At least a hundred people remained alive on the 88th and 89th floors, in some cases calling 911 for direction. The 911 system remained plagued by the operator's lack of awareness of what was occurring. Just as in the North Tower, callers from below and above the impact zone were advised to remain where they were and wait for help. The operators were not given any information about the inability to conduct rooftop rescues and therefore could not advise callers that they had essentially been ruled out. This lack of information, combined with the general advice to remain where they were, may have caused civilians above the impact not to attempt to descend, although stairwell A may have been passable. In addition, the 911 system struggled with the volume of calls and rigid standard operating procedures, according to which calls conveying crucial information had to wait to be transferred to either EMS or FDNY dispatch. According to one civilian who was evacuating down stairwell A from the heart of the impact zone and who stopped on the 31st floor in order to call 911, quote, I told them when they answered the phone where I was that I had passed somebody on the 44th floor injured. They need to get a medic and a stretcher to this floor and describe the situation in brief and the person then asked for my phone number or something and they said they put me on hold. You gotta talk to one of my supervisors and suddenly I was on hold and so I waited a considerable amount of time. Somebody else came back on the phone. I repeated the story, and then it happened again. I was on hold a second time and needed to repeat the story for a third time. But I told the third person that I am only telling you once. I am getting out of the building. Here are the details. Write it down and do what you should do. End quote. Very few 911 calls were received from floors below the impact, but at least one person was advised to remain on the 73rd floor despite the caller's protests 
convinced that oxygen was running out. The last known 911 call from this location came at 9.52. Evidence suggests that the public address system did not continue to function after the building was hit. A group of people trapped on the 97th floor, however, made repeated references and calls to 911 to having heard announcements to go down the stairs. Evacuation tones were heard in locations both above and below the impact zone. By 935, the West Street lobby level of the South Tower was becoming overwhelmed by injured people who had descended to the lobby but were having difficulty going on. Those who could continue were directed to exit north or east through the concourse and then out of the World Trade Center complex. By 959, at least one person had descended from as high as the 91st floor of the tower, and stairwell A was reported to have been almost empty. Stairwell B was also reported to have contained only a handful of descending civilians at an earlier point in the morning, but just before the tower collapsed, a team of NYPD ESU officers encountered a stream of civilians descending an unidentified stairwell in the 20s. These civilians may have been descending from at or above the impact zone. North Tower In the North Tower, civilians continued their evacuation. On the 91st floor, the highest floor with stairway access, all civilians but one were uninjured and able to descend. While some complained of smoke, heat, fumes, and crowding in the stairwells, conditions were otherwise fairly normal on floors below the impact. At least one stairwell was reported to have been clear and bright from the upper 80s down. Those who called 911 from floors below the impact were generally advised to remain in place. One group, trapped on the 83rd floor, pleaded repeatedly to know whether the fire was above or below them, specifically asking if 911 operators had any information from the outside or from the news. The callers were transferred back and forth several times and advised to stay put. Evidence suggests that these callers died. At 8.59, the Port Authority Police Desk at the Newark Airport told a third party that a group of Port Authority civilian employees on the 64th floor should evacuate. The third party was not at the World Trade Center, but had been in phone contact with the group on the 64th floor. At 9.10, in response to an inquiry from the employees themselves, the Port Authority Police Desk in Jersey City confirmed that employees on the 64th floor should be careful, stay near the stairwells, and wait for the police to come up. When the third party inquired again at 931, the police desk at the Newark Airport advised that they absolutely evacuate. The third party informed the police desk that the employees had previously received contrary advice from the FDNY, which could only have come via 911. These workers were not trapped, yet, unlike most occupants on the upper floors, they had chosen not to descend immediately after impact. They eventually began to descend the stairs, but most of them died in the collapse of the North Tower. All civilians who reached the lobby were directed by NYPD and PAPD officers into the concourse, where other police officers guided them to exit the concourse and complex to the north and east so that they might avoid falling debris and victims. By 9.55, only a few civilians were descending above the 25th floor in stairwell B. These primarily were injured, handicapped, elderly, or severely overweight civilians, in some cases being assisted by other civilians. By 9.59, tenants from the 91st floor had already descended the stairs and exited the concourse. However, a number of civilians remained in at least stairwell C, approaching lower floors. Other evacuees were killed earlier by debris falling on the street. FDNY response, increased mobilization. Immediately after the second plane hit, the FDNY chief of department called a second fifth alarm. 
by 915 the number of fdny personnel en route to or present at the scene was far greater than the commanding chiefs at the scene had requested five factors account for this disparity first while the second fifth alarm had called for twenty engine and eight ladder companies in fact twenty three engine and thirteen ladder companies were dispatched second several other units self-dispatched third because the attacks came so close to the nine o'clock shift change many firefighters just going off duty were given permission by company officers to ride heavy and became part of those on-duty teams under the leadership of that unit's officer. Fourth, many off-duty firefighters responded from firehouses separately from the on-duty unit, in some cases when expressly told not to, or from home. The arrival of personnel in excess of that dispatched was particularly pronounced in the department's elite units. Fifth, Numerous additional FDNY personnel, such as fire marshals and firefighters in administrative positions, who lacked a predetermined operating role, also reported to the World Trade Center. The Repeater System Almost immediately after the South Tower was hit, senior FDNY chiefs in the North Tower lobby huddled together to discuss strategy for the operations in the two towers. Of particular concern to the chiefs, in light of FDNY difficulties in responding to the 1993 bombing was communications capability. One of the chiefs recommended testing the repeater channel to see if it would work. Earlier, an FDNY chief had asked building personnel to activate the repeater channel, which would enable greatly enhanced FDNY portable radio communications in the high-rises. One button on the repeater system activation console in the North Tower was pressed at 854, though it is unclear by whom. As a result of this activation, communication became possible between FDNY portable radios on the repeater channel. In addition, the repeater's master handset at the fire safety desk could hear communications made by FDNY portable radios on the repeater channel. The activation of transmission on the master handset required, however, that a second button be pressed. That second button was never activated on the morning of September 11th. At 9.05, FDNY chiefs tested the World Trade Center complex's repeater system. Because the second button had not been activated, the chief on the master handset could not transmit. He was also apparently unable to hear another chief who was attempting to communicate with him from a portable radio, either because of a technical problem or because the volume was turned down on the console, the normal setting when the system was not in use. Because the repeater channel seemed inoperable, the master handset appeared unable to transmit or receive communications. The chiefs in the North Tower lobby decided not to use it. The repeater system was working at least partially, however, on portable FDNY radios, and firefighters subsequently used repeater channel 7 in the South Tower. FDNY North Tower Operations Command and control decisions were affected by the lack of knowledge of what was happening 30, 60, 90, and 100 floors above. According to one of the chiefs in the lobby, one of the most critical things in a major operation like this is to have information. We didn't have a lot of information coming in. We didn't receive any reports of what was seen from the NYPD helicopters. It was impossible to know how much damage was done on the upper floors, whether the stairwells were intact or not. According to another chief present, People watching on TV certainly had more knowledge of what was happening a hundred floors above us than we did in the lobby. Without critical information coming in, it's very difficult to make informed, critical decisions. As a result, chiefs in the lobby disagreed over whether anyone at or above the impact zone possibly could be rescued, or whether there should be even limited firefighting for the purpose of cutting exit routes through fire zones. 
Many units were simply instructed to ascend toward the impact zone and report back to the lobby via radio. Some units were directed to assist specific groups of individuals trapped in elevators or in offices well below the impact zone. One FDNY company successfully rescued some civilians who were trapped on the 22nd floor as a result of damage caused by the initial fireball. An attempt was made to track responding units assignments on a magnetic board, but the number of units and individual firefighters arriving in the lobby made this an overwhelming task. As the fire companies were not advised to the contrary, they followed protocol and kept their radios on tactical channel 1, which would be monitored by the chiefs in the lobby. Those battalion chiefs who would climb would operate on a separate command channel, which also would be monitored by the chiefs in the lobby. Fire companies began to ascend stairwell B at approximately 9.07, laden with about 100 pounds of heavy protective clothing, self-contained breathing apparatuses, and other equipment, including hoses for engine companies and heavy tools for ladder companies. Firefighters found the stairways they entered intact, lit, and clear of smoke. Unbeknownst to the lobby command post, one battalion chief in the North Tower found a working elevator, which he took to the 16th floor before beginning to climb. In ascending stairwell B, firefighters were passing a steady and heavy stream of descending civilians. Firemen were impressed with the composure and total lack of panic shown by almost all civilians. Many civilians were in awe of the firefighters and found their mere presence to be calming. Firefighters periodically stopped on particular floors and searched to ensure that no civilians were still on it. In a few instances, healthy civilians were found on floors, either because they were still collecting personal items or for no apparent reason. They were told to evacuate immediately. Firefighters deputized healthy civilians to be in charge of others who were struggling or injured. Climbing up the stairs with heavy protective clothing and equipment was very hard work, even for physically fit firefighters. As firefighters began to suffer varying levels of fatigue, some became separated from others in their unit. At 9.32, a senior chief radioed all units in the North Tower to return to the lobby, either because of a false report of a third plane approaching or because of his judgment about the deteriorating condition of the building. Once the rumor of the third plane was debunked, other chiefs continued operations, and there is no evidence that any units actually returned to the lobby. At the same time, a chief in the lobby was asked to consider the possibility of a rooftop rescue, but was unable to reach FDNY dispatch by radio or phone. Out on West Street, however, the FDNY chief of department had already dismissed any rooftop rescue as impossible. As units climbed higher, their ability to communicate with chiefs on Tactical 1 became more limited and sporadic both because of the limited effectiveness of FDNY radios in high-rises and because so many units on Tactical 1 were trying to communicate at once. When attempting to reach a particular unit, chiefs in the lobby often heard nothing in response. Just prior to 10 o'clock in the North Tower, one engine company had climbed to the 54th floor. At least two other companies of firefighters had reached the Sky Lobby on the 44th floor, and numerous units were located between the 5th and 37th floors. FDNY South Tower and Marriott Hotel Operations Immediately after the repeater test, a senior chief and a battalion chief commenced operations in the South Tower Lobby. Almost at once, they were joined by an OEM field responder. They were not, however, joined right away by a sizable number of fire companies as units that had been in or en route to the North Tower Lobby at 9.03 were not reallocated to the South Tower. A battalion chief and a ladder company found a working elevator to the 40th floor and from there proceeded to climb stairwell B. 
Another ladder company arrived soon thereafter and began to rescue civilians trapped in an elevator between the first and second floors. The senior chief in the lobby expressed frustration about the lack of units he initially had at his disposal for South Tower operations. Unlike the commanders in the North Tower, the senior chief in the lobby and the ascending battalion chief kept their radios on repeater channel 7. For the first 15 minutes of the operations, communications among them and the latter company climbing with the battalion chief worked well. Upon learning from a company security official that the impact zone began at the 78th floor, a ladder company transmitted this information, and the battalion chief directed an engine company staged on the 40th floor to attempt to find an elevator to reach that upper level. To our knowledge, no FDNY chiefs outside the South Tower realized that the repeater channel was functioning and being used by units in that tower. The senior chief in the South Tower lobby was initially unable to communicate his requests for more units to chiefs either in the North Tower lobby or at the outdoor command post. From approximately 9.21 on, the ascending battalion chief was unable to reach the South Tower lobby command post because the senior chief in the lobby had ceased to communicate on repeater channel 7. The vast majority of units that entered the South Tower did not communicate on the repeater channel. The first FDNY fatality of the day occurred at approximately 9.30 when a civilian landed on and killed a fireman near the intersection of West and Liberty Streets. By 9.30, chiefs in charge of the South Tower still were in need of additional companies. Several factors account for the lag in response. First, only two units that had been dispatched to the North Tower prior to 9.03 reported immediately to the South Tower. Second, units were not actually sent until approximately five minutes after the FDNY Chief of Department ordered their dispatch. Third, those units that had been ordered at 8.53 to stage at the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, and thus very close to the World Trade Center complex, were not dispatched after the plane hit the South Tower. Fourth, Units parked further north on West Street, then proceeded south on foot and stopped at the overall FDNY command post on West Street, where in some cases they were told to wait. Fifth, some units responded directly to the North Tower. Indeed, radio communications indicated that in certain cases some firemen believed that the South Tower was World Trade Center 1, when in fact it was World Trade Center 2. Sixth, some units couldn't find the staging area at West Street south of Liberty for the South Tower. Finally, the jumpers and debris that confronted units attempting to enter the South Tower from its main entrance on Liberty Street caused some units to search for indirect ways to enter that tower, most often through the Marriott Hotel or simply to remain on West Street. A chief at the overall outdoor command post was under the impression that he was to assist in lobby operations of the South Tower, and in fact, his aide already was in that lobby. But because of his lack of familiarity with the World Trade Center complex and confusion over how to get to there, he instead ended up in the Marriott about 9.35. Here he came across about 14 units, many of which had been trying to find safe access to the South Tower. He directed them to secure the elevators and conduct search and rescue operations on the upper floors of the Marriott. Four of these companies searched the spa on the hotel's top floor, the 22nd floor, for civilians, and found none. Feeling satisfied with the scope of the operation in the Marriott, the chief in the lobby there directed some units to proceed to what he thought was the South Tower. In fact, he pointed them to the North Tower. Three of the FDNY companies who had entered the North Tower from the Marriott found a working elevator in a bank at the south end of the lobby, which they took to the 23rd floor. In response to the shortage of units in the South Tower, at 9.37 an additional second alarm was requested by the chief at the West and Liberty Streets staging area. 
at this time the units that earlier had been staged on the brooklyn side of the brooklyn battery tunnel were dispatched to the south tower some had gone through the tunnel already and had responded to the marriott not the south tower between nine forty five and nine fifty eight the ascending battalion chief continued to lead f d n y operations on the upper floors of the south tower at nine fifty an f d n y ladder company encountered numerous seriously injured civilians on the seventieth floor with the assistance of a security guard at nine fifty three a group of civilians trapped in an elevator on the seventy eighth floor sky lobby were found by an f d n y company they were freed from the elevator at nine fifty eight by that time the battalion chief had reached the seventy eighth floor on stairwell a he reported that it looked open to the seventy ninth floor well into the impact zone he also reported numerous civilian fatalities in the area f d n y command and control outside the towers the overall command post consisted of senior chiefs commissioners the field communications van numerous units that began to arrive after the south tower was hit and ems chiefs and personnel Fieldcom's two main functions were to relay information between the overall operations command post and FDNY dispatch, and to track all units operating at the scene on a large magnetic board. Both of these missions were severely compromised by the magnitude of the disaster on September 11th. First, the means of transmitting information were unreliable. For example, while FDNY dispatch advised Fieldcom that 100 people were reported via 911 to be trapped on the 105th floor of the North Tower, and Fieldcom then attempted to convey that report to chiefs at the outdoor command post, this information did not reach the North Tower lobby. Second, Fieldcom's ability to keep track of which units were operating where was limited because many units reported directly to the North Tower, the South Tower, or the Marriott. Third, efforts to track units by listening to Tactical 1 were severely hampered by the number of units using that channel. As many people tried to speak at once, their transmissions overlapped and often became indecipherable. In the opinion of one of the members of the Fieldcom group, Tactical One simply was not designed to handle the number of units operating on it that morning. The primary field comm van had access to the NYPD's Special Operations Channel, but it was in the garage for repairs on September 11th. The backup van lacked that capability. The Chief of Department, along with civilian commissioners and senior EMS chiefs, organized ambulances on West Street to expedite the transport of injured civilians to hospitals. To our knowledge, none of the chiefs present believed that a total collapse of either tower was possible. One senior chief did articulate his concern that the upper floors could begin to collapse in a few hours, and that firefighters thus should not ascend above floors in the 60s. That opinion was not conveyed to chiefs in the North Tower lobby, and there is no evidence that it was conveyed to chiefs in the South Tower lobby either. Although the chief of department had general authority over operations, tactical decisions remained the province of the lobby commanders. The highest ranking officer in the North Tower was responsible for communicating with the chief of department. They had two brief conversations. In the first, the senior lobby chief gave the chief of department a status report and confirmed that this was a rescue, not firefighting, operation. In the second conversation, at about 9.45, the chief of department suggested that given how the North Tower appeared to him, the senior lobby chief might want to consider evacuating FDNY personnel. At 9.46, the chief of department called an additional fifth alarm, and at 9.54, an additional 20 engine and six ladder companies were sent to the World Trade Center. As a result, more than one-third of all FDNY companies now had been dispatched to the World Trade Center. At about 9.57, an EMS paramedic approached the FDNY chief of department 
and advised that an engineer in front of World Trade Center 7 had just remarked that the Twin Towers, in fact, were in imminent danger of total collapse. NYPD response. Immediately after the second plane hit, the chief of department of the NYPD ordered a second level four mobilization, bringing the total number of NYPD officers responding to close to 2,000. The NYPD chief of department called for Operation Omega, which required the protection of sensitive locations around the city. NYPD headquarters were secured and all other government buildings were evacuated. The ESU command posts at Church and Vesey Streets coordinated all NYPD and ESU rescue teams. After the South Tower was hit, the ESU officer running this command post decided to send one ESU team, each with approximately six police officers, up each side of the Twin Tower stairwells. While he continued to monitor the citywide SOD channel, which NYP helicopters were using, he also monitored the point-to-point -point tactical channel that the ESU teams climbing in the towers would use. The first NYPD ESU team entered the West Street level lobby of the North Tower and prepared to begin climbing at about 9.15 a.m. They attempted to check in with the FDNY chiefs present, but they were rebuffed. OEM personnel did not intervene. The ESU team began to climb the stairs. Shortly thereafter, a second NYPD ESU team entered the South Tower. The OEM field responder present ensured that they check in with the FDNY chief in charge of the lobby, and it was agreed that the ESU team would ascend and support FDNY personnel. A third ESU team subsequently entered the North Tower at its elevated mezzanine lobby level and made no effort to check in with the FDNY command post. A fourth ESU team entered the South Tower. By 9.59, a fifth ESU team was next to World Trade Center 6 and preparing to enter the North Tower. By approximately 9.50, the lead ESU team had reached the 31st floor, observing that there appeared to be no more civilians still descending. This ESU team encountered a large group of firefighters and administered oxygen to some of them who were exhausted. At about 9.56, the officer running the ESU command post on Church and Vesey Streets had a final radio communication with one of the ESU teams in the South Tower. The team then stated that it was ascending via stairs, was somewhere in the 20s, and was making slow progress because of the numerous descending civilians crowding the stairwell. Three plainclothes NYPD officers without radios or protective gear had begun ascending either stairwell A or C of the North Tower. They began checking every other floor above the 12th for civilians. Only occasionally did they find any, and in those few cases, they ordered the civilians to evacuate immediately. While checking floors, they used office phones to call their superiors. In one phone call, an NYPD chief instructed them to leave the North Tower, but they refused to do so. As they climbed higher, they encountered increasing smoke and heat. Shortly before 10 o'clock, they arrived on the 54th floor. Throughout this period, 9.03 to 9.59, a group of NYPD and Port Authority police officers, as well as two Secret Service agents, continued to assist civilians leaving the North Tower. They were positioned around the mezzanine lobby level of the North Tower, directing civilians leaving stairwells A and C to evacuate down an escalator to the concourse. The officers instructed those civilians, who seemed composed, to evacuate the complex calmly but rapidly. Other civilians exiting the stairs, who were either injured or exhausted, collapsed at the foot of these stairs. Officers then assisted them out of the building. When civilians reached the concourse, another NYPD officer stationed at the bottom of the escalator directed them to exit through the concourse to the north and east and then out of the World Trade Center complex. This exit route ensured that civilians would not be endangered by falling debris and people on West Street, on the plaza between the towers, and on Liberty Street. 
some officers positioned themselves at the top of a flight of stairs by world trade center five that led down into the concourse going into the concourse when necessary to evacuate injured or disoriented civilians numerous other nypd officers were stationed throughout the concourse assisting burned injured and disoriented civilians as well as directing all civilians to exit to the north and east nypd officers were also in the south tower lobby to assist in civilian evacuation nypd officers stationed on bessie street between west street and church street urged civilians not to remain in the area and instead to keep walking north at 906 the nypd chief of department instructed that no units were to land on the roof of either tower at about 930 one of the helicopters present advised that a rooftop evacuation still would not be possible one nypd helicopter pilot believed one portion of the north tower roof to be free enough of smoke that a hoist could be lowered in order to rescue people but there was no one on the roof this pilot's helicopter never attempted to hover directly over the tower another helicopter did attempt to do so and its pilot stated that the severity of the heat from the jet fuel laden fire in the north tower would have made it impossible to hover low enough for a rescue because the high temperature would have destabilized the helicopter at 951 an aviation unit warned units of large pieces of debris hanging from the building Prior to 9.59, no NYPD helicopter pilot predicted that either tower would collapse. Interaction of 911 calls and NYPD operations. At 9.37, a civilian on the 106th floor of the South Tower reported to a 911 operator that a lower floor, the 90-something floor, was collapsing. This information was conveyed inaccurately by the 911 operator to an NYPD dispatcher. The dispatcher further confused the substance of the 911 call by telling NYPD officers at the World Trade Center complex that the 106th floor is crumbling. At 9.52, 15 minutes after the 911 call was placed, the NYPD dispatcher conveyed this message on the radio frequency used in precincts in the vicinity of the World Trade Center and subsequently on the Special Operations Division's channel, but not on Citywide Channel 1. PAPD Response Initial responders from outside PAPD commands proceeded to the police desk in World Trade Center 5 or to the fire safety desk in the North Tower lobby. Some officers were then assigned to assist in stairwell evacuations. Others were assigned to expedite evacuation in the plaza, concourse, and path station. As information was received of civilians trapped above ground level floors in the North Tower, other PAPD officers were instructed to climb those floors for rescue efforts. Still, others began climbing toward the impact zone. At 9-11, the PAPD superintendent and an inspector began walking up stairwell B of the North Tower to assess damage near and in the impact zone. The PAPD chief and several other PAPD officers began ascending a stairwell in order to reach the Windows on the World restaurant on the 106th floor from which calls had been made to the PAPD police desk reporting at least 100 people trapped. Many PAPD officers from different commands responded on their own initiative. By 9.30, the PAPD Central Police Desk requested that responding officers meet at West and Vesey and await further instructions. In the absence of a predetermined command structure to deal with an incident of this magnitude, a number of PAPD inspectors, captains, and lieutenants step forward at around 9.30 to formulate an on-site response plan. They were hampered by not knowing how many officers were responding to the site and where those officers were operating. Many of the officers who responded to this command post lacked suitable protective equipment to enter the complex. By 9.58, one PAPD officer had reached the 44th floor sky lobby of the North Tower. Also in the North Tower, one team of PAPD officers was in the mid-twenties, and another was in the lower twenties. 
Numerous PAPD officers were also climbing in the South Tower, including the PAPD ESU team. Many PAPD officers were on the ground floors of the complex, some assisting in evacuation, others manning the PAPD desk in World Trade Center 5 or assisting at lobby command posts. OEM Response After the South Tower was hit, OEM senior leadership decided to remain in its bunker and continue conducting operations, even though all civilians had been evacuated from World Trade Center 7. At approximately 9.30, a senior OEM official ordered the evacuation of the facility after a Secret Service agent in World Trade Center 7 advised him that additional commercial planes were not accounted for. Prior to its evacuation, no outside agency liaisons had reached OEM. OEM field responders were stationed in each tower's lobby, at the FDNY overall command post, and, at least for some period of time, at the NYPD command post at Church and Vesey. Summary The emergency response effort escalated with the crash of United 175 into the South Tower. With that escalation, communications as well as command and control became increasingly critical and increasingly difficult. First responders assisted thousands of civilians in evacuating the towers, even as incident commanders from responding agencies lacked knowledge of what other agencies and, in some cases, their own responders were doing. End of Chapter 9.2, Part 1 Part 2 of Chapter 9.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The 9-11 Commission Report. Part 2 of Chapter 9.2. From 9.59 until 10.28 a.m. At 9.58 and 59 seconds, the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds, killing all civilians and emergency personnel inside, as well as a number of individuals, both first responders and civilians, in the concourse, in the Marriott, and on neighboring streets. The building collapsed into itself, causing a ferocious windstorm and creating a massive debris cloud. The Marriott Hotel suffered significant damage as a result of the collapse of the South Tower. Civilian Response in the North Tower The 911 calls placed from most locations in the North Tower grew increasingly desperate as time went on. As late as 1028, people remained alive in some locations including on the 92nd and 79th floors. Below the impact zone, it is likely that most civilians who were physically and emotionally capable of descending had exited the tower. The civilians who were nearing the bottom of stairwell C were assisted out of the building by NYPD, FDNY, and PAPD personnel. Others who experienced difficulty evacuating were being helped by first responders on lower floors. FDNY Response Immediate Impact of the Collapse of the South Tower The FDNY overall command post and posts in the North Tower lobby, the Marriott lobby, and the staging area on West Street south of Liberty all ceased to operate upon the collapse of the South Tower as did EMS staging areas, because of their proximity to the building. Those who had been in the North Tower lobby had no way of knowing that the South Tower had suffered a complete collapse. Chiefs who had fled from the overall command post on the west side of West Street took shelter in the underground parking garage at Number 2 World Financial Center and were not available to influence FDNY operations for the next 10 minutes or so. When the South Tower collapsed, firefighters on upper floors of the North Tower 
heard a violent roar, and many were knocked off their feet. They saw debris coming up the stairs, and observed that the power was lost, and emergency lights activated. Nevertheless, those firefighters not standing near windows facing south had no way of knowing that the south tower had collapsed. Many surmised that a bomb had exploded, or that the north tower had suffered a partial collapse on its upper floors. We do not know whether the repeater channel continued to function after 959. Initial Evacuation Instructions and Communications the South Tower's total collapse was immediately communicated on the Manhattan Dispatch Channel by an FDNY boat on the Hudson River, but to our knowledge, no one at the site received this information because every FDNY command post had been abandoned, including the overall command post, which included the field comm van. Despite his lack of knowledge of what had happened to the South Tower, a chief in the process of evacuating the North Tower lobby sent out an order within a minute of the collapse. Command to all units in Tower 1, evacuate the building. Another chief from the North Tower lobby soon followed with an additional evacuation order issued on Tactical 1. Evacuation orders did not follow the protocol for giving instructions when a building's collapse may be imminent, a protocol that includes constantly repeating Mayday, Mayday, Mayday during the 29 minutes between the fall of the South Tower and that of the North Tower. In addition, most of the evacuation instructions did not mention that the South Tower had collapsed, However, at least three firefighters heard evacuation instructions, which stated that the North Tower was in danger of imminent collapse. FDNY personnel above the ground floors of the North Tower. Within minutes, some firefighters began to hear evacuation orders over Tactical 1. At least one chief also gave the evacuation instruction on the command channel, used only by chiefs in the North Tower, which was much less crowded. At least two battalion chiefs on upper floors of the North Tower, one on the 23rd floor and one on the 35th floor, heard the evacuation instruction on the command channel and repeated it to everyone they came across. The chief on the 23rd floor apparently aggressively took charge to ensure that all firefighters on the floors in the immediate area were evacuating. The chief on the 35th floor also heard a separate radio communication stating that the South Tower had collapsed, which the chief on the 23rd floor may have heard as well. He subsequently acted with a sense of urgency, and some firefighters heard the evacuation order for the first time when he repeated it on Tactical 1. This chief also had a bullhorn and traveled to each of the stairwells and shouted the evacuation order, quote, All FDNY get the fuck out, end quote. As a result of his efforts, many firefighters who had not been in the process of evacuating began to do so. Other firefighters did not receive the evacuation transmissions for one of four reasons. First, some FDNY radios did not pick up the transmission because of the difficulties of radio communications and high-rises. Second, the numbers trying to use Tactical 1 after the South Tower collapsed may have drowned out some evacuation instructions. According to one FDNY lieutenant, who was on the 31st floor of the North Tower at the time, quote, Tactical Channel 1 just might have been so bogged down that it may have been impossible to get that order through, end quote. Third, some firefighters in the North Tower were off-duty and did not have radios. Fourth, some firefighters in the North Tower had been dispatched to the South Tower and likely were on the different tactical channel assigned to that tower. FDNY personnel in the North Tower who received the evacuation orders did not respond uniformly. Some units, including one whose officer knew that the South Tower had collapsed, either delayed or stopped their evacuation in order to assist non-ambulatory civilians. Some units whose members had become separated during the climb attempted to regroup so they could descend together. Some units began to evacuate, but, according to eyewitnesses, did not hurry. 
at least several firefighters who survived believed that they and others would have evacuated more urgently had they known of the south tower's complete collapse other firefighters continued to sit and rest on floors while other companies descended past them and reminded them that they were supposed to evacuate some firefighters were determined not to leave the building while other fdny personnel remained inside and in one case convinced others to remain with them in another case firefighters had successfully descended to the lobby where another firefighter then persuaded them to reascend in order to look for specific fdny personnel other fdny personnel did not hear the evacuation order on their radio but were advised orally to leave the building by other firefighters and police who were them themselves evacuating by 1024, approximately five FDNY companies reached the bottom of stairwell B and entered the North Tower lobby. They stood in the lobby for more than a minute, not certain what to do, as no chiefs were present. Finally, one firefighter, who had earlier seen from a window that the South Tower had collapsed, urged that they all leave, as this tower could fall as well. The units then proceeded to exit onto West Street, while they were doing so, the North Tower began its pancake collapse, killing some of these men. Other FDNY Personnel The Marriott Hotel suffered significant damage in the collapse of the South Tower. Those in the lobby were knocked down and enveloped in the darkness of a debris cloud. Some were hurt but could walk. Others were more severely injured and some were trapped. Several firefighters came across a group of about 50 civilians who had been taking shelter in the restaurant and assisted them in evacuating. Up above, at the time of the South Tower's collapse, four companies were descending the stairs single file in a line of approximately 20 men. Four survived. At the time of the South Tower's collapse, Two FDNY companies were either at the eastern side of the North Tower lobby, near the mall concourse, or actually in the mall concourse, trying to reach the South Tower. Many of these men were thrown off their feet by the collapse of the South Tower. They then attempted to regroup in the darkness of the debris cloud and evacuate civilians and themselves, not knowing that the South Tower had collapsed. Several of these firefighters subsequently searched the path station below the concourse, unaware that the PAPD had cleared the area of all civilians by 919. At about 1015, the FDNY chief of department and the chief of safety, who had returned to West Street from the parking garage, confirmed that the South Tower had collapsed. The chief of department issued a radio order for all units to evacuate the North Tower, repeating it about five times. He then directed that the FDNY command post be moved further north on West Street and told FDNY units in the area to proceed north on West Street toward Chambers Street. At approximately 1025, he radioed for two ladder companies to respond to the Marriott where he was aware that both FDNY personnel and civilians were trapped. Many chiefs, including several of those who had been in the North Tower lobby, did not learn that the South Tower had collapsed until 30 minutes or more after the event. According to two eyewitnesses, however, one senior FDNY chief who knew that the South Tower had collapsed strongly expressed the opinion that the North Tower would not collapse because, unlike the South Tower, it had not been hit on a corner. After the South Tower collapsed, some firefighters on the streets neighboring the North Tower remained where they were or came closer to the North Tower. Some of these firefighters did not know that the South Tower had collapsed, but many chose, despite that knowledge, to remain in an attempt to save additional lives. According to one such firefighter, a chief who was preparing to mount a search and rescue mission in the Marriott, quote, I would never think of myself as a leader of men if I had headed north on West Street after the South Tower collapsed, end quote. Just outside the North Tower on West Street, 
one firefighter was directing others exiting the building and telling them when no jumpers were coming down and it was safe to run out a senior chief had grabbed an nypd bullhorn and was urging firefighters exiting onto west street to continue running north well away from the world trade center three of the most senior and respected members of the fdny were involved in attempting to rescue civilians and firefighters from the marriott nypd response a member of the nypd aviation unit radioed that the south tower had collapsed immediately after it happened and further advised that all people in the world trade center complex in nearby areas should be evacuated at 10.04, NYPD Aviation reported that the top 15 stories of the North Tower, quote, were glowing red, end quote, and that they might collapse. At 10.08, a helicopter pilot warned that he did not believe the North Tower would last much longer. Immediately after the South Tower collapsed, many NYPD radio frequencies became overwhelmed with transmissions relating to injured, trapped, or missing officers. As a result, NYPD radio communications became strained on most channels. Nevertheless, they remained effective enough for the two closest NYPD mobilization points to be moved further from the World Trade Center at 10.06. Just like most firefighters, the ESU rescue teams in the North Tower had no idea that the South Tower had collapsed. However, by 10 o'clock, the ESU officer running the command post at Church and Vesey ordered the evacuation of all ESU units from the World Trade Center complex. This officer, who had observed the South Tower collapse, reported it to ESU units in the North Tower in his evacuation instruction. This instruction was clearly heard by two ESU units already in the North Tower and the other ESU unit preparing to enter the tower. The ESU team on the 31st floor found the full collapse of the South Tower so unfathomable that they radioed back to the ESU officer at the command post and asked him to repeat his communication. He reiterated his urgent message. The ESU team on the 31st floor conferred with the FDNY personnel there to ensure that they, too, knew that they had to evacuate, then proceeded down stairwell B. During the descent, they reported seeing many firefighters who were resting and did not seem to be in the process of evacuating. They further reported advising these firefighters to evacuate, but said that at times they were not acknowledged. In the opinion of one of the ESU officers, some of these firefighters essentially refused to take orders from cops. At least one firefighter who was in the North Tower has supported that assessment, stating that he was not going to take an evacuation instruction from a cop that morning. However, another firefighter reports that ESU officers ran past him without advising him to evacuate. The ESU team on the 11th floor began descending stairwell C after receiving the evacuation order. Once near the mezzanine level where stairwell C ended, this team spread out in chain formation, stretching from several floors down to the mezzanine itself. They used their flashlights to provide a path of beacons through the darkness and debris for civilians climbing down the stairs. Eventually, when no one else appeared to be descending, the ESU team exited the North Tower and ran one at a time to World Trade Center 6, dodging those who still were jumping from the upper floors of the North Tower by acting as spotters for each other. They remained in the area, conducting additional searches for civilians. All but two of them died. After surviving the South Tower's collapse, the ESU team that had been preparing to enter the North Tower spread into chain formation and created a path for civilians who had exited from the North Tower mezzanine to evacuate the World Trade Center complex by descending the stairs on the north side of World Trade Centers 5 and 6, which led down to Vesey Street. They remained at this post until the North Tower collapsed, yet all survived. The three plainclothes NYPD officers who had made it up to the 54th floor of the North Tower 
felt the building shake violently at 9.59 as the South Tower collapsed, though they did not know the cause. Immediately thereafter, they were joined by three firefighters from an FDNY engine company. One of the firefighters apparently heard an evacuation order on his radio, but responded in a return radio communication, quote, We're not fucking coming out, end quote. However, the firefighters urged the police officers to descend because they lacked the protective gear and equipment to handle the increasing smoke and heat. The police officers reluctantly began descending, checking that the lower floors were clear of civilians. They proceeded down stairwell B, poking their heads into every floor and briefly looking for civilians. Other NYPD officers helping evacuees on the mezzanine level of the North Tower were enveloped in the debris cloud that resulted from the South Tower's collapse. They struggled to regroup in the darkness and to evacuate both themselves and civilians they encountered. At least one of them died in the collapse of the North Tower. At least one NYPD officer from this area managed to evacuate out toward World Trade Center 5, where he teamed up with a Port Authority police officer and acted as a spotter in advising the citizens who were still exiting when they could safely run from World Trade Center 1 to World Trade Center 5 and avoid being struck by people and debris falling from the upper floors. At the time of the collapse of the South Tower, there were numerous NYPD officers in the concourse, some of whom are believed to have died there. Those who survived struggled to evacuate themselves in darkness, assisting civilians as they exited the concourse in all directions. Port Authority Response The collapse of the South Tower forced the evacuation of the PAPD command post on West and Vesey, compelling PAPD officers to move north. There is no evidence that PAPD officers without World Trade Center command radios received an evacuation order by radio. Some of these officers in the North Tower decided to evacuate, either on their own or in consultation with other first responders they came across. Some greatly slowed their own descent in order to assist non-ambulatory civilians. After 10.28 a.m., the North Tower collapsed at 10.28 and 25 seconds a.m., killing all civilians alive on upper floors, an undetermined number below, and scores of first responders. The FDNY Chief of Department, the Port Authority Police Department Superintendent, and many of their senior staff were killed. Incredibly, 12 firefighters one PAPD officer, and three civilians who were descending stairwell B of the North Tower survived its collapse. On September 11th, the nation suffered the largest loss of life, 2,973, on its soil as a result of hostile attack in its history. The FDNY suffered 343 fatalities, the largest loss of life of any emergency response agency in history. The PAPD suffered 37 fatalities, the largest loss of life of any police force in history. The NYPD suffered 23 fatalities, the second largest loss of life of any police force in history, exceeded only by the number of PAPD officers lost the same day. Mayor Giuliani, along with the police and fire commissioners, and the OEM director moved quickly north and established an emergency operations command post at the police academy. Over the coming hours, weeks, and months, thousands of civilians and city, state, and federal employees devoted themselves around the clock to putting New York City back on its feet. End of part two of chapter 9.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 9.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The 9-11 Commission Report. 
Chapter 9.3 Emergency Response at the Pentagon If it had happened on any other day, the disaster at the Pentagon would be remembered as a singular challenge and an extraordinary national story. Yet the calamity at the World Trade Center that same morning included catastrophic damage 1,000 feet above the ground that instantly imperiled tens of thousands of people. The two experiences are not comparable. Nonetheless, broader lessons in integrating multi-agency response efforts are apparent when we analyze the response at the Pentagon. The emergency response at the Pentagon represented a mix of local, state, and federal jurisdictions and was generally effective. It overcame the inherent complications of a response across jurisdictions because the incident command system, a formalized management structure for emergency response, was in place in the national capital region on 9-11. Because of the nature of the event, a plane crash, fire, and partial building collapse, the Arlington County Fire Department served as incident commander. Different agencies had different roles. The incident required a major rescue, fire, and medical response from Arlington County at the U.S. Military's headquarters, a facility under the control of the Secretary of Defense. Since it was a terrorist attack, the Department of Justice was the lead federal agency in charge with authority delegated to the FBI for operational response. Additionally, the terrorist attack affected the daily operations and emergency management requirements of Arlington County in all bordering and surrounding jurisdictions. At 9.37, the west wall of the Pentagon was hit by hijacked American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 757. The crash caused immediate and catastrophic damage. All 64 people aboard the airliner were killed, as were 125 people inside the Pentagon, 70 civilians, and 55 military service members. 106 people were seriously injured and transported to area hospitals. While no emergency response is flawless, the response to the 9-11 terrorist attack on the Pentagon was mainly a success for three reasons. First, the strong professional relationships and trust established among emergency responders. Second, the adoption of the incident command system. And third, the pursuit of a regional approach to response. Many fire and police agencies that responded had extensive prior experience working together on regional events and training exercises. Indeed, at the time preparations were underway at many of these agencies to ensure public safety at the annual meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank scheduled to be held later that month in Washington, D.C., Local, regional, state, and federal agencies immediately responded to the Pentagon attack. In addition to county fire, police, and sheriff's departments, the response was assisted by the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport Fire Department, Fort Myer Fire Department, the Virginia State Police, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, the FBI, FEMA, a National Medical Response Team, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and numerous military personnel within the Military District of Washington. Command was established at 941. At the same time, the Arlington County Emergency Communications Center contacted the fire departments of Fairfax County, Alexandria, and the District of Columbia to request mutual aid. The incident command post provided a clear view of and access to the crash site, allowing the incident commander to assess the situation at all times. At 9.55, the incident commander ordered an evacuation of the Pentagon impact area because a partial collapse was imminent. It occurred at 9.57 and no first responder was injured. At 10.15, the incident commander ordered a full evacuation of the command post because of the warning of an approaching hijacked aircraft passed along by the FBI. This was the first of three evacuation caused by reports of incoming aircraft, 
and the evacuation order was well communicated and well coordinated. Several factors facilitated the response to this incident and distinguished it from the far more difficult task in New York. There was a single incident, and it was not 1,000 feet above ground. The incident site was relatively easy to secure and contain, and there were no other buildings in the immediate area. There was no collateral damage beyond the Pentagon. Yet, the Pentagon response encountered difficulties that echo those experienced in New York. As the Arlington County After Action Report notes, there were significant problems with both self-dispatching and communications. Quote, Organizations, response units, and individuals proceeding on their own initiative directly to an incident site without the knowledge and permission of the host jurisdiction and the incident commander complicate the exercise of command, increase the risks faced by bona fide responders, and exasperate the challenge of accountability. End quote. With respect to communications, the report concludes, quote, Almost all aspects of communications continue to be problematic, from initial notification to tactical operations. Cellular telephones were of little value. Radio channels were initially oversaturated. Pagers seemed to be the most reliable means of notification when available and used, but most firefighters are not issued pagers." End quote. It is a fair inference, given the differing situations in New York City and Northern Virginia, that the problems in command, control, and communications that occurred at both sites will likely recur in any emergency of similar scale. The task looking forward is to enable first responders to respond in a coordinated manner with the greatest possible awareness of the situation. End of Chapter 9.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 9.4 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 9.4. Analysis. Like the national defense effort described in Chapter 1, the emergency response to the attacks on 9-11 was necessarily improvised. In New York, the FDNY, the NYPD, the Port Authority, WTC employees, and the building occupants themselves did their best to cope with the effects of an unimaginable catastrophe, unfolding furiously over a mere 102 minutes for which they were unprepared in terms of both training and mindset. As a result of the efforts of first responders, assistance from each other, and their own good instincts and good will, the vast majority of civilians below the impact zone were able to evacuate the towers. The National Institute of Standards and Technology has provided a preliminary estimation that between 16,400 and 18,800 civilians were in the WTC complex as of 8.46 a.m. on September 11. At most, 2,152 individuals died at the WTC complex who were not 1. fire or police first responders, 2. security or fire safety personnel of the WTC or individual companies, three volunteer civilians who ran to the WTC after the plane's impact to help others, or four on the two planes that crashed into the Twin Towers. Out of this total number of fatalities, we can account for the workplace location of 2,052 individuals, or 95.35%. Of this number, 1,942 or 94.64%, either worked or were supposed to attend a meeting at or above the respective impact zones of the Twin Towers. Only 110, or 5.36%, of those who died worked below the impact zone. While a given person's office location at the WTC 
does not definitively indicate where that individual died that morning, or whether he or she could have evacuated, these data strongly suggest that the evacuation was a success for civilians below the impact zone. Several actors influenced the evacuation on September 11. It was aided greatly by changes made by the Port Authority in response to the 1993 bombing, and by the training of both Port Authority personnel and civilians after that time. Stairwells remained lit near unaffected floors, some tenants relied on procedures learned in fire drills to help them to safety. Others were guided down the stairs by fire safety officials based in the lobby. Because of damage caused by the impact of the planes, the capability of the sophisticated building systems may have been impaired. Rudimentary improvements, however, such as the addition of glow strips to the handrails and stairs, were credited by some as the reason for their survival. The general evacuation time for the towers dropped from more than four hours in 1993 to under one hour on September 11 for most civilians who were not trapped or physically incapable of enduring a long descent. First responders also played a significant role in the success of the evacuation. Some specific rescues are quantifiable, such as an FDNY company's rescue of civilians trapped on the 22nd floor of the North Tower, or the success of FDNY, PAPD, and NYPD personnel in carrying non-ambulatory civilians out of both the North and South Towers. In other instances, intangibles combined to reduce what could have been a much higher death total. It is impossible to measure how many more civilians who descended to the ground floors would have died but for the NYPD and PAPD personnel directing them, via safe exit routes that avoided jumpers and debris, to leave the complex urgently but calmly. It is impossible to measure how many more civilians would have died, but for the determination of many members of the FDNY, PAPD, and NYPD to continue assisting civilians after the South Tower collapsed. It is impossible to measure the calming influence that ascending firefighters had on descending civilians, or whether, but for the firefighters' presence, the poor behavior of a very few civilians could have caused a dangerous and panicked mob flight. But the positive impact of the first responders on the evacuation came at a tremendous cost of first responder lives lost. Civilian and Private Sector Challenges The first first responders on 9-11, as in most catastrophes, were private sector civilians because 85% of our nation's critical infrastructure is controlled, not by government, but by private sector. Private sector civilians are likely to be the first responders in any future catastrophe. For that reason, we have assessed the state of private sector and civilian preparedness in order to formulate recommendations to address this critical need. Our recommendations grow out of the experience of the civilians at the World Trade Center on 9-11. Lack of protocol for rooftop rescues. Civilians at or above the impact zone in the North Tower had the smallest hope of survival. Once the plane struck, they were prevented from descending because of damage to or impassable conditions in the building's three stairwells. The only hope for those on the upper floors of the North Tower would have been a swift and extensive air rescue. Several factors made this impossible. Doors leading to the roof were kept locked for security reasons, and damage to software in the security command station prevented a lock release order from taking effect. Even if the doors had not been locked, Structural and radiation hazards made the rooftops unsuitable staging areas for a large number of civilians. And even if conditions permitted general helicopter evacuations, which was not the case, only several people could be lifted at a time. 
the WTC lacked any plan for evacuation of civilians on upper floors of the WTC in the event that all stairwells were impassable below. Lack of comprehensive evacuation of South Tower immediately after the North Tower impact. No decision has been criticized more than the decision of building personnel not to evacuate the South Tower immediately after the North Tower was hit. A firm and prompt evacuation order would likely have led many to safety. Even a strictly advisory announcement would not have dissuaded those who decided for themselves to evacuate. The advice to stay in place was understandable, however, when considered in its context. At that moment, no one appears to have thought a second plane could hit the South Tower. The evacuation of thousands of people was seen as inherently dangerous. Additionally, conditions were hazardous in some areas outside the towers. Less understandable, in our view, is the instruction given to some civilians who had reached the lobby to return to their offices. They could have been held in the lobby or perhaps directed through the underground concourse. Despite the initial advice given over its public address system, the South Tower was ordered to be evacuated by the FDNY and PAPD within twelve minutes of the North Tower's being hit. If not for a second, unanticipated attack, the evacuation presumably would have proceeded. Impact of Fire Safety Plan and Fire Drills on Evacuation Once the South Tower was hit, civilians on upper floors wasted time ascending the stairs instead of searching for a clear path down when stairwell A was at least initially passable. Although rooftop rescues had not been conclusively ruled out, civilians were not informed in fire drills that roof doors were locked that rooftop areas were hazardous, and that no helicopter evacuation plan existed. In both towers, civilians who were able to reach the stairs and descend were also stymied by the deviations in the stairways and by smoke doors. This confusion delayed the evacuation of some, and may have obstructed that of others. The Port Authority has acknowledged that in the future, Tenants should be made aware of what conditions they will encounter during descent. Impact of 9-11 Calls on Evacuation The NYPD's 9-11 operators and FDNY dispatch were not adequately integrated into the emergency response. In several ways, the 9-11 system was not ready to cope with a major disaster. These operators and dispatchers were one of the only sources of information for individuals at and above the impact zone of the towers. The FDNY ordered both towers fully evacuated by 8.57, but this guidance was not conveyed to 9-11 operators and FDNY dispatchers, who for the next hour often continued to advise civilians not to self-evacuate regardless of whether they were above or below the impact zone. Nor were 9-11 operators or FDNY dispatchers advised that rooftop rescues had been ruled out. This failure may have been harmful to civilians on the upper floors of the South Tower, who called 911 and were not told that their only evacuation hope was to attempt to descend, not to ascend. In planning for future disasters, it is important to integrate those taking 9-11 calls into the emergency response team and to involve them in providing up-to-date information and assistance to the public. Preparedness of Individual Civilians One clear lesson of September 11 is that individual civilians need to take responsibility for maximizing the probability that they will survive should disaster strike. Clearly, many building occupants in the World Trade Center did not take preparedness seriously. Individuals should know the exact location of every stairwell in their workplace. In addition, they should have access at all times to flashlights, which were deemed invaluable by some civilians who managed to evacuate the WTC on September 11. Challenges Experienced by First Responders 
the challenge of incident command. As noted above, in July 2001, Mayor Giuliani updated a directive titled Direction and Control of Emergencies in the City of New York. The directive designated for different types of emergencies an appropriate agency as incident commander. It would be responsible for the management of the city's response to the emergency. The directive also provided that where incidents are so multifaceted that no one agency immediately stands out as the incident commander, OEM will assign the role of incident commander to an agency as the situation demands. To some degree, the mayor's directive for incident command was followed on 9-11. It was clear that the lead response agency was the FDNY, and that the other responding local, federal, bi-state, and state agencies acted in a supporting role. There was a tacit understanding that FDNY personnel would have primary responsibility for evacuating civilians who were above the ground floors of the Twin Towers, while NYPD and PAPD personnel would be in charge of evacuating civilians from the WTC complex once they reached ground level. The NYPD also greatly assisted responding FDNY units by clearing emergency lanes to the WTC. In addition, coordination occurred at high levels of command. For example, the mayor and police commissioner consulted with the chief of the department of the FDNY at approximately 9.20. There were other instances of coordination at operational levels, and information was shared on an ad hoc basis. For example, an NYPD ESU team passed the news of their evacuation order to firefighters in the North Tower. It is also clear, however, that the response operations lacked the kind of integrated communications and unified command contemplated in the directive. These problems existed both within and among individual responding agencies. Command and Control Within First Responder Agencies For a unified incident management system to succeed, each participant must have command and control of its own units and adequate internal communications. This was not always the case at the WTC on 9-11. Understandably lacking experience in responding to events of the magnitude of the World Trade Center attacks, the FDNY as an institution proved incapable of coordinating the numbers of units dispatched to different points within the 16-acre complex. As a result, numerous units were congregating in the undamaged Marriott Hotel and at the overall command post on West Street by 9.30, while chiefs in charge of the South Tower still were in desperate need of units. With better understanding of the resources already available, additional units might not have been dispatched to the South Tower at 937. The task of accounting for and coordinating the units was rendered difficult, if not impossible, by internal communications breakdowns resulting from the limited capabilities of radios in the high-rise environment of the WTC and from confusion over which personnel were assigned to which frequency. Furthermore, when the South Tower collapsed, the overall FDNY command post ceased to operate, which compromised the FDNY's ability to understand the situation. An FDNY Marine Unit's immediate radio communication to FDNY dispatch that the South Tower had fully collapsed was not conveyed to chiefs at the scene. The FDNY's inability to coordinate and account for the different radio channels that would be used in an emergency of this scale contributed to the early lack of units in the South Tower, whose lobby chiefly initially could not communicate with anyone outside that tower. Though almost no one at 9.50 on September 11 was contemplating an imminent total collapse of the Twin Towers, Many first responders and civilians were contemplating the possibility of imminent additional terrorist attacks throughout New York City. Had any such attacks occurred, 
the FDNY's response would have been severely compromised by the concentration of so many of its off-duty personnel, particularly its elite personnel, at the WTC. The port authority's response was hampered by the lack of both standard operating procedures and radios capable of enabling multiple commands to respond in unified fashion to an incident at the WTC. Many officers reporting from the tunnel and airport commands could not hear instructions being issued over the WTC command frequency. In addition, command and control was complicated by senior Port Authority police officials becoming directly involved in frontline rescue operations. The NYPD experienced comparatively fewer internal command and control and communications issues. Because the department has a history of mobilizing thousands of officers for major events requiring crowd control, its technical radio capability and major incident protocols were more easily adapted to an incident of the magnitude of 9-11. In addition, its mission that day lay largely outside the towers themselves. Although there were ESU teams and a few individual police officers climbing in the towers, the vast majority of NYPD personnel were staged outside, assisting with crowd control and evacuation, and securing other sites in the city. The NYPD ESU division had firm command and control over its units, in part because there were so few of them in comparison to the number of FDNY companies, and all reported to the same ESU command post. It is unclear, however, whether non-ESU NYPD officers operating on the ground floors and in a few cases on upper floors of the WTC were as well coordinated. Significant shortcomings within the FDNY's command and control capabilities were painfully exposed on September 11. To its great credit, the department has made a substantial effort in the past three years to address these. While significant problems in the command and control of the PAPD also were exposed on September 11, it is less clear that the Port Authority has adopted new training exercises or major incident protocols to address these shortcomings. Lack of Coordination Among First Responder Agencies any attempt to establish a unified command on 9-11 would have been further frustrated by the lack of communication and coordination among responding agencies. Certainly, the FDNY was not responsible for the management of the city's response to the emergency, as the mayor's directive would have required. The command posts were in different locations, and OEM headquarters, which could have served as a focal point for information sharing, did not play an integrating role in ensuring that information was shared among agencies on 9-11, even prior to its evacuation. There was a lack of comprehensive coordination between FDNY, NYPD, and PAPD personnel climbing above the ground floors in the Twin Towers. Information that was critical to informed decision-making was not shared among agencies. FDNY chiefs in leadership roles that morning have told us that their decision-making capability was hampered by a lack of information from NYPD aviation. At 9.51 a.m., a helicopter pilot cautioned that large pieces of the South Tower appeared to be about to fall and could pose a danger to those below. Immediately after the tower's collapse, a helicopter pilot radioed that news. This transmission was followed by communications at 10.08, 10.15, and 10.22 that called into question the condition of the North Tower. The FDNY chiefs would have benefited greatly had they been able to communicate with personnel in a helicopter. The consequence of the lack of real-time intelligence from NYPD aviation should not be overstated. Contrary to a widely held misperception, no NYPD helicopter predicted the fall of either tower before the South Tower collapsed. 
and no NYPD personnel began to evacuate the WTC complex prior to that time. Furthermore, the FDNY, as an institution, was in possession of the knowledge that the South Tower had collapsed as early as the NYPD, as its fall had been immediately reported by an FDNY boat on a dispatch channel. Because of internal breakdowns within the department, however, this information was not disseminated to FDNY personnel on the scene. The FDNY, PAPD, and NYPD did not coordinate their units that were searching the WTC complex for civilians. In many cases, redundant searches of specific floors and areas were conducted. It is unclear whether fewer first responders in the aggregate would have been in the Twin Towers if there had been an integrated response, or what impact, if any, redundant searches had on the total number of first responder fatalities. Whether the lack of coordination between the FDNY and the NYPD on September 11 had a catastrophic effect has been the subject of controversy. We believe that there are too many variables for us to responsibly quantify those consequences. It is clear that the lack of coordination did not affect adversely the evacuation of civilians. It is equally clear, however, that the incident command system did not function to integrate awareness among agencies or to facilitate interagency response. If New York and other major cities are to be prepared for future terrorist attacks, different first responder agencies within each city must be fully coordinated, just as different branches of the U.S. military are. Coordination entails a unified command that comprehensively deploys all dispatched police, fire, and other first responder resources. In May 2004, New York City adopted an emergency response plan that expressly contemplates two or more agencies jointly being lead agency when responding to a terrorist attack, but does not mandate a comprehensive and unified incident command that can deploy and monitor all first responder resources from one overall command post. In our judgment, this falls short of an optimal response plan, which requires clear command and control, common training, and the trust that such training creates. The experience of the military suggests that integrated into such a coordinated response should be a unified field intelligence unit, which should receive and combine information from all first responders, including 911 operators. Such a field intelligence unit could be valuable in large and complex incidents. Radio Communication Challenges The Effectiveness and Urgency of Evacuation Instructions As discussed above, the location of the NYPD ESU command post was crucial in making possible an urgent evacuation order explaining the South Tower's full collapse. Firefighters most certainly would have benefited from that information. A separate matter is the varied success at conveying evacuation instructions to personnel in the North Tower after the South Tower's collapse. The success of NYPD ESU instruction is attributable to a combination of 1. the strength of the radios, 2. the relatively small numbers of individuals using them, and three, use of the correct channel by all. The same three factors worked against successful communication among FDNY personnel. First, the radio's effectiveness was drastically reduced in the high-rise environment. Second, tactical channel one was simply overwhelmed by the number of units attempting to communicate on it at 10 o'clock. Third, some firefighters were on the wrong channel or simply lacked radios altogether. It is impossible to know what difference it made that units in the North Tower were not using the repeater channel after 10 o'clock. While the repeater channel was at least partially operational before the South Tower collapsed, 
We do not know whether it continued to be operational after 959. Even without the repeater channel, at least 24 of the at most 32 companies who were dispatched and actually in the North Tower received the evacuation instruction, either via radio or directly from other first responders. Nevertheless, many of these firefighters died, either because they delayed their evacuation to assist civilians, attempted to regroup their units, lacked urgency, or some combination of these factors. In addition, many other firefighters not dispatched to the North Tower also died in its collapse. Some had their radios on the wrong channel, others were off-duty and lacked radios. In view of these considerations, we conclude that the technical failure of FDNY radios, while a contributing factor, was not the primary cause of the many firefighter fatalities in the North Tower. The FDNY has worked hard in the past several years to address its radio deficiencies. To improve radio capability in high-rises, the FDNY has internally developed a post radio that is small enough for a battalion chief to carry to the upper floors and that greatly repeats and enhances radio signal strength. The story with respect to Port Authority police officers in the North Tower is less complicated. Most of them lacked access to the radio channel on which the Port Authority police evacuation order was given. Since September 11, the Port Authority has worked hard to integrate the radio systems of their different commands. The lesson of 9-11 for civilians and first responders can be stated simply. In the new age of terror, they, we, are the primary targets. The losses America suffered that day demonstrated both the gravity of the terrorist threat and the commensurate need to prepare ourselves to meet it. The first responders of today live in a world transformed by the attacks on 9-11. Because no one believes that every conceivable form of attack can be prevented, civilians and first responders will again find themselves on the front lines. We must plan for that eventuality. A rededication to preparedness is perhaps the best way to honor the memories of those we lost that day. End of chapter 9.4「Chapter 10.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde The 9-11 Commission Report Section 10 Wartime after the attacks had occurred, while crisis managers were still sorting out a number of unnerving false alarms, Air Force One flew to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. One of these alarms was of a reported threat against Air Force One itself, a threat eventually run down to a misunderstood communication in the hectic White House Situation Room that morning. While the plan at the elementary school had been to return to Washington, by the time Air Force One was airborne at 9.55 a.m., the Secret Service, the President's advisers, and Vice President Cheney were strongly advising against it. President Bush reluctantly acceded to this advice, and at about 10.10, Air Force One changed course and began heading due west. The immediate objective was to find a safe location, not too far away, where the President could land and speak to the American people. The Secret Service was also interested in refueling the aircraft and paring down the size of the traveling party. The President's military aide, an Air Force officer, quickly researched the options and sometime around 10.20 identified Barksdale Air Force Base as an appropriate interim destination. 
When Air Force One landed at Barksdale at about 11.45, personnel from the local Secret Service office were still en route to the airfield. The motorcade consisted of a military police lead vehicle and a van. The proposed briefing theater had no phones or electrical outlets. Staff scrambled to prepare another room for the President's remarks, while the lead Secret Service agent reviewed the security situation with superiors in Washington. The President completed his statement, which for security reasons was taped and not broadcast live, and the traveling party returned to Air Force One. The next destination was discussed. Once again, the Secret Service recommended against returning to Washington, and the Vice President agreed. O'Foot Air Force Base in Nebraska was chosen because of its elaborate command and control facilities, and because it could accommodate overnight lodging for 50 persons. The Secret Service wanted a place where the President could spend several days if necessary. Air Force One arrived at Ofut at 2.50 p.m. At about 3.15, President Bush met with his principal advisors through a secure video teleconference. Rice said President Bush began the meeting with the words, We're at war, and that Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet said the agency was still assessing who was responsible, but the early signs all pointed to al-Qaeda. That evening, the Deputies Committee returned to the pending presidential directive they had labored over during the summer. The Secretary of Defense directed the nation's armed forces to Defense Condition 3, an increased state of military readiness. For the first time in history, all non-emergency civilian aircraft in the United States were grounded, stranding tens of thousands of passengers across the country. Contingency plans for the continuity of government and the evacuation of leaders had been implemented. The Pentagon had been struck. The White House or the Capitol had narrowly escaped direct attack. Extraordinary security precautions were put in place at the nation's borders and ports. In the late afternoon, the President overruled his aide's continuing reluctance to have him return to Washington and ordered Air Force One back to Andrews Air Force Base. He was flown by helicopter back to the White House, passing over the still smoldering Pentagon. At 8.30 that evening, President Bush addressed the nation from the White House. After emphasizing that the first priority was to help the injured and protect against any further attacks, he said, We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. He quoted Psalm 23, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, no American, he said, will ever forget this day. Following his speech, President Bush met again with his National Security Council, NSC, expanded to include Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta and Joseph Albaugh, the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had returned from Peru after hearing of the attacks, joined the discussion. They reviewed the day's events. Chapter 10.1 Immediate Responses at Home As the urgent domestic issues accumulated, White House Deputy Chief of Staff Joshua Bolton chaired a temporary domestic consequences group. The agenda in those first days is worth noting, partly as a checklist for future crisis planners. It began with problems of how to help victims and stanch the flowing losses to the American economy, such as organizing federal emergency assistance. One question was what kind of public health advice to give about the air quality in lower Manhattan in the vicinity of the fallen buildings. Compensating Victims they evaluated legislative options, eventually setting up a federal compensation fund and defining the powers of a special master to run it. Determining Federal Assistance On September 13th, President Bush promised to provide $20 billion for New York City, in addition to the $20 billion his budget director had already guessed might be needed for the country as a whole. 
restoring civil aviation. On the morning of September 13, the national airspace reopened for use by airports that met newly improvised security standards. Reopening the Financial Markets after extraordinary emergency efforts involving the White House, the Treasury Department, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, aided by unprecedented cooperation among the usually competitive firms of the financial industry, the markets reopened on Monday, September 17. Deciding when and how to return border and port security to more normal operations evaluating legislative proposals to bail out the airline industry and cap its liability. The very process of reviewing these issues underscored the absence of an effective government organization dedicated to assessing vulnerabilities and handling problems of protection and preparedness. Though a number of agencies had some part of the task, none had security as its primary mission. By September 14, Vice President Cheney had decided to recommend, at least as a first step, a new White House entity to coordinate all the relevant agencies rather than tackle the challenge of combining them in a new department. This new White House entity would be a Homeland Security Advisor and Homeland Security Council, paralleling the National Security Council system. Vice President Cheney reviewed the proposal with President Bush and other advisers. President Bush announced the new post and its first occupant, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, in his address to a joint session of Congress on September 20. Beginning on September 11, Immigration and Naturalization Service agents working in cooperation with the FBI began arresting individuals for immigration violations whom they encountered while following up leads in the FBI's investigation of the 9-11 attacks. Eventually, 768 aliens were arrested as special interest detainees. Some, such as Zacharias Musawi, were actually in INS custody before 9-11. Most were arrested after. Attorney General John Ashcroft told us that he saw his job in directing this effort as risk minimization, both to find out who had committed the attacks and to prevent a subsequent attack. Ashcroft ordered all special interest immigration hearings close to the public, family members, and press, directed government attorneys to seek denial of bond until such time as they were cleared of terrorist connections by the FBI and other agencies and ordered the identity of the detainees kept secret. INS attorneys charged with prosecuting the immigration violations had trouble getting information about the detainees and any terrorist connections. In the chaos after the attacks, it was very difficult to reach law enforcement officials who were following up on other leads. The clearance process approved by the Justice Department was time-consuming, lasting an average of about 80 days. We have assessed this effort to detain aliens of special interest. The detainees were lawfully held on immigration charges. Records indicate that 531 were deported, 162 were released on bond, 24 received some kind of immigration benefits, 12 had their proceedings terminated, and 8, one of whom was Musawi, were remanded to the custody of the U.S. Marshal Service. The Inspector General of the Justice Department found significant problems in the way the 9-11 detainees were treated. In response to a request about the counterterrorism benefits of the 9-11 detainee program, the Justice Department cited six individuals on the special interest detainee list, noting that two, including Musawi, were linked directly to a terrorist organization and that it had obtained new leads helpful to the investigation of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. A senior al-Qaeda detainee had stated that U.S. government efforts after the 9-11 attacks to monitor the American homeland, including review of Muslims' immigration files and deportation of non-permanent residents, forced al-Qaeda to operate less freely in the United States. 
the government's ability to collect intelligence inside the United States, and the sharing of such information between the intelligence and law enforcement communities was not a priority before 9-11. Guidelines on this subject issued in August 2001 by Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson essentially recapitulated prior guidance. However, the attacks of 9-11 changed everything. Less than one week after September 11, an early version of what was to become the Patriot Act, officially the USA Patriot Act, began to take shape. A central provision of the proposal was the removal of the wall on information sharing between the intelligence and law enforcement communities, discussed in Chapter 3. Ashcroft told us he was determined to take every conceivable action within the limits of the Constitution, to identify potential terrorists and deter additional attacks. The administration developed a proposal that eventually passed both houses of Congress by large majorities and was signed into law on October 26. Flights of Saudi Nationals Leaving the United States Three questions have arisen with respect to the departure of Saudi nationals from the United States in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. 1. Did any flights of Saudi nationals take place before national airspace reopened on September 13, 2001? 2. Was there any political intervention to facilitate the departure of Saudi nationals? 3. Did the FBI screen Saudi nationals thoroughly before their departure? First, we found no evidence that any flights of Saudi nationals, domestic or international, took place before the reopening of national airspace on the morning of September 13, 2001. To the contrary, every flight we have identified occurred after national airspace reopened. Second, we found no evidence of political intervention. We found no evidence that anyone at the White House, above the level of Richard Clark, participated in a decision on the departure of Saudi nationals. The issue came up in one of the many video teleconferences of the interagency group Clark chaired, and Clark said he approved of how the FBI was dealing with the matter when it came up for interagency discussion at his level. Clark told us, I asked the FBI, Dale Watson, to handle that, to check to see if that was all right with them, to see if they wanted access to any of these people, and to get back to me, and if they had no objections, it would be fine with me. Clark added, I have no recollection of clearing it with anybody at the White House. Although White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card remembered someone telling him about the Saudi request shortly after 9-11, he said he had not talked to the Saudis and did not ask anyone to do anything about it. The President and Vice President told us they were not aware of the issue at all until it surfaced much later in the media. None of the officials we interviewed recalled any intervention or direction on this matter from any political appointee. Third, we believe that the FBI conducted a satisfactory screening of Saudi nationals who left the United States on charter flights. The Saudi government was advised of and agreed to the FBI's requirements that passengers be identified and checked against various databases before the flights departed. The Federal Aviation Administration representative working in the FBI Operations Center made sure that the FBI was aware of the flights of Saudi nationals and was able to screen the passengers before they were allowed to depart. The FBI interviewed all persons of interest on these flights prior to their departure. They concluded that none of the passengers was connected to the 9-11 attacks and have since found no evidence to change that conclusion. Our own independent review of the Saudi nationals involved confirms that no one with known links to terrorism departed on these flights. End of chapter 10.1
Chapter 10.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 10.2 Planning for War. By late in the evening on September 11, the President had addressed the nation on the terrible events of the day. Vice President Cheney described the President's mood as somber. The long day was not yet over, when the large meeting that included his domestic department heads broke up. President Bush chaired a smaller meeting of top advisers, a group he would later call his War Council. This group usually included Vice President Cheney, Secretary of State Powell, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, General Hugh Shelton, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, later to become Chairman, General Myers, DCI Tenet, Attorney General Ashcroft, and FBI Director Robert Mueller. From the White House staff, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice and Chief of Staff Card were part of the core group often joined by their deputies, Stephen Hadley and Joshua Bolton. In this restricted National Security Council meeting, the President said it was a time for self-defense. The United States would punish not just the perpetrators of the attacks, but also those who harbored them. Secretary Powell said the United States had to make it clear to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Arab states that the time to act was now. He said he would need to build a coalition. The President noted that the attacks provided a great opportunity to engage Russia and China. Secretary Rumsfeld urged the President and the principals to think broadly about who might have harbored the attackers, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Sudan, and Iran. He wondered aloud how much evidence the United States would need in order to deal with these countries pointing out that major strikes could take up to 60 days to assemble. President Bush chaired two more meetings of the NSC on September 12. In the first meeting, he stressed that the United States was at war with a new and different kind of enemy. The President tasked principals to go beyond their pre-9-11 work and develop a strategy to eliminate terrorists and punish those who support them. As they worked on defining the goals and objectives of the upcoming campaign, they considered a paper that went beyond al-Qaeda to propose the elimination of terrorism as a threat to our way of life, an aim that would include pursuing other international terrorist organizations in the Middle East. Rice chaired a principals' committee meeting on September 13, in the Situation Room to refine how the fight against al-Qaeda would be conducted. The principals agreed that the overall message should be that anyone supporting al-Qaeda would risk harm. The United States would need to integrate diplomacy, financial measures, intelligence, and military actions into an overarching strategy. The principals also focused on Pakistan and what it could do to turn the Taliban against al-Qaeda. They concluded that if Pakistan decided not to help the United States, it too would be at risk. The same day, Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage met with the Pakistani ambassador to the United States, Maliha Lodhi, and the visiting head of Pakistan's military intelligence service, Mahmoud Ahmed. Armitage said, that the United States wanted Pakistan to take seven steps. To stop al-Qaeda operatives at its border and end all logistical support for bin Laden. To give the United States blanket overflight and landing rights for all necessary military and intelligence operations. To provide territorial access to U.S. and allied military intelligence and other personnel to conduct operations against al-Qaeda to provide the United States with intelligence information, to continue to publicly condemn the terrorist acts, to cut off all shipments of fuel to the Taliban and stop recruits from going to Afghanistan, and, if the evidence implicated bin Laden and al-Qaeda, and the Taliban continued to harbor them, 
to break relations with the Taliban government. Pakistan made its decision swiftly. That afternoon, Secretary of State Powell announced at the beginning of an NSC meeting that Pakistani President Musharraf had agreed to every U.S. request for support in the war on terrorism. The next day, the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad confirmed that Musharraf and his top military commanders had agreed to all seven demands. Pakistan will need full U.S. support as it proceeds with us, the embassy noted. Musharraf said the GOP, government of Pakistan, was making substantial concessions in allowing use of its territory and that he would pay a domestic price. His standing in Pakistan was certain to suffer. To counterbalance that, he needed to show that Pakistan was benefiting from his decisions. At the September 13 NSC meeting, when Secretary Powell described Pakistan's reply, President Bush led a discussion of an appropriate ultimatum to the Taliban. He also ordered Secretary Rumsfeld to develop a military plan against the Taliban. The President wanted the United States to strike the Taliban, step back, wait to see if they got the message, and hit them hard if they did not. He made it clear that the military should focus on targets that would influence the Taliban's behavior. President Bush also tasked the State Department, which on the following day delivered to the White House a paper titled Game Plan for a Political Military Strategy for Pakistan and Afghanistan. The paper took it as a given that bin Laden would continue to act against the United States even while under Taliban control. It therefore detailed specific U.S. demands for the Taliban, surrender bin Laden and his chief lieutenants, including Ayman al-Zawahiri, tell the United States what the Taliban knew about al-Qaeda and its operations, close all terrorist camps, free all imprisoned foreigners, and comply with all U.N. Security Council resolutions. The State Department proposed delivering an ultimatum to the Taliban. Produce bin Laden and his deputies, and shut down al-Qaeda camps within 24 to 48 hours, or the United States will use all necessary means to destroy the terrorist infrastructure. The State Department did not expect the Taliban to comply. Therefore, state and defense would plan to build an international coalition to go into Afghanistan. Both departments would consult with NATO and other allies and request intelligence, basing, and other support from countries according to their capabilities and resources. Finally, the plan detailed a public U.S. stance. America would use all its resources to eliminate terrorism as a threat punish those responsible for 9-11 attacks, hold states and other actors responsible for providing sanctuary to terrorists, work with a coalition to eliminate terrorist groups and networks, and avoid malice towards any people, religion, or culture. President Bush recalled that he quickly realized that the administration would have to invade Afghanistan with ground troops, but the early briefings to the President and Secretary Rumsfeld on military options were disappointing. Tommy Franks, the commanding general of Central Command, CENTCOM, told us that the President was dissatisfied. The U.S. military, Franks said, did not have an off-the-shelf plan to eliminate the al-Qaeda threat in Afghanistan. The existing infinite resolve options did not, in his view, amount to such a plan. All these diplomatic and military plans were reviewed over the weekend of September 15 and 16, as President Bush convened his war council at Camp David. Present were Vice President Cheney, Rice, Hadley, Powell, Armitage, Rumsfeld, Ashcroft, Muller, Tenet, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz and Kofer Black, Chief of the DCI's Counterterrorist Center. Tenet described a plan for collecting intelligence and mounting covert operations. He proposed inserting CIA teams into Afghanistan 
to work with Afghan warlords who would join the fight against al-Qaeda. These CIA teams would act jointly with the military special operations unit. President Bush later praised this proposal, saying it had been a turning point in his thinking. General Shelton briefed the principals on the preliminary plan for Afghanistan that the military had put together. It drew on the infinite resolve phased campaign plan the Pentagon had begun developing in November 2000 as an addition to the strike options it had been refining since 1998. But Shelton added a new element, the possible significant use of ground forces, and that is where President Bush reportedly focused his attention. After hearing from his senior advisors, President Bush discussed with Rice the contents of the directives he would issue to set all the plans into motion. Rice prepared a paper that President Bush then considered with principals on Monday morning, September 17. The purpose of this meeting, he recalled saying, is to assign tasks for the first wave of the war against terrorism. It starts today. In a written set of instructions, slightly refined during the morning meeting, President Bush charged Ashcroft, Muller, and Tenet to develop a plan for homeland defense. President Bush directed Secretary of State Powell to deliver an ultimatum to the Taliban along the lines that his department had originally proposed. The State Department was also tasked to develop a plan to stabilize Pakistan and to be prepared to notify Russia and countries near Afghanistan when hostilities were imminent. In addition, Bush and his advisors discussed new legal authorities for covert action in Afghanistan including the administration's first memorandum of notification on bin Laden. Shortly thereafter, President Bush authorized broad new authorities for the CIA. President Bush instructed Rumsfeld and Shelton to develop further the Camp David military plan to attack the Taliban and al-Qaeda if the Taliban rejected the ultimatum. The president also tasked Rumsfeld to ensure that robust measures to protect American military forces against terrorist attack were implemented worldwide. Finally, he directed Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill to craft a plan to target al-Qaeda's funding and seize its assets. NSC staff members had begun leading meetings on terrorist fundraising by September 18. Also by September 18, Powell had contacted 58 of his foreign counterparts, had received offers of general aid, search and rescue equipment and personnel, and medical assistance teams. On the same day, Deputy Secretary of State Armitage was called by Mahmoud Ahmed regarding a two-day visit to Afghanistan during which the Pakistani intelligence chief had met with Mullah Omar and conveyed the U.S. demands. Omar's response was not negative on all these points, but the administration knew that the Taliban was unlikely to turn over bin Laden. The pre-9-11 draft presidential directive on al-Qaeda evolved into a new directive, National Security Presidential Directive 9, now titled, Defeating the Terrorist Threat to the United States. The directive would now extend to a global war on terrorism, not just on al-Qaeda. It also incorporated the president's determination not to distinguish between terrorists and those who harbor them. It included a determination to use military force if necessary to end al-Qaeda sanctuary in Afghanistan. The new directive, formally signed on October 25, after the fighting in Afghanistan had already begun, included new material followed by annexes discussing each targeted terrorist group. The old draft directive on al-Qaeda became, in effect, the first annex. The United States would strive to eliminate all terrorist networks, dry up their financial support, and prevent them from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. The goal was the elimination of terrorism as a threat to our way of life. End of chapter 10.2
Chapter Ten Three of the Nine Eleven Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, two thousand and eight. The Nine Eleven Commission Report, Chapter Ten Three, Phase Two, and the Question of Iraq. President Bush had wondered immediately after the attack whether Saddam Hussein's regime might have had a hand in it. Iraq had been an enemy of the United States for eleven years, and was the only place in the world where the United States was engaged in ongoing combat operations. As a former pilot, the President was struck by the apparent sophistication of the operation and some of the piloting, especially Hanjo's high-speed dive into the Pentagon. He told us he recalled Iraqi support for Palestinian suicide terrorists as well. Speculating about other possible states that could be involved, the President told us he also thought about Iran. Clark has written that on the evening of September the 12th, President Bush told him and some of his staff to explore possible Iraqi links to 9-11. See if Saddam did this, Clark recalls the President telling them. See if he's linked in any way. Footnote. Richard A. Clark, Against All Enemies, Inside America's War on Terror, Free Press 2004. According to Clark, he responded that Al-Qaeda did this. When the President pressed Clark to check if Saddam was involved and said that he wanted to learn of any shred of evidence, Clark promised to look at the question again, but added that the NSC and the intelligence community had looked in the past for linkages between Al-Qaeda and Iraq and had never found any real linkages. End footnote. While he believed the details of Clark's account to be incorrect, President Bush acknowledged that he might well have spoken to Clark at some point, asking him about Iraq. Footnote. President Bush told us that Clark had mischaracterized this exchange. On the evening of September the 12th, the President was at the Pentagon and then went to the White House residence. He dismissed the idea that he had been wandering around the Situation Room alone, saying, I don't do that. He said that he did not think that any President would roam around looking for something to do, while Clark said he had found the President's tone very intimidating. President Bush doubted that anyone would have found his manner intimidating. Roger Cressy, Clark's deputy, recalls this exchange with the President and Clark concerning Iraq shortly after 9-11, but did not believe the President's manner was intimidating. End footnote. Responding to a presidential tasking, Clark's office sent a memo to Rice on September the 18th titled Survey of Intelligence Information on Any Iraqi Involvement in the September 11 Attacks. Rice's chief staffer on Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, concurred in its conclusion that only some anecdotal evidence linked Iraq to Al-Qaeda. The memo found no compelling case that Iraq had either planned or perpetrated the attacks. It passed along a few foreign intelligence reports, including the Czech report alleging an April 2001 Prague meeting between Atta and an Iraqi intelligence officer, discussed in Chapter 7, and a Polish report that personnel at the headquarters of Iraqi intelligence in Baghdad were told before September 11th to go on the streets to gauge crowd reaction to an unspecified event. Arguing that the case for links between Iraq and Al-Qaeda was weak, the memo pointed out that bin Laden resented the secularism of Saddam Hussein's regime. Finally, the memo said, there was no confirmed reporting on Saddam cooperating with bin Laden on unconventional weapons. Footnote. NSC memo, Kurtz to Rice, Survey of Intelligence Information on Any Iraqi Involvement in the September 11 Attacks. On 60 Minutes, CBS, March 21st, 2004, Clark said that the first draft of this memo was returned by the NSC front office because it did not find a tie between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Rice and Hadley deny that they asked to have the memo redone for this reason. End footnote. On the afternoon of 9-11, according to contemporaneous notes, Secretary Rumsfeld instructed General Myers to obtain quickly as much information as possible. 
The notes indicate that he also told Myers that he was not simply interested in striking empty training sites. He thought the US response should consider a wide range of options and possibilities. The secretary said his instinct was to hit Saddam Hussein at the same time, not only bin Laden. Secretary Rumsfeld later explained that at this time he had been considering either one of them, or perhaps someone else, as the responsible party. According to Rice, the issue of what, if anything, to do about Iraq was really engaged at Camp David. Briefing papers on Iraq, along with many others, were in briefing materials for the participants. Rice told us the administration was concerned that Iraq would take advantage of the 9-11 attacks. She recalled that in the first Camp David session, chaired by the President, Rumsfeld asked what the administration should do about Iraq. Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz made the case for striking Iraq during this round of the war on terrorism. Footnote. Rice told us that the Bush at war account of the Camp David discussion on Iraq accorded with her memory. End footnote. A Defence Department paper for the Camp David briefing book on the strategic concept for the war on terrorism specified three priority targets for initial action. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban and Iraq. It argued that of the three, Al-Qaeda and Iraq posed a strategic threat to the United States. Iraq's long-standing involvement in terrorism was cited, along with its interest in weapons of mass destruction. Secretary Powell recalled that Wolfowitz, not Rumsfeld, argued that Iraq was ultimately the source of the terrorist problem and should therefore be attacked. Footnote. Rumsfeld told Bob Woodward that he had no recollection of Wolfowitz's remarks at Camp David. DOD Transcript, Secretary Rumsfeld Interview with the Washington Post, January the 9th, 2002, end footnote. Powell said that Wolfowitz was not able to justify his belief that Iraq was behind 9-11. Quote, Paul was always of the view that Iraq was a problem that had to be dealt with, Powell told us and he saw this as one way of using this event as a way to deal with the Iraq problem. End quote. Powell said that President Bush did not give Wolfowitz's argument, quote, much weight, end quote. Though continuing to worry about Iraq in the following week, Powell said, President Bush saw Afghanistan as the priority. Footnote. Powell raised concerns that a focus on Iraq might negate progress made with the international coalition the administration was putting together for Afghanistan. Taking on Iraq at this time could destroy the international coalition. End footnote. President Bush told Bob Woodward that the decision not to invade Iraq was made at the morning session on September the 15th. Iraq was not even on the table during the September the 15th afternoon session, which dealt solely with Afghanistan. Rice said that when President Bush called her on Sunday, September the 16th, he said the focus would be on Afghanistan, although he still wanted plans for Iraq should the country take some action or the administration eventually determine that it had been involved in the 9-11 attacks. At the September the 17th NSC meeting, there was some further discussion of Phase 2 of the War on Terrorism. President Bush ordered the Defense Department to be ready to deal with Iraq if Baghdad acted against U.S. interests, with plans to include possibly occupying Iraqi oil fields. Within the Pentagon, Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz continued to press the case for dealing with Iraq. Writing to Rumsfeld on September the 17th in a memo headlined, Preventing More Events, he argued that if there was even a 10% chance that Saddam Hussein was behind the 9-11 attack, maximum priority should be placed on eliminating that threat. Wolfowitz contended that the odds were far more than 1 in 10, citing Saddam's praise for the attack, his long record of involvement in terrorism, and theories that Ramzi Youssef was an Iraqi agent and Iraq was behind the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. Footnote we review contacts between Iraq and Al-Qaeda in Chapter 2. We have found no credible evidence to support theories of Iraqi government involvement in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Wolfowitz added in his memo that in 
that he had attempted in June to get the CIA to explore these theories. End footnote. The next day, Wolfowitz renewed the argument, writing to Rumsfeld about the interest of Yousef's co-conspirator in the 1995 Manila air plot in crashing an explosives-laden plane into CIA headquarters and about information from a foreign government regarding Iraqi's involvement in the attempted hijacking of a Gulf Air flight. Given this background, he wondered why so little thought had been devoted to the danger of suicide pilots, seeing a, quote, failure of imagination, end quote, and a mindset that dismissed possibilities. On September the 19th, Rumsfeld offered several thoughts for his commanders as they worked on their contingency plans. Though he emphasised the worldwide nature of the conflict, the references to specific enemies or regions named only the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and Afghanistan. Footnote. DOD Memo. Rumsfeld to Shelton. Some thoughts for the CINCs as they prepare plans. September the 19th, 2001. In a memo that appears to be from Under Secretary of Defence Douglas Fyth to Rumsfeld, dated September the 20th, the author expressed disappointment at the limited options immediately available in Afghanistan and the lack of ground options. The author suggested instead hitting terrorist targets outside the Middle East in the initial offensive, perhaps deliberately selecting a non-Al-Qaeda target like Iraq. Since US attacks were expected in Afghanistan, an American attack in South America or Southeast Asia might be a surprise to the terrorists. The memo may have been a draft never sent to Rumsfeld, or may be a draft of points being suggested for Rumsfeld to deliver in a briefing to the President. DOD Memo Fife to Rumsfeld, Briefing Draft, September the 20th, 2001. End footnote. Sheldon told us, the administration reviewed all the Pentagon's war plans and challenged certain assumptions underlying them, as any prudent organisation or leader should do. General Tommy Franks, the commanding general of Central Command, recalled receiving Rumsfeld's guidance that each regional commander should assess what these plans meant for his area of responsibility. He knew he would soon be striking the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, but, he told us, he now wondered how that action was connected to what might need to be done in Somalia, Yemen or Iraq. On September the 20th, President Bush met with British Prime Minister Tony Blair and the two leaders discussed the global conflict ahead. When Blair asked about Iraq, the President replied that Iraq was not the immediate problem. Some members of his administration, he commented, had expressed a different view but he was the one responsible for making the decisions. Franks told us that he was pushing independently to do more robust planning on military responses in Iraq during the summer before 9-11, a request President Bush denied, arguing that the time was not right. CENTCOM also began dusting off plans for a full invasion of Iraq during this period, Franks said. The CENTCOM commander told us he renewed his appeal for further military planning to respond to Iraqi moves shortly after 9-11, both because he personally felt that Iraq and Al-Qaeda might be engaged in some form of collusion, and because he worried that Saddam might take advantage of the attacks to move against his internal enemies in the northern or southern parts of Iraq, where the United States was flying regular missions to enforce Iraqi no-fly zones. Franks said that President Bush again turned down this request. Having issued directives to guide his administration's preparations for war, on Thursday, September the 20th, President Bush addressed the nation before a joint session of Congress. Quote, Tonight, he said, we are a country awakened to danger. End quote. The President blamed Al-Qaeda for 9-11 and the 1998 embassy bombings and, for the first time, declared that Al-Qaeda was, quote, responsible for bombing the USS Cole, end quote. Footnote. Several NSC officials, including Clark and Cressy, told us that the mention of the Cole in the speech to Congress marked the first public US declaration that Al-Qaeda had been behind the October 2000 attack. Clark said he added the language on this point to the speech. End footnote. 
he reiterated the ultimatum that had already been conveyed privately. Quote, the Taliban must act and act immediately, he said. They will hand over the terrorists, or they will share their fate. End quote. Footnote. President Bush told the Washington Post that he considered having Powell deliver the ultimatum to the Taliban, but determined it would have more impact coming directly from the President. End footnote. The President added that America's quarrel was not with Islam. Quote, the enemy of America is not our many Muslim friends. It is not our many Arab friends. Our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them. End quote. Other regimes faced hard choices, he pointed out. Quote, every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. End quote. President Bush argued that the new war went beyond bin Laden. Quote, our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there, he said. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. End quote. The President had a message for the Pentagon. Quote, the hour is coming when America will act, and you will make us proud. End quote. He also had a message for those outside the United States. Quote, this is civilization's fight, he said. We ask every nation to join us. End quote. President Bush approved military plans to attack Afghanistan in meetings with Central Command's General Franks and other advisers on September the 21st and October the 2nd. Originally titled Infinite Justice, the operation's codeword was changed to avoid the sensibilities of Muslims who associate the power of infinite justice with God alone, to the operational name still used for operations in Afghanistan, Enduring Freedom. Footnote. Tommy Frank's interview, April the 9th, 2004. Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Richard Myers and Major General Del Daly, Commander of Joint Special Operations Command, also attended the September the 21st meeting. The meeting was in direct response to the President's September the 17th instruction to Rumsfeld to develop a military campaign for Afghanistan. The original Infinite Justice name was a continuation of a series of names begun in August 1998 with Operation Infinite Reach, the airstrikes against bin Laden's facilities in Afghanistan and Sudan after the embassy bombings. The series also included Operation Infinite Resolve, a variety of proposed follow-on strikes on Al-Qaeda targets in Afghanistan. End footnote. The plan had four phases. In Phase 1, the United States and its allies would move forces into the region and would arrange to operate from or over neighbouring countries such as Uzbekistan and Pakistan. This occurred in the weeks following 9-11, aided by overwhelming international sympathy for the United States. In Phase 2, airstrikes and special operations attacks would hit key Al-Qaeda and Taliban targets. In an innovative joint effort, CIA and Special Operations Forces would be deployed to work together with each major Afghan faction opposed to the Taliban. The Phase 2 strikes and raids began on October the 7th. The basing arrangements contemplated for Phase 1 were substantially secured after arduous effort by the end of that month. In Phase 3, the United States would carry out quote, decisive operations, end quote, using all elements of national power, including ground troops, to topple the Taliban regime and eliminate al-Qaeda's sanctuary in Afghanistan. Mazar-e-Sharif, in northern Afghanistan, fell to a coalition assault by Afghan and US forces on November the 9th. Four days later, the Taliban had fled from Kabul. By early December, all major cities had fallen to the coalition. On December the 22nd, Hamid Karzai, a Pashtun leader from Kandahar, was installed as the chairman of Afghanistan's interim administration. Afghanistan had been liberated from the rule of the Taliban. In December 2001, Afghan forces with limited US support engaged al-Qaeda elements in a cave complex called Tora Bora. In March 2002, 
the largest engagement of the war was fought in the mountainous shah i kot area south of gardez against a large force of al-qaeda jihadists the three-week battle was substantially successful and almost all remaining al-qaeda forces took refuge in pakistan's equally mountainous and lightly governed frontier provinces as of july two thousand and four bin laden and zawahiri are still believed to be at large in phase four civilian and military operations turned to the indefinite task of what the armed forces call quote, security and stability operations end quote. within about two months of the start of combat operations several hundred cia operatives and special forces soldiers backed by the striking power of u.s aircraft and a much larger infrastructure of intelligence and support efforts had combined with afghan militias and a small number of other coalition soldiers to destroy the taliban regime and disrupt al-qaeda they had killed or captured about a quarter of the enemy's known leaders mohammed atef al-qaeda's military commander and a principal figure in the 9-11 plot had been killed by a u.s air strike According to a senior CIA officer who helped devise the overall strategy, the CIA provided intelligence, experience, cash, covert action capabilities, and entree to tribal allies. In turn, the US military offered combat expertise, firepower, logistics, and communications. With these initial victories won by the middle of 2002, the global conflict against Islamist terrorism became a different kind of struggle. End of chapter 10 of 3。Chapter 11.1 .1 of the 9-11 Commission Report。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 11 Foresight and Hindsight In composing this narrative, we have tried to remember that we write with the benefit and the handicap of hindsight. Hindsight can sometimes see the past clearly, with twenty-twenty vision. But the path of what happened is so brightly lit that it places everything else more deeply into shadow. Commenting on Pearl Harbor, Roberta Wallstetter found it much easier after the event to sort the relevant from the irrelevant signals. After the event, of course, a signal is always crystal clear. We can now see what disaster it was signalling, since the disaster has occurred. But before the event it is obscure and pregnant with conflicting meanings. As time passes, more documents become available, and the bare facts of what happened become still clearer. Yet the picture of how those things happened becomes harder to reimagine, as that past world, with its preoccupations and uncertainty, recedes, and the remaining memories of it become coloured by what happened, and what was written about it later. With that caution in mind, we asked ourselves, before we judged others, whether the insights that seem apparent now would really have been meaningful at the time, given the limitations of what people then could reasonably have known or done. We believe the 9-11 attacks revealed four kinds of failures in imagination, policy, capabilities, and management. 11.1 .1. Imagination Historical Perspective The 9-11 attack was an event of surpassing disproportion. America had suffered surprise attacks before. Pearl Harbor is one well-known case, the 1950 Chinese attack in Korea another but these were attacks by major powers. While by no means as threatening as Japan's act of war, the 9-11 attack was in some ways more devastating. It was carried out by a tiny group of people, not enough to man a full platoon. Measured on a governmental scale, the resources behind it were trivial. The group itself was dispatched by an organisation based in one of the poorest, most remote, and least industrialised countries on earth. This organization recruited a mixture of young fanatics and highly educated zealots who could not find suitable places in their home societies or were driven from them. 
To understand these events, we attempted to reconstruct some of the context of the 1990s. Americans celebrated the end of the Cold War with a mixture of relief and satisfaction. The people of the United States hoped to enjoy a peace dividend, as U.S. spending on national security was cut following the end of the Soviet military threat. The United States emerged into the post-Cold War world as the globe's preeminent military power. But the vacuum created by the sudden demise of the Soviet Union created fresh sources of instability and new challenges for the United States. President George H. W. Bush dealt with the first of these in 1990 and 1991 when he led an international coalition to reverse Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Other examples of U.S. leaders handling new threats included the removal of nuclear weapons from Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan, the Nunluga Threat Reduction Program to help contain new nuclear dangers, and international involvement in the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo. America stood out as an object for admiration, envy and blame. This created a kind of cultural asymmetry. To us, Afghanistan seemed very far away. To members of Al-Qaeda, America seemed very close. In a sense, they were more globalized than we were. Understanding the Danger If the government's leaders understood the gravity of the threat they faced, and understood at the same time that their policies to eliminate it were not likely to succeed any time soon, then history's judgment will be harsh. Did they understand the gravity of the threat? The U.S. government responded vigorously when the attack was on our soil. Both Ramzi Youssef, who organized the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, and Mir Amal Kanzi, who in 1993 killed two CIA employees as they waited to go to work in Langley, Virginia, were the objects of relentless, uncompromising, and successful efforts to bring them back to the United States to stand trial for their crimes. Before 9-11, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates had killed fewer than fifty Americans, including the East Africa embassy bombings and the coal attack. The U.S. government took the threat seriously, but not in the sense of mustering anything like the kind of effort that would be gathered to confront an enemy of the first, second or even third rank. The modest national effort exerted to contain Serbia and its depredations in the Balkans between 1995 and 1999, for example, was orders of magnitude larger than that devoted to Al-Qaeda. As best we can determine, neither in 2000 nor in the first eight months of 2001 did any polling organization in the United States think the subject of terrorism sufficiently on the minds of the public to warrant asking a question about it in a major national survey. Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, or even terrorism was not an important topic in the 2000 presidential election. Congress and the media called little attention to it. If a president wanted to rally the American people to a warlike effort, he would need to publicize an assessment of the growing Al-Qaeda danger. Our government could spark a full public discussion of who Osama bin Laden was, what kind of organization he led, what bin Laden or Al-Qaeda intended, what past attacks they had sponsored or encouraged, and what capabilities they were bringing together for future assaults. We believe American and international public opinion might have been different, and so might the range of options for a president, had they been informed of these details. Recent examples of such debates include calls to arms against such threats as Serbian ethnic cleansing, biological attacks, Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, global climate change, and the HIV-AIDS epidemic. While we now know that Al-Qaeda was formed in 1988, at the end of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, the intelligence community did not describe this organization, at least in documents we have seen, until 1999. A national intelligence estimate distributed in July 1995 predicted future terrorist attacks against the United States and in the United States. It warned that this danger would increase over the next several years. It specified as particular points of vulnerability the White House, the Capitol, symbols of capitalism such as Wall Street, critical infrastructure such as power grids, areas where people congregate such as sports arenas, 
and civil aviation generally. It warned that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing had been intended to kill a lot of people, not to achieve any more traditional political goal. This 1995 estimate described the greatest danger as transient groupings of individuals that lacked strong organization but rather a loose affiliations. They operate outside traditional circles but have access to a worldwide network of training facilities and safe havens. This was an excellent summary of the emerging danger, based on what was then known. In 1996 to 1997, the intelligence community received new information, making clear that bin Laden headed his own terrorist group, with its own targeting agenda and operational commanders. Also revealed was the previously unknown involvement of bin Laden's organization in the 1992 attack on a Yemeni hotel quartering U.S. military personnel, the 1993 shootdown of U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters in Somalia, and quite possibly the 1995 Riyadh bombing of the American training mission to the Saudi National Guard. The 1997 update of the 1995 estimate did not discuss the new intelligence. It did state that the terrorist danger depicted in 1995 would persist. In the update's summary of key points, the only reference to bin Laden was this sentence. Iran and its surrogates, as well as terrorist financier Osama bin Laden and his followers, have stepped up his threats and surveillance of U.S. facilities abroad in what also may be a portent of possible additional attacks in the United States. Bin Laden was mentioned in only two other sentences in the six-page report. The Al-Qaeda organization was not mentioned. The 1997 update was the last national estimate on the terrorism danger, completed before 9-11. From 1998 to 2001, a number of very good analytical papers were distributed on specific topics. These included Bin Laden's political philosophy, his command of a global network, analysis of information from terrorists captured in Jordan in December 1999, Al-Qaeda's operational style, and the evolving goals of the Islamist extremist movement. Many classified articles for morning briefings were prepared for the highest officials in the government, with titles such as Bin Laden threatening to attack U.S. aircraft with anti-aircraft missiles, June 1998. Strains surface between Taliban and Bin Laden, January 1999. Terrorist threat to U.S. interests in Caucasus, June 1999. Bin Laden to exploit looser security during holidays, December 1999. Bin Laden evading sanctions, March 2000. Bin Laden's interest in biological, radiological weapons, February 2001. Taliban holding firm on Bin Laden for now, March 2001. Terrorist groups said cooperating on U.S. hostage plot, May 2001. And... Bin Laden determined to strike in the U.S., August 2001. Despite such reports and a 1999 paper on Bin Laden's command structure for Al-Qaeda, there were no complete portraits of his strategy or of the extent of his organization's involvement in past terrorist attacks. Nor had the intelligence community provided an authoritative depiction of his organization's relationships with other governments or the scale of the threat his organization posed to the United States. Though Deputy DCI John McLaughlin said to us that the cumulative output of the Counter-Terrorist Center, CTC, dramatically eclipsed any analysis that could have appeared in a fresh national intelligence estimate, he conceded that most of the work of the Center's 30-40 to 40 person analytic group dealt with collection issues. In late 2000, DCI George Tenet recognized the deficiency of strategic analysis against al-Qaeda. To tackle the problem within the CTC, he appointed a senior manager, who briefed him in March 2001 on creating a strategic assessment capability. The CTC established a new strategic assessments branch during July 2001. The decision to add about ten analysts to this effort was seen as a major bureaucratic victory, but the CTC labored to find them. The new chief of this branch reported for duty on September the 10th, 2001. 
Whatever the weaknesses in the CIA's portraiture, both Presidents Bill Clinton and George Bush, and their top advisers, told us they got the picture, they understood Bin Laden was a danger. But given the character and pace of their policy efforts, we do not believe they fully understood just how many people Al-Qaeda might kill, and how soon it might do it. At some level that is hard to define, we believe the threat had not yet become compelling. It is hard now to recapture the conventional wisdom before 9-11. For example, a New York Times article in April 1999 sought to debunk claims that Bin Laden was a terrorist leader, with the headline, U.S. hard put to find proof Bin Laden directed attacks. The head of analysis at the CTC until 1999 discounted the alarms about a catastrophic threat as relating only to the danger of chemical, biological or nuclear attack, and he downplayed even that, writing several months before 9-11. It would be a mistake to redefine counter-terrorism as a task of dealing with catastrophic, grand or super-terrorism, when in fact these labels do not represent most of the terrorism that the United States is likely to face, or most of the costs that terrorism imposes on U.S. interests. Beneath the acknowledgment that bin Laden and al-Qaeda presented serious dangers, there was uncertainty among senior officials about whether this was just a new and especially venomous version of the ordinary terrorist threat America had lived with for decades, or was radically new, posing a threat beyond any yet experienced. Such differences affect calculations about whether or how to go to war. Therefore, those government experts who saw bin Laden as an unprecedented new danger needed a way to win broad support for their views, or at least spotlight the areas of dispute, and perhaps prompt action across the government. The national estimate has often played this role, and is sometimes controversial for this very reason. Such assessments, which provoke widespread thought and debate, have a major impact on their recipients, often in a wider circle of decision-makers. The national intelligence estimate is noticed in the Congress, for example. But, as we have said, none was produced on terrorism between 1997 and 9-11. By 2001, the government still needed a decision at the highest level as to whether Al-Qaeda was, or was not, a first-order threat, Richard Clark wrote in his first memo to Condoleezza Rice on January 25, 2001. In his blistering protest about foot-dragging in the Pentagon and at the CIA, sent to Rice just a week before 9-11, he repeated that the real question for the principals was, are we serious about dealing with the Al-Qaeda threat? Is Al-Qaeda a big deal? One school of thought, Clark wrote in this September 4th note, implicitly argued that the terrorist network was a nuisance that killed a score of Americans every 18 to 24 months. If that view was credited, then current policies might be proportionate. Another school saw Al-Qaeda as the point of the spear of radical Islam, but no one forced the argument into the open by calling for a national estimate or a broader discussion of the threat. The issue was never joined as a collective debate by the US government, including the Congress, before 9-11. We return to the issue of proportion and imagination. Even Clark's note challenging Rice to imagine the day after an attack posits a strike that kills hundreds of Americans. He did not write thousands. Institutionalizing Imagination The Case of Aircraft as Weapons Imagination is not a gift usually associated with bureaucracies. For example, before Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government had excellent intelligence that a Japanese attack was coming, especially after peace talks stalemated at the end of November 1941. These were days, one historian notes, of excruciating uncertainty. The most likely targets were judged to be in Southeast Asia. An attack was coming, but officials were at a loss to know where the blow would fall or what more might be done to prevent it. In retrospect, Available intercepts pointed to Japanese examination of Hawaii as a possible target. But, another historian observes, in the face of a clear warning, alert measures bowed to routine. It is therefore crucial to find a way of routinizing, even bureaucratizing, 
the exercise of imagination. Doing so requires more than finding an expert who can imagine that aircraft could be used as weapons. Indeed, since Al-Qaeda and other groups had already used suicide vehicles, namely truck bombs, the leap to the use of other vehicles, such as boats, the coal attack, or planes, is not far-fetched. Yet these scenarios were slow to work their way into the thinking of aviation security experts. In 1996, as a result of the TWA Flight 800 crash, President Clinton created a commission under Vice President Al Gore to report on shortcomings in aviation security in the United States. The Gore Commission's report, having thoroughly canvassed available expertise in and outside of government, did not mention suicide hijackings or the use of aircraft as weapons. It focused mainly on the danger of placing bombs onto aircraft, the approach of the Manila air plot. The Gore Commission did call attention, however, to lax screening of passengers and what they carried onto planes. In late 1998, reports came in of a possible Al-Qaeda plan to hijack a plane. One, a December 4th presidential daily briefing for President Clinton, reprinted in Chapter 4, brought the focus back to more traditional hostage-taking. It reported Bin Laden's involvement in planning a hijack operation to free prisoners such as the blind sheikh, Omar Abdel Rahman. Had the contents of this PDB been brought to the attention of a wider group, including key members of Congress, it might have brought much more attention to the need for permanent changes in domestic airport and airline security procedures. Threat reports also mentioned the possibility of using an aircraft filled with explosives. The most prominent of these mentioned a possible plot to fly an explosives-laden aircraft into a U.S. city. This report, circulated in September 1998, originated from a source who had walked into an American consulate in East Asia. In August of the same year, the intelligence community had received information that a group of Libyans hoped to crash a plane into the World Trade Center. In neither case could the information be corroborated. In addition, an Algerian group hijacked an airliner in 1994, most likely intending to blow it up over Paris, but possibly to crash it into the Eiffel Tower. In 1994, a private airplane had crashed onto the south lawn of the White House. In early 1995, Abdul Hakim Murad, Ramzi Yosef's accomplice in the Manila Airlines bombing plot, told Philippine authorities that he and Yosef had discussed flying a plane into CIA headquarters. Clark had been concerned about the danger posed by aircraft since at least the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. There, he had tried to create an air defence plan using assets from the Treasury Department after the Defence Department declined to contribute resources. The Secret Service continued to work on the problem of airborne threats to the Washington region. In 1998, Clark chaired an exercise designed to highlight the inadequacy of the solution. This paper exercise involved a scenario in which a group of terrorists commandeered a Learjet on the ground in Atlanta, loaded it with explosives, and flew it towards a target in Washington, D.C. Clark asked officials from the Pentagon, Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, and Secret Service what they could do about the situation. Officials from the Pentagon said they could scramble aircraft from Langley Air Force Base, but they would need to go to the President for rules of engagement, and there was no mechanism to do so. There was no clear resolution of the problem at the exercise. In late 1999, a great deal of discussion took place in the media about the crash off the coast of Massachusetts of Egypt Air Flight 990, a Boeing 767. The most plausible explanation that emerged was that one of the pilots had gone berserk, seized the controls, and flown the aircraft into the sea. After the 1999-2000 Millennium Alerts, when the nation had relaxed, Clark held a meeting of his counter-terrorism security group devoted largely to the possibility of a possible airplane hijacking by Al-Qaeda. In his testimony, Clark commented that he thought that warning about the possibility of a suicide hijacking would have been just one more speculative theory among many, hard to spot since the volume of warnings of Al-Qaeda threats and other terrorist threats was in the tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands. Yet the possibility was imaginable and imagined. In early August 1999, 
the FAA's Civil Aviation Security Intelligence Office, summarized the Bin Laden hijacking threat. After a solid recitation of all the information available on this topic, the paper identified a few principal scenarios, one of which was a suicide hijacking operation. The FAA analysts judged such an operation unlikely, because it does not offer an opportunity for dialogue to achieve the key goal of obtaining Rahman and other key captive extremists, a suicide hijacking is assessed to be an option of last resort. Analysts could have shed some light on what kind of opportunity for dialogue Al-Qaeda desired. The CIA did not write any analytical assessments of possible hijacking scenarios. One prescient pre-9-11 analysis of an aircraft plot was written by a Justice Department trial attorney. The attorney had taken an interest, apparently on his own initiative, in the legal issues that would be involved in shooting down a U.S. aircraft in such a situation. The North American Aerospace Defense Command imagined the possible use of aircraft as weapons too, and developed exercises to counter such a threat, from planes coming to the United States from overseas, perhaps carrying a weapon of mass destruction. None of this speculation was based on actual intelligence of such a threat. One idea, intended to test command and control plans, and NORAD's readiness, postulated a hijacked airliner coming from overseas and crashing into the Pentagon. The idea was put aside in the early planning of the exercise, as too much of a distraction from the main focus, war in Korea, and as too unrealistic. As we pointed out in Chapter 1, the military planners assumed that since such aircraft would be coming from overseas, they would have time to identify the target and scramble interceptors. We can therefore establish that at least some government agencies were concerned about the hijacking danger, and had speculated about various scenarios. The challenge was to flesh out and test those scenarios, then figure out a way to turn a scenario into constructive action. Since the Pearl Harbor attack of 1941, the intelligence community has devoted generations of effort to understanding the problem of forestalling a surprise attack. Rigorous analytic methods were developed, focused in particular on the Soviet Union, and several leading practitioners within the intelligence community discussed them with us. These methods have been articulated in many ways, but almost all seem to have at least four elements in common. 1. Think about how surprise attacks might be launched. 2. Identify telltale indicators connected to the most dangerous possibilities. 3. Where feasible, collect intelligence on these indicators. And 4. Adopt defences to deflect the most dangerous possibilities, or at least trigger an earlier warning. After the end of the Gulf War, concerns about lack of warning led to a major study, conducted by DCI Robert Gates in 1992, that proposed several recommendations, among them strengthening the National Intelligence Officer for warning. We were told that these measures languished under Gates's successors. Responsibility for warning related to a terrorist attack passed from the National Intelligence Officer for Warning to the CTC. An Intelligence Community Counterterrorism Board had the responsibility to issue threat advisories. With the important exception of analysis of Al-Qaeda efforts in chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear weapons, we did not find evidence that the methods to avoid surprise attack, that had been so laboriously developed over the years, were regularly applied. Considering what was not done suggests possible ways to institutionalize imagination. To return to the four elements of analysis just mentioned. 1. The CTC did not analyze how an aircraft, hijacked or explosives laden, might be used as a weapon. It did not perform this kind of analysis from the enemy's perspective, red team analysis, even though suicide terrorism had become a principal tactic of Middle Eastern terrorists. If it had done so, we believe such an analysis would soon have spotlighted a critical constraint for the terrorists, finding a suicide operative able to fly large jet aircraft. They had never done so before 9-11. 2. The CTC did not develop a set of telltale indicators for this method of attack. For example, one such indicator might be the discovery of possible terrorists pursuing flight training to fly large jet aircraft, 
or seeking to buy advanced flight simulators. 3. The CTC did not propose, and the Intelligence Community Collection Management Process did not set, requirements to monitor such telltale indicators. Therefore, the warning system was not looking for information, such as the July 2001 FBI report, of potential terrorist interest in various kinds of aircraft training in Arizona, or the August 2001 arrest of Zacharias Musari because of his suspicious behavior in a Minnesota flight school. In late August, the Musari arrest was briefed to the DCI and other top CIA officials under the heading Islamic Extremist Learns to Fly. Because the system was not tuned to comprehend the potential significance of this information, the news had no effect on warning. 4. Neither the intelligence community nor aviation security experts analyzed systemic defenses within an aircraft or against terrorist-controlled aircraft, suicidal or otherwise. The many threat reports mentioning aircraft were passed to the FAA. While that agency continued to react to specific, credible threats, it did not try to perform the broader warning functions we describe here. No one in the government was taking on that role for domestic vulnerabilities. Richard Clark told us that he was concerned about the danger posed by aircraft in the context of protecting the Atlanta Olympics of 1996, the White House complex, and the 2001 G8 summit in Genoa but he attributed his awareness more to Tom Clancy novels than to warnings from the intelligence community. He did not, or could not, press the government to work on the systemic issues of how to strengthen the layered security defences to protect aircraft against hijackings, or put the adequacy of air defences against suicide hijackers on the national policy agenda. The methods for detecting and then warning of surprise attack that the U.S. government had so painstakingly developed in the decades after Pearl Harbor did not fail. Instead, they were not really tried. They were not employed to analyze the enemy that, as the twentieth century closed, was most likely to launch a surprise attack directly against the United States. End of chapter 11.1 Chapter 11.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 11.2. Policy. The road to 9-11 again illustrates how the large, unwieldy U.S. government tended to underestimate a threat that grew ever greater. The terrorism fostered by bin Laden and al-Qaeda was different from anything the government had faced before. The existing mechanisms for handling terrorist acts had been trial and punishment for acts committed by individuals, sanction, reprisal, deterrence, or war for acts by hostile governments. The action of al-Qaeda fit neither category. Its crimes were on a scale approaching acts of war, but they were committed by a loose, far-flung, nebulous conspiracy with no territories or citizens or assets that could be readily threatened, overwhelmed, or destroyed. Early in 2001, DCI Tenant and Deputy Director for Operations James Povett gave an intelligence briefing to President-elect Bush, Vice President-elect Cheney, and Rice. It included the topic of al-Qaeda. Povett recalled conveying that bin Laden was one of the gravest threats to the country. Bush asked whether killing bin Laden would end the problem. Pavit said he and the DCI had answered that killing bin Laden would have had an impact, but would not stop the threat. The CIA later provided more formal assessments to the White House, reiterating that conclusion. It added that in the long term, the only way to deal with the threat was to end al-Qaeda's ability to use Afghanistan as a sanctuary for its operations. Perhaps the most incisive of the advisers on terrorism to the new administration was a holdover Richard Clark. Yet he admits his policy advice, even if it had been accepted immediately and turned into action, would not have prevented 9-11. 
We must ask when the U.S. government had reasonable opportunities to mobilize a country for major action against al-Qaeda and its Afghan sanctuary. The main opportunities came after the new information the U.S. government received in 1996 and 1997, after the embassy bombings of August 1998, after the discoveries of the Jordanian and Rissam plots in late 1999, and after the attack on the USS Cole in October 2000. The U.S. policy response to al-Qaeda before 9-11 was essentially defined following the embassy bombings of August 1998. We described those decisions in Chapter 4. It is worth noting that they were made by the Clinton administration under extremely difficult domestic political circumstances. Opponents were seeking the president's impeachment. In addition, in 1998-99, President Clinton was preparing the government for possible war against Serbia, and he had authorized major airstrikes against Iraq. The tragedy of the embassy bombings provided an opportunity for a full examination across the government of the national security threat that bin Laden posed. Such an examination could have made clear to all that issues were at stake that were much larger than the domestic politics of the moment but the major policy agencies of the government did not meet the threat. The diplomatic efforts of the Department of State were largely ineffective. Al-Qaeda and terrorism was just one more priority added to already crowded agendas with countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. After 9-11, that changed. Policymakers turned principally to the CIA and covert action to implement policy. Before 9-11, no agency had more responsibility or did more to attack al-Qaeda during day and night than the CIA. But there were limits to what the CIA was able to achieve in its energy's worldwide efforts to disrupt terrorist activities or to use proxies to try to capture or kill bin Laden and his lieutenants. As early as mid-1997, one CIA officer wrote to his supervisor, all we're doing is holding the ring until the cavalry gets here. Military measures failed or were not applied. Before 9-11, the Department of Defense was not given the mission of ending al-Qaeda's sanctuary in Afghanistan. Officials in both the Clinton and Bush administration regarded a full U.S. invasion of Afghanistan as practically inconceivable before 9-11. It was never the subject of formal interagency deliberation. Lesser forms of intervention could also have been considered. One would have been the deployment of the U.S. military or intelligence personnel or special strike forces to Afghanistan itself or nearby, openly, clandestinely, secretly, or covertly, with their connection to the United States hidden. Then the United States would no longer have been dependent on proxies to gather actionable intelligence. However, it would have needed to secure basing and overflight support from neighboring countries. A significant political, military, and intelligence effort would have been required, extending over months and perhaps years, with associated costs and risks. Given how hard it has proved to locate bin Laden, even today, when there are substantial ground forces in Afghanistan, its odds of success are hard to calculate. We have found no indication that President Clinton was offered such an intermediate choice or that this option was given any more consideration than the idea of invasion. These policy challenges are linked to the problem of imagination we have already discussed. Since we believe that both President Clinton and President Bush were genuinely concerned about the danger posed by al-Qaeda, Approaches involving more direct intervention against the sanctuary in Afghanistan apparently must have seemed, if they were considered at all, to be disproportionate to the threat. Insight for the future thus not easy to apply in practice. It is hardest to mount a major effort when the problem still seems minor. Once the danger is fully materialized, evident to all, mobilizing action is easier but it then may be too late. Another possibility short of putting U.S. personnel on the ground was to issue a blunt ultimatum to the Taliban, backed by a readiness to at least launch an indefinite air campaign to disable the region's limited military capabilities, 
and tip the balance in Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The United States had warned the Taliban that it would be held accountable for further attacks by bin Laden against Afghanistan U.S. interests. The warning had been given in 1998, again in late 1999, once more in the fall of 2000, and again in the summer of 2001. Delivering it repeatedly did not make it more effective. As evidence of al-Qaeda's responsibility for the coal attack came in during November 2000, National Security Advisor Samuel Berger asked the Pentagon to develop a plan for a sustained air campaign against the Taliban. Clark developed a paper laying out a formal specific ultimatum, but Clark's plan apparently did not advance to formal consideration by the small group of principals. We have found no indication that the idea was briefed to the new administration or that Clark passed his paper to them although the same team of career officials spanned both administrations. After 9-11, President Bush announced that al-Qaeda was responsible for the attack on the USS Cole. Before 9-11, neither president took any action. Bin Laden's inference may have been that attacks, at least at the level of the Cole, were risk-free. End of chapter 11.2「Chapter 11.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 11.3 Capabilities. Earlier chapters describe in detail the actions decided on by the Clinton and Bush administrations. Each president considered or authorized covert actions, a process that consumed considerable time, especially in the Clinton administration, and achieved little success beyond the collection of intelligence. After the August 1998 missile strikes in Afghanistan, naval vessels remained on station in or near the region, prepared to fire cruise missiles. General Hugh Shelton developed as many as 13 different strike options and did not recommend any of them. The most extended debate on counterterrorism in the Bush administration before 9-11 had to do with missions for the unmanned predator, whether to use it just to locate bin Laden or to wait until it was armed with a missile so that it could find him and also attack him. Looking back, we are struck with the narrow and unimaginative menu of options for action offered to both President Clinton and President Bush. Before 9-11, the United States tried to solve the al-Qaeda problem with the same government institutions and capabilities it had used in the last stages of the Cold War and its immediate aftermath. These capabilities were insufficient, but little was done to expand or reform them. For covert action, of course, the White House depended on the Counterterrorist Center and the CIA's Directorate of Operations. Though some officers, particularly in the bin Laden unit, were eager for the mission, most were not. The higher management of the Directorate was unenthusiastic. The CIA's capacity to conduct paramilitary operations with its own personnel was not large, and the agency did not seek a large-scale general expansion of these capabilities before 9-11. James Pavitt, the head of this directorate, remembered that covert action, promoted by the White House, had gotten the clandestine service into trouble in the past. He had no desire to see this happen again. He thought, not unreasonably, that a truly serious counterterrorism campaign against an enemy of this magnitude would be business primarily for the military, not the clandestine service. As for the Department of Defense, some officers in the Joint Staff were keen to help. Some in the Special Operations Command have told us that they worked on plans for using Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan and that they hoped for action orders. JCS Chairman General Shelton and General Anthony Zini at Central Command had a different view. Shelton felt that the August 1998 attacks had proved a waste of good ordnance and thereafter consistently opposed firing expensive Tomahawk missiles merely at Jungle Jim terrorist training infrastructure. In this view, he had complete support from Defense Secretary William Cohen. 
Shelton was prepared to plan other options, but he was also prepared to make perfectly clear his own strong doubts about the wisdom of any military action that risked U.S. lives unless the intelligence was actionable. The high price of keeping counterterrorism policy within the restricted circle of the counterterrorism security group and the highest level principles was nowhere more apparent than in the military establishment. After the August 1998 missile strike, other members of the JCS let the press know their unhappiness that, in conformity with the Goldwater-Nichols reforms, Shelton had been the only member of the JCS to be consulted. Although follow-on military options were briefed more widely, the Vice Director of Operations on the Joint Staff commented to us that intelligence and planning documents relating to Al-Qaeda arrived in a Ziploc red package, and that many flag and general officers never had the clearances to see its contents. At no point before 9-11 was the Department of Defense fully engaged in the mission of countering Al-Qaeda, though this was perhaps the most dangerous foreign enemy then threatening the United States. The Clinton administration effectively relied on the CIA to take the lead in preparing long-term offensive plans against an enemy sanctuary. The Bush administration adopted this approach, although its emerging new strategy envisioned some yet undefined further role for the military in addressing the problem. Within defense, both Secretary Cohen and Secretary Donald Rumsfeld gave their principal attention to other challenges. America's homeland defenders faced outward. NORAD itself was barely able to retain any alert bases. Its planning scenarios occasionally considered the danger of hijacked aircraft being guided to American targets, but only aircraft that were coming from overseas. We recognize that a costly change in NORAD's defense posture to deal with the danger of suicide hijackers before such a threat had ever actually been realized would have been a tough sell. But NORAD did not canvass available intelligence and try to make the case. The most serious weaknesses in agency capabilities were in the domestic arena. In Chapter 3, we discussed these institutions, the FBI, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the FAA, and others. The major pre-9-11 effort to strengthen domestic agency capabilities came in 2000 as part of a Millennium After Action Review. President Clinton and his principal advisors paid considerable attention then to border security problems but were not able to bring about significant improvements before leaving office. The NSC-led interagency process did not effectively bring along the leadership of the Justice and Transportation Departments in an agenda for institutional change. The FBI did not have the capability to link the collective knowledge of agents in the field to national priorities. The acting director of the FBI did not learn of his bureau's hunt for two possible al-Qaeda operatives in the United States or about his bureau's arrest of an Islamic extremist taking flight training until September 11th. The director of Central Intelligence knew about the FBI's Musawi investigation weeks before word of it made its way even to the FBI's own assistant director for counterterrorism. Other agencies deferred to the FBI. In the August 6 PDB, reporting to President Bush, of 70 full field investigations related to al-Qaeda, news the president said he found heartening, the CIA had simply restated what the FBI had said. No one looked behind the curtain. The FAA's capabilities to take aggressive, anticipatory security measures were especially weak. Any serious policy examination of a suicide hijacking scenario, critiquing each of the layers of the security system, could have suggested changes to fix glaring vulnerabilities, expanding no-fly lists, searching passengers identified by the CAPS screening system, deploying federal air marshals domestically, hardening cockpit doors, alerting air crew to a different kind of hijacking than what they had been trained to expect, or adjusting the training of controllers and managers in the FAA and NORAD. Government agencies also sometimes display a tendency to match capabilities to mission by defining away the hardest part of their job. They are often passive, accepting what are viewed as givens, including that efforts to identify and fix glaring vulnerabilities to dangerous threats would be too costly, too controversial, or too disruptive. End of chapter 11.3 Recording by Leanne Howlett
Chapter 11.4 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 11.4 Management Operational Management Earlier in this report, we detailed various missed opportunities to thwart the 9-11 plot. Information was not shared, sometimes inadvertently or because of legal misunderstandings. Analysis was not pooled. Effective operations were not launched. Often the handoffs of information were lost across the divide separating the foreign and domestic agencies of the government. However the specific problems are labeled, we believe they are symptoms of the government's broader inability to adapt how it manages problems to the new challenges of the 21st century. The agencies are like a set of specialists in a hospital, each ordering tests, looking for symptoms, and prescribing medications. What is missing is the attending physician who makes sure they work as a team. One missing element was effective management of transnational operations. Action officers should have drawn on all available knowledge in the government. This management should have ensured that information was shared and duties were clearly assigned across agencies and across the foreign domestic divide. Consider, for example, the case of Midar, Hazmi, and their January 2000 trip to Kuala Lumpur, detailed in Chapter 6. In late 1999, the National Security Agency, NSA, analyzed communications associated with a man named Khalid, a man named Nawaf, and a man named Salim. Working-level officials in the intelligence community knew little more than this, but they correctly concluded that Nawaf and Khalid might be part of an operational cadre and that something nefarious might be afoot. The NSA did not think its job was to research these identities. It saw itself as an agency to support intelligence consumers, such as CIA. The NSA tried to respond energetically to any request made, but it waited to be asked. If NSA had been asked to try to identify these people, the agency would have started by checking its own database of earlier information from these same sources. Some of this information had been reported, some had not, but it was all readily accessible in the database. NSA's analysts would promptly have discovered who Nawaf was, that his full name might be Nawaf al-Hazmi, and that he was an old friend of Khalid. With this information and more that was available, managers could have more effectively tracked the movement of these operatives in Southeast Asia. With the name Nawaf al-Hazmi, a manager could then have asked the State Department also to check that name. State would promptly have found its own record on Nawaf al-Hazmi, showing that he too had been issued a visa to visit the United States. Officials would have learned that the visa had been issued at the same place, Jeddah, and on almost the same day as the one given to Khalid al-Midar. When the travelers left Kuala Lumpur for Bangkok, local officials were able to identify one of the travelers as Khalid al-Midar. After the flight left, they learned that one of his companions had the name al-Hazmi, but the officials did not know what that name meant. The information arrived at Bangkok too late to track these travelers as they came in. Had the authorities there already been keeping an eye out for Khalid al-Madar as part of a general regional or worldwide alert, they might have tracked him coming in. Had they been alerted to look for a possible companion named Nawaf al-Hazmi, they might have noticed him too. Instead, they were notified only after Kuala Lumpur sounded the alarm. By that time, the travelers had already disappeared into the streets of Bangkok. On January 12th, the head of the CIA's Al-Qaeda unit told his bosses that surveillance in Kuala Lumpur was continuing. He may not have known that, in fact, Midar and his companions had dispersed and the tracking was falling apart. U.S. officials in Bangkok regretfully reported the bad news on January 13th. The names they had were put on a watch list in Bangkok so that Thai authorities might notice if the men left the country. On January 14th, the head of the CIA's Al-Qaeda unit again updated his bosses, telling them that officials were continuing to track the suspicious individuals who had now dispersed to various countries. 
Unfortunately, there is no evidence of any tracking efforts actually being undertaken by anyone after the Arabs disappeared into Bangkok. No other effort was made to create other opportunities to spot these Arab travelers in case the screen in Bangkok failed. Just from the evidence in Midar's passport, one of the logical possible destinations and interdiction points would have been the United States. Yet no one alerted the INS or the FBI to look for these individuals. They arrived unnoticed in Los Angeles on January 15th. In early March 2000, Bangkok reported that Nawaf al-Hazmi, now identified for the first time with his full name, had departed on January 15th on a United Airlines flight to Los Angeles. Since the CIA did not appreciate the significance of that name or notice the cable, we have found no evidence that this information was sent to the FBI. Even if watchlisting had prevented or at least alerted U.S. officials to the entry of Hazmi and Madar, we do not think it is likely that watchlisting by itself have prevented the 9-11 attacks. Al-Qaeda adapted to the failure of some of its operatives to gain entry into the United States. None of these future hijackers was a pilot. Alternatively, had they been permitted entry and surveilled, some larger results might have been possible had the FBI been patient. These are difficult what-ifs. The intelligence community might have judged that the risks of conducting such a prolonged intelligence operation were too high. Potential terrorists might have been lost track of, for example. The pre-9-11 FBI might not have been judged capable of conducting such an operation. But surely the intelligence community would have preferred to have the chance to make these choices. From the details of this case, or from the other opportunities we catalog in the text box, one can see how hard it is for the intelligence community to assemble enough of the puzzle pieces gathered by different agencies to make some sense of them and then develop a fully informed joint plan. Accomplishing all this is especially difficult in a transnational case. We sympathize with the working level officers, drowning in information and trying to decide what is important or what needs to be done when no particular action has been requested of them. Operational Opportunities 1. January 2000. The CIA does not watch list Khalid al-Madar or notify the FBI when it learned Madar possessed a valid U.S. visa. 2. January 2000. The CIA does not develop a transnational plan for tracking Madar and his associates so that they could be followed to Bangkok and onward, including the United States. 3. March 2000. The CIA does not watch list Nawaf al-Hazmi or notify the FBI when it learned that he possessed a U.S. visa and had flown to Los Angeles on January 15, 2000. 4. January 2001. The CIA does not inform the FBI that a source had identified Khalad, or Tafik Ben Atash, a major figure in the October 2000 bombing of the USS Cole, as having attended the meeting in Kuala Lumpur with Khalid al-Madar. 5. May 2001. A CIA official does not notify the FBI about Madar's U.S. visa, Hazmi's U.S. travel, or Khalad's having attended the Kuala Lumpur meeting, identified when he reviewed all of the relevant traffic because of the high level of threats. 6. June 2001. FBI and CIA officials do not ensure that all relevant information regarding the Kuala Lumpur meeting was shared with the Cole investigators at the June 11th meeting. 7. August 2001. The FBI does not recognize the significance of the information regarding Madar and Hazmi's possible arrival in the United States and thus does not take adequate action to share information, assign resources, and give sufficient priority to the search. 8. August 2001 FBI headquarters does not recognize the significance of the information regarding Musawi's training and beliefs, and thus does not take adequate action to share information, involve higher-level officials across agencies, obtain information regarding Musawi's ties to al-Qaeda, and give sufficient priority to determining what Musawi might be planning. 9. August 2001. The CIA does not focus on information that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is a key al-Qaeda lieutenant or connect information identifying KSM as the Mukhtar mentioned in other reports to the analysis that could have linked Mukhtar with Ramzi bin al-Shib and Musawi. 
10. August 2001. The CIA and FBI do not connect the presence of Nadar, Hazmi, and Musawi to the general threat reporting about imminent attacks. Who had the job of managing the case to make sure these things were done? One answer is that everyone had the job. The CIA's Deputy Director for Operations, James Pavitt, stressed to us that the responsibility resided with all involved. Above all, he emphasized the primacy of the field. The field had the lead in managing operations. The job of headquarters, he stressed, was to support the field, and do so without delay. If the field asked for information or other support, the job of headquarters was to get it, right away. This is a traditional perspective on operations, and traditionally it has had great merit. It reminded us of the FBI's pre-9-11 emphasis on the primacy of its field offices. When asked about how this traditional structure would adapt to the challenge of managing a transnational case, one that hopped from place to place as this one did, the deputy director argued that all involved were responsible for making it work. Pavitt underscored the responsibility of the particular field location where the suspects were being tracked at any given time. On the other hand, he also said that the counter-terrorist center was supposed to manage all the moving parts, while what happened on the ground was the responsibility of managers in the field. Headquarters tended to support and facilitate, trying to make sure everyone was in the loop. From time to time a particular post would push one way, or headquarters would urge someone to do something. But headquarters never really took responsibility for the successful management of this case. Hence the managers at CIA headquarters did not realize that omissions in planning had occurred, and they scarcely knew that the case had fallen apart. The director of the counter-terrorist center at the time, Kofer Black, recalled to us that this operation was one among many, and that at the time it was considered interesting, but not heavy water yet. He recalled the failure to get the word to Bangkok fast enough, but has no evident recollection of why the case then dissolved unnoticed. The next level down, the director of the Al-Qaeda unit in CIA at the time, recalled that he did not think it was his job to direct what should or should not be done. He did not pay attention when the individuals dispersed and things fell apart. There was no conscious decision to stop the operation after the trail was temporarily lost in Bangkok. He acknowledged, however, that perhaps there had been a letdown for his overworked staff after the extreme tension and long hours in the period of the Millennium Alert. The details of this case illuminate real management challenges, past and future. The U.S. government must find a way of pooling intelligence and using it to guide the planning of and assignment of responsibilities for joint operations involving organizations as disparate as the CIA, the FBI, the State Department, the military, and the agencies involved in homeland security. Institutional Management Beyond those day-to-day -day tasks of bridging the foreign domestic divide and matching intelligence with plans, the challenges include broader management issues pertaining to how the top leaders of the government set priorities and allocate resources. Once again, it is useful to illustrate the problem by examining the CIA, since before 9-11 this agency's role was so central in the government's counterterrorism efforts. On December 4, 1998, DCI Tenet issued a directive to several CIA officials and his deputy for community management stating, We are at war. I want no resources or people spared in this effort, either inside CIA or the community. The memorandum had little overall effect on mobilizing the CIA or the intelligence community. The memo was addressed only to CIA officials and the deputy for community management, Joan Dempsey. She faxed the memo to the heads of the major intelligence agencies after removing covert action sections. Only a handful of people received it. The NSA director at the time, Lieutenant General Kenneth Minahan, believed the memo applied only to the CIA and not the NSA because no one had informed him of any NSA shortcomings. For their part, CIA officials thought the memorandum was intended for the rest of the intelligence community given that they were already doing all they could and believed that the rest of the community needed to pull its weight. The episode indicates some of the limitations of the DCI's authority over the direction and priorities of the intelligence community, especially its elements within the Department of Defense. The DCI has to direct agencies without controlling them. He does not receive an appropriation for their activities, and therefore does not control their purse strings. 
he has little insight into how they spend their resources. Congress attempted to strengthen the DCI's authority in 1996 by creating the positions of Deputy DCI for Community Management and Assistant DCI's for Collection, Analysis and Production, and Administration. But the authority of these positions is limited, and the vision of central management clearly has not been realized. The DCI did not develop a management strategy for a war against Islamist terrorism before 9-11. Such a management strategy would define the capabilities the intelligence community must acquire for such a war, from language training to collection systems to analysts. Such a management strategy would necessarily extend beyond the CTC to the components that feed its expertise and support its operations, linked transparently to counterterrorism objectives. It would then detail the proposed expenditures and organizational changes required to acquire and implement these capabilities. DCI Tenet and his Deputy Director for Operations told us they did have a management strategy for a war on terrorism. It was to rebuild the CIA. They said the CIA as a whole had been badly damaged by prior budget constraints and that capabilities needed to be restored across the board. Indeed, the CTC budget had not been cut while the budgets had been slashed in many other parts of the agency. By restoring funding across the CIA, a rising tide would lift all boats. They also stressed the synergy between improvements of every part of the agency and the capabilities that the CTC or stations overseas could draw on in the War on Terror. As some officials pointed out to us, there is a trade-off in this management approach. In an attempt to rebuild everything at once, the highest priority efforts might not get the maximum support that they need. Furthermore, this approach attempted to channel relatively strong outside support for combating terrorism into backing for across-the-board funding increases. Proponents of the counterterrorism agenda might respond by being less inclined to loosen the purse strings than they would have been if offered a convincing counterterrorism budget strategy. The DCI's management strategy was also focused mainly on the CIA. Lacking a management strategy for the war on terrorism or ways to see how funds were being spent across the community, DCI Tenet and his aides found it difficult to develop an overall intelligence community budget for a war on terrorism. Responsibility for domestic intelligence gathering on terrorism was vested solely in the FBI, yet during almost all of the Clinton administration, the relationship between the FBI director and the president was nearly non-existent. The FBI director would not communicate directly with the president. His key personnel shared very little information with the National Security Council and the rest of the national security community. As a consequence, one of the critical working relationships in the counterterrorism effort was broken. The Millennium Exception Before concluding our narrative, we offer a reminder and an explanation of the one period in which the government as a whole seemed to be acting in concert to deal with terrorism, the last weeks of December 1999 preceding the millennium. In the period between December 1999 and early January 2000, information about terrorism flowed widely and abundantly. The flow from the FBI was particularly remarkable because the FBI at other times shared almost no information. That from the intelligence community was also remarkable because some of it reached officials, local airport managers and local police departments, who had not seen such information before and would not see it again before 9-11, if then. And the terrorist threat, in the United States even more than abroad, engaged the frequent attention of high officials in the executive branch and leaders in both houses of Congress. Why was this so? Most obviously it was because everyone was already on edge with the millennium and possible computer programming glitches, Y2K, that might obliterate records, shut down power and communication lines, or otherwise disrupt daily life. Then, Jordanian authorities arrested 16 al-Qaeda terrorists planning a number of bombings in that country. Those in custody included two U.S. citizens. Soon after, an alert customs agent caught Ahmed Rassam bringing explosives across the Canadian border with the apparent intention of blowing up Los Angeles Airport. He was found to have Confederates on both sides of the border. These were not events whispered about in highly classified intelligence dailies or FBI interview memos. The information was in all major newspapers and highlighted in network television news. Though the Jordanian arrests only made page 13 of the New York Times, 
They were featured on every evening newscast. The arrest of Rassam was on front pages, and the original story and its follow-ups dominated television news for a week. FBI field offices around the country were swamped by calls from concerned citizens. Representatives of the Justice Department, the FAA, local police departments, and major airports had microphones in their faces whenever they showed themselves. After the Millennium Alert, the government relaxed. Counterterrorism went back to being a secret preserve for segments of the FBI, the Counterterrorist Center, and the Counterterrorism Security Group. But the experience showed that the government was capable of mobilizing itself for an alert against terrorism. While one factor was the pre-existence of widespread concern about Y2K, another, at least equally important, was simply shared information. Everyone knew not only of an abstract threat, but of at least one terrorist who had been arrested in the United States. Terrorism had a face, that of Ahmed Rassam, and Americans from Vermont to Southern California went on the watch for his like. In the summer of 2001, DCI Tenet, the Counter-Terrorist Center, and the Counter-Terrorism Security Group did their utmost to sound a loud alarm, its basis being intelligence indicating that al-Qaeda planned something big. But the millennium phenomenon was not repeated. FBI field offices apparently saw no abnormal terrorist activity, and headquarters was not shaking them up. Between May 2001 and September 11th, there was very little in newspapers or on television to heighten anyone's concern about terrorism. Front-page stories touching on the subject dealt with the wind-up of trials dealing with the East Africa Embassy bombings and Rassam. All this reportage looked backward, describing problems satisfactorily resolved. Back-page notices told of tightened security at embassies and military installations abroad, and government cautions against travel to the Arabian Peninsula. All the rest was secret. End of Chapter 11.4 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 12.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Rohde The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 12.1 Reflecting on a Generational Challenge Three years after 9-11, Americans are still thinking and talking about how to protect our nation in this new era. The national debate continues. Countering terrorism has become, beyond any doubt, the top national security priority for the United States. This shift has occurred with the full support of the Congress, both major political parties, the media, and the American people. The nation has committed enormous resources to national security and to countering terrorism. Between fiscal year 2001, the last budget adopted before 9-11, and the present fiscal year 2004, total federal spending on defense, including expenditures on both Iraq and Afghanistan, homeland security, and international affairs rose more than 50 percent, from $354 billion to about $547 billion. The United States has not experienced such a rapid surge in national security spending since the Korean War. This pattern has occurred before in American history. The United States faces a sudden crisis and summons a tremendous exertion of national energy. Then, as that surge transforms the landscape, comes a time for reflection and re-evaluation. Some programs, and even agencies, are discarded. Others are invented or redesigned. Private firms and engaged citizens redefine their relationships with government, working through the processes of the American Republic. Now is the time for that reflection and re-evaluation. The United States should consider what to do, the shape and objectives of a strategy. Americans should also consider how to do it, organizing their government in a different way. Defining the Threat In the post-9-11 world, 
threats are defined more by the fault lines within societies than by territorial boundaries between them from terrorism to global disease or environmental degradation the challenges have become transnational rather than international that is the defining quality of world politics in the twenty-first century national security used to be considered by studying foreign frontiers weighing opposing groups of states and measuring industrial might to be dangerous an enemy had to muster large armies threats emerged slowly often visibly as weapons were forged armies conscripted and units trained and moved into place because large states were more powerful they also had more to lose they could be deterred now threats can emerge quickly an organization like al-qaeda headquartered in a country on the other side of the earth in a region so poor that electricity or telephones were scarce could none the less scheme to wield weapons of unprecedented destructive power in the largest cities of the united states in this sense nine eleven has taught us that terrorism against american interests over there should be regarded just as we regard terrorism against america over here in this same sense the american homeland is the planet but the enemy is not just terrorism some generic evil this vagueness blurs the strategy the catastrophic threat at this moment in history is more specific it is the threat posed by islamist terrorism especially the al-qaeda network its affiliates and its ideology as we mentioned in chapter two osama bin laden and other islamist terrorist leaders draw on a long tradition of extreme intolerance within one stream of islam a minority tradition from at least ibn taymiyyah through the founders of wahhabism through the muslim brotherhood to saeed Qutbi. that stream is motivated by religion and does not distinguish politics from religion thus distorting both it is further fed by grievances stressed by bin laden and widely felt throughout the muslim world against the u s military presence in the middle east policies perceived as anti-arab and anti-muslim and support by israel bin laden and islamist terrorists mean exactly what they say to them america is the font of all evil the head of the snake and it must be converted or destroyed it is not a position with which americans can bargain or negotiate with it there is no common ground not even respect for life on which to begin a dialogue it can only be destroyed or utterly isolated because the muslim world has fallen behind the west politically economically and militarily for the past three centuries and because few tolerant or secular muslim democracies provide alternative models for the future bin laden's message finds receptive ears it has attracted active support from thousands of disaffected young muslims and resonates powerfully with a far larger number who do not actively support his method the resentment of america and the west is deep even among leaders of relatively successful muslim states tolerance the rule of law political and economic openness the extension of greater opportunities to women these cures must come from within muslim societies themselves the united states must support such developments but this process is likely to be measured in decades not years it is a process that will be violently opposed by islamist terrorist organizations both inside muslim countries and in attacks on the united states and other western nations the united states finds itself caught up in a clash within a civilization that clash arises from particular conditions in the muslim world conditions that spill over into expatriate muslim communities in non-muslim countries our enemy is twofold al-qaeda a stateless network of terrorists that struck us on nine eleven 
and a radical ideological movement in the Islamic world, inspired in part by al-Qaeda, which has spawned terrorist groups and violence across the globe. The first enemy is weakened, but continues to pose a grave threat. The second enemy is gathering, and will menace Americans and American interests long after Osama bin Laden and his cohorts are killed or captured. Thus our strategy must match our means to two ends, dismantling the al-Qaeda network, and prevailing in the longer term over the ideology that gives rise to Islamist terrorism. Islam is not the enemy. It is not synonymous with terror. Nor does Islam teach terror. America and its friends oppose a perversion of Islam, not the great world faith itself. Lives guided by religious faith, including literal beliefs in holy scriptures, are common to every religion, and represent no threat to us. Other religions have experienced violent internal struggles. With so many diverse adherents, every major religion will spawn violent zealots. Yet understanding and tolerance among people of different faiths can and must prevail. The present transnational danger is Islamist terrorism. What is needed is a broad political-military strategy that rests on a firm tripod of policies to attack terrorists and their organizations, prevent the continued growth of Islamist terrorism, and protect against and prepare for terrorist attacks. More than a war on terrorism Terrorism is a tactic used by individuals and organizations to kill and destroy. Our efforts should be directed at those individuals and organizations. Calling this struggle a war accurately describes the use of American and allied armed forces to find and destroy terrorist groups and their allies in the field, notably in Afghanistan. The language of war also evokes the mobilization for a national effort. Yet the strategy should be balanced. The first phase of our post-9-11 efforts rightly included military action to topple the Taliban and pursue al-Qaeda. This work continues. But long-term success demands the use of all elements of national power. Diplomacy, intelligence, covert action, law enforcement, economic policy, foreign aid, public diplomacy, and homeland defense. If we favor one tool while neglecting others, we leave ourselves vulnerable and weaken our national effort. Certainly the strategy should include offensive operations to counter terrorism. Terrorists should no longer find safe haven where their organizations can grow and flourish. America's strategy should be a coalition strategy that includes Muslim nations as partners in its development and implementation. Our efforts should be accompanied by a preventive strategy that is as much or more political as it is military. The strategy must focus clearly on the Arab and Muslim world in all its variety. Our strategy should also include defenses. America can be attacked in many ways and has many vulnerabilities. No defenses are perfect, but risks must be calculated. Hard choices must be made about allocating resources. Responsibilities for America's defense should be clearly defined. Planning does make a difference, identifying where a little money might have a large effect. Defenses also complicate the plans of attackers, increasing their risk of discovery and failure. Finally, the nation must prepare to deal with attacks that are not stopped. Measuring Success what should Americans expect from their government in the struggle against Islamist terrorism? The goals seem unlimited. Defeat terrorism anywhere in the world. But Americans have also been told to expect the worst. An attack is probably coming. It may be terrible. With such benchmarks, 
the justifications for action and spending seem limitless goals are good yet effective public policies also need concrete objectives agencies need to be able to measure success these measurements do not need to be quantitative government cannot measure success in the ways that private firms can but the targets should be specific enough so that reasonable observers in the white house the congress the media or the general public can judge whether or not the objectives have been attained vague goals match an amorphous picture of the enemy al-qaeda and its affiliates are popularly described as being all over the world adaptable resilient needing little higher level organization and capable of anything the american people are thus given the picture of an omnipotent unslayable hydra of destruction this image lowers expectations for government effectiveness it should not lower them too far our report shows a determined and capable group of plotters yet the group was fragile dependent on a few key personalities and occasionally left vulnerable by the marginal unstable people often attracted to such causes the enemy made mistakes like khalid al midhar's unauthorized departure from the united states that required him to enter the country again in july two thousand and one or the selection of zacharias musawi as a participant and ramsi bin al sheep's transfer of money to him the u s government was not able to capitalize on those mistakes in time to prevent nine eleven we do not believe it is possible to defeat all terrorist attacks against americans every time and everywhere a president should tell the american people no president can promise that a catastrophic attack like that of nine eleven will not happen again history has shown that even the most vigilant and expert agencies cannot always prevent determined suicidal attackers from reaching a target but the american people are entitled to expect their government to do its very best they should expect that officials will have realistic objectives clear guidance and effective organization they are entitled to see some standards for performance so they can judge with the help of their elected representatives whether the objectives are being met end of chapter twelve point one Chapter 12.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Siebold. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 12.2. Attack Terrorists and Their Organizations. The U.S. government, joined by other governments around the world, is working through intelligence, law enforcement, military, financial, and diplomatic channels to identify, disrupt, capture, or kill individual terrorists. This effort was going on before 9-11, and it continues on a vastly enlarged scale. But to catch terrorists, a U.S. or foreign agency needs to be able to find and reach them. No Sanctuaries the 9-11 attack was a complex international operation, the product of years of planning. Bombings like those in Bali in 2003 or Madrid in 2004, while able to take hundreds of lives, can be mounted locally. Their requirements are far more modest in size and complexity. They are more difficult to thwart. But the U.S. government must build the capacities to prevent a 9-11 scale plot from succeeding, and those capabilities will help greatly to cope with lesser but still devastating attacks. A complex international terrorist operation aimed at launching a catastrophic attack cannot be mounted by just anyone in any place. Such operations appear to require time, space, and ability to perform competent planning and staff work, a command structure able to make necessary decisions and possessing the authority and contacts to assemble needed people, money, and materials. 
opportunity and space to recruit, train, and select operatives with the needed skills and dedication, providing the time and structure required to socialize them into the terrorist cause, judge their trustworthiness, and hone their skills. A logistics network able to securely manage the travel of operatives, move money, and transport resources like explosives where they need to go. Access, in the case of certain weapons, to the special materials needed for a nuclear, chemical, radiological, or biological attack. Reliable communications between coordinators and operatives, and opportunity to test the workability of the plan. Many details in Chapters 2, 5, and 7 illustrate the direct and indirect value of the Afghan sanctuary to Al-Qaeda in preparing the 9-11 attack and other operations. The organization cemented personal ties among veteran jihadists working together there for years. It had the operational space to gather and sift recruits, indoctrinating them in isolated desert camps. It built up logistical networks running through Pakistan and the United Arab Emirates. Al-Qaeda also exploited relatively lax internal security environments in Western countries, especially Germany. It considered the environment in the United States so hospitable that the 9-11 operatives used America as their staging area for further training and exercises, traveling into, out of, and around the country, and complacently using their real names with little fear of capture. To find sanctuary, terrorist organizations have fled to some of the least governed, most lawless places in the world. The intelligence community has prepared a world map that highlights possible terrorist havens, using no secret intelligence, just indicating areas that combine rugged terrain, weak governance, room to hide or receive supplies, and low population density with a town or city near enough to allow necessary interaction with the outside world. Large areas scattered around the world meet these criteria. In talking with American and foreign government officials and military officers on the front lines fighting terrorists today, we asked them, if you were a terrorist leader today, where would you locate your base? Some of the same places come up again and again on their lists. Western Pakistan and the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region. Southern or Western Afghanistan. The Arabian Peninsula, especially Saudi Arabia and Yemen and the nearby Horn of Africa, including Somalia and extending southwest into Kenya. Southeast Asia, from Thailand to the southern Philippines to Indonesia. West Africa, including Nigeria and Mali. European cities with expatriate Muslim communities, especially cities in Central and Eastern Europe, where security forces and border controls are less effective. In the 20th century, strategists focused on the world's great industrial heartlands. In the 21st, the focus is in the opposite direction, toward remote regions and failing states. The United States has had to find ways to extend its reach, straining the limits of its influence. Every policy decision we make needs to be seen through this lens. If, for example, Iraq becomes a failed state, it will go to the top of the list of places that are breeding grounds for attacks against Americans at home. Similarly, if we are paying insufficient attention to Afghanistan, the rule of the Taliban or warlords or narco-traffickers may re-emerge and its countryside could once again offer refuge to Al-Qaeda or its successor. Recommendation The U.S. government must identify and prioritize actual or potential terrorist sanctuaries. For each, it should have a realistic strategy to keep possible terrorists insecure and on the run, using all elements of national power. We should reach out, listen to, and work with other countries that can help. We offer three illustrations that are particularly applicable today in 2004. Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia. Pakistan Pakistan's endemic poverty, widespread corruption, and often ineffective government create opportunities for Islamist recruitment. Poor education is a particular concern. Millions of families, especially those with little money, send their children to religious schools or madrasas. Many of these schools are the only opportunity available for an education, but some have been used as incubators for violent extremism. According to Karachi's police commander, there are 859 madrasas teaching more than 200,000 youngsters in this city alone. It is hard to overstate the importance of Pakistan in the struggle against Islamist terrorism. Within Pakistan's borders are 150 million Muslims, 
scores of al-Qaeda terrorists, many Taliban figures, and, perhaps, Osama bin Laden. Pakistan possesses nuclear weapons and has come frighteningly close to war with nuclear-armed India over the disputed territory of Kashmir. A political battle among anti-American Islamic fundamentalists, the Pakistani military, and more moderate mainstream political forces has already spilled over into violence, and there have been repeated recent attempts to kill Pakistan's president, Pervez Musharraf. In recent years, the United States has had three basic problems in its relationship with Pakistan. On terrorism, Pakistan helped nurture the Taliban. The Pakistani army and intelligence services, especially below the top ranks, have long been ambivalent about confronting Islamist extremists. Many in the government have sympathized with or provided support to the extremists. Musharraf agreed that bin Laden was bad, but before 9-11, preserving good relations with the Taliban took precedence. On proliferation, Musharraf has repeatedly said that Pakistan does not barter with its nuclear technology, but proliferation concerns have been long-standing and very serious. Most recently, the Pakistani government has claimed not to have known that one of its nuclear weapons developers, a national figure, was leading the most dangerous nuclear smuggling ring ever disclosed. Finally, Pakistan has made little progress toward the return of democratic rule at the national level, although that turbulent process does continue to function at the provincial level and the Pakistani press remains relatively free. Immediately after 9-11, confronted by the United States with a stark choice, Pakistan made a strategic decision. Its government stood aside and allowed the U.S.-led coalition to destroy the Taliban regime. In other ways, Pakistan actively assisted. Its authorities arrested more than 500 al-Qaeda operatives and Taliban members, and Pakistani forces played a leading part in tracking down KSM, Abu Zubaydah, and other key al-Qaeda figures. In the following two years, the Pakistani government tried to walk the fence, helping against al-Qaeda while seeking to avoid a larger confrontation with Taliban remnants and other Islamic extremists. When al-Qaeda and its Pakistani allies repeatedly tried to assassinate Musharraf, almost succeeding, the battle came home. The country's vast unpoliced regions make Pakistan attractive to extremists seeking refuge and recruits, and also provide a base for operations against coalition forces in Afghanistan. Almost all the 9-11 attackers traveled the north-south nexus of Kandahar, Keita, Karachi. The Baluchistan region of Pakistan, KSM's ethnic home, and the sprawling city of Karachi remained centers of Islamist extremism, where the U.S. and Pakistani security and intelligence presence has been weak. The U.S. consulate in Karachi is a makeshift fortress, reflecting the gravity of the surrounding threat. During the winter of 2003-2004, Musharraf made another strategic decision. He ordered the Pakistani army into the frontier provinces of northwest Pakistan along the Afghan border, where bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahari have reportedly taken refuge. The army is confronting groups of al-Qaeda fighters and their local allies in very difficult terrain. On the other side of the frontier, U.S. forces in Afghanistan have found it challenging to organize effective joint operations, given Pakistan's limited capabilities and reluctance to permit U.S. military operations on its soil. Yet in 2004, it is clear that the Pakistani government is trying harder than ever before in the battle against Islamist terrorists. Acknowledging these problems and Musharraf's own part in the story, we believe that Musharraf's government represents the best hope for stability in Pakistan and Afghanistan. In an extraordinary public essay asking how Muslims can drag ourselves out of the pit we find ourselves in to raise ourselves up, Musharraf has called for a strategy of enlightened moderation. The Muslim world, he said, should shun militancy and extremism. The West, and the United States in particular, should seek to resolve disputes with justice and help better the Muslim world. Having come close to war in 2002 and 2003, Pakistan and India have recently made significant progress in peacefully discussing their long-standing differences. The United States has been and should remain a key supporter of that process. The constant refrain of Pakistanis is that the United States long treated them as allies of convenience. As the United States makes fresh commitments now, it should make promises it is prepared to keep for years to come. Recommendation if Musharraf stands for enlightened moderation in a fight for his life and for the life of his country, 
the United States should be willing to make hard choices too, and make the difficult long-term commitment to the future of Pakistan. Sustaining the current scale of aid to Pakistan, the United States should support Pakistan's government in its struggle against extremists with a comprehensive effort that extends from military aid to support for better education, so long as Pakistan's leaders remain willing to make difficult choices of their own. Afghanistan Afghanistan was the incubator for al-Qaeda and for the 9-11 attacks. In the fall of 2001, the U.S.-led International Coalition and its Afghan allies toppled the Taliban and ended the regime's protection of al-Qaeda. Notable progress has been made. International cooperation has been strong, with a clear U.N. mandate and a NATO-led peacekeeping force, the International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF. More than 10,000 American soldiers are deployed today in Afghanistan, joined by soldiers from NATO allies and Muslim states. A central government has been established in Kabul with a democratic constitution, new currency, and a new army. Most Afghans enjoy greater freedom. Women and girls are emerging from subjugation, and three million children have returned to school. For the first time in many years, Afghans have reason to hope. But grave challenges remain. Taliban and al-Qaeda fighters have regrouped in the south and southeast. Warlords control much of the country beyond Kabul, and the land is awash in weapons. Economic development remains a distant hope. The narcotics trade, long a massive sector of the Afghan economy, is again booming. Even the most hardened aid workers refuse to operate in many regions, and some warn that Afghanistan is near the brink of chaos. Battered Afghanistan has a chance. Elections are being prepared. It is revealing that in June 2004, Taliban fighters resorted to slaughtering 16 Afghans on a bus, apparently for no reason other than their boldness in carrying an unprecedented Afghan weapon, a voter registration card. Afghanistan's president, Hamid Karzai, is brave and committed. He is trying to build genuinely national institutions that can overcome the tradition of allocating powers among ethnic communities. Yet even if his efforts are successful and elections bring a democratic government to Afghanistan, the United States faces some difficult choices. After paying relatively little attention to rebuilding Afghanistan during the military campaign, U.S. policies changed noticeably during 2003. Greater consideration of the political dimension and congressional support for a substantial package of assistance signaled a longer-term commitment to Afghanistan's future. One Afghan regional official plaintively told us the country finally has a good government. He begged the United States to keep its promise and not abandon Afghanistan again, as it had in the 1990s. Another Afghan leader noted that if the United States leaves, we will lose all that we have gained. Most difficult is to define the security mission in Afghanistan. There is continuing political controversy about whether military operations in Iraq have had any effect on the scale of America's commitment to the future of Afghanistan. The United States has largely stayed out of the central government's struggles with dissident warlords, and it has largely avoided confronting the related problem of narco-trafficking. Recommendation The President and the Congress deserve praise for their efforts in Afghanistan so far. Now the United States and the international community should make a long-term commitment to a secure and stable Afghanistan in order to give the government a reasonable opportunity to improve the life of the Afghan people. Afghanistan must not again become a sanctuary for international crime and terrorism. The United States and the international community should help the Afghan government extend its authority over the country with a strategy and nation-by-nation -nation commitments to achieve their objectives. This is an ambitious recommendation. It would mean a redoubled effort to secure the country, disarm militias, and curtail the age of warlord rule. But the United States and NATO have already committed themselves to the future of this region, wisely, as the 9-11 story shows, and failed half-measures could be worse than useless. NATO in particular has made Afghanistan a test of the alliance's ability to adapt to current security challenges of the future. NATO must pass this test. Currently, the United States and the international community envision enough support so that the central government can build a truly national army and extend the essential infrastructure and minimum public services to major towns and regions. The effort relies in part on foreign civil military teams arranged under various national flags. 
the institutional commitments of NATO and the United Nations to these enterprises are weak. NATO member states are not following through. Some of the other states around the world that have pledged assistance to Afghanistan are not fulfilling their pledges. The U.S. presence in Afghanistan is overwhelmingly oriented toward military and security work. The State Department presence is woefully understaffed, and the military mission is narrowly focused on al-Qaeda and Taliban remnants in the south and southeast. The U.S. government can do its part if the international community decides on a joint effort to restore the rule of law and contain rampant crime and narcotics trafficking in this crossroads of Central Asia. We have heard again and again that the money for assistance is allocated so rigidly that, on the ground, one U.S. agency often cannot improvise or pitch in to help another agency, even in small ways, when a few thousand dollars could make a great difference. The U.S. government should allocate money so that lower-level officials have more flexibility to get the job done across agency lines, adjusting to the circumstances they find in the field. This should include discretionary funds for expenditures by military units that often encounter opportunities to help the local population. Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia has been a problematic ally in combating Islamic extremism. At the level of high policy, Saudi Arabia's leaders cooperated with American diplomatic initiatives aimed at the Taliban or Pakistan before 9-11. At the same time, Saudi Arabia's society was a place where al-Qaeda raised money directly from individuals and through charities. It was the society that produced 15 of the 19 hijackers. The kingdom is one of the world's most religiously conservative societies, and its identity is closely bound to its religious links, especially its position as the guardian of Islam's two holiest sites. Charitable giving, or zakat, is one of the five pillars of Islam. It is broader and more pervasive than Western ideas of charity, functioning also as a form of income tax, educational assistance, foreign aid, and a source of political influence. The Western notion of the separation of civic and religious duty does not exist in Islamic cultures. Funding charitable works is an integral function of the governments in the Islamic world. It is so ingrained in Islamic culture that in Saudi Arabia, for example, a department within the Saudi Ministry of Finance and National Economy collects zakat directly, much as the U.S. Internal Revenue Service collects payroll withholding tax. Closely tied to zakat is the dedication of the government to propagating the Islamic faith, particularly the Wahhabi sect that flourishes in Saudi Arabia. Traditionally, throughout the Muslim world, there is no formal oversight mechanism for donations. As Saudi wealth increased, the amounts contributed by individuals and the state grew dramatically. Substantial sums went to finance Islamic charities of every kind. While Saudi domestic charities are regulated by the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare, charities and international relief agencies, such as the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, are currently regulated by the Ministry of Islamic Affairs. This ministry uses zakat and government funds to spread Wahhabi beliefs throughout the world, including in mosques and schools. Often these schools provide the only education available. Even in affluent countries, Saudi-funded Wahhabi schools are often the only Islamic schools. Some Wahhabi-funded organizations have been exploited by extremists to further their goal of violent jihad against non-Muslims. One such organization has been the al Haramain Islamic Foundation, the assets of some branch offices have been frozen by the U.S. and Saudi governments. Until 9-11, few Saudis would have considered government oversight of charitable donations necessary. Many would have perceived it as interference in the exercise of their faith. At the same time, the government's ability to finance most state expenditures with energy revenues has delayed the need for a modern income tax system. As a result, there have been strong religious, cultural, and administrative barriers to monitoring charitable spending. That appears to be changing, however, now that the goal of violent jihad also extends to overthrowing Sunni governments, such as the House of Saud, that are not living up to the ideals of the Islamic extremists. The leaders of the United States and the rulers of Saudi Arabia have long had friendly relations, rooted in fundamentally common interests against the Soviet Union during the Cold War, in American hopes that Saudi oil supplies would stabilize the supply and price of oil in world markets, 
and in Saudi hopes that America could help protect the kingdom against foreign threats. In 1990, the kingdom hosted U.S. armed forces before the first U.S.-led war against Iraq. American soldiers and airmen have given their lives to help protect Saudi Arabia. The Saudi government has difficulty acknowledging this. American military bases remained there until 2003 as part of an international commitment to contain Iraq. For many years, leaders on both sides preferred to keep their ties quiet and behind the scenes. As a result, neither the U.S. nor the Saudi people appreciated all the dimensions of the bilateral relationship, including the Saudi role in U.S. strategies to promote the Middle East peace process. In each country, political figures find it difficult to publicly defend good relations with the other. Today, mutual recriminations flow. Many Americans see Saudi Arabia as an enemy, not as an embattled ally. They perceive an autocratic government that oppresses women, dominated by a wealthy and indolent elite. Saudi contacts with American politicians are frequently invoked as accusations in partisan political arguments. Americans are often appalled by the intolerance, anti-Semitism, and anti-American arguments taught in schools and preached in mosques. Saudis are angry, too. Many educated Saudis who were sympathetic to America now perceive the United States as an unfriendly state. One Saudi reformer noted to us that the demonization of Saudi Arabia in the U.S. media gives ammunition to radicals who accuse reformers of being U.S. lackeys. Tens of thousands of Saudis who once regularly traveled to and often had homes in the United States now go elsewhere. Among Saudis, the United States is seen as aligned with Israel in its conflict with the Palestinians, with whom Saudis ardently sympathize. Although Saudi Arabia's cooperation against terrorism improved to some extent after the September 11th attacks, significant problems remained. Many in the kingdom initially reacted with disbelief and denial. In the following months, as the truth became clear, some leading Saudis quietly acknowledged the problem but still did not see their own regime as threatened and thus often did not respond promptly to U.S. requests for help. Though Saddam Hussein was widely detested, many Saudis are sympathetic to the anti-U.S. insurgents in Iraq, although majorities also condemn jihadist attacks in the kingdom. As in Pakistan, Yemen, and other countries, attitudes changed when the terrorism came home. Cooperation had already become significant, but after the bombings in Riyadh on May 12, 2003, it improved much more. The kingdom openly discussed the problem of radicalism, criticized the terrorists as religiously deviant, reduced official support for religious activities overseas, closed suspect charitable foundations, and publicized arrests, very public moves for a government that has preferred to keep internal problems quiet. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is now locked in mortal combat with Al-Qaeda. Saudi police are regularly being killed in shootouts with terrorists. In June 2004, the Saudi ambassador to the United States called publicly, in the Saudi press, for his government to wage a jihad of its own against terrorists. We must all, as a state and as a people, recognize the truth about these criminals, he declared, if we do not declare a general mobilization, we will lose this war on terrorism. Saudi Arabia is a troubled country. Although regarded as very wealthy, in fact, per capita income has dropped from $28,000 at its height to the present level of about $8,000. Social and religious traditions complicate adjustment to modern economic activity and limit employment opportunities for young Saudis. Women find their education and employment sharply limited. President Clinton offered us a perceptive analysis of Saudi Arabia, contending that fundamentally friendly rulers have been constrained by their desire to preserve the status quo. He, like others, made the case for pragmatic reform instead. He hopes the rulers will envision what they want their kingdom to become in 10 or 20 years and start a process in which their friends can help them change. There are signs that Saudi Arabia's royal family is trying to build a consensus for political reform though uncertain about how fast and how far to go. Crown Prince Abdullah wants the kingdom to join the World Trade Organization to accelerate economic liberalization. He has embraced the Arab Human Development Report, which was highly critical of the Arab world's political, economic, and social failings, and called for greater economic and political reform. 
cooperation with Saudi Arabia against Islamist terrorism is very much in the U.S. interest. Such cooperation can exist for a time largely in secret, as it does now, but it cannot grow and thrive there. Nor, on either side, can friendship be unconditional. Recommendation The problems in the U.S.-Saudi relationship must be confronted openly. The United States and Saudi Arabia must determine if they can build a relationship that political leaders on both sides are prepared to publicly defend, a relationship about more than oil. It should include a shared commitment to political and economic reform, as Saudis make common cause with the outside world. It should include a shared interest in greater tolerance and cultural respect, translating into a commitment to fight the violent extremists who foment hatred. End of chapter 12.2 Recording by Bob Siebold Chapter 12.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 12.3 Prevent the Continued Growth of Islamist Terrorism In October 2003, reflecting on progress after two years of waging the global war on terrorism, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld asked his advisers, Are we capturing, killing, or deterring and dissuading more terrorists every day than the madrasas and the radical clerics are recruiting, training, and deploying against us? Does the U.S. need to fashion a broad, integrated plan to stop the next generation of terrorists? The U.S. is putting relatively little effort into a long-range plan, but we are putting a great deal of effort into trying to stop terrorists. The cost-benefit ratio is against us. Our cost is billions against the terrorist costs of millions. These are the right questions. Our answer is that we need short-term action on a long-range strategy, one that invigorates our foreign policy with the attention that the President and Congress have given to the military and intelligence parts of the conflict against Islamist terrorism. Engage the Struggle of Ideas The United States is heavily engaged in the Muslim world and will be for many years to come. This American engagement is resented. Polls in 2002 found that among America's friends, like Egypt, the recipient of more U.S. aid for the past 20 years than any other Muslim country, only 15% of the population had a favorable opinion of the United States. In Saudi Arabia, the number was 12%, and two-thirds of those surveyed in 2003 in countries from Indonesia to Turkey, a NATO ally, were very or somewhat fearful that the United States may attack them. Support for the United States has plummeted. Polls taken in Islamic countries after 9-11 suggested that many or most people thought the United States was doing the right thing in its fight against terrorism. Few people saw popular support for al-Qaeda. Half of those surveyed said that ordinary people had a favorable view of the United States. By 2003, polls showed that the bottom has fallen out of support for America in most of the Muslim world. Negative views of the U.S. among Muslims, which had been largely limited to countries in the Middle East, have spread. Since last summer, favorable ratings for the U.S. have fallen from 61% to 15% in Indonesia and from 71% to 38% among Muslims in Nigeria. Many of these views are at best uninformed about the United States and at worst informed by cartoonish stereotypes the coarse expression of a fashionable Occidentalism among intellectuals who caricature U.S. values and policies. Local newspapers and the few influential satellite broadcasters, like Al Jazeera, often reinforce the jihadist theme that portrays the United States as anti-Muslim. The small percentage of Muslims who are fully committed to Osama bin Laden's version of Islam are impervious to persuasion. It is among the large majority of Arabs and Muslims that we must encourage reform, freedom, democracy, and opportunity, 
even though our own promotion of these messages is limited in its effectiveness simply because we are its carriers. Muslims themselves will have to reflect upon such basic issues as the concept of jihad, the position of women, and the place of non-Muslim minorities. The United States can promote moderation, but cannot ensure its ascendancy. Only Muslims can do this. The setting is difficult. The combined gross domestic product of the 22 countries in the Arab League is less than the gross domestic product of Spain. 40% of adult Arabs are illiterate, two-thirds of them women. One-third of the broader Middle East lives on less than two dollars a day. Less than two percent of the population has access to the Internet. The majority of older Arab youths have expressed the desire to immigrate to other countries, particularly those in Europe. In short, the United States has to help defeat an ideology, not just a group of people, and we must do so under difficult circumstances. How can the United States and its friends help moderate Muslims combat the extremist ideas? Recommendation The U.S. government must define what the message is, what it stands for. We should offer an example of moral leadership in the world, committed to treat people humanely, abide by the rule of law, and be generous and caring to our neighbors. America and Muslim friends can agree on respect for human dignity and opportunity. To Muslim parents, terrorists like bin Laden have nothing to offer their children but visions of violence and death. America and its friends have a crucial advantage. We can offer these parents a vision that might give their children a better future. If we heed the views of thoughtful leaders in the Arab and Muslim world, a moderate consensus can be found. That vision of the future should stress life over death, individual educational and economic opportunity. This vision includes widespread political participation and contempt for indiscriminate violence. It includes respect for the rule of law, openness in discussing differences, and tolerance for opposing points of view. Recommendation Where Muslim governments, even those who are friends, do not respect these principles, the United States must stand for a better future. One of the lessons of the long Cold War was that short-term gains in cooperating with the most repressive and brutal governments were too often outweighed by long-term setbacks for America's stature and interests. American foreign policy is part of the message. America's policy choices have consequences. Right or wrong, it is simply a fact that American policy regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and American actions in Iraq are dominant staples of popular commentary across the Arab and Muslim world. That does not mean U.S. choices have been wrong. It means those choices must be integrated with America's message of opportunity to the Arab and Muslim world. Neither Israel nor the new Iraq will be safer if worldwide Islamist terrorism grows stronger. The United States must do more to communicate its message. Reflecting on bin Laden's success in reaching Muslim audiences, Richard Holbrook wondered, how can a man in a cave out-communicate the world's leading communications society? Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage worried to us that Americans have been exporting our fears and our anger, not our vision of opportunity and hope. Recommendation Just as we did in the Cold War, we need to defend our ideals abroad vigorously. America does stand up for its values. The United States defended and still defends Muslims against tyrants and criminals in Somalia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. If the United States does not act aggressively to define itself in the Islamic world, the extremists will gladly do the job for us. Recognizing that Arab and Muslim audiences rely on satellite television and radio, the government has begun some promising initiatives in television and radio broadcasting to the Arab world, Iran, and Afghanistan. These efforts are beginning to reach large audiences. The Broadcasting Board of Governors has asked for much larger resources. It should get them. The United States should rebuild the scholarship, exchange, and library programs that reach out to young people and offer them knowledge and hope. Where such assistance is provided, it should be identified as coming from the citizens of the United States. An Agenda of Opportunity 
the United States and its friends can stress educational and economic opportunity. The United Nations has rightly equated literacy as freedom. The international community is moving towards setting a concrete goal. To cut the Middle East region's illiteracy rate in half by 2010, targeting women and girls and supporting programs for adult literacy. Unglamorous help is needed to support the basics, such as textbooks that translate more of the world's knowledge into local languages, and libraries to house such materials. Education about the outside world or other cultures is weak. More vocational education is needed, too, in trades and business skills. The Middle East can also benefit from some of the programs to bridge the digital divide and increase Internet access that have already been developed for other regions of the world. Education that teaches tolerance, the dignity and value of each individual, and respect for different beliefs is a key element in any global strategy to eliminate Islamist terrorism. Recommendation the U.S. government should offer to join with other nations in generously supporting a new International Youth Opportunity Fund. Funds will be spent directly for building and operating primary and secondary schools in those Muslim states that commit to sensibly investing their own money in public education. Economic openness is essential. Terrorism is not caused by poverty. Indeed, many terrorists come from relatively well-off families. Yet when people lose hope, when societies break down, when countries fragment, the breeding grounds for terrorism are created. Backward economic policies and repressive political regimes slip into societies that are without hope, where ambition and passions have no constructive outlet. The policies that support economic development and reform also have political implications. Economic and political liberties tend to be linked. Commerce, especially international commerce, requires ongoing cooperation and compromise, the exchange of ideas across cultures, and the peaceful resolution of differences through negotiation or the rule of law. Economic growth expands the middle class, a constituency for further reform. Successful economies rely on vibrant private sectors, which have an interest in curbing indiscriminate government power. Those who develop the practice of controlling their own economic destiny soon desire a voice in their communities and political societies. The U.S. government has announced the goal of working toward a Middle East Free Trade Area, or MEFTA, by 2013. The United States has been seeking comprehensive free trade agreements, FTAs, with the Middle Eastern nations most firmly on the path to reform. The U.S.-Israeli FTA was enacted in 1985, and Congress implemented an FTA with Jordan in 2001. Both agreements have expanded trade and investment, thereby supporting domestic economic reform. In 2004, new FTAs were signed with Morocco and Bahrain, and are awaiting congressional approval. These models are drawing the interest of their neighbors. Muslim countries can become full participants in the rules-based global trading system as the United States considers lowering its trade barriers with the poorest Arab nations. Recommendation A comprehensive U.S. strategy to counter terrorism should include economic policies that encourage development, more open societies, and opportunities for people to improve the lives of their families and to enhance prospects for their children's future. Turning a National Strategy into a Coalition Strategy Practically every aspect of U.S. counterterrorism strategy relies on international cooperation. Since 9-11, these contacts concerning military, law enforcement, intelligence, travel and customs, and financial matters have expanded so dramatically, and often in an ad hoc way, that it is difficult to track these efforts, much less integrate them. Recommendation. The United States should engage other nations in developing a comprehensive coalition strategy against Islamist terrorism. There are several multilateral institutions in which such issues should be addressed. But the most important policies should be discussed and coordinated in a flexible contact group of leading coalition governments. This is a good place, for example, to develop joint strategies for targeting terrorist travel or for hammering out a common strategy for the places where terrorists may be finding sanctuary. 
Presently the Muslim and Arab states meet with each other in organizations such as the Islamic Conference and the Arab League. The Western states meet with each other in organizations such as NATO and the Group of Eight Summit of Leading Industrial Nations. A recent G8 summit initiative to begin a dialogue about reform may be a start toward finding a place where leading Muslim states can discuss, and be seen to discuss, critical policy issues with the leading Western powers committed to the future of the Arab and Muslim world. These new international efforts can create durable habits of visible cooperation as states willing to step up to their responsibilities join together in constructive efforts to direct assistance and coordinate action. Coalition warfare also requires coalition policies on what to do with enemy captives. Allegations that the United States abused prisoners in its custody make it harder to build the diplomatic, political, and military alliances the government will need. The United States should work with friends to develop mutually agreed on principles for the detention and humane treatment of captured international terrorists who are not being held under a particular country's criminal laws. Countries such as Britain, Australia, and Muslim Friends are committed to fighting terrorists. America should be able to reconcile its views on how to balance humanity and security with our nation's commitment to these same goals. The United States and some of its allies do not accept the application of full Geneva Convention treatment of prisoners of war to captured terrorists. Those conventions establish a minimum set of standards for prisoners in internal conflicts. Since the international struggle against Islamic terrorism is not internal, those provisions do not formally apply, but they are commonly accepted as basic standards for humane treatment. Recommendation The United States should engage its friends to develop a common coalition approach toward the detention and humane treatment of captured terrorists. New principles might draw upon Article Three of the Geneva Conventions on the Law of Armed Conflict. That article was specifically designed for those cases in which the usual laws of war did not apply. Its minimum standards are generally accepted throughout the world as customary international law. Proliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction The greatest danger of another catastrophic attack in the United States will materialize if the world's most dangerous terrorists acquire the world's most dangerous weapons. As we note in Chapter 2, Al-Qaeda has tried to acquire or make nuclear weapons for at least 10 years. In Chapter 4, we mentioned officials worriedly discussing in 1998 reports that bin Laden's associates thought their leader was intent on carrying out a Hiroshima. These ambitions continue. In the public portion of his February 2004 Worldwide Threat Assessment to Congress, DCI Tenet noted that bin Laden considered the acquisition of weapons of mass destruction to be a religious obligation. He warned that Al-Qaeda continues to pursue its strategic goal of obtaining a nuclear capability. Tenet added that more than two dozen other terrorist groups are pursuing CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear materials. A nuclear bomb can be built with a relatively small amount of nuclear material. A trained nuclear engineer with an amount of highly enriched uranium or plutonium about the size of a grapefruit or an orange, together with commercially available material, could fashion a nuclear device that would fit in a van like the one Ramsey Youssef parked in the garage of the World Trade Center in 1993. Such a bomb would level Lower Manhattan. The coalition strategies we have discussed to combat Islamist terrorism should therefore be combined with a parallel, vital effort to prevent and counter the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, WMD. We recommend several initiatives in this area. Strengthen counter-proliferation efforts. While efforts to shut down Libya's illegal nuclear program have been generally successful, Pakistan's illicit trade and the nuclear smuggling networks of Pakistani scientist A.Q. Khan have revealed that the spread of nuclear weapons is a problem of global dimensions. Attempts to deal with Iran's nuclear program are still underway. Therefore, the United States should work with the international community to develop laws and an international legal regime with universal jurisdiction to enable the capture, interdiction, and prosecution of such smugglers by any state in the world where they do not disclose their activities. Expand the Proliferation Security Initiative 
In May 2003, the Bush administration announced the Proliferation Security Initiative, PSI, nations in a willing partnership combining their national capabilities to use military, economic, and diplomatic tools to interdict threatening shipments of WMD and missile-related technology. The PSI can be more effective if it uses intelligence and planning resources of the NATO alliance. Moreover, PSI membership should be open to non-NATO countries. Russia and China should be encouraged to participate. Support the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program Outside experts are deeply worried about the U.S. government's commitment and approach to securing the weapons and highly dangerous materials still scattered in Russia and other countries of the Soviet Union. The government's main instrument in this area, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, usually referred to as Nun Lugar, after the senators who have sponsored the legislation in 1991, is now in need of expansion, improvement, and resources. The U.S. government has recently redoubled its international commitments to support this program, and we recommend that the United States do all it can, if Russia and other countries will do their part. The government should weigh the value of this investment against the catastrophic cost America would face should such weapons find their way to the terrorists who are so anxious to acquire them. Recommendation our report shows that Al-Qaeda has tried to acquire or make weapons of mass destruction for at least 10 years. There is no doubt the United States would be a prime target. Preventing the proliferation of these weapons warrants a maximum effort. By strengthening counter-proliferation efforts, expanding the proliferation security initiative, and supporting the cooperative threat reduction program. Targeting Terrorist Money the general public sees attacks on terrorist finance as a way to starve the terrorists of money. So initially did the U.S. government. After 9-11, the United States took aggressive actions to designate terrorist financiers and freeze their money in the United States and through resolutions of the United Nations. These actions appeared to have little effect, and when confronted by legal challenges, the United States and the United Nations were often forced to unfreeze assets. The difficulty, understood later, was that even if the intelligence community might link someone to a terrorist group through acquaintances or communications, the task of tracing the money from that individual to the terrorist group, or otherwise showing complicity, was far more difficult. It was harder still to do so without disclosing secrets. These early missteps made other countries unwilling to freeze assets or otherwise act merely on the basis of a U.S. action. Multilateral freezing mechanisms now require waiting periods before being put into effect, eliminating the element of surprise and thus virtually ensuring that little money is actually frozen. Worldwide asset freezes have not been adequately enforced and have been easily circumvented, often within weeks by simple methods. But trying to starve the terrorists of money is like trying to catch one kind of fish by draining the ocean. A better strategy has evolved since those early months, as the government learned more about how Al-Qaeda raises, moves, and spends money. Recommendation Vigorous efforts to track terrorist financing must remain front and center in U.S. counterterrorism efforts. The government has recognized that information about terrorist money helps us to understand their networks, search them out, and disrupt their operations. Intelligence and law enforcement have targeted the relatively small number of financial facilitators, individuals Al-Qaeda relied on for their ability to raise and deliver money, at the core of Al-Qaeda's revenue stream. These efforts have worked. The death or capture of several important facilitators has decreased the amount of money available to Al-Qaeda and has increased its costs and difficulty in raising and moving that money. Captures have additionally provided a windfall of intelligence that can be used to continue the cycle of disruption. The U.S. financial community and some international financial institutions have generally provided law enforcement and intelligence agencies with extraordinary cooperation, particularly in supplying information to support quickly developing investigations. Obvious vulnerabilities in the U.S. financial system have been corrected. The United States has been less successful in persuading other countries to adopt financial regulations that would permit the tracing of financial transactions. Public designation of terrorist financiers and organizations is still part of the fight. 
but it is not the primary weapon. Designations are instead a form of diplomacy, as governments join together to identify named individuals and groups as terrorists. They also prevent open fundraising. Some charities that have been identified as likely avenues for terrorist financing have seen their donations diminish and their activities come under more scrutiny, and others have been put out of business, although controlling overseas branches of Gulf area charities remains a challenge. The Saudi crackdown after the May 2003 terrorist attacks in Riyadh has apparently reduced the funds available to Al-Qaeda, perhaps drastically, but it is too soon to know if this reduction will last. Though progress apparently has been made, terrorists have shown considerable creativity in their methods of moving money. If Al-Qaeda is replaced by smaller, decentralized terrorist groups, the premise behind the government's efforts, that terrorists need a financial support network, may become outdated. Moreover, some terrorist operations do not rely on outside sources of money and may now be self-funding, either through legitimate employment or low-level criminal activity. End of chapter 12.3 Recording by Leanne Howlett Section 50 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Chantry. The 9-11 Commission Report by the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States. Section 50. Protect against and prepare for terrorist attacks. In the nearly three years since 9-11, Americans have become better protected against terrorist attack. Some of the changes are due to government action, such as new precautions to protect aircraft. A portion can be attributed to the sheer scale of spending and effort. Publicity and the vigilance of ordinary Americans also make a difference. But the President and other officials acknowledge that although Americans may be safer, they are not safe. Our report shows that the terrorists analyse defences. They plan accordingly. Defences cannot achieve perfect safety. They make targets harder to attack successfully, and they deter attacks by making capture more likely. Just increasing the attacker's odds of failure may make the difference between a plan attempted or a plan discarded. The enemy may also have to develop more elaborate plans, thereby increasing the danger of exposure or defeat. Protective measures also prepare for the attacks that may get through, containing the damage and saving lives. Terrorist travel. More than 500 million people annually cross US borders at legal entry points, about 330 million of them non-citizens. Another 500,000 or more enter illegally without inspection across America's thousands of miles of land borders, or remain in the country past the expiration of their permitted stay. The challenge for national security in an age of terrorism is to prevent the very few people who may pose overwhelming risks from entering or remaining in the United States undetected. In the decade before September 11, 2001, border security, encompassing travel, entry and immigration, was not seen as a national security matter. Public figures voiced concern about the war on drugs, the right level and kind of immigration, problems along the southwest border, migration crises originating in the Caribbean and elsewhere, or the growing criminal traffic in humans. The immigration system as a whole was widely viewed as increasingly dysfunctional and badly in need of reform. In national security circles, however, only smuggling of weapons of mass destruction carried weight, not the entry of terrorists who might use such weapons or the presence of associated foreign-born terrorists. For terrorists, travel documents are as important as weapons. Terrorists must travel clandestinely to meet, train, plan, case targets, and gain access to attack. To them, international travel presents great danger because they must surface to pass through regulated channels, 
present themselves to border security officials or attempt to circumvent inspection points. In their travels, terrorists use evasive methods, such as altered and counterfeit passports and visas, specific travel methods and routes, liaisons with corrupt government officials, human smuggling networks, supportive travel agencies and immigration and identity fraud. These can sometimes be detected. Before 9-11, no agency of the US government systematically analysed terrorists' travel strategies. Had they done so, they could have discovered the ways in which the terrorist predecessors to Al-Qaeda had been systematically but detectably exploiting weaknesses in our border security since the early 1990s. We found that as many as 15 of the 19 hijackers were potentially vulnerable to interception by border authorities. Analyzing their characteristic travel documents and travel patterns could have allowed authorities to intercept 4 to 15 hijackers a more effective use of information available in US government database could have identified up to three hijackers. Looking back, we can also see that the routine operations of our immigration laws, that is, aspects of those laws not specifically aimed at protecting against terrorism, inevitably shaped Al-Qaeda's planning and opportunities. Because they were deemed not to be bona fide tourists or students, as they claimed, five conspirators that we know of tried to get visas and failed, and one was denied entry by an inspector. We also found that had the immigration system set a higher bar for determining whether individuals are who they claim to be, and ensuring routine consequences for violations, it could potentially have excluded, removed, or come into further contact with several hijackers who did not appear to meet the terms for admitting short-term visitors. Our investigation shows that two systemic weaknesses came together in our border system's inability to contribute to an effective defence against the 9-11 attacks. A lack of a well-developed counter-terrorism measures as a part of border security and an immigration system not able to deliver on its basic commitments, much less support counter-terrorism. These weaknesses have been reduced but are far from being overcome. Recommendation. Targeting travel is at least as powerful a weapon against terrorists as targeting their money. The United States should combine terrorist travel intelligence, operations and law enforcement in a strategy to intercept terrorists, find terrorist travel facilitators and constrain terrorist mobility. Since 9-11, significant improvements have been made to create an integrated watch list that makes terrorist name information available to border and law enforcement authorities. However, in the already difficult process of merging border agencies in the new Department of Homeland Security, changing the engine while flying, as one official put it, new insights into terrorist travel have not yet been integrated into the front lines of border security. The small terrorist travel intelligence collection and analysis program currently in place has produced disproportionately useful results. It should be expanded. Since officials at the borders encounter travellers and their documents first and investigate travel facilitators, they must work closely with intelligence officials. Internationally and in the United States, constraining terrorist travel should become a vital part of counter-terrorism strategy. Better technology and training to detect terrorist travel documents are the most important immediate steps to reduce America's vulnerability to clandestine entry. Every stage of our border and immigration system should have as a part of its operations the detection of terrorist indicators on travel documents. Information systems able to authenticate travel documents and detect potential terrorist indicators should be used at consulates, at primary border inspection lines, in immigration services offices and in intelligence and enforcement units. All frontline personnel should receive some training. Dedicated specialists and ongoing linkages with the intelligence community are also required. The Homeland Security Department's Directorate of Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection should receive more resources to accomplish its mission as the bridge between the frontline border agencies and the rest of the government counter-terrorism community. A biometric screening system. 
When people travel internationally, they usually move through defined channels or portals. They may seek to acquire a passport. They may apply for a visa. They stop at ticket counters, gates and exit controls at airports and seaports. Upon arrival, they pass through inspection points. They may transit to another gate to get on an airplane. Once inside the country, they may seek another form of identification and try to enter a government or private facility. They may seek to change immigration status in order to remain. Each of these checkpoints or portals is a screening, a chance to establish that people are who they say they are and are seeking access for their stated purpose, to intercept identifiable suspects and to take effective action. The job of protection is shared among these many defined checkpoints. By taking advantage of them all, we need not depend on any one point in the system to do the whole job. The challenge is to see the common framework across agencies and functions and develop a conceptual framework, an architecture, for an effective screening system. Throughout government, and indeed in private enterprise, Agencies and firms at these portals confront recurring judgments that balance security, efficiency and civil liberties. These problems should be addressed systematically, not in an ag hoc, fragmented way. For example, what information is an individual required to present and in what form? A fundamental problem, now beginning to be addressed, is the lack of standardised information in feeder documents used in identifying individuals. Biometric identifiers that measure unique physical characteristics, such as facial features, fingerprints or iris scans, and reduce them to digitised numerical statements called algorithms, are just beginning to be used. Travel history, however, is still recorded in passports with entry-exit stamps called cachet, which Al-Qaeda has trained its operatives to forge and use to conceal their terrorist activities. How will the individual and the information be checked? There are many databases just in the United States for terrorist, criminal and immigration history, as well as financial information, for instance. Each is set up for different purposes and stores different kinds of data under varying rules of access. Nor is access always guaranteed. Acquiring information held by foreign governments may require painstaking negotiations and records that are not yet digitised are difficult to search or analyse. The development of terrorist indicators has hardly begun and behavioural cues remain important. Who will screen individuals and what will they be trained to do? A wide range of border, immigration and law enforcement officials encounter visitors and immigrants and they are given little training in terrorist travel intelligence. Fraudulent travel documents, for instance, are usually returned to travellers who are denied entry without further examination for terrorist trademarks, investigation as to their source or legal process. What are the consequences of finding a suspicious indicator and who will take action? One risk is that responses may be ineffective or produce no further information. Four of the 9-11 attackers were pulled into secondary border inspection but then admitted. More than half of the 19 hijackers were flagged by the Federal Aviation Administration's profiling system when they arrived for their flights, but the consequence was that bags, not people, were checked. Competing risks include false positives or the danger that rules may be applied with insufficient training or judgment. Overreactions can impose high costs too on individuals, our economy and our beliefs about justice. A special note on the importance of trusting subjective judgment. One potential hijacker was turned back by an immigration inspector as he tried to enter the United States. The inspector relied on intuitive experience to ask questions more than he relied on any objective factor that could be detected by scores or a machine. Good people who have worked in such jobs for a long time understand this phenomenon well. Other evidence we obtained confirmed the importance of letting experienced gate agents or security screeners ask questions and use their judgment. This is not an invitation to arbitrary exclusions, but any effective system has to grant some scope, perhaps in a little extra inspection or one more check, to the instincts and discretion of well-trained human beings. Recommendation. 
the US border security system should be integrated into a larger network of screening points that includes our transportation system and access to vital facilities such as nuclear reactors. The President should direct the Department of Homeland Security to lead the effort to design a comprehensive screening system, addressing common problems and setting common standards with system-wide goals in mind. Extending those standards among other governments could dramatically strengthen America and the world's collective ability to intercept individuals who pose catastrophic threats. We advocate a system for screening, not categorical profiling. A screening system looks for particular identifiable suspects or indicators of risk. It does not involve guesswork about who might be dangerous. It requires frontline border officials who have the tools and resources to establish that people are who they say they are, intercept identifiable suspects and disrupt terrorist operations. The US border screening system. The border and immigration system of the United States must remain a visible manifestation of our belief in freedom, democracy, global economic growth and the rule of law yet serve equally well as a vital element of counter-terrorism. Integrating terrorist travel information in the ways we have described is the most immediate need, but the underlying system must also be sound. Since September 11, the United States has built the first phase of a biometric screening program called US Visit, the United States Visitor and Immigration Status Indicator Technology Program. It takes two biometric identifiers, digital photographs and prints of two index fingers, from travellers. False identities are used by terrorists to avoid being detected on a watch list. These biometric identifiers make such evasions far more difficult. So far, however, only visitors who acquire visas to travel to the United States are covered. While visitors from visa waiver countries will be added to the program beginning this year, covered travellers will still constitute only about 12% of all non-citizens crossing US borders. Moreover, exit data are not uniformly collected and entry data are not fully automated. It is not clear the system can be installed before 2010, but even this timetable may be too slow given the possible security dangers. Americans should not be exempt from carrying biometric passports or otherwise enabling their identities to be securely verified when they enter the United States, nor should Canadians or Mexicans. Currently, US persons are exempt from carrying passports when returning from Canada, Mexico and the Caribbean. The current system enables non-US citizens to gain entry by showing minimal identification. The 9-11 experience shows that terrorists study and exploit America's vulnerabilities. To balance this measure, programs to speed known travellers should be a higher priority, permitting inspectors to focus on greater risks. The daily commuter should not be subject to the same measures as first-time travellers. An individual should be able to pre-enrol with his or her identity verified in passage. Updates of database information and other checks can ensure ongoing reliability. The solution, requiring more research and development, is likely to combine radio frequency technology with biometric identifiers. The current patchwork of border screening systems, including several frequent traveller programs, should be consolidated with the US visit system to enable the development of an integrated system which in turn can become part of the wider screening plan we suggest. The program allowing individuals to travel from foreign countries through the United States to a third country without having to obtain a US visa has been suspended. Because transit without visa can be exploited by terrorists to enter the United States, the program should not be reinstated unless and until transit passage areas can be fully secured to prevent passengers from illegally exiting the airport. Inspectors adjudicating entries of the 9-11 hijackers lacked adequate information and knowledge of the rules. All points in the border system, from consular officers to immigration services officers, will need appropriate electronic access to an individual's file. Scattered units at Homeland Security and the State Department perform screening and data mining. Instead, a government-wide team of border and transportation officials should be working together. 
a modern border and immigration system should combine a biometric entry exit system with accessible files on visitors and immigrants, along with intelligence on indicators of terrorist travel. Our border screening system should check people efficiently and welcome friends. Admittedly large numbers of students, scholars, business people and tourists fuel our economy, cultural vitality and political reach. There is evidence that the present system is disrupting travel to the United States. Overall, visa applications in 2003 were down over 32% since 2001. In the Middle East they declined about 46% training and the design of security measures should be continuously adjusted. Recommendation. The Department of Homeland Security, properly supported by Congress, should complete as quickly as possible a biometric entry exit screening system, including a single system for speeding qualified travellers. It should be integrated with the system that provides benefits to foreigners seeking to stay in the United States. Linking biometric passports to good data systems and decision making is a fundamental goal. No one can hide his or her debt by acquiring a credit card with a slightly different name. Yet today a terrorist can defeat the link to electronic records by tossing away an old passport and slightly altering the name in the new one. Completion of the entry exit system is a major and expensive challenge. Biometrics have been introduced into an antiquated computer environment. Replacement of these systems and improved biometric systems will be required. Nonetheless, funding and completing a biometrics-based entry-exit system is an essential investment in our national security. Exchanging terrorist information with other countries, consistent with privacy requirements, along with listings of lost and stolen passports, will have immediate security benefits. We should move toward real-time verification of passports with issuing authorities. The further away from our borders that screening occurs, the more security benefits we gain. At least some screening should occur before a passenger departs on a flight destined for the United States. We should also work with other countries to ensure effective inspection regimes at all airports. The international community arrives at international standards for the design of passports through the International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO. The global standard for identification is a digital photograph. Fingerprints are optional. We must work with others to improve passport standards and provide foreign assistance to countries that need help in making the transition. Recommendation. The US government cannot meet its own obligations to the American people to prevent the entry of terrorists without a major effort to collaborate with other governments. We should do more to exchange terrorist information with trusted allies and raise US and global border security standards for travel and border crossing over the medium and long term through extensive international cooperation. Immigration Law and Enforcement Our borders and immigration system, including law enforcement, ought to send a message of welcome, tolerance and justice to members of immigrant communities in the United States and in their countries of origin we should reach out to immigrant communities. Good immigration services are one way of doing so that is valuable in every way, including intelligence. It is elemental to border security to know who is coming into the country. Today, more than 9 million people are in the United States outside the legal immigration system. We must also be able to monitor and respond to entrances between our ports of entry, working with Canada and Mexico as much as possible. There is a growing role for state and local law enforcement agencies. They need more training and work with federal agencies so that they can cooperate more effectively with those federal authorities in identifying terrorist suspects. All but one of the 9-11 hijackers acquired some form of US identification document, some by fraud. Acquisition of these forms of identification would have assisted them in boarding commercial flights, renting cars and other necessary activities. Recommendation. Secure identification should begin in the United States. The federal government should set standards for the issuance of birth certificates and sources of identification, such as driver's licenses. Fraud in identification documents is no longer just a problem of theft. At many entry points to vulnerable facilities, 
including gates for boarding aircraft, sources of identification are the last opportunity to ensure that people are who they say they are and to check whether they are terrorists. Strategies for Aviation and Transportation Security The US transportation system is vast and, in an open society, impossible to secure completely against terrorist attacks. There are hundreds of commercial airports, thousands of planes and tens of thousands of daily flights carrying more than half a billion passengers a year. Millions of containers are imported annually through more than 300 sea and river ports, served by more than 3,700 cargo and passenger terminals. About 6,000 agencies provide transit services through buses, subways, ferries and light rail service to about 14 million Americans each weekday. In November 2001, Congress passed and the President signed the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. This act created the Transportation Security Administration, which is now part of the Homeland Security Department. In November 2002, both the Homeland Security Act and the Maritime Transportation Security Act followed. These laws required the development of strategic plans to describe how the new department and TSA would provide security for critical parts of the US transportation sector. Over 90% of the nation's $5.3 billion annual investment in the TSA goes to aviation to fight the last war. The money has been spent mainly to meet congressional mandates to federalise the security checkpoint screeners and to deploy existing security methods and technologies at airports. The current efforts do not yet reflect a forward-looking strategic plan systematically analysing assets, risks, costs and benefits. Lacking such a plan, we are not convinced that our transportation security resources are being allocated to the greatest risks in a cost-effective way. Major vulnerabilities still exist in cargo and general aviation security. These, together with inadequate screening and access controls, continue to present aviation security challenges. While commercial aviation remains a possible target, terrorists may turn their attention to other modes. Opportunities to do harm are as great or greater in maritime or surface transportation. Initiatives to secure shipping containers have just begun. Surface transportation systems such as railroads and mass transit remain hard to protect because they are so accessible and extensive. Despite congressional deadlines, the TSA has developed neither an integrated strategic plan for the transportation sector, nor specific plans for the various modes, air, sea and ground. Recommendation. Hard choices must be made in allocating limited resources. The US government should identify and evaluate the transportation assets that need to be protected, set risk-based priorities for defending them, select the most practical and cost-effective ways of doing so, and then develop a plan, budget and funding to implement the effort. The plan should assign roles and missions to the relevant authorities, federal, state, regional and local, and to private stakeholders. In measuring effectiveness, perfection is unattainable, but terrorists should perceive that potential targets are defended. They may be, de be deterred by a significant chance of failure. Congress should set a specific date for the completion of these plans and hold the Department of Homeland Security and TSA accountable for achieving them. The most powerful investments may be for improvements in technologies with applications across the transportation modes, such as scanning technologies designed to screen containers that can be transported by plane, ship, truck or rail. Though such technologies are becoming available now, widespread deployment is still years away. In the meantime, the best protective measures may be to combine improved methods of identifying and tracking the high-risk containers, operators and facilities that require added scrutiny with further efforts to integrate intelligence analysis, effective procedures for transmitting threat information to transportation authorities and vigilance by transportation authorities and the public. A layered security system. No single security measure is foolproof. Accordingly, the TSA must have multiple layers of security in place to defeat the more plausible and dangerous forms of attack against public transportation. The plan must take into consideration the full array of possible enemy tactics, such as use of insiders, suicide terrorism or standoff attack. Each layer must be effective in its own right, 
each must be supported by other layers that are redundant and coordinated. The TSA should be able to identify for Congress the array of potential terrorist attacks, the layers of security in place, and the reliability provided by each layer. TSA must develop a plan, as described above, to improve weak individual layers and the effectiveness of the layered systems it deploys. On 9-11, the 19 hijackers were screened by a computer-assisted screening system called CAPS. More than half were identified for further inspection, which applied only to their checked baggage. Under current practices, air carriers enforce government orders to stop certain known and suspected terrorists from boarding commercial flights and to apply secondary screening procedures to others. The no-fly and automatic selectee lists include only those individuals who the US government believes pose a direct threat of attacking aviation. Because air carriers implement the program, concerns about sharing intelligence information with private firms and foreign countries keep the US government from listing all terrorist and terrorist suspects who should be included. The TSA has planned to take over this function when it deploys a new screening system to take the place of CAPS. The deployment of this system has been delayed because of claims it may violate civil liberties. Recommendation. Improved use of no-fly and automatic selectee lists should not be delayed while the argument about a successor to CAPS continues. This screening function should be performed by the TSA, and it should utilise the larger set of watch lists maintained by the Federal Government. Air carriers should be required to supply the information needed to test and implement this new system. CAPS is still part of the screening process, still profiling passengers, with the consequences of selection now including personal searches of the individual and carry-on bags. The TSA is dealing with the kind of screening issues that are being encountered by other agencies. As we mentioned earlier, these screening issues need to be elevated for high-level attention and addressed promptly by the government. Working through these problems can help clear the way for the TSA's screening improvements and would help many other agencies too. The next layer is the screening checkpoint itself. As the screening system tries to stop dangerous people, the checkpoint needs to be able to find dangerous items. Two reforms are needed soon. Screening people for explosives, not just their carry-on bags, and improved screener performance. Recommendation. The TSA and the Congress must give priority attention to improving the ability of screening checkpoints to detect explosives on passengers. As a start, each individual selected for special screening should be screened for explosives. Further, the TSA should conduct a human factors study, a method often used in the private sector, to understand problems in screener performance and set attainable objectives for individual screeners and for the checkpoints where screening takes place. Concerns also remain regarding the screening and transport of checked bags and cargo. More attention and resources should be directed to reducing or mitigating the threat posed by explosives in vessels' cargo holds. The TSA should expedite the installation of advanced inline baggage screening equipment. Because the aviation industry will derive substantial benefits from this deployment, it should pay a fair share of the costs. The TSA should require that every passenger aircraft carrying cargo must deploy at least one hardened container to carry any suspect cargo. TSA also needs to intensify its efforts to identify, track and appropriately screen potentially dangerous cargo in both the aviation and maritime sectors. The Protection of Civil Liberties Many of our recommendations call for the government to increase its presence in our lives for example by creating standards for the issuance of forms of identification, by better securing our borders, by sharing information gathered by many different agencies. We also recommend the consolidation of authority over the now far-flung entities constituting the intelligence community. The Patriot Act vests substantial powers in our federal government. We have seen the government use the immigration laws as a tool in its counter-terrorism effort. Even without the changes we recommend, the American public has vested enormous authority in the US government. At our first public hearing on March 31, 2003, we noted the need for balance as our government responds to the real and ongoing threat of terrorist attacks. 
The terrorists have used our open society against us. In wartime, government calls for greater powers, and then the need for those powers recedes after the war ends. This struggle will go on. Therefore, while protecting our homeland, Americans should be mindful of threats to vital personal and civil liberties. This balancing is no easy task, but we must constantly strive to keep it right. This shift of power and authority to the government calls for an enhanced system of checks and balances to protect the precious liberties that are vital to our way of life. We therefore make three recommendations. First, as we will discuss in Chapter 13, to open up the sharing of information across so many agencies and with the private sector, the President should take responsibility for determining what information can be shared by which agencies and under what conditions. Protection of privacy rights should be one key element of this determination. Recommendation. As the President determines the guidelines for information sharing among government agencies and by those agencies with the public sector, he should safeguard the privacy of individuals about whom information is shared. Second, Congress responded in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 with the Patriot Act, which vested substantial new powers in the investigative agencies of the government. Some of the most controversial provisions of the Patriot Act are to sunset at the end of 2005. Many of the Act's provisions are relatively non-controversial, updating America's surveillance laws to reflect technological developments in a digital age. Some executive actions that have been criticised are unrelated to the Patriot Act. The provisions in the Act that facilitate the sharing of information among intelligence agencies and between law enforcement and intelligence appear on balance to be beneficial. Because of concerns regarding the shifting balance of power to the government, we think that a full and informed debate on the Patriot Act would be healthy. Recommendation. The burden of proof for retaining a particular governmental power should be on the executive to explain a that the power actually materially enhances security and b that there is adequate supervision of the executive's use of the powers to ensure protection of civil liberties. If the power is granted there must be adequate guidelines and oversight to properly confine its use. Third, during the course of our inquiry we were told that there is no office within the government whose job it is to look across the government at the actions we are taking to protect ourselves to ensure that liberty concerns are appropriately considered. If, as we recommend, there is substantial change in the way we collect and share intelligence, there should be a voice within the executive branch for those concerns. Many agencies have privacy offices, albeit of limited scope. The Intelligence Oversight Board of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board has in the past had the job of overseeing certain activities of the intelligence community. Recommendation. At this time of increased and consolidated government authority, there should be a board within the executive branch to oversee adherence to the guidelines we recommend and the commitment the government makes to defend our civil liberties. We must find ways of reconciling security with liberty, since the success of one helps protect the other. The choice between security and liberty is a false choice as nothing is more likely to endanger America's liberties than the success of a terrorist attack at home. Our history has shown us that insecurity threatens liberty. Yet, if our liberties are curtailed, we lose the values that we are struggling to defend. Setting Priorities for National Preparedness Before 9-11, no executive department had, as its first priority, the job of defending America from terrorist attack. That changed with the 2002 creation of the Department of Homeland Security. This department now has the lead responsibility for problems that feature so prominently in the 9-11 story, such as protecting borders, securing transportation and other parts of our critical infrastructure, organising emergency assistance and working with the private sector to assess vulnerabilities. Throughout the government, nothing has been harder for officials, executive or legislative, than to set priorities, making hard choices in allocating limited resources. These difficulties have certainly afflicted the Department of Homeland Security, hamstrung by its many congressional overseers. In delivering assistance to state and local governments, we heard, especially in New York, about imbalances in the allocation of money. 
the argument concentrates on two questions. First, how much money should be set aside for criteria not directly related to risk? Currently, a major portion of the billions of dollars apportioned for state and local assistance is allocated so that each state gets a certain amount, or an allocation based on its population wherever they live. Recommendation Homeland security assistance should be based strictly on an assessment of risks and vulnerabilities. Now, in 2004, Washington DC and New York City are certainly at the top of any such list. We understand the contention that every state and city needs to have some minimum infrastructure for emergency response, but federal homeland security assistance should not remain a program for general revenue sharing. It should supplement state and local resources based on the risks or vulnerabilities that merit additional support. Congress should not use this money as a pork barrel. The second question is, can useful criteria to measure risk and vulnerability be developed that assess all the many variables? The allocation of funds should be based on an assessment of threats and vulnerabilities. That assessment should consider such factors as population, population density, vulnerability and the presence of critical infrastructure within each state. In addition, the federal government should require each state receiving federal emergency preparedness funds to provide an analysis based on the same criteria to justify the distribution of funds in that state. In a free-for-all over money, it is understandable that representatives will work to protect the interests of their home states or districts. But this issue is too important for politics as usual to prevail. Resources must be allocated according to vulnerabilities. We recommend that a panel of security experts be convened to develop written benchmarks for evaluating community needs. We further recommend that federal homeland security funds be allocated in accordance with those benchmarks and that states be required to abide by those benchmarks in dispersing the federal funds. The benchmarks will be imperfect and subjective. They will continually evolve, but hard choices must be made. Those who would allocate money on a different basis should then defend their view of a national interest. Command, Control and Communications The attacks on 9-11 demonstrated that even the most robust emergency response capabilities can be overwhelmed if an attack is large enough. Teamwork, collaboration and cooperation at an incident site are critical to a successful response. Key decision makers who are represented at the incident command level help to ensure an effective response, the efficient use of resources and responder safety. Regular joint training at all levels is moreover essential to ensuring close coordination during an actual incident. Recommendation. Emergency response agencies nationwide should adopt the incident command system. When multiple agencies or multiple jurisdictions are involved, they should adopt a unified command. Both are proven frameworks for emergency response. We strongly support the decision that federal homeland security funding will be contingent, as of October 1, 2004, upon the adoption and regular use of ICS and unified command procedures. In the future, the Department of Homeland Security should consider making financing contingent on aggressive and realistic training in accordance with ICS and Unified Command procedures. The attacks of September 11, 2001 overwhelmed the response capacity of most of the jurisdictions where the hijacked airliners crashed. While many jurisdictions have established mutual aid compacts, a serious obstacle to multi-jurisdictional response has been the lack of indemnification for mutual aid responders in areas such as the National Capital Region. Public safety organisations, chief administrative officers, state emergency management agencies and the Department of Homeland Security should develop a regional focus within the emergency responder community and promote multi-jurisdictional mutual assistance compacts. Where such compacts already exist, training in accordance with their terms should be required. Congress should pass legislation to remedy the long-standing indemnification and liability impediments to the provision of public safety mutual aid in the National Capital Region and where applicable throughout the nation. 
The inability to communicate was a critical element as the World Trade Center, Pentagon and Somerset County, Pennsylvania crash sites, where multiple agencies and multiple jurisdictions responded. The occurrence of this problem at three very different sites is strong evidence that compatible and adequate communications among public safety organisations at the local, state and federal levels remains an important problem. Recommendation Congress should support pending legislation which provides for the expedited and increased assignment of radio spectrum for public safety purposes. Furthermore, high-risk urban areas such as New York City and Washington DC should establish signal core units to ensure communications connectivity between and among civilian authorities, local first responders and the National Guard. Federal funding of such units should be given high priority by Congress. Private sector preparedness. The mandate of the Department of Homeland Security does not end with government. The department is also responsible for working with the private sector to ensure preparedness. This is entirely appropriate, for the private sector controls 85% of the critical infrastructure in the nation. Indeed, unless a terrorist's target is a military or other secure government facility, the first first responders will almost certainly be civilians. Homeland security and national preparedness therefore often begins with the private sector. Preparedness in the private sector and public sector for rescue, restart and recovery operations should include 1. A plan for evacuation, 2. Adequate communications capabilities and 3. A plan for continuity of operations. As we examined the emergency response to 9-11, witness after witness told us that despite 9-11, the private sector remains largely unprepared for a terrorist attack. We were also advised that the lack of a widely embraced private sector preparedness standard was a principal contributing factor to this lack of preparedness. We responded by asking the American National Standards Institute ANSI, to develop a consensus on a national standard for preparedness for the private sector. ANSI convened safety, security and business continuity experts from a wide range of industries and associations, as well as from federal, state and local government stakeholders, to consider the need for standards for private sector emergency preparedness and business continuity. The result of these sessions was ANSI's recommendation that the Commission endorse a voluntary national preparedness standard. Based on the existing American National Standard on Disaster Emergency Management and Business Continuity Programs NFPA 1600, the proposed National Preparedness Standard establishes a common set of criteria and terminology for preparedness, disaster management, emergency management and business continuity programs. The experience of the private sector in the World Trade Center emergency demonstrated the need for these standards. Recommendation We endorse the American National Standards Institute's recommended standard for private preparedness. We were encouraged by Secretary Tom Ridge's praise of the standard and urged the Department of Homeland Security to promote its adoption. We also encourage the insurance and credit rating industries to look closely at a company's compliance with the ANSI standard in assessing its insurability and credit worthiness. We believe that compliance with the standard should define the standard of care owed by a company to its employees and the public for legal purposes. Private sector preparedness is not a luxury. It is a cost of doing business in the post 9-11 world. It is ignored at a tremendous potential cost in lives, money and national security. End of section 50. Recording by Philippa Chantry, Canberra. Chapter 13 and 13.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Biddy. The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 13. How to do it. A different way of organizing the government. As presently configured, the national security institutions of the U.S. government 
are still the institutions constructed to win the Cold War. The United States confronts a very different world today. Instead of facing a few very dangerous adversaries, the United States confronts a number of less visible challenges that surpass the boundaries of traditional nation-states and call for quick, imaginative and agile responses. The men and women of the World War II generation rose to the challenge of the 1940s and 1950s. They restructured the government so that it could protect the country. That is now the job of the generation that experienced 9-11. Those attacks showed emphatically that ways of doing business rooted in a different era are just not good enough. Americans should not settle for incremental, ad hoc adjustments to a system designed generations ago for a world that no longer exists. We recommend significant changes in the organization of the government. We know that the quality of the people is more important than the quality of the wiring diagrams. Some of the saddest aspects of the 9-11 story are the outstanding efforts of so many individual officials straining, often without success, against the boundaries of the possible. Good people can overcome bad structures. They should not have to. The United States has the resources and the people. The government should combine them more effectively, achieving unity of effort. We offer five major recommendations to do that. 1. Unifying strategic intelligence and operational planning against Islamist terrorists across the foreign domestic divide with the National Counter-Terrorism Center. 2. Unifying the intelligence community with the new National Intelligence Director. 3. Unifying the many participants in the counter-terrorism effort and their knowledge in a network-based information sharing system that transcends traditional governmental boundaries. 4. Unifying and strengthening congressional oversight to improve quality and accountability. And 5. Strengthening the FBI and Homeland Defenders. Chapter 13.1 Unity of Effort Across the Foreign Domestic Divide Much of the public commentary about the 9-11 attacks has dealt with lost opportunities, some of which we reviewed in Chapter 11. These are often characterized as problems of watch-listing, of information sharing, or of connecting the dots. In Chapter 11, we explained that these labels are too narrow. They describe the symptoms, not the disease. In each of our examples, no one was firmly in charge of managing the case and able to draw relevant intelligence from anywhere in the government, assign responsibilities across the agencies, foreign or domestic, track progress, and quickly bring obstacles up to the level where they could be resolved. Responsibility and accountability were diffuse. The agencies cooperated some of the time, but even such cooperation as there was is not the same thing as joint action. When agencies cooperate, one defines the problem and seeks help with it. When they act jointly, the problem and options for action are defined differently from the start. Individuals from different backgrounds come together in analyzing a case and planning how to manage it. In our hearings, we regularly ask witnesses, who is the quarterback? The other players are in their positions doing their jobs, but who is calling the play that assigns roles to help them execute as a team? Since 9-11, those issues have not been resolved. In some ways, joint work has gotten better, and in some ways worse. The effort of fighting terrorism has flooded over many of the usual agency boundaries because of its sheer quantity and energy. Attitudes have changed. Officials are keenly conscious of trying to avoid the mistakes of 9-11. They try to share information. They circulate, even to the President, practically every reported threat, however dubious. Partly because of all this effort, the challenge of coordinating it has multiplied. Before 9-11, the CIA was plainly the lead agency confronting Al-Qaeda. The FBI played a very secondary role. The engagement of the Departments of Defense and State was more episodic. Today, the CIA is still central, but the FBI is much more active along with other parts of the Justice Department. The Defense Department effort is now enormous. 
three of his unified commands, each headed by a four-star general, have counter-terrorism as a primary mission. Special Operations Command, Central Command, both headquartered in Florida, and Northern Command, headquartered in Colorado. A new Department of Homeland Security combines formidable resources in border and transportation security, along with analysis of domestic vulnerability and other tasks. The State Department has the lead on many of the foreign policy tasks we described in Chapter 12. At the White House, the National Security Council, NSC, now is joined by a parallel presidential advisory structure, the Homeland Security Council. So far we have mentioned two reasons for joint action, the virtue of joint planning and the advantage of having someone in charge to ensure a unified effort. There is a third, the simple shortage of experts with sufficient skills. The limited pool of critical experts, for example, skilled counterterrorism analysts and linguists, is being depleted. Expanding these capabilities will require not just money, but time. Primary responsibility for terrorism analysis has been assigned to the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC, created in 2003 based at the CIA headquarters but staffed with representatives of many agencies reporting directly to the director of the Central Intelligence. Yet the CIA houses another intelligence fusion center, the counter-terrorist center that played such a key role before 9-11. A third major analytic unit is at Defense, in the Defense Intelligence Agency. A fourth, concentrating more on homeland vulnerabilities, is at the Department of Homeland Security. The FBI is in the process of building the analytic capability it has long lacked, and it also has the terrorist screening center. The U.S. government cannot afford so much duplication of effort. There are not enough experienced experts to go around. The duplication also places extra demands on already hard-pressed single-source national technical intelligence collectors like the National Security Agency. Combining Joint Intelligence and Joint Action A smart government would integrate all sources of information to see the enemy as a whole. Integrated all-source analysis should also inform and shape strategies to collect more intelligence. Yet, the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, while it has primary responsibility for terrorism analysis, is formally proscribed from having any oversight or operational authority and is not part of any operational entity other than reporting to the Director of Central Intelligence. The government now tries to handle the problem of joint management informed by analysis of intelligence from all sources in two ways. First, agencies with lead responsibilities for certain problems have constructed their own interagency entities and task forces in order to get cooperation. The Counter-Terrorist Center at CIA, for example, recruits liaison officers from throughout the intelligence community. The Military Central Command has its own interagency center, recruiting liaison officers from all the agencies from which it might need help. The FBI has joint terrorism task forces in 84 locations to coordinate the activities of other agencies when action may be required. Second, the problem of joint operational planning is often passed to the White House, where the NSC staff tries to play this role. The National Security staff at the White House, both NSC and New Homeland Security Council staff, has already become 50% larger since 9-11. But our impression after talking to serving officials is that even this enlarged staff is consumed by meetings on day-to-day -day issues, sifting each day's threat information and trying to coordinate everyday operations. Even as it crowds into every square inch of available office space, the NSC staff is still not sized or funded to be an executive agency. In Chapter 3, we described some of the problems that arose in the 1980s when a White House staff, constitutionally insulated from the usual mechanisms of oversight, became involved in direct operations. During the 1990s, 
Richard Clarke occasionally tried to exercise such authority, sometimes successfully, but often causing friction. Yet a subtler and more serious danger is that as the NSC staff is consumed by these day-to-day -day tasks, it has less capacity to find the time and detachment needed to advise a president on larger policy issues. That means less time to work on major new initiatives, help with legislative management to steer needed bills through Congress, and track the design and implementation of the strategic plans for regions, countries and issues that we discuss in Chapter 12. Much of the job of operational coordination remains with the agencies, especially the CIA. There, DCI Tenet and his chief aides ran interagency meetings nearly every day to coordinate much of the government's day-to-day -day work. The DCI insisted he did not make policy and only oversaw its implementation. In the struggle against terrorism, these distinctions seem increasingly artificial. Also, as the DCI becomes a lead coordinator of the government's operations, it becomes harder to play all the position's other roles, including that of analyst-in-chief. The problem is nearly intractable because of the way the government is currently structured. Lines of operational authority run to the expanding executive departments, and they are guarded for understandable reasons. The DCI commands the CIA's personnel overseas. The Secretary of Defense will not yield to others in conveying commands to military forces. The Justice Department will not give up the responsibility of deciding whether to seek arrest warrants. But the result is that each agency or department needs its own intelligence apparatus to support the performance of its duties. It is hard to break down stovepipes when there are so many stoves that are legally and politically entitled to have cast iron pipes of their own. Recalling the Goldwater Nichols legislation of 1986, Secretary Rumsfeld reminded us that to achieve better joint capability, each of the armed services had to give up some of their turf and authorities and prerogatives. Today, he said, the executive branch is stovepiped much like the four services were nearly 20 years ago. He wondered if it might be appropriate to ask agencies to give up some of their existing turf and authority in exchange for a stronger, faster, more efficient government-wide joint effort. Privately, other key officials have made the same point to us. We therefore propose a new institution, a civilian-led unified joint command for counterterrorism. It should combine strategic intelligence and joint operational planning. In the Pentagon's joint staff, which serves the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, intelligence is handled by the J-2 Directorate, operational planning by J-3, and overall policy by J-5. Our concept combines the J-2 and J-3 functions, intelligence and operational planning, in one agency, keeping overall policy coordination where it belongs, in the National Security Council. Recommendation we recommend the establishment of a National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, built on the foundation of the existing Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC. Breaking the older mold of national government organization, this NCTC should be a center for joint operational planning and joint intelligence, staffed by personnel from the various agencies. The head of the NCTC should have authority to evaluate the performance of the people assigned to the center. Such a joint center should be developed in the same spirit that guided the military's creation of unified joint commands or the shaping of earlier national agencies, like the National Reconnaissance Office, which was formed to organize the work of the CIA and several defense agencies in space. NCTC Intelligence the NCTC should lead strategic analysis, pooling all source intelligence, foreign and domestic, about transnational terrorist organizations with global reach. It should develop net assessments, comparing enemy capabilities and intentions against U.S. defenses and countermeasures. It should also provide warning. It should do this work by drawing on the efforts of the CIA, FBI, 
Homeland Security, and other departments and agencies. It should task collection requirements both inside and outside the United States. The intelligence function, J2, should build on the existing TTIC structure and remain distinct as a national intelligence center within the NCTC, as the government's principal knowledge bank on Islamist terrorism with the main responsibility for strategic analysis and net assessment, it should absorb a significant portion of the analytical talent now residing in the CIA's Counterterrorist Center and the DIA's Joint Intelligence Task Force, Combating Terrorism, JITF-CT. NCTC Operations The NCTC should perform joint planning the plans would assign operational responsibilities to lead agencies, such as State, the CIA, the FBI, Defense, and its combatant commands, Homeland Security, and other agencies. The NCTC should not direct the actual execution of these operations, leaving that job to the agencies. The NCTC would then track implementation. It would look across the foreign domestic divide and across agency boundaries, updating plans to follow through on cases. The Joint Operational Planning Function, J3, will be new to the TTIC structure. The NCTC can draw on analogous work now being done in the CIA and every other involved department of the government, as well as reaching out to knowledgeable officials in state and local agencies throughout the United States. The NCTC should not be a policy-making body. Its operations and planning should follow the policy direction of the President and the National Security Council. Consider this hypothetical case. The NSA discovers that a suspected terrorist is traveling to Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur. The NCTC should draw on joint intelligence resources, including its own NSA counter-terrorism experts, to analyze the identities and possible destinations of these individuals. Informed by this analysis, the NCTC would then organize and plan the management of the case, drawing on the talents and differing kinds of experience among the several agency representatives assigned to it assigning tasks to the CIA overseas, to Homeland Security watching entry points into the United States, and to the FBI. If military assistance might be needed, the Special Operations Command could be asked to develop an appropriate concept for such an operation. The NCTC would be accountable for tracking the progress of the case, ensuring that the plan evolved with it, and integrating the information into a warning. The NCTC would be responsible for being sure that intelligence gathered from the activities in the field became part of the government's institutional memory about Islamist terrorist personalities, organizations, and possible means of attack. In each case, the involved agency would make its own senior managers aware of what it was being asked to do. If those agency heads objected and the issue could not easily be resolved, then the disagreement about roles and missions could be brought before the National Security Council and the President. NCTC Authorities The head of the NCTC should be appointed by the President and should be equivalent in rank to a Deputy Head of Cabinet Department. The head of the NCTC would report to the National Intelligence Director, an office whose creation we recommend below placed in the executive office of the president. The head of the NCTC would thus also report indirectly to the president. This official's nomination should be confirmed by the Senate, and he or she should testify to the Congress, as is the case now with other statutory presidential offices, like the U.S. Trade Representative. To avoid the fate of other entities with great nominal authority and little real power, the head of the NCTC must have the right to concur in the choices of personnel to lead the operating entities of the departments and agencies focused on counterterrorism, specifically including the head of the counterterrorist center, the head of the FBI's counterterrorism division, the commanders of the Defense Department's Special Operations Command, and Northern Command and the State Department's coordinator for counterterrorism.
the head of the NCTC should also work with the director of the Office of Management and Budget in developing the President's counter-terrorism budget. There are precedents for surrendering authority for joint planning while preserving an agency's operational control. In the international context, NATO commanders may get line authority over forces assigned by other nations. In U.S. Unified Commands, commanders plan operations that may involve units belonging to one of the services. In each case, procedures are worked out, formal and informal, to define the limits of the Joint Commander's authority. The most serious disadvantage of the NCTC is the reverse of its greatest virtue. The struggle against Islamist terrorism is so important that any clear-cut centralization of authority to manage and be accountable for it may concentrate too much power in one place. The proposed NCTC would be given the authority of planning the activities of other agencies. Law or executive order must define the scope of such line authority. The NCTC would not eliminate interagency policy disputes. These would still go to the National Security Council. To improve coordination at the White House, we believe the existing Homeland Security Council should soon be merged into a single National Security Council. The creation of the NCTC should help the NSC staff concentrate on its core duties of assisting the President and supporting interdepartmental policy making. We recognize that this is a new and difficult idea precisely because the authorities we recommend for the NCTC really would, as Secretary Rumsfeld foresaw, ask strong agencies to give up some of their turf and authority in exchange for a stronger, faster, more efficient government-wide joint effort. Countering transnational Islamist terrorism will test whether the U.S. government can fashion more flexible models of management needed to deal with the 21st century world. An argument against change is that the nation is at war and cannot afford to reorganize in midstream. But some of the main innovations of the 1940s and 1950s, including the creation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and even the construction of the Pentagon itself, were undertaken in the midst of war. Surely the country cannot wait until the struggle against Islamist terrorism is over. Surprise, when it happens to a government, is likely to be a complicated, diffuse, bureaucratic thing. It includes neglect of responsibility, but also responsibility so poorly defined or so ambiguously delegated that action gets lost. That comment was made more than 40 years ago about Pearl Harbor. We hope another commission, writing in the future about another attack, does not again find this quotation to be so apt. End of chapter 13.1 Recording by Biddy Chapter 13.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Rohde the 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 13.2 Unity of Effort in the Intelligence Community In our first section we concentrated on counterterrorism, discussing how to combine the analysis of information from all sources of intelligence with the joint planning of operations that draw on that analysis. In this section we step back from looking just at the counterterrorism problem we reflect on whether the government is organized adequately to direct resources and build the intelligence capabilities it will need, not just for countering terrorism, but for the broader range of national security challenges in the decades ahead. The Need for a Change During the Cold War, intelligence agencies did not depend on seamless integration to track and count the thousands of military targets, such as tanks and missiles, fielded by the Soviet Union and other adversary states. Each agency concentrated on its specialized mission, acquiring its own information, and then sharing it via formal, finished reports. The Department of Defense had given birth to, 
and dominated the main agencies for technical collection of intelligence. Resources were shifted at an incremental pace, coping with challenges that arose over years, even decades. We summarized the resulting organization of the intelligence community in Chapter 3. It is outlined below. Members of the U.S. Intelligence Community Office of the Director of Central Intelligence, which includes the Office of the Deputy Director of Central Intelligence for Community Management, the Community Management Staff, the Terrorism Threat Integration Center, the National Intelligence Council, and other community offices. The Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, which performs human source collection, all source analysis, and advanced science and technology. National Intelligence Agencies National Security Agency, NSA, which performs signals collection and analysis. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, which performs imagery collection and analysis. National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, which develops, acquires, and launches space systems for intelligence collection. Other National Reconnaissance Programs. Departmental Intelligence Agencies. Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, of the Department of Defense. Intelligence Entities of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. Bureau of Intelligence and Research, INR, of the Department of State. Office of Terrorism and Finance Intelligence of the Department of Treasury. Office of Intelligence and the Counterterrorism and Counterintelligence Divisions of the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice. Office of Intelligence of the Department of Energy. Directorate of Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection, IAIP, and Directorate of Coast Guard Intelligence of the Department of Homeland Security. The need to restructure the intelligence community grows out of six problems that have become apparent before and after 9-11. Structural Barriers to Performing Joint Intelligence Work National intelligence is still organized around the collection disciplines of the home agencies, not the joint mission. The importance of integrated all-source analysis cannot be overstated. Without it, it is not possible to connect the dots. No one component holds all the relevant information. By contrast, in organizing national defense, the Goldwater-Nichols legislation of 1986 created joint commands for operations in the field, the Unified Command Plan. The services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, organize, train, and equip their people and units to perform their missions. Then they assign personnel and units to the joint combatant commander, like the commanding general of the Central Command, CENTCOM. The Goldwater-Nichols Act required officers to serve tours outside their service in order to win promotion. The culture of the Defense Department was transformed. Its collective mindset moved from service-specific to joint, and its operations became more integrated. Lack of common standards and practices across the foreign domestic divide. The leadership of the intelligence community should be able to pool information gathered overseas with information gathered in the United States, holding the work, wherever it is done, to a common standard of quality in how it is collected, processed, translated, reported, shared, and analyzed. A common set of personnel standards for intelligence can create a group of professionals better able to operate in joint activities transcending their own service-specific mindsets. Divided Management of National Intelligence Capabilities While the CIA was once central to our national intelligence capabilities, following the end of the Cold War it has been less able to influence the use of the nation's imagery and signals intelligence capabilities in three national agencies housed within the Department of Defense. The National Security Agency, 
the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and the National Reconnaissance Office. One of the lessons learned from the 1991 Gulf War was the value of national intelligence systems, satellites in particular, in precision warfare. Since that war, the Department has appropriately drawn these agencies into its transformation of the military. Helping to orchestrate this transformation is the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, a position established by Congress after 9-11. An unintended consequence of these developments has been the far greater demand made by defense on technical systems, leaving the DCI less able to influence how these technical resources are allocated and used. Weak capacity to set priorities and move resources. The agencies are mainly organized around what they collect or the way they collect it. But the priorities for collection are national. As the DCI makes hard choices about moving resources, he or she must have the power to reach across agencies and reallocate effort. Too many jobs. The DCI now has at least three jobs. He is expected to run a particular agency, the CIA. He is expected to manage the loose confederation of agencies that is the intelligence community. He is expected to be the analyst-in-chief for the government, sifting evidence and directly briefing the president as his principal intelligence adviser. No recent DCI has been able to do all three effectively. Usually, what loses out is management of the intelligence community, a difficult task even in the best case, because the DCI's current authorities are weak. With so much to do, the DCI often has not used even the authority he has. Too Complex and Secret Over the decades, the agencies and the rules surrounding the intelligence community have accumulated to a depth that practically defies public comprehension. There are now 15 agencies or parts of agencies in the intelligence community. The community and the DCI's authorities have become arcane matters, understood only by initiates after long study. Even the most basic information about how much money is actually allocated to or within the intelligence community, and most of its key components, is shrouded from public view. The current DCI is responsible for community performance, but lacks the three authorities critical for any agency head or chief executive officer. 1. Control over the purse strings. 2. The ability to hire or fire senior managers. And 3 the ability to set standards for the information infrastructure and personnel. The only budget power of the DCI over agencies other than the CIA lies in coordinating the budget requests of the various intelligence agencies into a single program for submission to Congress. The overall funding request of the 15 intelligence entities in this program is then presented to the President and Congress in 15 separate volumes. When Congress passes an appropriations bill to allocate money to intelligence agencies, most of their funding is hidden in the Defense Department in order to keep intelligence spending secret. Therefore, although the House and Senate Intelligence Committees are the authorizing committees for funding of the intelligence community, the final budget review is handled in the Defense Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committees. Those committees have no subcommittees just for intelligence, and only a few members and staff review the requests. The appropriations for the CIA and the National Intelligence Agencies, NSA, NGA, and NRO, are then given to the Secretary of Defense. The Secretary transfers the CIA's money to the DCI, but disperses the national agency's money directly. Money for the FBI's national security components falls within the appropriations for commerce, justice, and state, and goes to the Attorney General. In addition, the DCI lacks hire and fire authority over most of the intelligence community's senior managers. 
for the national intelligence agencies housed in the defense department the secretary of defense must seek the dci's concurrence regarding the nomination of these directors who are presidentially appointed but the secretary may submit recommendations to the president without receiving this concurrence the dci cannot fire these officials the dci has even less influence over the head of the fbi's national security component who is appointed by the attorney general in consultation with the dci combining joint work with stronger management we have received recommendations on the topic of intelligence reform from many sources other commissions have been over the same ground thoughtful bills have been introduced most recently a bill by the chairman of the house intelligence committee porter goss republican florida and another by the ranking minority member jane harman democrat california in the senate senators bob graham democrat florida and diane feinstein democrat california have introduced reform proposals as well past efforts have foundered because the president did not support them because the dci the secretary of defense or both opposed them and because some proposals lacked merit we have tried to take stock of these experiences and borrowed from strong elements in many of the ideas that have already been developed by others recommendations the current position of director of central intelligence should be replaced by a national intelligence director with two main areas of responsibility one to oversee national intelligence centers on specific subjects of interest across the u s government and two to manage the national intelligence program and oversee the agencies that contribute to it first the national intelligence director should oversee national intelligence centers to provide all source analysis and plan intelligence operations for the whole government on major problems. One such problem is counterterrorism. In this case, we believe that the center should be the intelligence entity, formerly TTIC, inside the National Counterterrorism Center we have proposed. It would sit there alongside the operations management unit we described earlier, with both making up the NCTC in the executive office of the president. Other national intelligence centers, for instance on counterproliferation, crime and narcotics, and China, would be housed in whatever department or agency is best suited for them. The national intelligence director would retain the present DCI's role as the principal intelligence advisor to the president. We hope the President will come to look directly to the directors of the National Intelligence Centers to provide all source analysis in their areas of responsibility, balancing the advice of these intelligence chiefs against the contrasting viewpoints that may be offered by department heads at State, Defense, Homeland Security, Justice, and other agencies. Second, the National Intelligence Director should manage the National Intelligence Program and oversee the component agencies of the intelligence community. The National Intelligence Director would submit a unified budget for national intelligence that reflects priorities chosen by the National Security Council, an appropriate balance among the varieties of technical and human intelligence collection and analysis. He or she would receive an appropriation for national intelligence and apportion the funds to the appropriate agencies in line with that budget and with authority to reprogram funds among the national intelligence agencies to meet any new priority, as counterterrorism was in the 1990s. The National Intelligence Director should approve and submit nominations to the President of the individuals who would lead the CIA, DIA, FBI Intelligence Office, NSA, NGA, NRO, Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security, and other national intelligence capabilities. 
the national intelligence director would manage this national effort with the help of three deputies each of whom would also hold a key position in one of the component agencies foreign intelligence the head of cia defense intelligence the under secretary of defense for intelligence homeland intelligence the fbi's executive assistant director for intelligence or the under secretary of homeland security for information analysis and infrastructure protection other agencies in the intelligence community would coordinate their work within each of these three areas largely staying housed in the same departments or agencies that support them now returning to the analogy of the defense department's organization these three deputies like the leaders of the army navy air force or marines would have the job of acquiring the systems training the people and executing the operations planned by the national intelligence centers and just as the combatant commanders also report to the secretary of defense the directors of national intelligence centers that is for counter-proliferation crime and narcotics and the rest also would report to the national intelligence director the defense department's military intelligence programs the joint military intelligence program jmip and the tactical intelligence and related activities program tiara tiara would remain part of that department's responsibility the national intelligence director would set personnel policies to establish standards for education and training and facilitate assignments at the national intelligence centers and across agency lines the national intelligence director also would set information sharing and information technology policies to maximize data sharing as well as policies to protect the security of information too many agencies now have an opportunity to say no to change the national intelligence director should participate in an nsc executive committee that can resolve differences and priorities among the agencies and bring the major disputes to the president for decision the national intelligence director should be located in the executive office of the president this official who would be confirmed by the senate and would testify before congress would have a relatively small staff of several hundred people taking the place of the existing community management offices housed at the cia in managing the whole community the national intelligence director is still providing a service function within the partial exception of his or her responsibilities for overseeing the nctc the national intelligence director should support the consumers of national intelligence the president and policy-making advisers such as the secretaries of state defense and homeland security and the attorney general we are weary of too easily equating government management problems with those of the private sector but we have noticed that some very large private firms rely on a powerful ceo who has significant control over how money is spent and can hire or fire leaders of the major divisions assisted by a relatively modest staff while leaving responsibility for execution in the operating divisions there are disadvantages to separating the position of national intelligence director from the job of heading the cia for example the national intelligence director will not head a major agency of his or her own and may have a weaker base for support but we believe that these disadvantages are outweighed by several other considerations the national intelligence director must be able to directly oversee intelligence collection inside the united states yet law and custom has counseled against giving such a plain domestic role to the head of the cia the cia will be one among several claimants for funds in setting national priorities the national intelligence director should not be both one of the advocates and the judge of them all 
Covert operations tend to be highly tactical, requiring close attention. The National Intelligence Director should rely on the relevant Joint Mission Center to oversee these details, helping to coordinate closely with the White House. The CIA will be able to concentrate on building the capabilities to carry out such operations and on providing the personnel who will be directing and executing such operations in the field. Rebuilding the analytic and human intelligence collection capabilities of the CIA should be a full-time effort, and the director of the CIA should focus on extending its comparative advantages. Recommendation. The CIA director should emphasize a. Rebuilding the CIA's analytic capabilities b. Transforming the clandestine service by building its human intelligence capabilities c. Developing a stronger language program with high standards and sufficient financial incentives d. Renewing emphasis on recruiting diversity among operations officers so they can blend more easily in foreign cities. e. Ensuring a seamless relationship between human source collection and signals collection at the operational level. And f. Stressing a better balance between unilateral and liaison operations. The CIA should retain responsibility for the direction and execution of clandestine and covert operations, as assigned by the relevant National Intelligence Center and authorized by the National Intelligence Director and the President. This would include propaganda, renditions, and non-military disruption. We believe, however, that one important area of responsibility should change. Recommendation. Lead responsibility for directing and executing paramilitary operations, whether clandestine or covert, should shift to the Defense Department. There it should be consolidated with the capabilities for training, direction, and execution of such operations already being developed in the Special Operations Command. Before 9-11, the CIA did not invest in developing a robust capability to conduct paramilitary operations with U.S. personnel. It relied on proxies instead, organized by CIA operatives without the requisite military training. The results were unsatisfactory. Whether the price is measured in either money or people, the United States cannot afford to build two separate capabilities for carrying out the secret military operations, secretly operating standoff missiles, and secretly training foreign military or paramilitary forces. The United States should concentrate responsibility and necessary legal authorities in one entity. The post-9-11 Afghanistan president of using joint CIA military teams for covert and clandestine operations was a good one. We believe this proposal to be consistent with it. Each agency would concentrate on its comparative advantages in building capabilities for joint missions. The operation itself would be planned in common. The CIA has a reputation for agility in operations. The military has a reputation for being methodical and cumbersome. We do not know if these stereotypes match current reality. They may also be one more symptom of the civil-military misunderstandings we described in Chapter 4. It is a problem to be resolved in policy guidance and agency management, not in the creation of redundant overlapping capabilities and authorities in such sensitive work. The CIA's experts should be integrated into the military training, exercises, and planning. To quote a CIA official now serving in the field, one fight, one team. Recommendation. Finally, to combat the secrecy and complexity we have described, the overall amounts of money being appropriated for national intelligence and to its component agencies should no longer be kept secret. Congress should pass a separate Appropriations Act 
for intelligence defending the broad allocation of how these tens of billions of dollars have been assigned among the varieties of intelligence work the specifics of the intelligence appropriation would remain classified as they are today. Opponents of declassification argue that America's enemies could learn about intelligence capabilities by tracking the top-line appropriations figure. Yet the top-line figure by itself provides little insight into U.S. intelligence sources and methods. The U.S. government readily provides copious information about spending on its military forces, including military intelligence. The intelligence community should not be subject to that much disclosure, but when even aggregate categorical numbers remain hidden, it is hard to judge priorities and foster accountability. End of chapter 13.2 Chapter 13.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 13.3. Unity of Effort in Sharing Information. Information Sharing. We have already stressed the importance of intelligence analysis that can draw on all relevant sources of information. The biggest impediment to all source analysis, to a greater likelihood of connecting the dots, is the human or systemic resistance to sharing information. The U.S. government has access to a vast amount of information. When databases not usually thought of as intelligence, such as customs or immigration information, are included, the storehouse is immense. But the U.S. government has a weak system for processing and using what it has. In interviews around the government, official after official urged us to call attention to frustrations with the unglamorous back-office side of government operations. In the 9-11 story, for example, we sometimes see examples of information that could be accessed, like the undistributed NSA information that would have helped identify Nawaf al-Hazmi in January 2000, but someone had to ask for it. In that case, no one did. Or, as in the episodes we described in Chapter 8, the information is distributed, but in a compartmented channel or the information is available, and someone does ask, but it cannot be shared. What all these stories have in common is a system that requires a demonstrated need-to-know before sharing. This approach assumes it is possible to know, in advance, who will need to use the information. Such a system implicitly assumes that the risk of inadvertent disclosure outweighs the benefits of wider sharing. Those Cold War assumptions are no longer appropriate. The culture of agencies feeling they own the information they gathered at taxpayer expense must be replaced by a culture in which the agencies instead feel they have a duty to the information to repay the taxpayer's investment by making that information available. Each intelligence agency has its own security practices, outgrowths of the Cold War. We certainly understand the reason for these practices. Counterintelligence concerns are still real, even if the old Soviet enemy has been replaced by other spies. But the security concerns need to be weighed against the costs. Current security requirements nurture overclassification and excessive compartmentation of information among agencies. Each agency's incentive structure opposes sharing with risks, criminal, civil, and internal administrative sanctions, but few rewards for sharing information. No one has to pay the long-term costs of overclassifying information, though these costs, even in literal financial terms, are substantial. There are no punishments for not sharing information. Agencies uphold a need-to-know culture of information protection 
rather than promoting a need-to-share culture of integration. Recommendation. Information procedures should provide incentives for sharing to restore a better balance between security and shared knowledge. Intelligence gathered about transnational terrorism should be processed, turned into reports, and distributed according to the same quality standards, whether it is collected in Pakistan or in Texas. The logical objection is that sources and methods may vary greatly in different locations. We therefore propose that when a report is first created, its data be separated from the sources and methods by which they are obtained. The report should begin with the information in its most shareable but still meaningful form. Therefore, the maximum number of recipients can access some form of that information. If knowledge of further details becomes important, any user can query further, with access granted or denied according to the rules set for the network and with queries leaving an audit trail in order to determine who accessed the information. But the questions may not come at all unless experts at the edge of the network can readily discover the clues that prompt to them. We propose that information be shared horizontally across new networks that transcend individual agencies. The current system is structured of an old mainframe or hub-and-spoke concept. In this older approach, each agency has its own database. Agency users send information to the database and then can retrieve it from the database. A decentralized network model, the concept behind much of the information revolution, shares data horizontally, too. Agencies would still have their own databases, but those databases would be searchable across agency lines. In this system, secrets are protected through the design of the network and an information rights management approach that controls access to the data, not access to the whole network. An outstanding conceptual framework for this kind of trusted information network has been developed by a task force of leading professionals in national security, information technology, and law assembled by the Markle Foundation. Its report has been widely discussed throughout the U.S. government and has not yet been converted into action. Recommendation The President should lead the government-wide effort to bring the major national security institutions into the information revolution. He should coordinate the resolution of the legal, policy, and technical issues across agencies to create a trusted information network. No one agency can do it alone. Well-meaning agency officials are under tremendous pressure to update their systems. Alone, they may only be able to modernize the stovepipes, not replace them. Only presidential leadership can develop government-wide concepts and standards. Currently, no one is doing this job. Backed by the Office of Management and Budget, a new National Intelligence Director, empowered to set common standards for information used throughout the community, and a Secretary of Homeland Security, who helps extend the system to public agencies and relevant private sector databases, a government-wide initiative can succeed. White House leadership is also needed because the policy and legal issues are harder than the technical ones. The necessary technology already exists. What does not are the rules for acquiring, accessing, sharing, and using the vast stores of public and private data that may be available. When information sharing works, it is a powerful tool. Therefore, the sharing and uses of information must be guided by a set of practical policy guidelines that simultaneously empower and constrain officials, telling them clearly what is and is not permitted. This is government acting in new ways to face new threats, the most recent Markle report explains, and while such change is necessary, it must be accomplished while engendering the people's trust that privacy and other civil liberties are being protected 
that businesses are not being unduly burdened with requests for extraneous or useless information that taxpayer money is being well spent and that ultimately the network will be effective in protecting our security the authors add leadership is emerging from all levels of government and from many places in the private sector what is needed now is a plan to accelerate these efforts and public debate and consensus on the goals end of chapter thirteen point three Chapter 13.4 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Siebold. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 13.4. The Unity of Effort in the Congress. Strengthen Congressional Oversight of Intelligence and Homeland Security. Of all of our recommendations, strengthening congressional oversight may be among the most difficult and important. So long as oversight is governed by current congressional rules and resolutions, we believe the American people will not get the security they want and need. The United States needs a strong, stable, and capable congressional committee structure to give America's national intelligence agencies oversight, support, and leadership. Few things are more difficult to change in Washington than Congressional Committee jurisdiction and prerogatives. To a member, these assignments are almost as important as the map of his or her Congressional District. The American people may have to insist that these changes occur, or they may well not happen. Having interviewed numerous members of Congress from both parties, as well as Congressional staff members, we found that dissatisfaction with Congressional oversight remains widespread. The future challenges of America's intelligence agencies are daunting. They include the need to develop leading-edge technologies that give our policymakers and warfighters a decisive edge in any conflict where the interests of the United States are vital. Not only does good intelligence win wars, but the best intelligence enables us to prevent them from happening altogether. Under the terms of existing rules and resolutions, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees lack the power, influence, and sustained capability to meet this challenge. While few members of Congress have the broad knowledge of intelligence activities or the know-how about the technologies employed, all members need to feel assured that good oversight is happening. When their unfamiliarity with the subject is combined with the need to preserve security, a mandate emerges for substantial change. Tinkering with the existing structure is not sufficient. Either Congress should create a Joint Committee for Intelligence using the Joint Atomic Energy Committee as its model, or it should create House and Senate committees with combined authorizing and appropriations powers. Whichever of these two forms are chosen, the goal should be a structure, codified by resolution with powers expressly granted and carefully limited, allowing a relatively small group of members of Congress, given time and reason, to master the subject and the agencies, to conduct oversight of the intelligence establishment, and be clearly accountable for their work. The staff of this committee should be nonpartisan and work for the entire committee and not for individual members. The other reforms we have suggested for a National Counterterrorism Center and a National Intelligence Director will not work if congressional oversight does not change too. Unity of effort in executive management can be lost if it is fractured by divided congressional oversight. Recommendation Congressional oversight for intelligence and counterterrorism is now dysfunctional. Congress should address this problem. We have considered various alternatives. A Joint Committee on the old model of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy is one. A single committee in each House of Congress, combining authorizing and appropriating authorities, is another. The new committee, or committees, should conduct continuing studies of the activities of the intelligence agencies and report problems relating to the development and use of intelligence to all members of the House and Senate. We have already recommended that the total level of funding for intelligence be made public and that the National Intelligence Program be appropriated by the National Intelligence Director, not to the Secretary of Defense. We also recommend that the Intelligence Committee should have a subcommittee specifically dedicated to oversight, freed from the consuming responsibility of working on the budget. The resolution creating the new Intelligence Committee structure should grant subpoena authority to the committee or committees. The majority party's representation on this committee 
should never exceed the minority's representation by more than one. Four of the members appointed to this committee or committees should be a member who also serves on each of the following additional committees, Armed Services, Judiciary, Foreign Affairs, and the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. In this way, the other major congressional interests can be brought together in the new committee's work. Members should serve indefinitely on the Intelligence Committees without set terms, thereby letting them accumulate expertise. The committee should be smaller, perhaps seven or nine members in each House, so that each member feels a greater sense of responsibility and accountability for the quality of the committee's work. The leaders of the Department of Homeland Security now appear before 88 committees and subcommittees of Congress. One expert witness, not a member of the administration, told us that this is perhaps the single largest obstacle impeding the department's successful development. The one attempt to consolidate such committee authority, the House Select Committee on Homeland Security, may be eliminated. The Senate does not even have this. Congress needs to establish for the Department of Homeland Security the kind of clear authority and responsibility that exists to enable the Justice Department to deal with crime and the Defense Department to deal with threats to national security. Through not more than one authorizing committee and one appropriating subcommittee in each House, Congress should be able to ask the Secretary of Homeland Security whether he or she has the resources to provide reasonable security against major terrorist acts within the United States and to hold the Secretary accountable for the Department's performance. Recommendation Congress should create a single principal point of oversight and review for Homeland Security. Congressional leaders are best able to judge what committee should have jurisdiction over this department and its duties, but we believe that Congress does have the obligation to choose one in the House and one in the Senate, and that this committee should be a permanent standing committee with a nonpartisan staff. Improve the transitions between administrations. In Chapter 6, we describe the transition of 2000 to 2001. Beyond the policy issues we described, the new administration did not have its deputy cabinet officers in place until the spring of 2001, and the critical sub-cabinet officials were not confirmed until the summer, if then. In other words, the new administration, like others before it, did not have its team on the job until at least six months after it took office. Recommendation Since a catastrophic attack could occur with little or no notice, we should minimize as much as possible the disruption of national security policymaking during the change of administrations by accelerating the process for national security appointments. We think the process could be improved significantly so transitions can work more effectively and allow new officials to assume their new responsibilities as quickly as possible. Before the election, candidates should submit the names of selected members of their prospective transition teams to the FBI so that, if necessary, those team members can obtain security clearances immediately after the election is over. A president-elect should submit lists of possible candidates for national security positions to begin obtaining security clearances immediately after the election, so that their background investigations can be complete before January 20th. A single federal agency should be responsible for providing and maintaining security clearances, ensuring uniform standards, including uniform security questionnaires and financial report requirements, and maintaining a single database. This agency can also be responsible for administering polygraph tests on behalf of organizations that require them. A president-elect should submit the nominations of the entire new national security team through the level of undersecretary of cabinet departments, not later than January 20th. The Senate, in return, should adopt special rules requiring hearings and votes to confirm or reject national security nominees within 30 days of their submission. The Senate should not require confirmation of such executive appointees below Executive Level 3. The outgoing administration should provide the President-elect as soon as possible after Election Day with a classified, compartmented list that catalogs specific operational threats to national security major military or covert operations, and pending decisions on the possible use of force. Such a document could provide both notice and a checklist, inviting a president-elect to inquire and learn more. End of Chapter 13.4 Recording by Bob Siebold Chapter 13.5 of the 911 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. The 911 Commission Report. Chapter 13.5. Organizing America's Defenses in the United States The Future Role of the FBI We have considered proposals for a new agency dedicated to an intelligence collection in the United States. Some call this a proposal for an American MI5. Although the analogy is weak, the actual British Security Service is a relatively small worldwide agency that combines duties assigned in the U.S. government to the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, the CIA, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security. The concern about the FBI is that it has long favored its criminal justice mission over its national security mission. Part of the reason for this is the demand around the country for FBI help on criminal matters. The FBI was criticized, rightly, for the overzealous domestic intelligence investigations disclosed during the 1970s. The pendulum swung away from those types of investigations during the 1980s and 1990s, though the FBI maintained an active counterintelligence function and was the lead agency for the investigation of foreign terrorist groups operating inside the United States. We do not recommend the creation of a new domestic intelligence agency. It is not needed, if our other recommendations are adopted, to establish a strong national intelligence center, part of the NCTC, that will oversee counterterrorism intelligence work, foreign and domestic, and to create a national intelligence director who can set and enforce standards for the collection, processing, and reporting of information. Under the structures we recommend, the FBI's role is focused, but still vital. The FBI does need to be able to direct its thousands of agents and other employees to collect intelligence in America's cities and towns, interviewing informants, conducting surveillance and searches, tracking individuals, working collaboratively with local authorities, and doing so with meticulous attention to detail and compliance with the law. The FBI's job in the streets of the United States would thus be a domestic equivalent, operating under the U.S. Constitution and quite different laws and rules, to the job of the CIA's operations officers abroad. Creating a new domestic intelligence agency has other drawbacks. The FBI is accustomed to carrying out sensitive intelligence collection operations in compliance with the law. If a new domestic intelligence agency were outside of the Department of Justice, the process of legal oversight, never easy, could become even more difficult. Abuses of civil liberties could create a backlash that would impair the collection of needed intelligence. Creating a new domestic intelligence agency would divert attention of the officials most responsible for current counterterrorism efforts while the threat remains high. Putting a new player into the mix of federal agencies with counterterrorism responsibilities would exacerbate existing information sharing problems. A new domestic intelligence agency would need to acquire assets and personnel. The FBI already has 28,000 employees, 56 field offices, 400 satellite offices, and 47 legal attache offices, a laboratory, operations center, and training facility, an existing network of informants, cooperating defendants, and other sources, and relationships with state and local law enforcement, the CIA, and foreign intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Counterterrorism investigations in the United States very quickly become matters that involve violations of criminal law and possible law enforcement action. Because the FBI can have agents working criminal matters 
and agents working intelligence investigations concerning the same international terrorism target, the full range of investigative tools against a suspected terrorist can be considered within one agency. The removal of the wall that existed before 911 between intelligence and law enforcement has opened up new opportunities for cooperative action within the FBI. Counterterrorism investigations often overlap or are cued by other criminal investigations, such as money laundering or the smuggling of contraband. In the field, the close connection to criminal work has many benefits. Our recommendation to leave counterterrorism intelligence collection in the United States with the FBI still depends on an assessment that the FBI, if it makes an all-out effort to institutionalize change, can do the job. As we mentioned in Chapter 3, we have been impressed by the determination that agents display in tracking down details, patiently going the extra mile and working the extra month to put facts in the place of speculation. In our report, we have shown how agents in Phoenix, Minneapolis, and New York displayed initiative in pressing their investigations. FBI agents and analysts in the field need to have sustained support and dedicated resources to become stronger intelligence officers. They need to be rewarded for acquiring informants and for gathering and disseminating information differently and more broadly than usual in a traditional criminal investigation. FBI employees need to report and analyze what they have learned in ways the Bureau has never done before. Under Director Robert Mueller, the Bureau has made significant progress in improving its intelligence capabilities. It now has an Office of Intelligence overseen by the top tier of FBI management. Field intelligence groups have been created in all field offices to put FBI priorities and the emphasis on intelligence into practice. Advances have been made in improving the Bureau's information technology systems and in increasing connectivity and information sharing with intelligence community agencies. Director Mueller has also recognized that the FBI's reforms are far from complete. He has outlined a number of areas where added measures may be necessary. Specifically, he has recognized that the FBI needs to recruit from a broader pool of candidates, that agents and analysts working on national security matters require specialized training, and that agents should specialize within programs after obtaining a generalist foundation. The FBI is developing career tracks for agents to specialize in counterterrorism, counterintelligence, cyber crimes, criminal investigations, or intelligence. It is establishing a program for certifying agents as intelligence officers, a certification that will be a prerequisite for promotion to the senior ranks of the Bureau. New training programs have been instituted for intelligence-related subjects. The director of the FBI has proposed creating an intelligence directorate as a further refinement of the FBI intelligence program. This directorate would include units for intelligence planning and policy and for the direction of analysts and linguists. We want to ensure that the Bureau's shift to a preventive counterterrorism posture is more fully institutionalized so that it survives beyond Director Mueller's tenure. We have found that in the past the Bureau has announced its willingness to reform and restructure itself to address transnational security threats, but has fallen short, failing to effect the necessary institutional and cultural changes organization-wide. We want to ensure that this does not happen again, despite having found acceptance of the Director's clear message that counterterrorism is now the FBI's top priority, two years after 911, we also found gaps between some of the announced reforms and the reality in the field. We are concerned that management in the field offices still can allocate people and resources to local concerns that diverge from the national security mission. 
this system could revert to a focus on lower priority criminal justice cases over national security requirements. Recommendation A specialized and integrated national security workforce should be established at the FBI consisting of agents, analysts, linguists, and surveillance specialists who are recruited, trained, rewarded, and retained to ensure the development of an institutional culture imbued with a deep expertise in intelligence and national security. The President, by executive order or directive, should direct the FBI to develop this intelligence cadre, recognizing that cross-fertilization between the criminal justice and national security disciplines is vital to the success of both missions, all new agents should receive basic training in both areas. Furthermore, new agents should begin their careers with meaningful assignments in both areas. Agents and analysts should then specialize in one of these disciplines and have the option to work such matters for their entire career with the Bureau. Certain advanced training courses and assignments to other intelligence agencies should be required to advance within the national security discipline. In the interest of cross-fertilization, all senior FBI managers, including those working on law enforcement matters, should be certified intelligence officers. The FBI should fully implement a recruiting, hiring, and selection process for agents and analysts that enhances its ability to target and attract individuals with educational and professional backgrounds in intelligence, international relations, language, technology, and other relevant skills. The FBI should institute the integration of analysts, agents, linguists, and surveillance personnel in the field so that a dedicated team approach is brought to bear on national security intelligence operations. Each field office should have an official at the field office's deputy level for national security matters. This individual would have management oversight and ensure that the national priorities are carried out in the field. The FBI should align its budget structure according to its four main programs, intelligence, counterterrorism, and counterintelligence, criminal and criminal justice services, to ensure better transparency on program costs, management of resources, and protection of the intelligence program. The FBI should report regularly to Congress in its semi-annual program reviews, designed to identify whether each field office is appropriately addressing FBI and national program priorities. The FBI should report regularly to Congress in detail on the qualifications, status, and roles of analysts in the field and at headquarters. Congress should ensure that analysts are afforded training and career opportunities on a par with those offered analysts in other intelligence community agencies. The Congress should make sure funding is available to accelerate the expansion of secure facilities in FBI field offices so as to increase their ability to use secure email systems and classified intelligent product exchanges. The Congress should monitor whether the FBI's information sharing principles are implemented in practice. The FBI is just a small fraction of the national law enforcement community in the United States, a community comprised mainly of state and local agencies. The network designed for sharing information and the work of the FBI through local joint terrorism task forces should build a reciprocal relationship in which state and local agents understand what information they are looking for and, in return, receive some of the information being developed about what is happening or may happen in their communities. In this relationship, the Department of Homeland Security also will play an important part. The Homeland Security Act of 2002 gave the Undersecretary for Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection broad responsibilities. In practice, this directorate has the job to map terrorist threats to the homeland against our assessed vulnerabilities 
in order to drive our efforts to protect against terrorist threats. These capabilities are still embryonic. The Directorate has not yet developed the capacity to perform one of its assigned jobs, which is to assimilate and analyze information from Homeland Security's own component agencies, such as the Coast Guard, Secret Service, Transportation Security Administration, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and Customs and Border Protection. The Secretary of Homeland Security must ensure that these components work with the Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Directorate so that this office can perform its mission. Homeland Defense At several points in our inquiry, we asked, who is responsible for defending us at home? Our national defense at home is the responsibility first of the Department of Defense and second of the Department of Homeland Security. They must have clear delineations of responsibility and authority. We found that NORAD, which had been given the responsibility for defending U.S. airspace, had construed that mission to focus on threats coming from outside America's borders. It did not adjust its focus, even though the intelligence community had gathered intelligence on the possibility that terrorists might turn to hijacking and even use of planes as missiles. We have been assured that NORAD has now embraced the full mission. Northern Command has been established to assume responsibility for the defense of the domestic United States. Recommendation the Department of Defense and its oversight committees should regularly assess the adequacy of Northern Command strategies and planning to defend the United States against military threats to the homeland. The Department of Homeland Security was established to consolidate all of the domestic agencies responsible for securing America's borders and national infrastructure, most of which is in private hands. It should identify those elements of our transportation, energy, communications, financial, and other institutions that need to be protected, develop plans to protect that infrastructure, and exercise the mechanisms to enhance preparedness. This means going well beyond the pre-existing jobs of the agencies that have been brought together inside the department. Recommendation the Department of Homeland Security and its oversight committees should regularly assess the types of threats the country faces to determine a. the adequacy of the government's plans and the progress against those plans to protect America's critical infrastructure and b. the readiness of the government to respond to the threats that the United States might face. We look forward to a national debate on the merits of what we have recommended, and we will participate vigorously in that debate. End of chapter 13.5 End of the 911 Commission Report